This is Not Alone. End Game. Written by Craig A. Falconer. Narrated by James Patrick Cronin. Part 1. Uninvited. Of the future, man knows least. Yet about this, he worries most. Ivan Panin. E-99. Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland. From the operations cabin they had come to call home, two local drillers and their more exotic archaeologist colleague couldn't help but speculate wildly about what the breaking dawn might bring. For Stevie and Davy, the past few weeks had brought more drama and tension than they could ever have expected in a thousand lifetimes. Even Gio Nunes was reeling from all that had happened, despite his long-term employment by Timo Fiori, having taken him to various exciting dig sites around the world, as well as to the ultimate research destination of the Il Cercatori space station. The recent series of alien ground pulses that all but flattened an enormous area of the Scottish Highlands had brought the men to this hastily erected cabin, which lay in a small safe zone directly above the source of the remarkably destructive kinetic energy. But while much of the world continued to fixate on those pulses, and particularly on the recent earthly return of an alien whose distant race had seemingly planted the seeds for the unprecedented destruction, those closest to the incident had newer and even bigger concerns to worry about. The trio's heart rates were admittedly still recovering from the previous day's arrival of a colossal alien spacecraft over their heads, but what troubled them now was what lay beneath their feet. Unlike the general public, the men knew that the terrifying alien who emerged from that craft brought with him some startling revelations about his long-feared race of so-called architects. Also, unlike the general public, the trio and Thurso knew that the alien in question, known as Rogue, was now on the space station having firmly established himself, if not the rest of his kind, as humanity's friend rather than its foe. Trusted with the knowledge that 24 genetically engineered and evidently viable alien fetuses had been discovered within incubation pods in the vault beneath their feet, all three men hoped with every fiber of their being that the next movement in the lift shaft they dug to the door of the alien vault would be downwards. Stevie, Davy, and Geo watched their small TV with interest as it became clear that news crews were beginning to swarm the devastated area around Thurso in a bid to get as close to their unique vantage point as possible. Rogue's arrival brought even greater attention to Thurso than had already been the case, and ICA Chairman William Godfrey's recent confident proclamation that no more pulses would occur had removed the fear factor that had, until now, left the whole area eerily quiet. Godfrey assured the public that the vault had been swept and no further dangers to humanity had been detected. This wasn't an outright lie, but rather a carefully evasive reflection of his own confidence that Rogue could safely awaken and subjugate the gestating aliens. The cabin-based trio naturally hoped Godfrey was right, but what they didn't know was that the grandest danger was, indeed, high above their heads after all, albeit far beyond the station, and getting closer by the minute. As a striking sunrise lit up the highland sky, the men would have gone outside to appreciate every second of it had they known there might not have been many sunrises left before not just Scotland, but their whole world fell into a shadow that would make Rogue's city-sized mothership seem like a quickly passing cloud. Before long, and even more so than the deadly pulses of weeks gone by, what started in Thurso would this time be felt everywhere. For despite the deceptive peace and clear blue sky of this crisp Scottish morning, a storm was coming like never before. The security barriers at the edge of Thursul are gonna look like the barriers at that old drive-in in Birchwood soon, Davy mused as the TV relayed images of a seemingly endless stream of news vans swarming the area like flies. Aye, his old friend Stevie replied. Let's just hope they'll no have too much to report, eh? Even as the men spoke, however, the family who put Birchwood, Colorado on the map were trembling in the face of a revelation more frightening than any they had ever had to confront. 
on Il Tricatori, the McCarthys were catching an unwanted glimpse of Earth's near future. More to the point, and most unsettling of all, they were regrettably coming to terms with the notion that a near future was all their planet might have left. E-98, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore as Alessandro Bonucci showed the images on his screen to everyone in the control room, none of them could believe what they were seeing. Even as it sank in, none of them wanted to believe it. The images, received from the distant heartbeat probe which was now far beyond the sun, showed a spacecraft that the brilliant Italian physicist told the others had been reliably calculated to be larger than Earth's moon. The spacecraft seemed to have appeared from nowhere, materializing at the precise moment a surprisingly helpful alien architect successfully combined his remarkable powers with Alessandro's theoretical wisdom to reinstate the gate between Earth and the cooperative planet of New Kerguelen. Given what had been learned shortly beforehand, chiefly that the long-despised architects had never been inherently bad, but were in fact genetically engineered and imprinted to unquestioningly perform specific tasks, Alessandro now understandably felt that his success in fixing the gate had come at a great price. The craft his probe had detected en route for Earth was far beyond even the city-sized architect mothership that had spread terror around the world when it arrived first over New York and then, 13 years later, over the Scottish Highlands. Now that he knew the manipulative architects had in fact been manipulated themselves by some devious and all-powerful race the group were already thinking of as engineers, Alessandro had no doubt who was inside the phenomenal vessel that was moving so quickly it would reach Earth in as little as six weeks. It's the engineers, Dan McCarthy stated grimly. Fixing the gate must have taken us across some threshold in their minds, just like when Rogue first came to New York because the world was about to stumble into a nuclear war. We know the architects used the messengers to monitor us in case we evolved to become a threat to their order, and Rogue was adamant that we should never dabble with time travel or try to reactivate our nukes once he disabled them all. Now we know the architects were never really calling the shots, and maybe we've roused the engineers by dabbling in the dimensional aspect of the gate. And since Rogue is on our side now, Maybe they've decided they have to deal with us themselves. Alessandro didn't disagree with a word of what Dan said. This only further concerned the others who were gathered around, from ICA Chairman William Godfrey to the young couple of Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz. Dan's wife, Emma, and their remarkably gifted daughter, Piper, shared an uncomfortable glance that rendered words unnecessary in confirming their reluctant agreement with Dan's theory. I think we got their attention in the worst way by fixing that gate, Alessandro sighed. The timing is so clear. This craft appeared at the very moment Timo broke through to New Kerguelen. We would have known hours ago if this thing wasn't so big that it drowned the heartbeat probe in its shadow and blocked its transmissions for so long. Something tells me a few hours wouldn't have helped us much, William Godfrey interjected in an uncharacteristically defeatist tone. We thought the architects were the biggest and baddest enemies we'd ever encounter, but these engineers have used them as lapdogs, just like they used the messengers. Look at this thing. Bigger than the moon, you said. The moon! There were four others in the room, with the two adults being almost as out of the loop as their five-year-old son and his days-old baby brother. Clark and Tara McCarthy whose time spent stranded on New Kerguelen had motivated the rest of the group to do whatever it took to fix the gate that had enabled their outward trip, were quite simply utterly lost in this discussion. Engineers? Tara asked, still seated with baby Liam in her arms. Rogue? Clark added, walking to the group at the computer for a better view of what they were looking at and in search of some understanding of just what in the hell they were talking about. And what's this about the architects not calling the shots? What happened when we were gone? What the hell is going on? After a pleasant day warmed by an overdue reunion and the outpouring of relief that came with it, certain difficult conversations could no longer be avoided. 
Although Clark and Terra were now privy to the unwelcome news that a colossal spacecraft was heading straight for Earth, when it came to many other recent developments, this couple, who were so typically at the heart of humanity's alien-related scenarios, actually knew less than the average person on the ground. The rest of the group hadn't refused to tell them anything they desperately wanted to know, but during the relaxing few hours everyone needed they had fully avoided certain topics in accordance with Emma's suggestion to enjoy the day and ease back into things after all they'd been through. What Clark and Tara had been through was perhaps the most stressful situation either could have imagined, beginning with their wise but difficult decision to leave Earth for New Kergolen shortly before the final pulse and Thurso had been forecast to hit. Tara's unique history of being neurologically uplifted by New Kergolen's friendly messengers left her susceptible to experiencing those pulses far more painfully than almost anyone besides Dan and Piper. The fact that she had been eight months pregnant naturally brought additional concerns as to what might have happened when the final pulse hit if she had been on Earth's side of the remarkable portal-like gate that linked the planets. So she traveled across the gate with Clark and their five-year-old son Aiden just in time. A cruel twist of fate saw the final pulse render the gate impassable, however, and even blocked all communication. Worst still, Concerning medical scans by New Kergolen's resident human doctors led to an induced labor, which saw little Liam McCarthy become the first human to be born anywhere except Earth. The relief that came with the baby's safe arrival was more than a little tempered by the fact that there appeared to be no way for him to ever reach the rest of his family, and indeed the rest of his species, on Earth, and the total lack of cross-gate communication even had Clark and Terra worried that Earth itself, rather than just the gate, had been destroyed by the final pulse. A brave voyage by Timo Fiori had effectively forced the gate back open. But even now, Clark and Terra had no idea what had gone into making that journey viable. They knew nothing about the arrival on Earth of a huge individual from the long-despised race of architects who had subjugated New Kergolen's overly trusting natives for thousands of years, and who had set Earth's destructive pulses in motion almost as long ago. Certainly, the emotionally exhausted couple had no idea that 24 gestating architects had been discovered in the vault beneath Thurso, or that their discovery had come along with a revelation that they and the arriving rogue had all been genetically engineered to follow orders from some distant puppet masters who were now emerging as humanity's greatest and ultimate threat. The final discovery the couple knew nothing about was one they wouldn't have believed if they weren't about to see it with their own eyes, and Clark's firm questions about what was going on led to the rest of the group instinctively turning to his sister-in-law, Emma. Can someone get Chip and tell him to bring them both here? She asked. For all we know, Rogue might recognize this craft. Either way, Cody will be able to tell us what his first reaction is to seeing it. I'll go. Alessandro said. Just give me a second to send this data to New Kergolen in case they're picking anything up anywhere. There's no reason to think they will be, but for all we know, there could be another one of these things approaching them on their side of the gate. It's a long shot, but we need to be vigilant. There are a lot of smart people there and a lot of expensive observation equipment too, so it makes sense to ask. Definitely, Emma said. None of the workers there are in direct contact with Earth anyway, so nothing can leak out and cause panic too soon. Mm-hmm, William Godfrey uttered in an uncharacteristically quiet sign of approval. Once Alessandro finished firing off his quick message to New Kergolen, he jumped to his feet and wasted no time in setting off to fetch Chip Petrovich and the powerful duo he was keeping one watchful and one protective eye on. As soon as the Italian was gone, Clark intensified his gaze on Emma. Are you really going to tell me you let them bring that thing here? He said. Rogue? As in the rogue architect Dan used to talk about from New York? Those things practically wiped out life on New Kergolen and tried to do the same thing here. How could you let Uncle Clark? Piper interjected, raising her eyebrows in a somewhat admonishing manner. She tilted her head slightly towards five-year-old Aiden, who was suddenly cuddling into Terra and looking concerned by his father's change in demeanor. Rogue is on our side. 
If you don't trust anyone else on that, trust me. Clark exhaled slowly in an effort to compose himself. It's the architects I don't trust, he hissed through gritted teeth. Rogue's not what you think, Dan chimed in. His older brother was rarely one to keep his feelings to himself, which wasn't always a bad thing, but staying calm here was important not only for Aiden's sake, but also to reduce the chances of any problems when Rogue and Cody reached the control deck. Believe me, Clark, the architects aren't what we thought. Clark could only close his eyes and try an even slower breath. Listen, Dan, I don't know what you guys found in the Scottish vault or what Rogue has told you, but none of you know what Billy found in the vault on New Kerguelen. Everyone looked at Clark with increasing interest. And if you've fallen for the architect's lies, it doesn't even matter who's inside that incoming craft, he went on. Because if you've let one of those monsters onto the station, it's already too late. E-97. Drive-in, Birchwood, Colorado. Very late in the Colorado night, a lone TV reporter remained stationed at the Birchwood drive-in. Having come from out of state with his cameraman, this reporter had less incentive than the local crews to escape the cold for a few hours, and instead waited more in hope than expectation that something might happen. Large crowds had gathered in recent days as alien hysteria reached a fever unseen for more than a decade, with interest in Birchwood boosted by the now absconded former President Nick Mason and his anti-McCarthy comments, which had sought to paint the hometown heroes as somehow being traitors to humanity. But with Mason now rumored to be in hiding on a Pacific island having left office via the unprecedented manner of resignation by Internet, and with ICA Chairman William Godfrey recently having stated that the vault in Thurso no longer posed a threat to Earth, speculation had grown that the McCarthys might be back in town before long. It seemed highly unlikely that the family would be able to return to the relatively low profile they had enjoyed for the long period prior to the first of the alien pulses a few weeks earlier, and it went without saying that the town would be teeming with media personnel and well-wishers alike as soon as that return was confirmed. Everyone knew Piper had risked her life in a successful bid to stop the final pulse, even if they didn't quite know all of the details relating to the power she used to do so, and as such, her own time on the fringes was unquestionably over. As it went, in fact, many of the reporters in recent days had promised their viewers they would deliver a sighting of Piper as soon as they could, rather than one of the typically more sought-after Dan or Emma. The lone overnight reporter was currently recording a short segment about William Godfrey's recent video announcement from Thurso, with a unique focus on what the ICA chairman didn't say, about the vault when he promised, as the reporter quoted, that precise details of what was found will be revealed in due course. Just as the reporter began to speculate on what those details might be and when due course might come around, and ahead of his planned discussion of why Godfrey hadn't even mentioned the architect mothership that cast the town of Thurso and beyond into shadow, his cameraman panned quickly to the left, when he caught sight of something on the ground. This unauthorized change of focus initially irked the reporter, but then just as quickly gained his approval when he turned to see the unusual sight that had motivated it. A vixen and her two cubs passing across the famous backdrop of New Care Grillin Bar and Grill. It isn't every night you see that in Birchwood, the man said to the camera with a grateful smile but something tells me things aren't going to be this sedate for long. And while the reporter had no idea of what would puncture the bubble of calm, he was prescient in his belief that fate might just have it that the current piece, across the whole world, but nowhere more so than Birchwood, would be short-lived indeed. E-96 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Turcatori What was in the vault on New Kerguelen? Carrick Thomas asked, interjecting himself into a conversation that had, until now, played out entirely within the McCarthy family. 
The young Welshman, a self-described conspiracy theorist, had been pulled into their inner circle along with his new girlfriend, Serena Cruz, due to their independent but near-simultaneous brave decisions to publicize some highly illuminating video footage of the first Pulse and Thurso. Both had since vindicated their position in the group with two important discoveries, the first of which saw them track down a misclassified and out-of-place artifact which opened the Thurso vault's door and enabled Piper to courageously contain the final pulse at its source and in doing so quite possibly save humanity from immediate extinction. Their second discovery, as yet unknown to Clark and Terra, involved their role in tracking down the location from which Piper had detected a connection to another uplifted individual. While this hadn't had an instant effect quite so far-reaching as their unlocking of the vault just in time, there was no telling just how important the uplifted individual in question and his surprising bond with Rogue could come to be. Are you sure you want to know? Clark replied with a rhetorical question of his own. He had a lot of time for Carrick and Serena, even without yet knowing anything about their second success, largely because it had been him who recruited them both to assist in dealing with the pulses after they raised their heads above the parapet. Not quite spotting the rhetorical part, Carrick nodded. Of course I do. What was it? Human skeletons, Clark deadpanned. There were a bunch of cages, and there were messenger skeletons and human skeletons inside them. There was a transcript left by the architects who were there so that future architects could know what happened, just like they did with the other transcripts we found. Every face in the room reflected the horror of what Clark had just said, so much so that no one hurried him along during the five-second gap he left between introducing the presence of an illuminating transcript and thinking of the clearest way to phrase what it had revealed. It said there had been tests to confirm the pulses were strong enough to kill both species they were monitoring, Clark went on. That was us and the messengers, obviously, and it said that any architects on the surface would have to make sure they were sheltered before the pulses finally hit. So it seems like they didn't mess around because it sounds like the pulses would be strong enough to kill them, too. I don't know how long before the pulses, those tests happened, or those warnings were put there, but those scumbags took humans to New Kergolen to make sure the pulses would kill us, so they'd know the same thing they were using to cleanse New Kergolen would work when they finally did it here. Silence circled for several seconds. That doesn't tell us much about the architects that we didn't already know, Carrick countered. Clark greeted the comment with a confused expression. Carrick upturned his palms. Listen, that rewrites a lot of what we know about ancient visitation, because we didn't know they ever abducted anyone from Earth, much less that any human has been on New Care Galen before Dan, Terra, and Billy went to talk the squadron down from their war prep. Granted, we didn't know that. But Clark, we've known for a long time that the architects as a collective were absolute scumbags. They enslaved the messengers and used them as lapdogs, just like Chairman Godfrey was saying a minute ago. We knew that. Clark briefly glanced at the relatively stoic Godfrey, who gave a slight nod that indicated he was with Carrick on more than this individual point. And the pulses told us that all over again, the young Welshman continued. The ancient architects planted that vault and set off its pulse mechanism to cleanse Earth. You don't know why yet, because you still don't know what we found in the vault. There are still parts I don't understand, like why there was a key at Scara Bray, but why there was no shelter. But we can ask Rogue. That's the whole thing. We've known for a while that the ancient architects tried to wipe out life on Earth, just like we know what they did to the messengers. But that cross isn't Rogue's to bear. He's right, Serena chimed in. The transatlantic slave trade wasn't your fault, Clark. The worst parts of the British Empire weren't Carrick or Godfrey's fault, and that's just talking about our countries. If you're talking a species going down for collective guilt, even for the past century, let alone stuff that happened tens of thousands of years ago, all of our heads would be on the block. You'll see. Just have an open mind, okay? You really think Emma and Dan would have him here with Piper if they weren't sure? When Serena's thoughtful and impactful point was made, Clark turned at last to Terra. 
Still sitting with little Liam and the thankfully calmed Aiden, who had wisely been given a phone and headphones to distract himself with an educational game while the most harrowing aspects of the situation were discussed, Tara looked understandably weary but relatively receptive to the young couple's defense of the architect they knew as Rogue. If he hadn't helped with the gate, we wouldn't even be here, she shrugged. So if he knows anything about this ship that's coming, we have to hear him out. Sounding more like his late father Henry than he intended, Clark then focused on Aiden and signaled a request for him to remove his headphones. Don't be scared, son, he said, knowing that wasn't going to be easy when a huge and decidedly unfriendly-looking alien entered the room as it would at any moment. Be brave. Aiden gulped and blinked several times while forcing a nod. Good boy, Clark said. As the sound of footsteps approached, human, as far as he could tell, Clark took a deep gulp of his own. Don't be scared, he told himself, hearing Henry's voice all over again. Be brave. E-95, Planetary Research Committee, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. Although he was still shaken up by his harrowing and history-reframing discovery of human bones within New Kerguelen's underground vault, Billy Kendrick had gotten through the worst of it. The restoration of the Gate to Earth and the safe reunion of the McCarthys on Timo's space station was certainly soothing news, even if Timo's own presence in New Kerguelen's infirmary was a cause of new concern. As Billy sat in his chair at the Planetary Research Committee, he flicked between various aerial images of the planet's many unexplored islands. One thing that would never be shaken was his spirit of discovery, and he held on to the hope that the other islands might yet provide happier, awe-inspiring finds than the vault he explored on the godforsaken Isle of Answers. A quick triple knock on the wall behind Billy took his attention from the screen in an instant, reliably signaling, as it did, the presence of his old friend, Leisha the messenger's unquestioned but benevolent leader. How are you feeling now? Leisha asked, communicating via thought alone, thanks to his innate uplift ability and the telepathy patch attached painlessly to Billy's neck. He was glad to see the aging archaeologist up and about, and particularly to see him back here in the one place he felt most at home. Knowing Leisha's alien expressions well enough to sense that something wasn't right, however, Billy found his calmness fading by the second. What's wrong? he asked. Is it Timo? Leisha closed his eyes for a few seconds and walked the rest of the way to Billy. Talk to me, Billy pleaded. What's happened? Leisha shook away his hesitation and got down to the business of telling Billy the news he'd come to deliver after just receiving it from Alessandro on the station. The main headline of a colossal spacecraft having been discovered on its way to Earth was a difficult enough one for Billy to hear, but some of the earlier developments that underpinned it and had been kept from him until now were perhaps even more unsettling. You're telling me they willingly called an architect back to Earth and now it's on the station? Billy asked incredulously, almost gasping half of the air from the room. They faced a desperate situation, and they didn't know what you found in our vault, Leisha replied. And Billy, it's a good thing they did not, because the rogue architect from New York returned and helped Alessandro to restore the gate. Melly has connected with the architect, the same one who visited in New York, who they are calling Rogue, and she confirms he is well-intentioned. What has gone before here and on earth, was not his fault, not the pulses, not the lies, none of it. Billy stared dumbly at Leisha, quite literally disbelieving of what he was being told. We have learned that the architects themselves were engineered and manipulated from afar, Leisha went on, much as my kind was by theirs, but that is the context we have learned. The architects were another link in the chain, helplessly bound to the engineers who we believe are piloting the craft that is approaching Earth. That's what the group is worried about, the potential arrival of the ultimate enemy, 
who ordered all of the pulse-based destruction and all of the lies they built around it in the first place. Do you know if Timo is awake? Billy asked. Did you tell him any of this? He needs to know. He is lucid and doing well, the alien replied. But Billy, I do not think learning this will do him any good right now. I told you because you are better versed in our assumptions and lore regarding the history of interspecies engagement than anyone else on any planet. When Timo has had a few more days to recover, that will be the time to tell him. But I do not think there's going to be much he can assist. Billy pushed his chair back and rose to his feet. Leisha watched on uneasily. Don't underestimate him, Billy said. If this craft is moving as fast as you say, we need every mind on this we can get, especially if they're as sharp as Timo's. Talk to your people and get them to start drawing up possible options for dealing with all eventualities. All eventualities, Leisha, which means talking to the guys in your old squadron. We used to have very powerful weapons on Earth, nuclear ones, but the architect decommissioned them all when he came to New York. Whether he was looking out for us or whether he was still acting on orders from these other guys, it doesn't really matter. What counts is that I don't think Earth has much in the way of a defensive arsenal. But even after all this time, your guys still might. Leisha's eyes widened at this. Billy's initial shock regarding the presence of an architect on the station had quickly been superseded by the revelation that even those monstrous-looking giants were mere pawns in the game of the distant manipulators who were now getting less distant from Earth by the second. Raising the prospect of a physical confrontation with a craft as large as the one in Alessandro's images was the last thing he had expected from Billy, though. It had been, in any case, until even that was blown out of the water by the idea of recruiting former members of New Kerguelen's controversial squadron cast to consider any ways their long-decommissioned defensive arsenal could conceivably assist in any physical standoff. I'll talk to Timo, you talk to the squadron. Billy said, clarifying his idea. Okay? You know, if this was the other way around, our friends on Earth's side of the gate would be doing whatever they could think of to help New Kergolen. Remember Sanctuary? Like everyone else who had seen Billy, Dan, and Tara bravely cross a mysterious and long-since eliminated gate in New Kergolen's sky that led to the expectation-defying world of Sanctuary, all to ease concerns about the gate's implications before increasing panic burnt New Kerguelen's society to the ground, Leisha did know that they would always do whatever it took to help. It was certainly true that the humans had never held back when their help was needed, and Leisha was just as determined to assist in the other direction. He remained taken aback by Billy's request, but offered a labored shrug in imitation of the gesture he'd seen from many of those friends over the years. Billy, he said, if you want the squadron, they are yours. Just do not get your hopes too high on that front. Billy nodded before setting off towards the infirmary. Thanks. Defensive weaponry is a last resort, Leisha. But when the stakes are this high, sometimes it pays to be ready for the worst. E-94, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. Okay, Alessandro Bonucci called into the control deck, nearing the door and keen to give the group a heads up. They're here. It briefly crossed Clark's mind that he didn't know exactly who this they would entail. He knew what to expect in Rogue, at least in terms of the aliens' horror movie-ready appearance, and a reunion with Chip Petrovich was always welcome. The other individual that had been briefly alluded to was more of a mystery, however, with all discussion of Cody having been very brief in the midst of everything else that was going on with the hot topic of Rogue's presence and the devastatingly unsettling issue of the gargantuan spacecraft that the others believed was being piloted by the monstrous beings they were terming engineers. As difficult and stressful as his family's time on New Kerguelen had been, the revelation of these multi-layered developments on Earth's side of the gate made Clark realize it hadn't been all sunshine and rainbows here, either. The sound of footsteps reached a crescendo right before Alessandro appeared. He was first in, having led the group along the corridor. 
but a small boy dashed beyond him as soon as they were across the threshold. Is this it here? the boy asked, immediately settling in front of the computer screen which still displayed an image of a truly colossal spacecraft, captured by the heartbeat probe Alessandro had worked on with Timo Fiori before sending it on its voyage beyond the sun almost a decade earlier. Cody? Clark asked. The boy, wearing a strange kind of headset, immediately stopped what he was doing and turned to the imposing figure of Clark McCarthy. Hi, he said. Uh, hi, Clark replied, quickly looking to Emma and Dan for some kind of hint as to what was going on and how exactly a seemingly unaccompanied child had come to be on the station. Something about the boy was unsettlingly familiar to Clark, but he couldn't yet put his finger on what. Before any reply came, however, Clark's attention was utterly captured by the entrance of an alien who might as well have been his every childhood nightmare come to life. Even without knowing what the architect's race had done, and even without thinking back to the night in New York when this architect in particular had thrust Dan into the air for a painful bout of cable-based communication, Clark would have felt a deep unease upon glancing at the creature. Creature was one word in Clark's mind as he eyed the extremely tall being's elongated skull and crocodilian eyes, but there were plenty of others. The aforementioned monster was one, along with the likes of beast and even demon. As Henry McCarthy's orders to be brave echoed in Clark's thoughts, another deeply ingrained motto came to the fore. The only way is forward. With this one in mind, Clark didn't wait another second for the creature to move towards him and instead stepped to meet it where it stood. The others watched on silently, relatively at ease since they truly knew Rogue was on their side, as Clark struck the very uncharacteristic pose of a man looking up at someone else. The elder McCarthy's tall and well-built stature was certainly nothing close to a match for Rogue's, and the interspecies difference was great enough that he didn't look much bigger next to the creature than anyone else would have. Do you remember me? Clark asked, staring into its reptilian eyes with the strongest gaze he could muster. From New York, a voice replied. It wasn't rogues, however, but rather belonged to the small boy standing by the computer. He now held his small headset in his hand rather than on his head. You wanted to reach him when he was talking to Dan. He says you were brave, a protector. Slowly tearing his eyes away from Rogue, Clark looked uneasily at the boy. Yeah, and you can talk to him? The boy nodded, but before saying anything else to Clark, he looked across to the doorway where Chip Petrovich was standing. He doesn't know, Cody said. You didn't tell him? Chip asked everyone else. The impatience was etched on Clark's face for all to see. Tell me what, he grunted. Anyone, please? Okay, Dan stated, taking it upon himself to break the news that was sure to shock Clark and Tara as much as it had shocked the others, or perhaps even more so, since they didn't yet know anything at all about Piper's visions or the prison raid that brought Cody's nature to light. Clark waited with bated breath. Cody was born with uplift powers even stronger than Piper's, Dan said. He paused as he prepared to spit out the even more remarkable part of a double revelation that had already stunned Clark if his slack jaw was anything to go by. He doesn't share 50% of my DNA from the time when I was uplifted, like Piper does. He shares 100%. At this... Clark's eyes looked fit to pop out of their sockets. You mean... I'm a clone, Cody said. I was genetically engineered, just like Rogue, and just like all of the other architects in the vault. E-93, White House, Washington, D.C. We're hoping to hear from the newly inaugurated President Ana Vasquez very shortly an ACN reporter announced from the press cordon at the edge of the White House lawn. The question on everyone's lips is which way she will go on alien engagement, 
will she follow the lead of her disgraced predecessor, whose coattails many say she has ridden to the highest office in the land, or will she distance herself from the toxic Mason brand and build bridges with the Godfreys and McCarthys of the world? Countless other reporters were asking similar rhetorical questions to their audiences, and none would have much longer to wait for an answer. E-92 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore Upon hearing that Cody was a clone, and of Dan, no less, Clark's hands shot to his head. He swept back his hair as his cheeks puffed out several times in an effort to take some air into his shell-shocked body. He had only been gone for a few days, but each of the revelations coming his way could have been the biggest of any lifetime. That they were all coming so quickly, each superseding the last and momentarily pushing out of his mind the last huge shock, was almost physically disorienting. There are more of them in the vault, he asked everyone and no one in particular. They haven't been born yet, Cody replied. They're in pods, and they won't be born until Rogue or another architect lets them out. Rogue is alone, though, so it doesn't seem like there are any other architects left. And a transcript in the vault says that when they're born, they bond to whoever wakes them up. Then, he's supposed to show them certain programs of transcripts to mold them into whatever kind of role they're supposed to fill. That's even worse than the old caste system on New Kergalen, Tara mused with more than a little disgust. Like Clark, she was struggling to keep up with everything she was learning to the extent that she wasn't currently fixating on the frankly unthinkable news that the child before her was a bona fide clone of her brother-in-law Dan. Exactly, Dan said. And we always thought it was the architects who were behind all of that, putting the messengers into specific roles and stunting their development but the architects themselves were all literally programmed from birth to unquestioningly follow orders and perform specific tasks. There was a transcript warning that the unborn architects would lose attachment to their imprinted identity if they were left alone for too long. That's what happened to Rogue. He's been on his own for thousands of years, and all of the programming has worn off. Clark turned back to Cody. And you saw this transcript? You were able to read it? I just want to make sure we're not counting on what he's telling you. I read it, the boy confirmed. And Rogue was intimidated by Cody at first, Dan added. The same way Leisha was scared of Piper's power when she was a baby. Cody's brain developed around the powers, and he wasn't even constrained by having 50% standard DNA. Standard DNA? Emma chimed in, mocking offense in a brief moment of levity. Cody smiled slightly at the joke. So who did this? Clark asked. Was one of Mason's biotech companies involved in the cloning? Alessandro Bonucci, back at his computer, cleared his throat in his trademark staccato style. It was intentionally attention-grabbing and succeeded in its task. Cody was directly linked to Mason and his corporate interests, he said. But Clark, forgive me, there will be time for you to pick up the details, Right now, I want Cody and Rogue to see if there is anything here we could be missing, whether that's a transcript on the craft that Cody can read, or whether Rogue recognizes anything about it. Clark held a hand out towards the computer, encouraging the two forward. Rogue waited for Cody to lead the way and then ambled awkwardly behind him. The alien, in anything but his natural habitat, seemed acutely aware of his size as he ducked his head and kept his long arms as close to his sides as he could. More than that, though, Clark fixated on his apparent deference to the child. Rogue didn't look to be intimidated by Cody, as Dan suggested he had been at first, but deference really was the only word Clark could ascribe to the way the alien followed the boy and mimicked his body language once they arrived at the computer. Clark looked over his shoulder towards Terra and saw her rising to her feet for a belated view of the screen. He met her halfway to take baby Liam, with the two sharing a silent glance that confirmed she had noted the same signs that Rogue perhaps saw Cody as some kind of leader, or at least an intellectual superior. Whether or not there was some latent need within the alien for a leader to bond to, they could only guess. If that was the case, Rogue at least seemed to have bonded to a responsible ally. While Tara moved forward, Clark hung back to ask Chip for some more details on Cody. 
when those details came, especially that the innocent boy had been held in an outbuilding at a high-security for-profit prison in Wyoming for literally as long as he could remember, a new kind of rage swirled within Clark. The abstract knowledge that a corporation had used an illicitly gathered sample of Dan's DNA while he had been temporarily uplifted and all to engineer the first known cloned human was unsettling and infuriating enough, but seeing the child in question and imagining everything he must have gone through brought feelings far stronger than those into Clark's heart. Chip also stated without any kind of ego that Cody looked to him almost adoringly as a savior and protector as a result of Chip being the one who had liberated the boy from the prison outbuilding in which he'd spent his whole conscious life until that moment. He pretty much looks at me like Rogue looks at him, Chip said, again without ego, but this time with a little hint of warm pride. He's a good kid. This little tidbit of news calmed Clark's mind even further regarding Rogue's apparent bond to Cody, because if Cody would in turn look to Chip for approval, there was nothing to worry about in any regard. Chip Petrovich was the most loyal man anyone could ask for, as the sadly distant but fortunately still alive Timo Fiori would have readily attested if he was in a chair on his station rather than a hospital bed on New Care Galen, and his presence at the top of any bizarre, if as yet hypothetical, chain of commands was something to be grateful for. Listening in to the others, Clark shared in their disappointment that Rogue didn't recognize anything about the huge craft and Cody didn't pick up any transcripts or indeed any other details the others had missed. The remarkably gifted child was, however, even more confident than Alessandro, if confident was the right word for such a bad feeling, that the incoming craft would indeed contain the distant engineers who had manipulated Rogue's ancestors and perhaps his long-gone contemporaries into carrying out heinously destructive acts on both Earth and New Kerguelen alike. Do you have any kind of plan of action to deal with this? The boy asked. He aimed the question directly at Alessandro, who he had quickly and rightly come to see as the station's leading scientific mind. As this question echoed in the otherwise silent air, the shell-shocked and unusually silent William Godfrey found his eyes momentarily drawn to Emma. Hers moved to meet his at the very same moment, a thought simultaneously triggered in the mind of each when the boy asked if there was a plan to deal with this. For while Cody and Alessandro's minds jumped to practicalities of what could be done to deal with the object itself, even if for the moment that amounted only to gathering more data, Emma and Godfrey's minds went somewhere else. Both quickly jumped to a different concern, one they saw as just as important during the vessel's forecast six-week approach, specifically over how the craft's approach would go down on Earth once the news got out. It went without saying that this was the worst and most dangerous kind of revelation, one that couldn't be hidden forever because it would reveal itself in the passage of time, and that left the powerful duo wondering what they could do in the meantime to ensure that the news of this craft wouldn't cause untold panic-driven damage on Earth before the craft and its crew even had the chance to do so directly. In this single regard, the situation wasn't all that unlike when Alessandro himself had detected the extinction-level comet Il Diavolo some fifteen years earlier, and Emma and Godfrey had done all they could to stop society from crumbling around them, while Alessandro and his fellow scientists analyzed the comet in a search for tangible solutions. Just like then, Godfrey and Emma were only too aware that the news of an incoming and likely hostile megaship like this could cause huge problems long before its journey was complete. Unlike then, however, both knew there was unlikely to be any way the messengers from New Kerguelen could step in to save Earth, like they had at Dan's desperate request in the days of Il Diavolo. Godfrey tipped his head towards the doorway and held up two fingers, clearly signaling his desire to talk about that side of things alone in a few minutes. Emma nodded, aware both that this had to be discussed, but that the others were probably best left to consider the more tangible side of things. Alessandro. How long do we have until it passes the sun and could be seen from Earth? Godfrey asked, forcing the words through an uncomfortably dry throat. 
During a brief lull in the rest of the group's speculative talking about somehow intercepting the craft, the ICA chairman asked this one question in the hope that the answer would come back as four or five weeks. Because the heartbeat probe had been launched so long ago and been out of the public eye for almost as long, Godfrey hadn't kept close tabs on how far it had traveled. If he had done, he would have known that the position from which it alerted them of the incoming craft wasn't all that far beyond the sun, which meant the majority of the craft's journey would occur between Earth and the sun, and thus that it would be observable from the ground before long. My triple-checked data suggests we have 43 days until it reaches Earth and seven days until it passes the sun, the Italian replied. Although he didn't sound perturbed by the question, his attention quickly returned to the computer and the inquiries about possible interventions that were coming primarily from Piper and Cody. Godfrey looked to the floor in disappointment. Seven days was worse than he would ever have guessed. As Emma watched his reaction, feeling exactly the same thing about how little time they had to prepare for the craft becoming visible, she ruefully noticed how old and tired the ICA stalwart looked. Although well past seventy and no spring chicken, Godfrey usually looked experienced rather than old and wise, rather than tired. Today, however, and understandably beaten by the relentless barrage of challenges that had been thrown his way in recent weeks, he didn't look like someone the people of Earth could count on turning to in most of their alien-related concerns for all that much longer. I'm going to ask the guys on the ground in Thurso to make sure they're paying close attention to the readings in every chamber of the vault, Alessandro said. And also, if there were any changes in anything at the moment when Timo passed through the gate, that's when this thing became visible. So, if it had any kind of effect on the gestating architects, or indeed the latent energy source of the pulses, that's when it would have happened. We can trust them. Emma said, putting her seal of approval on a course of action Alessandro hadn't even thought necessary of clearing with her and Godfrey. But no one else. The team on New Kergolin, like you already said, and the guys in Thurso. No one else needs to know about this today, and no one else can know about this today. There's more we can do to analyze it, and we need to make sure your time estimates hold strong for at least 24 hours before we even start thinking about announcing anything. Is everyone on board with that? I don't want this news getting around the station either, because people talk to their friends and family on the ground. This isn't a secret, and it's not something we have to hold on our shoulders for long, but we have to hold it for now. I think so too, Cody said, putting his seal of approval on something Emma certainly didn't think she had to clear with him. And you're right, there are definitely things we can do to analyze this, and maybe more than that. Rogue might even know more if we ask the right questions, because he definitely knows bits and pieces about whoever he used to take orders from. Anything we learn could be the one crucial thing. You guys work on that, maybe with Melly too, Emma suggested, referencing the kindly empath from New Kergolen who was able to sense insights about humans and aliens alike that the individuals in question sometimes didn't even know about themselves. Godfrey and I are going to think about how this plays out if we can't do anything to stop it before it passes the sun. People would be scared, so we have to try to mitigate that. Seven days is a long time, Cody said in a neutral and untroubled tone. Emma forced a nod, pretending to agree for the sake of everyone else's morale. It was certainly true that seven days was a long time in politics, but it wasn't a long time to prepare for the kind of trouble that could be on the way. Before too long, however, there wouldn't be much she and Godfrey wouldn't have given for seven days to deal with the engineer's impending arrival. Because compared to where this most unpredictable of all situations was taking them, the idea of having a week at their disposal without any immediate threat would soon feel like a dream of all dreams. E-91, Infirmary New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. Ah, there you are. Timo Fiore smiled as Billy entered his hospital room. Billy forced a smile in return. Sorry I've not been. I should have visited. How are you feeling? I'm fine, Timo replied with a somewhat theatrically impatient wave of his hand. 
Hopefully they won't keep me in here another day. But how are you? I know what you found. It's not as bad as you thought at the time. What we found in Earth's vault brings context to that. But I can't even imagine stumbling upon the human skeletons and the transcript explaining why they were there. About all of that, Billy began. As succinctly as he could, he then broke the news to Timo about the huge spacecraft Alessandro had recently detected on its way to Earth. Timo listened intently, his expression tensing on a few occasions. His hand scratched his chin in thought when Billy reached his own idea about recruiting the remnants of New Kerguelen's militaristic squadron for any potential physical conflict. I hate to say it, Timo sighed, but if the craft is as big as you think, and if the beings inside it are the ones who have used the architects like the architects used the messengers, I don't see much scope for a fight between their technologies and the squadrons. It sounds like an ant versus magnifying glass kind of deal. It was anything but common to hear Timo talking in defeatist tones like this, but on reflection, Billy could certainly see and understand where he was coming from. But, the Italian continued, the architect, rogue, has more than a little power at his disposal. It's still a level down from the engineer's but his mothership is enormous in its own right, and it's certainly a level up from anything the squadron will have access to. Billy tipped his head to the side slightly and thought, Hmm, so if he's as firmly on our side as everyone else seems to think... Exactly, Timo said. The fact that Billy was talking in these terms was a clear sign that his own mind was opening up to the idea that Rogue could be an ally despite the fact that his ancient ancestors had proven themselves such ruthless foes. And while Timo understood the time it had taken Billy to come around to this line of thought, he was delighted that he finally had. A moment later, a bespectacled doctor approached with a clipboard in his hands and began to study the readings on a screen next to Timo's bed. I'd like to leave with your permission, Timo said before the man uttered a word. I'm going to leave, but I'd like to leave with your permission. We haven't seen enough progress in your readings, the doctor replied, gesturing to the machine and the seemingly endless array of data on its screen. But none of this is caused by my passage across the gate, so none of this is going to improve, Timo said in a flat tone. This is the toxin at work, and I know you're not going to make me lie here and wait for it to finish the job. Are you? As the doctor walked away to seek discharge approval from the infirmary's higher-ups, who would in any event ultimately answer to this particular patient who funded the whole operation, Timo slowly turned his head towards one of his oldest friends. Toxin? Billy echoed the single word question reflecting just how out of the loop on certain things the gate blockage and then his post-traumatic stress had left him. I've been poisoned and there's no cure, Timo announced, avoiding any further unnecessary tension by blurting it out as plainly as he could. It was Nick Mason. The group has proof, but our searching high and low for an antidote has proven fruitless. I crossed the gate because I had nothing to lose. At this stage, maybe a few weeks at most. Billy Kendrick's eyes quivered in an attempt to keep tears at bay. He succeeded in that endeavor, but the twitching was at least as telling and left no doubt as to how upset he was. I'm glad you told me about this new threat as soon as you learned of it, my friend, the Italian said. I don't know how many days I have left, but I want to help in any... Every way I possibly can. I don't want to waste another minute sitting here feeling sorry for myself. I'll be out of here in the next hour, and then we can get to thinking about our best potential courses of action. Devastated by his old friend's hopeless prognosis, but steeled by his selfless spirit, Billy forced a nod of agreement. This planet is teeming with transcripts and contexts and who knows what else, Billy said. But what are you thinking of in terms of the ways you specifically can help? I'm dying, Billy, Timo mused, the words sounding oddly upbeat given their meaning. 
so if there's a risk to be taken, we know who's going to take it. Billy couldn't help but grin slightly at the defiant light in Timo's eyes. And you know as well as I do, my friend, the Italian smiled. There is always a risk to be taken. E-90 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tercatore At Emma's indirect suggestion, Piper took it upon herself to awaken Melly from a restful sleep. The girl did so and gently invited her close alien friend to join the rest of the group in the control deck, where she said they had discovered something, and where Rogue was about to tell them as much as he could about some of the likely background. Melly jumped to her feet instantly, knowing, despite Piper's relaxed tones, that this wouldn't be happening if something very important wasn't going on. Indeed, Melly's ability to see through outwardly projected moods and feelings was why Emma had suggested having her around when Rogue shared everything he knew about the boss-like individuals he used to take orders from before the point thousands of years earlier when those orders stopped coming. No one, with the possible exception of Clark, doubted the truthfulness of Rogue's assertions chiefly because they had seen firsthand his assistance with the gate and his desolation over discovering the truth of his own genetic engineering and historic transcript-based manipulation. Additionally, however, they also understood that Cody could communicate telepathically with the alien and would surely have known if he was ever stretching the truth or implying certainty where none was justified. Even they were glad to see Melly, though, due to her ability as Emma had earlier reflected, to sense things about others that they couldn't even sense about themselves. If there were any suppressed feelings or memories within Rogue that could illuminate anything about the incoming megaship, Melly would find them. As an empath, this was her gift, and it was one she was always not only willing but keen to share with her friends whenever it might be able to help them. Everyone except Emma and Godfrey was present when Melly arrived. That duo had just made their way to the McCarthy dorm to discuss their own area of competence, namely considerations of the indirect effects the craft's approach would have on an already skittish population when the news reached Earth, and more specifically, what could be done to mitigate the worst of those potentially chaotic effects. At Piper's request, Melly soon took hold of Rogue's long-fingered hand and paid close attention to his general aura, while he looked at the incoming craft and fielded questions from anyone who had them. Cody's powers meant that he was, in effect, a human lie detector, which was one way he had been repeatedly used by those responsible for his terrible incarceration, but reasons of both personal familiarity and experience meant that Clark would put more weight in Melly's take on Rogue than he did in the boys. After several minutes had passed, and Rogue had answered via Cody multiple questions Clark used to probe the limits of what the alien knew about his engineers or whoever else he used to take orders from, Clark was as satisfied as everyone else that Rogue had already told the full truth of all he knew. While this was a relief in the most part, it simultaneously brought great frustration when Melly reported a lack of any suppressed memories or feelings within Rogue that might have illuminated anything he didn't know he knew for lack of a better explanation. Rogue openly and apologetically confirmed to Clark that the ancient humans whose bones Billy Kendrick found in New Kerguelen's vault had been taken from Earth by aliens of his kind, but that he had no recollection of ever setting foot on New Kerguelen until the first of its vault's cleansing pulses hit, long after the underground tests were conducted. By that point, he had already been alone, Rogue explained, with the others in the band he had once traveled with, all lost to ill-fated time-gate experiments, and the other bands he knew of, all having disappeared just as completely. Orders had always come through the leader of his band, he explained, and his belief that they came from the other side of a distant gate was based upon what that leader had told him. Several members of the group understandably speculated in their own minds that Rogue's leader had perhaps awakened him from a pod, like Rogue might soon awaken those in the ground beneath Thurso, and that being cut off from the leader he was bonded to had led to a loss of Rogue's artificially but rigidly imprinted identity, just as the transcript in the vault suggested it could. When all was said, 
Clark, Rogue's only real skeptic on the station, was starting to feel sorry for the poor bastard over what had been done to him. Emma put it best when she said to me yesterday that it's almost like the opposite of a rogue elephant, Dan said. Male elephants can turn into aggressive beasts if they're isolated for too long, away from the supportive structure of their herd. They forget how to be socialized. But for Rogue, the longer he spent away from the rigid structure, the further he slipped from the ancient influence of whoever raised and imprinted him to obediently play his role. He's become helpful towards us, even considerate. All he's done for the last few thousand years is watch us and the messengers, and since New York 13 years ago, his view on us has clearly changed again. He softened to us. And I don't want to overstretch any assumptions, but maybe it's kind of like what Emma has said about Godfrey a few times. By taking him further from the everyday life of the old world he used to walk in, maybe we softened him. Clark bit his lip and thought quite reasonably, looking like he thought Dan had overstretched some of these assumptions. The main thing is, do you believe him now? Dan asked. Do you trust that he's free from those old rigid influences that made the other architects do what they did? And do you trust that he's here with us because he wants to help us? There was no argumentative tone behind Dan's words in the slightest, and Clark responded with a straightforward nod. If Melly says it's true, it's true, he stated. Melly smiled warmly as soon as the vocal translator next to Alessandro's computer relayed these words in the language of her kind. If, uh, if that part is done, Carrick Thomas interjected, stumbling somewhat over the words, while Rogue is answering questions, can I ask him something about the pulses on Earth? Yeah, Cody said. Thanks the young Welshman replied. Okay, so could you ask him if he knows anything about the significance of the sites where the electrical surges hit during the last few pulses, mainly whether those locations were targeted because there are ancient sites there, or if the sites are there because the vault caused some kind of minor energy releases in the past that made those sites seem significant to our ancient ancestors? Cody shrugged. Sure he said before gladly turning to Rogue and passing it on. The boy's ability to do this, thanks to the innate and unrestrained uplift powers he inherited at birth, made his presence on the station absolutely priceless for the group. Not everyone shared Carrick's level of interest in this question, but it only took a few seconds to ask, and given how geographically distanced the electrical surges had been, it was something that at least mildly intrigued all of them. The second one, Cody said. The vault was there first, before any of those sites, and the way the energy sphere works, that's the source of the pulses, meant there would be very low-level releases every so often, and that they would be picked up in some places more than others. If you picture a grid, the main intersections are where the energy would be felt most. It wasn't much, and he thinks only some people could pick it up at all, which could explain why the sites aren't evenly spread. If there was no one in the area who naturally had a slightly heightened sensitivity to certain sound frequencies, there would be no one to mark a specific spot out as any more sacred or meaningful than any other. Despite the tension and uncertainty of the broader situation, Carrick was undeniably excited to be hearing this. In any other situation, he would have been completely enthralled by the news, which confirmed in an instant something that countless people like him had mulled and debated for their whole lives that there really were meaningful energy-based connections between the geographical location of key ancient sites. It sounded a lot like the famous ley lines theory, if not quite an exact match, and one of Carrick's first thoughts was that Billy Kendrick would be excited to hear something like this. Carrick was grateful for the answer and pretty stunned by what it confirmed, that the ancients who built the likes of Stonehenge and Machu Picchu chose the precise locations they did because some individuals had heightened sensitivity to latent alien energy fields around those very areas. There was more than a little irony in the fact that an alien object, which had been planted to ultimately cleanse the world of humans, had in fact led to the choice of locations where ancient humans went on to build many of their most meaningful and impressive monuments. This whole topic greatly intrigued Serena, too, 
who had pondered extensively with Carrick the uncertain direction of causality that made the pulse's electrical effects hit ancient sites. Even if there was no immediately tangible benefit to receiving a clear answer on this from the horse's mouth, it was nevertheless satisfying to learn that their suspicions had been correct and that minor energetic releases from the pulse had indeed made the locations in question appealing to ancient humans, rather than the ancient aliens having targeted sites where humans had already settled or built things. I've got a question about something else, Cody said. He turned to Alessandro. Is it okay if I ask you some more questions? You don't mind? Of course I don't mind, my friend, Alessandro replied. It was an odd question from Cody, and the group's scant knowledge of his dark history left room for uncomfortable imaginings as to why he was reluctant to directly seek information without first asking permission to do so. Although permission was granted, Cody looked up to Chip and sought permission from him, too. Is it okay if I ask about something else? Ask whatever you want, kid. Chip gently encouraged him. For his part, though, he now couldn't help but wonder if he could have done more over the course of the past day or so to make the boy feel more at ease within a group who already truly valued and needed his presence as much as anyone else's. Either that, Chip considered, or the scumbags who kept him at the prison really had implored him against sticking his nose where they thought it didn't belong. At last, Cody uttered a two-part question for Alessandro that was far less difficult or loaded than anyone had expected, simply inquiring as to how quickly data-gathering probes could be launched to illuminate more about the incoming craft, and then whether any other existing probes might soon deliver data in the way Heartbeat already had. Alessandro's expression wasn't one of much enthusiasm over these prospects. The only other thing it's going to pass is an old Chinese probe orbiting Mercury, the Italian stated with as little downbeat inflection as he could manage. Officially, that probe is dead, but, well, it's not. When the time comes that it's passing by, if the time comes that it passes by, we can certainly ask Ding to pass on any data it might gather. With how quickly this thing is moving, there's no guarantee we'll get much from such a basic and small probe, and I certainly wouldn't expect a lot, but we naturally can't get anything else out there in such a short time frame, so any extra data or images will be better than nothing. We can launch a lot of things for when it gets closer, but the difference between its pace of travel and any speed our launches could achieve means that we could probably only meet it a few days away from Earth. What about Rogue, though? Clark interjected. Can't he just flash stuff anywhere he wants? Cody, can you ask him if it works like that within our solar system but across interplanetary distances? Cody turned to his alien friend and waited for the answer he then quickly relayed. His craft, pretty much? It would just take a few flashes. Nothing smaller can travel that far, but things can go inside his craft, carried wherever you want them to be and then released from there. Does he understand how those teleportation flashes actually work? Alessandro interjected, beyond curious, but asking with little expectation of a positive answer. Cody shook his head. He didn't invent it. He's just always had the ability. Like the messengers, Dan chimed in. We always thought they got it from the architects, and I guess they did in a direct sense, but really it all came from these engineers. They're top of the chain. The final bosses, Clark mused. But while we're talking about what we could possibly do if this spacecraft does keep coming and gives us no reason to think it's not hostile. Yes, Alessandro asked, sensing that Clark was addressing this to him. Well, I'm not making any judgments on this next point or anything like that, the elder McCarthy qualified. But this is a lot different from when you worked out when the final pulse was going to hit. This time we've got six weeks and access to a craft the size of a city, so what I'm wondering is, if we wanted this, and I mean everyone collectively, if we wanted to launch a mass evacuation to New Kergolen, is there any good reason we couldn't? E-89, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland We've got two new messages from the station, 
Gio Nunez called out to his colleagues and friends, the local drilling operators he still knew only as Davy and Stevie. Both were outside, Davy peering down their lift shaft and Stevie dangling his legs over the edge from a seated position. There were heavy sheets of metal at the bottom to prevent anything getting in or out without the need to close a door they might not be able to reopen, but the two liked to make a quick direct observation every few hours to make sure the cameras and sensors hadn't missed anything falling in. That was what they told each other, at least, but in truth, both men were more concerned about something coming out. Both were likewise glad to be making their checks together, even though pride prevented them from admitting it, and instead saw them insist that neither could trust the other's thoroughness enough to work on a rotational basis. Geo's call grabbed their attention and sent them rushing back to the cabin to hear two relatively rare messages from the station, which in this case Geo was reading aloud rather than playing since they came in text form. When the Scotsman arrived at the doorway, they saw Geo looking at the message like a cat might look at a mirror not only trying to make sense of what he was seeing, but seemingly trying to determine whether it was even real. What's it saying? Stevie asked. Two separate message boxes were visible on the screen, side by side, and Geo was silently rereading both. Is everything all right, Chief? Davy added. In truth, however, Geo's body language and expression made it clear that this was one of those times when asking what was wrong would have been a more appropriate question than asking if something was wrong. Alessandro wants us to look very closely at data changes from the moment when Timo made it through the gate, Gio said. I already did and there was nothing, so that's nothing to worry about, but the reason he wants us to look definitely is. Guys, they've spotted a mysterious craft on the way to Earth, coming from the other side of the sun. I? Stevie uttered. Geo turned briefly to face the two men, fear wrinkling his typically youthful face, then turned back to the screen to check one more time that his eyes weren't deceiving him before he shared the rest of the news. Aye, he replied, so shaken that he began to unthinkingly adopt his host's dialect. It's six weeks away, and it's bigger than the moon. He says it appeared precisely when Timo forced the gate back open, but that they didn't find out for hours, not until the heartbeat probe that picked it up moved out of its shadow and started transmitting again. Rogue doesn't recognize the craft, but the working theory is that messing with the gate has triggered a direct intervention, just like putting nukes in space brought the messengers here back in the days of DS-1, and just like the nuclear escalation when Cole and Slater were in charge brought Rogue to New York a few years later. So they think it's the bastards who engineered these things underground? Stevie asked, hoping he was picking up the wrong end of the stick, but sensing that he wasn't. The same bastards who programmed the architects to set up the pulses and do all the other shit they did on Nuker Galen? Geo gulped and nodded. Our launching of DS-1 brought the messengers to Earth. Our nuclear escalation brought the architects, or at least Rogue and it seems like our mastering of the gate technology has brought the engineers. A sick bastard is at the top of the chain of command who manipulated the other two, Davy groaned. The very same, Geo sighed. The only one of the trio not visibly shaken by this news was Stevie, which didn't go unnoticed. Are you not hearing what the man's telling us? Davy asked him. Stevie rubbed his chin and looked back outside towards the lift shaft. I'm just thinking, he began, pausing to consider whether or not he was being completely crazy to even say it out loud. As simple as it gets, we're worried these are gonna be bad guys, right? Right, Geo said, encouraging him on. And Rogue's a good guy, Stevie continued. A good guy with a lot of power to do things well beyond anything we can do, right? Stevie, mate, what are you getting at here? Davy impatiently butted in. I'm just thinking, Stevie reiterated again, keen to preface his thought with that disclaimer. But if this plays out like we're worrying it might, maybe there are 24 more rogues sleeping under our feet right now. And maybe we might want to start thinking about waking up all the good guys we can get our hands on.
E-88, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. Musing Clark's speculative suggestion of using Rogue's enormous mothership as a way to evacuate huge numbers of people to New Kerguelen, if such a thing became as necessary as the group feared it might, Alessandro tipped his head back in thought. We were lucky to have that facility last time, so the pulse couldn't hurt Terra, Clark went on. But now I'm thinking if the worst comes to the worst and we find out these guys are hostile, a lot more people could share that luck this time around. These guys are the ultimate origin of all the technologies behind the gates and everything else, Piper replied. Uncle Clark, if they wanted to hurt us, I don't think we can hide on the other side of a gate they created. If we did that, we might even be making New Kergolan a target too, if it isn't already. Hmm, I guess, Clark said, accepting the logical answer to his open-minded question rather than reluctantly conceding a point he'd been set on. I think Piper's points are sound, Alessandro stated. If Rogue's mothership can cross the gate, then I certainly think we could conduct a mass evacuation, but I think a longer period of thought will only bring up more reasons why we shouldn't. Cody focused on Rogue, evidently picking up a telepathic point. But he says all of his crafts can cross the gate, so yeah, that's going to be all about the question of whether you ever think we should. He would do it if we wanted him to. And if Godfrey thinks we should, Dan chimed in. Also, only if Leisha and the others on New Kergolen were for it. If anyone is asking me as Chief Planetary Liaison, I don't like the idea of abandoning Earth and I think we're getting way ahead of ourselves in thinking about that. I know it's the kind of thing that takes planning, but it's like Emma was saying about holding off on announcing anything at all right now. We need to wait at least a day or two to see how this craft behaves and analyze as many variables as we can. I won't take my eyes off the incoming data, Alessandro confirmed. It's not much, for now we only have heartbeat within sight or range of this thing, but it tells us the main things. Speed, path, size, any major radiation it might emit. There are not many variables we can track right now, but we can track those few fairly well. As of right now, I don't have much else to tell anyone, but I'll be here keeping tabs and ready to listen to anything that comes to any of your minds. While this wasn't quite an overt dismissal, no one missed the focused change in Alessandro's tone. The control deck where the group had been settled until his startling discovery wasn't a lounge area in any regard, and had in fact been chosen as the spot for Clark and Terra's slow and easy station reunion day precisely because it was a good distance from the dorms and communal areas. This had in turn been down to Emma's understandable desire to temporarily keep the emotionally charged news about Cody and Rogue from the exhausted new parents and because keeping away the news about those individuals meant keeping away those individuals themselves. It was a credit to Cody, and perhaps especially to the fish-out-of-water rogue, that they hadn't taken this the wrong way, and a credit to Chip Petrovich that he'd kept Cody entertained despite his near total lack of prior experience in any kind of child care scenario. There's one last thing I want to know about. Tara said, breaking a long spell of silence. Now that Godfrey was elsewhere with Emma, Tara had been the most notably and atypically quiet in the group. The past few days, and indeed much of the past eight months, had left her exhausted in a way none of the others could relate to, but they knew her well enough to know better than to annoy her by repeatedly asking if she was okay. You guys have probably already talked about it, she went on. But what's the plan with the other architects in the vault? Doesn't anyone think that maybe if these engineers know what's happening here, and especially that Rogue helped us with the gate, maybe they're coming here to make sure that he, or we, don't end up in charge of a bunch of the super soldier-style aliens they built to do their own dirty work? Because you said they bond to whoever wakes them up, right? I certainly hadn't considered that until now, Alessandro mused. But there might be something in it. We know the moment of the gate passage was crucial, because the timestamp on Heartbeat's first sighting tells us that. 
But at the risk of stacking our assumptions ten high, I think there's at least a possibility that you could be onto something, Terra. Perhaps Rogue's teamwork with us to fix the gate is what really got the engineer's attention and showed them he's closer to us than they would like. And perhaps the presence of these unbonded architects is why they're so concerned. So you think it's almost like if you have an animal's unhatched eggs and it wants them back? Dan asked. Not exactly, Terra said, saying the same words at the same time as Alessandro. But maybe you're right with that side of it. Maybe if they were gone, the engineers wouldn't come. If Rogue is going to raise these things and take them away at some point, which I guess he must be, maybe it makes sense to do that really soon and see if it halts the craft. All eyes turned to Cody and Rogue. He's ready whenever we are, the boy said barely a few seconds after silently asking the question. As these powerful words sank in, Piper was the first to raise the obvious question to the group at large. So, when are we ready? An even longer-lasting silence lingered, eventually broken this time by Dan. I think the idea of waiting at least a day to see what we're looking at and consider the next step makes sense, he said. But I think your Aunt Tara is right and we should think about emptying that vault with more urgency than we've been planning until now. Even if there's only a small chance the engineers are coming for those unbonded architects, it's still a chance. I think Godfrey will agree with that too. In one sense, the notion of raising 24 architects from an ancient slumber and hoping they would bond correctly to Rogue was a frightening prospect for many in the group. At the same time, however, they knew that leaving them there forever was no viable alternative, even though a transcript in the vault seemed to indicate they could stay in their suspended state for as long as necessary. If any visitor less friendly than Rogue ever came to Earth and raised those architects, a prospect Terra had just raised, regret wouldn't be a strong enough word to sum up the feelings of those who had a chance to act preventatively when the time was right. These considerations brought hope as well as contemplative concerns, however, given that there was now an albeit optimistic notion in the air that the crew of the rapidly approaching megaship could possibly change course from Earth as soon as the underground architects were gone. Rogue says he'll take them on his craft and leave if we want him to, Cody relayed. He says if that's what the engineers want, this isn't our fight. In something of a watershed moment, Clark found himself looking at the giant alien with a newfound respect as soon as Cody shared these words. He helped in our fight with the gate, Clark said. We won't leave him on his own. Rogue maintained eye contact with Clark for several seconds after Cody relayed these words in the opposite direction. Their exchange was of a very different nature to the initial stare-down when Clark had been far more suspicious of everything relating to the architect he had spent more than a decade of life vilifying from afar and considering as more or less the devil incarnate. We'll talk about this tomorrow, Alessandro reaffirmed. I'm going to try to brighten some of these initial images to look for details, but like I said, I'll be here if anyone needs anything. The tone this time was even clearer and everyone soon left Alessandro alone in his previously crowded control deck. Clark asked Chip to hang back with Cody when most of the others had left, at which point he asked the boy a question, unrelated to the incoming craft, that had been at the forefront of his mind for the better part of an hour. Prefacing the question with a comment that they didn't have to talk about it if Cody didn't want to, he then asked the boy very plainly if the people at the prison had hurt him. Not physically the boy said, speaking in a trembling tone after several seconds of thought. The way he said it, so much more weakly than anything else he'd said, almost made the answer worse than a straight yes. You don't need to make them pay. I just want to help, Cody continued, responding to a thought Clark hadn't even gotten around to sharing out loud. The boy then put his headset back in place, blocking out the incoming thoughts he was less internally adept at filtering out, than the telepathy patch wearers typically were. Cody's powers weren't just permanent rather than temporary, it seemed to Clark, but were also constant and perhaps even intrusive rather than on standby until consciously called upon. 
the same powers that constituted a gift to the group's ability to deal with certain situations were something of a curse to the boy himself, but Clark was glad that he at least had the headset to keep things in check. Do you know that Melly could help you get rid of your powers after this is all over? If we get past it? Clark asked. He hoped he wasn't speaking out of turn, but simply couldn't not give Cody this spark of hope. Cody smiled. I do, but thanks for telling me too. Once this is done, like you said, first I want to help however I can, after how Piper and Chip and everyone work together to help me. Because if these powers first came from whoever is in that spaceship, through the architects and the messengers and then Dan, all the way to me... Maybe these powers are going to be what it takes to stop them. I like the way you think, Clark said. His grin then gave way to a more pensive expression, though still a positive one. What is it? Cody asked. Clark hesitated, unsure whether to say what was in his mind. Ultimately reflecting that the gifted boy was wise and mature beyond his years, he decided to say it. I was just thinking, you're Kind of my brother, right? Kind of, the boy replied with a slight but warm smile. I'll look out for you anyway, Clark promised. But that is pretty cool. Cody grinned fully now. You know, Mason was always worried about you, he said. One of the guards told me that. He was always worried about doing anything that would bring you back into the public eye because you were well connected and you don't back down. If Mason said that, it's the first time he's ever been right, Clark chuckled. But for real, he'll be sorry. I know you said you don't care if he pays or not, but I do. The boy's eyes widened. Oh, I didn't say I don't care, he clarified. I said you don't need to make him pay, Clark. There's a time for all things, and his time will come. As Cody turned around to leave, one approving thought filled Clark's mind. He was a McCarthy, all right. E-87, McCarthy Dorm, Space Station, Il Tricatore. In another area of the station from the rest of the group, Emma and Godfrey were hard at work considering their best options for mitigating potentially deadly societal and political problems that could result from news of the alien craft's relentless approach towards Earth. Anything they wanted to do to get ahead of the narrative would have to be done very quickly, they both knew, with Alessandro's confident, data-driven observation telling them that the craft would pass the sun and become much more easily spotted in as little as seven days. Roughly a thousand times larger than Comet Il Diavolo, which had in its own right caused near-apocalyptic carnage on Earth long before it was due to hit, the craft would, from that moment, loom larger and larger in the night sky, and before long in the daytime sky, too. Such was its size and reflectivity. There was a foreboding feeling of inevitability about the whole thing but Emma and Godfrey were both seasoned operatives in damage limitation and shared the rare gift of being able to focus on the albeit small parts of a problem they could focus on, while others were helplessly fixated on the problem as a whole. Announcing the discovery before it effectively announced itself was crucial, they both agreed, and Emma took the point a step further by suggesting that daily ICA press briefings could be used to maintain an appearance of control over the situation. Even if it didn't succeed in suggesting the situation was under control, she said, it would at least serve to assure an undoubtedly edgy public that every angle was being covered and every stone was being upturned in the dual quest to get to the bottom of the craft's origin and to make sure it didn't bring the kind of destruction many would understandably think it might. Godfrey agreed with this point and also added that there was a good psychological benefit of getting people in the habit of watching a briefing at the same time every day. The routine alone can be of great benefit, the ICA chairman pointed out. Certain challenges of the past have shown that very clearly. But more broadly, there's definitely a lot to be said for maintaining a public face during a crisis. Setting a precedent allows you to stand before the world and address a certain difficult point without them thinking the point itself was a sufficient emergency to merit the briefing, if you follow my meaning. 
because with a daily or even tri-weekly schedule, you set the expectation of a fairly low bar. In that sense, it lets you nip things in the bud. At the same time, it also lets you highlight any potential good news to a wide audience. Hell, you played that card to the fullest at the old Birchwood Drive-In back in the day. A slow, nostalgic smile spread across Emma's face at that thought. She and Dan had stood on that makeshift stage for more than a few consecutive days, delivering to the world everything from video footage of suspicious activity to huge scans of the written documents he had discovered in Richard Walker's fateful folder. The mood had been very different back then than it would be now, with a groundswell of public opinion pushing for the disclosure of a huge cover-up, having little in common with the world on the edge of its seat as a threatening foe edged ever closer, but Emma couldn't help but feel that Godfrey was onto something with his drive-in comparison. A TV in the corner of the room had been talking about Nick Mason for several minutes, chiefly analyzing a two-sentence online resignation from his position as President of the United States. When this utterly unprecedented story first broke a few hours earlier, it relegated the previous night's arrival of an architect mothership above Scotland into second billing, and had kept it there since. There was still a lot of media speculation about what Godfrey had alluded to when he mentioned that the vault had been fully swept and its contents would be responsibly disclosed in due course. But the calmness of his message and the quick departure of Rogue's mothership, now in a distant orbit and invisible to the naked eye, combined to make all things alien-related feel less urgent to the general public than they had at any point since the first pulse kicked off a frenzy a few weeks earlier. Emma turned to face the screen only when she heard the voice of Anna Vasquez, Mason's vice presidential running mate who had all of a sudden fallen into perhaps the highest office of national government in the world. Vasquez was more experienced and more sedate than Mason, and had been largely respected on both sides of the aisle for three decades of diligent service until she let a lot of that respect slip by hitching her flag to the bad ship Nick Mason. When Emma saw the look on the political stalwart's face, there was clearly a lot of discomfort behind her stoic expression. No one wants to come in like that, Godfrey commented. I've known Vasquez for years, and I don't think she ever had a serious ambition of coming in at all. But no one wants to sneak in by default, and especially not with Mason's name following them around. The positive for us is that she'll probably act like Logan has been acting in London lately keeping the lowest profile she can until some of the worst of this blows over. She might even be open to a unified front with moderates from the other side. As Emma mulled this over, comments rolling along the bottom of the news station's feed told a less optimistic story of a nation divided like rarely before. I think when this thing becomes visible, Vasquez has to be part of a united bipartisan front, she mused. The time for the post-Mason political reckoning is later, when we know there's still going to be a country for someone else to lead, but we need something that removes questions of illegitimate rule and removes the stain of Mason. Godfrey nodded. We do. And we don't even need anything formal, Emma continued. It doesn't have to be anything like the government of national unity there was talk of Diane Logan putting together in the UK during the pulses, Vasquez could definitely distance herself from Mason with some new cabinet appointments, but what we really need is for her to be standing side by side with the opposition when news of this becomes public. It couldn't fail to help, Godfrey agreed, and for the kind of unified ICA response I expect, we'll need to spearhead things. There is a part of me that thinks we couldn't afford a U.S. delegation fronted by Mason's running mate particularly if the opposition tries to take her down with guilt by association, which is what I'd be doing in their shoes. It just wouldn't fly. Not after the way he went out. There are already all kinds of ongoing media investigations into what was going on at the prison in Wyoming, and we both know that each snippet they uncover is going to make him even more of a pariah. Emma sighed. With Vasquez alone at the top, I don't know if the country could afford the division this is all going to bring, even without thinking about the chaos that comes with adding an incoming alien megaship into the equation. In that kind of chaos, 
The country needs a steady ship just to keep people above water with the inevitable fallout we'll see. It'll be like the countdowns to Il Diavolo and the final pulse all over again, but this time with an alien ship getting closer and more visible by the day. But at least we have weeks rather than days, Godfrey sighed, desperately seeking consolation wherever he could find it. That gives us a few days to think about how to approach this in a way that minimizes secondary knock-on problems in addition to the direct harms. Godfrey's comment about direct harms caused by the incoming mothership didn't include any kind of qualifier like that might arise, and Emma didn't query precisely what kind of direct harms he was anticipating. That wasn't the duo's remit right now with their current focus instead on the need to get their ducks in a row in a timely manner in order to limit avoidable reactionary chaos when the craft became visible from Earth. Can we talk to Vasquez today? Emma asked. Godfrey lifted his phone from his pocket. Like cross-gate communication, he and many others had come to take the ability to have satellite calls between Earth and the station for granted. The seamless ease of this communication was, indeed, why Emma had urged the others to keep the news amongst themselves for now, since many of the station's resident scientists were in regular contact with their families and friends on the surface and might have either slipped up to reveal something about the discovery or perhaps even deliberately passed it on to their loved ones. What are you saying to her? Emma asked as Godfrey busily typed away. He then turned his phone so she could see the message before it was sent. In the short greeting, Godfrey congratulated Vasquez for her low-key inauguration and offered a clean slate in U.S.-ICA relations. He made it clear that he didn't hold her responsible for Mason's sins, but stressed that she would have to meet him halfway by firmly disowning the disgraced former president. And if Vasquez was willing to do that and talk constructively about a way to move forward, Godfrey promised to bring her in on high-level ICA decision-making and, more immediately, to offer a head start by looping her in on major developments that were set to become major issues in the days and weeks to come. Emma encouraged Godfrey to send the message and watched quietly as he did. Now we wait, he said, and something tells me we won't be waiting long. As Emma flicked the TV to a different news network when commercials began to air, William Godfrey had no idea how right he was. For, as well as a call from the new President of the United States, something else might just have been set to arrive sooner than expected. E-86, White House, Washington, D.C. In her first few minutes alone, after a whirlwind night and early morning that almost defied belief in how rapidly it had changed her life, and a lot more besides, incoming President Anna Vasquez ponderously looked at the chair that had been Nick Mason's until his habit of flying as close to the wind as humanly possible finally caught up with him. Party insiders had briefed Vasquez on the kind of dirt on Mason that seemed certain to drop before long with the most serious revelations being new to them as well as her. Whether or not the public would ever believe it, the despicable truths being brought to light by media investigations and eyewitness testimony at Wyoming's Sunforth Correctional Facility in particular were all based on schemes Mason had conducted in a personal capacity without the knowledge of his support staff or, indeed, his financial backers. Vasquez, generally considered a steady pair of hands who most in the party were glad to be the ones stepping in, considered that the first and perhaps greatest challenge of her unexpected presidency would be walking a line between distancing her new administration from the depths of Mason's depravity without being kowtowed into walking back unrelated policy positions he had championed to popular acclaim. High-level politics was a game of nuance Anna Vasquez had been playing for longer than the vast majority of elected representatives in Washington, but she knew only too well that her new level brought a need for ever finer balancing acts. Her phone had been blowing up all day with messages of support from the friends and allies who had access to that private number, but a quick glance at the latest notification took Vasquez by surprise 
when she saw that the incoming message was from ICA Chairman Godfrey. With alien-related issues set to roll on and likely return to prominence as soon as the political tumult surrounding a choppy presidential transition slowly fizzled out, Vasquez knew that a working relationship with Godfrey was one that could go a long way to easing her troubles on that front. Perhaps just as importantly, Vasquez considered that a public pivot from Mason's outspoken criticism of the McCarthys was in order, given the swell of support for them that had been growing since news had broken of young Piper's role in preventing the final Scottish pulse from wreaking total destruction across Earth as a whole. Godfrey was on the station, Vasquez knew, and so were the McCarthys. As two birds with one stone phone calls went, she could think of no better way to kick off her first day in the top job. Vasquez tapped her screen to call Godfrey and walked round to the chair she'd been pondering since being left alone for the first time all day. When Godfrey answered, she sat down and held the phone to her ear. Chairman Godfrey, she said, amiable if not quite friendly as she finally sat down. I can think of no better first order of business than closing the chasm between us. Where should we start? E-85, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore Although Alessandro Bonucci had few variables to work with, primarily because his heartbeat probe was designed to scan the galaxy for life signatures as well as provide a base for some controversial remote research, the data he did have about the gargantuan craft the probe had revealed a few hours earlier was very strong. The size, path, and speed of the alien object, as remarkable as both data points were, couldn't be disputed. It was bigger than the moon, it was on course for Earth, and it would arrive in six weeks. Confident in those crucial points, Alessandro made the most of his focused time alone at the control deck's powerful computer system to analyze all manner of less obvious data points from inside the heartbeat probe. He paid close attention to the recent readings from his team's experiments relating to everything from gravitation shielding to dimensional flux, but didn't see anything that immediately jumped out as unusual. Alessandro focused most closely of all at readings taken around the time of Timo's gate jump and the colossal craft's appearance. The fact that only the timestamps identified the columns in question as those he was looking for said everything, though, as there was no sign of even minor fluctuations. External readings were another story, naturally, with the change in lighting and thus solar energy very obvious in the data. Alessandro switched then to assess the as-live data, which was a snapshot of the current state of things when the probe last transmitted a signal towards the station. The vast distance between them meant that this took a while, much like any change to the sun itself would take around eight minutes to be seen on Earth. Because of this, by the time Alessandro got word of what was happening, it was too late for the heartbeat probe. When the impact warning status began flashing on his screen, relaying that something had been detected on an imminent course for the probe, Alessandro knew he was effectively looking into the very recent past at a tragedy he could do nothing to prevent. The nature of the probe meant that it couldn't nimbly change course and was reliant on impact avoidance cannons capable of breaking up only relatively small asteroids and similar threats. Alessandro Bonucci was under no illusions that anything as natural as an asteroid had triggered the alarm, however. The timing was impossibly convenient for that to be the case. But when he flicked to the latest visual images received from the cameras and telescopes pointing in the direction of the alien megaship as it sped towards Earth in the opposite direction, having a hunch at what he was going to see didn't make it any easier for Alessandro to actually see it. The recent images, clear as day, showed three torpedo-like missiles growing larger by the second. Alessandro's stomach nodded as the final image showed the first missile very close to the camera and the next image, the last one Heartbeat would ever send, showed the probe's outer shell ripped apart in the seconds before all of its systems went down forever. If there had been any doubt as to the hostility of the engineer's craft, Alessandro Bonucci had just watched those doubts being blown into a million worthless pieces. 
The Italian glanced to the final primary data readings in the corner of his screen and shook his head ruefully at the painful realization that these were the last numbers Heartbeat would ever provide. Until the hostile craft responsible for the probe's destruction was on the other side of the sun, as visible to anyone else with the right ground-based telescope as it would be to Alessandro on the station, he would see nothing else. This feeling was quickly replaced by an even worse one, however, when Alessandro's eyes resettled on one of those data points in particular. Sure, it couldn't be right, he skipped back to just before the destructive impact. But to his shock and increasing concern, the anomalous data point remained. He then skipped further and further back until he saw the number return to its previous level. The jump between that original number and the later reading was sudden, coming without any intermediary steps, and the sudden change had occurred a few moments after the craft sent its torpedo-like missiles towards the probe. First, they fired, and then it happened. Alessandro sat stunned as it all sank in. No, 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 he repetitively mouthed to himself, almost chanting it out. No. Confronted by final data that took things from bad to worse, all he could do was pray that he was wrong. All he could do was pray that the system was wrong. All he could do was pray that one way or another, nothing on the screen he was looking at could be real. But despite his deepest hopes, he knew deep down that the data was clear and incontrovertible. Frozen in desolation, Alessandro sat for several seconds before his phone started buzzing and chiming with endless notifications from other scientists on the station who had just seen their own partial streams of heartbeat-derived experiment data stop coming. No one else enjoyed the full system access Alessandro did, so none of them yet knew that the entire probe was gone. But that wouldn't remain the case for long. With this in mind, as well as the more urgent concern relating to the other piece of data he alone had seen so far, Alessandro picked up his laptop and jumped to his feet. He wasted no more time in setting off to bring the news to William Godfrey, the one man, in Timo's absence, who his instincts implored him to tell first. After more than a little conspicuously rushing past everyone else who saw him, Alessandro neared the McCarthy's dorm and heard Godfrey talking animatedly into his phone. When the ICA chairman saw this, however, he would be a whole lot more than animated. E-84, White House, Washington, D.C. I'll start with my warm congratulations on your inauguration, Chairman Godfrey stated down the phone. President Vasquez, who would have thought, after all this time? But, more importantly, I sense you might join me in saying good riddance to bad rubbish. Vasquez took a second to ponder her response. I will say I wouldn't have run with him if I'd known what kinds of things he was involved in, she said somewhat carefully. But I'm sure you know more about that than I do so far. I imagine so, Anna. Indeed, I'm talking to you right now because I know you weren't in on the worst of Mason's schemes, Godfrey said, making this very plain from the outset. Because if for one second I thought you were, there would be no olive branch in my hand. Some of his crimes haven't come out, and I don't envy your position in seeing out that particular storm when they do, because your opponents are going to smell blood and go for the jugular. That's where I think getting on top of the agenda with a preemptive offer of cooperation is going to be the smartest move you can make. Cooperation in what sense? Vasquez inquired. Maybe invite some opposition representatives into your ICA delegation, Godfrey said, making an effort to sound as though he was brainstorming as he spoke, rather than sharing a thought he'd had many minutes earlier. And even better... When the time comes for a public announcement regarding the challenge that's coming all of our way, be ready to have a high-level moderate from the other side standing next to you when you address the people. 
when Logan and I stood together in Downing Street to announce an evacuation of the Scottish Highlands, our mutual presence prevented the politicized sniping that would have come either of our ways if we had recommended such a thing on our own. Needless to say, when the threat was as big as the pulses and public order was at stake, there was no room for sniping. Are you suggesting we face a threat like that again? the new president asked with more than a hint of surprised concern in her voice. Something with a countdown to destruction again. Il Diavolo, the final pulse. There's not another threat like that, is there? Some would say so, Godfrey admitted. But I prefer to see it as a challenge to which we must rise. He did prefer to see it this way, always keener on an optimistic outlook than the more depressing alternatives, but this didn't mean Godfrey was in denial about the enormous threat posed by the incoming megaship. Given that it seemed certain to contain the beings who bore ultimate responsibility for the pulses and were perhaps capable of even worse, it really wasn't any kind of stretch to view the current threat as an even more unsettling one than those pulses. After all, no one was under any illusions that Piper would be able to defeat a colossal craft with a localized force field in the manner she had been able to constrain the final pulse at its source before it could grow in ferocity and raise all signs of human civilization to the ground. So what is it? Vasquez asked. Is it whatever you found in the vault, ticking down to something else? There are protocols for disclosure of things like this, Godfrey replied, more than a little evasively. The ICA is the best place for me to do it, and that's the crux of this. Here's the situation, Anna. The nature of the challenge we face demands an ICA response, but the scale of the challenge we face demands a truly unified ICA response. Everyone has to be pulling in the same direction, and from my perspective, speaking as someone who has been leader of a national government and multiple international organizations, my firm hunch is that for the U.S. position to have any legitimacy within an international team, you're first going to need to present a unified front at home. Vasquez blew air from her lips. I'm all for a thawing in relations between our offices, William. But you have to give me something here. You have to know that bringing in the opposition to stand beside me looks like something between an admission of shaky authority and a request for help, just like when Logan had you in Downing Street. If you're telling me the threat we face is big enough to require something like that, I have to know what it is. Well, Godfrey sighed, the elephant in the room is that your authority is shaky. You didn't win an election. The brash, Mason-esque populism you're going to have to distance yourself from is what won the election that's ultimately landed you in that seat. Humility will go a long way, and you're shrewd enough to walk the line of looking conciliatory rather than weak. Logan is, too, more or less. But especially when you're following a charlatan like Mason, you're going to look good by default. Vasquez shook her head slowly, instinctively, rather than performatively, given that Godfrey couldn't see her. I don't need to distance myself from the entire platform that got me here, she said. You know that as well as I do. There are some things I know as well as you do, the ICA chairman retorted. But to be frank, there are some other things I know much better. For instance... I'm sure you've picked up some snippets regarding the prison incident, even if the worst details are yet to emerge. But what would you say if I were to tell you that I have incontrovertible proof that Nick Mason paid an ICA delegate to fatally poison Timo Fiori in a hit which went ahead as planned and is slowly killing Timo as we speak? Would you still think Nick Mason is leaving a legacy from which you can pick and choose what elements to jettison and what elements to keep? Vasquez said nothing. Truly, to a revelation like this, nothing was the only thing she could say. 
That happened in Buenos Aires when Mason was attending a summit in his capacity as president, the ICA chairman went on. Other governments are not going to accept a hand-waving dismissal of private criminality in that instance, even if you manage to distance yourself from the rest. For an American delegation to be welcome again in Buenos Aires, and I'm talking about you being welcome in the eyes of the other delegations more so than by myself, it needs to look very different to the old delegation. And with how busy the ICA is going to be in dealing with this new challenge in the coming days and weeks, the sidelines really aren't somewhere you want to be if you can possibly avoid... A loud noise cut Godfrey off mid-word and made President Vasquez sit bolt upright in her chair. William? she asked uneasily. The next thing Vasquez heard was a heavily accented voice, Alessandro Bonucci's, she reckoned, and then the much more audible and instantly recognizable voice of Emma McCarthy. Tell her you'll call back, Emma implored Godfrey, revealing to Vasquez that she had been at his side all along. Uh, I'll call back shortly, Godfrey stammered into the phone. Something, I'll call back. As the call ended on this bizarre note, tremendously uncomfortable thoughts circled in the mind of Anna Vasquez as to what kind of news could be capable of reducing Godfrey's typically powerful speech into the weak whimper of his last few words. But once a few more minutes passed, and Vasquez found out what Godfrey had just learned, she would be wondering how he'd managed to speak at all. E-83, McCarthy Dorm, Space Station, Il Cercatore. Alessandro burst through the door to reach Emma and Godfrey with none of his usual politeness, far too concerned by a frightening development to waste a single second on anything as mundane as knocking. When the Italian began to talk, Emma held up a very forceful finger to silence him and then encouraged Godfrey to end his call as quickly as he could. Godfrey lowered his phone to his leg without disconnecting the call and furrowed his brow in the direction of the station's very concerned-looking lead physicist. What's wrong? He asked Alessandro, wisely skipping the question of whether something was wrong at all, given how loudly everything about the Italian's uncharacteristic manner screamed that there was a major problem for the group to contend with. Alessandro, breathless, spat it out. They destroyed the probe. Tell her you'll call back, Emma urged Godfrey, while he did, ending what had been a relatively smooth call with the new U.S. President, Anna Vasquez, she focused intently on Alessandro. There was going to be nothing smooth about dealing with this, Emma figured with a growing sense of foreboding, and he hadn't even got to the worst of it yet. You're sure it was them, Godfrey asked as soon as his call with Vasquez was over. I know the timing is too convenient to dismiss it as a coincidence, but is there no way this could be an incidental side effect of the craft passing by? Something it's emitting, perhaps, or a change in conditions it's caused that Heartbeat couldn't tolerate? They blew it up with three missiles, Alessandro glumly relayed. Godfrey and Emma exchanged a tremendously uneasy glance, before the ICA chairman extended his hands to take hold of the laptop Alessandro was offering. Alessandro leaned in to hit the space bar and begin a slideshow of the images in question. The appearance on the screen of three missiles sent a chill down each of their spines, just as it had Alessandro's, and the worst feeling of all came when they saw the heartbeat probe, one of humanity's greatest creations and achievements reduced to rubble like a condemned shanty. This time watch the numbers in the corner, Alessandro said. Before Heartbeat was destroyed, it brought us one important new data point. I have to warn you in advance, it's not good. Those final few words hardly seemed necessary, but the reality behind the changing data was so terrible that a warning was justified, even if negativity could be naturally assumed. Only one thing changed, Emma noted as the loop of images replayed. Oh, God, it's the speed. 
William Godfrey gulped. Exactly, Alessandro sighed. The craft fired three missiles that destroyed the probe and then immediately increased its speed by a factor of five. What about its course? Godfrey asked, scrambling in vain for a crumb of comforting news even as his face was already whitening. Alessandro grimly shook his head. The course didn't change. Chairman Godfrey, these engineers have just flagrantly demonstrated their hostility. And at this new speed, they're not going to get here in six weeks. They're going to get here in eight days. Part 2. Adjustment Nothing is more damaging to a new truth than an old error. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe E-82 McCarthy Dorm, Space Station, Il Cercatore Eight days, Emma said. It wasn't a question, just an involuntary utterance following a revelation that hit her like a kick in the gut. So basically we've now got as long until it arrives as we thought we'd have until it becomes visible? Alessandro gulped. Yes, assuming it doesn't speed up again. William Godfrey blinked several times, as if trying to force away a vision he couldn't shake. So if we thought we have a week until it passed the sun, we now have around forty hours for that, the Italian stated. Again, assuming the speed of approach doesn't increase any further, that's not an assumption I'm particularly confident in, but it doesn't seem like one we can do much about. I just hope you two came up with some ways to preemptively calm things down on Earth, because the time frame for that just got extremely tight. Did anything useful come out of whatever you were all talking about with Rogue and Melly? Emma asked in return, the non-answer giving Alessandro a hint that tangible measures on the message management front had been in short supply, even when the duo thought they had a week rather than one full day. Clark brought up the possibility of evacuating serious numbers of people to New Kerguelen in Rogue's mothership, and Terra raised the possibility that the engineers might be coming to make sure we don't raise the unbonded architects from the vault, Alessandro replied. Emma and Godfrey were clearly listening. She thinks it could be worth getting them out of there soon and seeing if the engineers changed course once they're gone, the Italian went on. Rogue is willing, on both fronts, to assist in a mass evacuation and to empty the vault. Piper thinks an evacuation would be pointless since the engineers could surely follow the evacuees to New Kerguelen, but like everything else, I think that depends on why they're coming in the first place. I must admit, I see merit in Terra's point. Godfrey quickly typed a message into his phone, apologizing to President Vasquez for the interruption and stating that things had just gotten a lot more urgent. He also pressed Vasquez, for her own sake, to approach some moderate opponents with the view of presenting a united front at the emergency announcement that was now going to be necessary even sooner than he had previously insinuated. The president called back immediately, but Godfrey couldn't take the call. Not when there was so much to do right away, now that the time frame had been compressed to such a stress-inducing extent. I like the idea of Rogue raising the rest of the architects from the vault as soon as possible. Emma said. Like Alessandro, she saw a lot of sense in the incisive point her sister Terra had landed upon, regarding the unbonded alien's potential role in making Earth a sudden point of interest for the engineers. All eyes fell on Godfrey. We have to do something, he said. And if it's not that, I don't know what else. And we can't look like we're keeping secrets, Emma said. We need to tell the world about the craft, and I think we need to tell the world everything we know about Rogue and the engineers we think are on the way here. Godfrey, we just talked about creating a public feeling that we're still in control of the situation, even if that's an illusion, and I think the best way to do that is to take decisive action in public view. Godfrey bit his lip and thought. If something goes wrong with raising the architects, everyone is going to find out instantly anyway, Emma contended. By telling people we're going to do it, and then doing it in public view, at least we create the opportunity for people to see something going right. Don't you think? I do, Godfrey said, 
the affirmative words stronger than the tone they were delivered in, and indeed than the uncertain body language the typically stoic ICA chairman was currently displaying. And Alessandro, do the others know about the acceleration yet, or did you come here first? They don't know yet, Alessandro replied. Godfrey nodded. Okay, we tell them, we tell the world, and then we put Rogue into action in that vault. Very well. Do you want me to call a camera crew from the Outreach Division to get ready for filming an announcement, or are you thinking of addressing the world from Thurso again? Godfrey turned to Emma, deferring to her judgment on a matter in which she had no strong view. Neither, she said. Mason is gone and Piper is already out of the shadows after what happened with the final pulse. For the first time since the comet, our backs really are all against the same wall, and the world needs something to rally around. An empty field in Thurso isn't the place. Catching her drift long before Alessandro, Godfrey raised his eyebrows. It's been a while, Emma said. But this time we're going back where the cameras always follow. Home, sweet home? Godfrey asked. She nodded, confident decision oozing through the gesture. Live from the Birchwood Drive-In. E-81, White House, Washington, D.C. With her brief window of solo time over after just a few illuminating minutes, Anna Vasquez followed her handlers and advisors to a waiting media scrum for her first full speech as President of the United States. She felt very much as though another thirty seconds on the phone with William Godfrey would have made her task far easier by virtue of giving her a more meaningful insight into what kind of societally destabilizing challenge he would soon be disclosing. The speech that had been prepared for her was short and generally conciliatory in any case, seeking to draw a line under the divisive Mason presidency with a promise of stability and consolidation. So Vasquez felt confident enough in delivering it as planned. Is everything okay? Her chief advisor asked. You need to look fresh and ready. Vasquez took this in the intended spirit, trusting the input of the younger woman who had been at her side for several years and who rarely steered her wrong. I haven't slept. Get used to it, Madam President, her advisor replied with a wink. This momentarily broke the tension Vasquez was feeling, drawing a smile. But with around ten minutes remaining until the speech and the sound of the excited press pack already echoing through the closed doors they lay beyond, Vasquez couldn't help but think back to some of the other blockbuster speeches that had been delivered over the years from the very podium she was about to grace for the first time. After Chairman Godfrey's hints that a major disclosure of something very consequential and evidently alien-related would be coming soon, Vasquez also felt her mind thinking back to the most famous speech of all, when Valerie Slater had addressed the world from the chair she had just been sitting in while taking Godfrey's call. Anna Vasquez wasn't nervous about the speech she was about to give, but the uncertainty over what might be coming next had her stomach doing somersaults. Loathing this feeling of helpless dread more than just about any other, Vasquez took it upon herself to push again for an answer while there was still time, albeit only just, to factor it into the words she was about to deliver. They would, after all, be poured over by the world's media from the moment they left her mouth, she considered, and foreknowledge of news that was about to break, anyway, would enable her to avoid setting any unreasonable expectations of what might lie ahead. What's the news? She typed into her phone. I'll work on the United Front, but I need to know what it is before I speak. Hurry. Anything I can help with? The advisor asked, glancing back to Vasquez just in time to see her putting her phone away again. The president shook her head. Truly, this wasn't something anyone currently standing on the surface of Earth could help with. Whatever the big news was, it could only come from the Il Cercatore space station, and Anna Vasquez could only hope it would come in time.
E-80, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. This is going to be quick, Emma McCarthy announced, addressing the entirety of the station's inner circle who had been gathered urgently to hear the bad news. She truly wasted no time in relaying not only the terrible news Alessandro had just broken about the now clearly hostile craft's destructive action and rapid acceleration, but also her and Godfrey's joint decision to tell the world everything as a matter of urgency. We don't even have two full days until the craft passes the sun, she said, so we need to act now. Rogue, you're willing and ready to raise the others from the vault, correct? After the briefest of pauses, young Cody confirmed that the huge alien with whom he shared an unusual bond was indeed ready to do what was asked of him. We're following Tara's idea on that, Emma went on, because it's a good one, that the engineers might be coming for those unbonded architects. If they are, the craft's course will change. We'll know either way as soon as it passes the sun. So we're thinking of raising them from the vault before then? Dan asked expressing surprise rather than any kind of opposition to his wife's suggestion. As in, less than two full days from now? She nodded decisively. But we need to get on top of things today, and Godfrey and I both think we should do it at the drive-in. Things are going to get scary, and people are going to be looking for comfort and hope. I just think if we're standing there giving updates, it's better than anchormen reading out doomsday reports and filling in the gaps of what they don't know with the worst things they can think of. If Rogue can flash us down soon, we could go home and get everything ready for an appearance tonight. No one said anything for a few seconds. The first to break the silence, somewhat surprisingly, was Clark. His supportive comment, welcomed by Emma, also came as a surprise to some of the group. Makes sense to me. With everything going on with Mason, politics and the usual media stuff is the last thing people want. But if you're breaking the news about the engineer's craft and if Rogue is raising the other architects from the vault, there's a lot to explain there. How much are you getting into? Absolutely everything, Emma said. She then turned squarely to her husband. Dan, it's going to be like when you went for full disclosure about the hoax and everything else, when the comet was on the way. There could be something we're missing that someone else might see, which is like what we were thinking when we went public with the Pulse forecasts, and doing it before the craft becomes visible is the only way to have a hope of avoiding chaos. You know how it is. We've seen it enough times. Bad news brings fear, but sudden bad news brings panic. And when you say everything, Piper probed, Emma took a deep breath. If you want to get it off your chest that you were born with the powers and use them to contain the final pulse, now's the time, she replied. The engineers are coming, and we're going to raise the unbonded architects from the vault, so we need to give the context about the chain of command and where the powers ultimately came from, and people might be less scared of Rogue and his powers if he's standing next to you while you're talking about yours. The change in Emma's views regarding public knowledge of Piper's powers would have shocked any of the group if it had been foretold a few weeks earlier, but everything that had happened in the interim made the still startling about turn somewhat less surprising. Piper had nailed her own colors to the mast when she unilaterally decided to tell British Prime Minister Diane Logan, and Logan's relatively muted lack of surprise had helped Emma to more or less forget about that incident. More to the point, Certain highly consequential incidents since then had further underlined Piper's willingness to raise her head above the parapet, as well as the good she could do when she wasn't constrained. The cabin-based trio in Thurso had also seen Piper's telekinesis up close and were more impressed than scared, again reacting with far less unease than Emma would have expected. But perhaps most importantly, the overdue downfall of former President Nick Mason removed in a single stroke the chief fearmonger about the uplift powers. With Mason out of the picture and a more cautious replacement now in the chair he'd been forced to vacate in disgrace, the anti-ICA and anti-McCarthy policy positions he had been so vociferous about were likely to become political poison from which former allies would distance themselves as fully as possible. 
Have there been crowds at the drive-in lately? Dan asked, understandably not having been keeping track of domestic coverage of the unprecedented threats his family had recently helped the world to navigate in one piece. Some, Emma replied. But I'll announce something when we're home and come tonight it's going to be like old times. Cameras and locals, as far as the eye can see. We'll get some video ready of everything we have, from New Kerguelen too. And we could even wrap up right before Rogue raises the other architects. We could even have cameras in the vault and show that live on the big screen while Rogue is doing it. Hmm, the previously nodding Carrick Thomas mused. I'm on board with the rest, Emma, but that sounds like playing with fire. More grateful for the opportunity to explain than irked by the interjection, Emma shook her head. It's more like we're trying to put a big fire out. If the plan fails, everything burns down whether you film it or not. I said this to Godfrey and we're both on the same page in thinking there isn't really any risk to broadcasting it, because if it all goes wrong and it ends up being that we unleash those architects on Earth instead of releasing them into Rogue's control, everyone's going to find out when they start wreaking havoc anyway, whether we have cameras in the vault or not. But if we broadcast it going well... That's another reason for people to feel like we can overcome major challenges. And with the size of the challenge that's going to be global news in less than two days, we really need people to feel like we have a chance. The ICA chairman was nodding forcefully. And this is going to be a powerful image, Carrick, he said. Fully clearing out the vault that caused so much damage is a victory for all of humanity. Imagine the moon landings without any recordings, it wouldn't be the same. The idea of airing video footage from some of the discoveries on New Kerguelen comes from the same mindset, and in that case there's even less cause for hesitation because it's pre-recorded and we can highlight precisely what we want to. Carrick acknowledged the sense in both of these comments, particularly Emma's, and looked like he was now on board with the plan in its entirety. I could give Trey Myers a heads up if we'll need someone to help with preparing a video package or making sure the AV setup at the drive-in will be ready in time, Clark suggested. He's great with video, and we know we can trust him with sensitive stuff. Remember Lolo? He could have made a fortune if he sold his footage instead of bringing it to us. And he brought me to Colorado without asking too many questions, Serena chimed in. He's definitely one of the good guys. Emma nodded. They were right. Trey was as good a bet as anyone else. Alessandro, can you connect us to Billy? She asked. Some footage from the island would be great. Everything we have will come together to really show people everything all of us have done lately, and how much we've already overcome. When a threat as big as this craft is coming, perspective like that can make a real difference. Will do, the Italian replied getting right to the business of making a cross-gate call to New Kerguelen's Planetary Research Committee. Instinctively, everyone gathered more closely around Alessandro for a better view of the screen. Most of them hadn't seen Billy Kendrick for a long while, and footage from the infamous Isle of Answers was something they were all very interested in seeing for themselves. Billy would have a lot more than that for them, as it went, but before this call began, William Godfrey glanced at his own phone upon thinking back to another he'd recently cut short. An unread message now filled his screen from Anna Vasquez, in which the new president all but begged for information on the revelation Godfrey had hinted at. The urgency had been ramped up by the craft's acceleration since then, equaling the urgency Vasquez felt to know what the hell it was before her imminent inaugural address. Godfrey held his phone towards Emma, who pondered it for a few seconds. This is an opportunity, she eventually said, thinking it all through even as she spoke. Tell her we're going to address what's in the vault tonight and another recent discovery. She can say Dan called her to discuss it because he wants to work together on the issues that affect the whole world, but she has to explicitly promise cross-party cooperation in dealing with those same issues. That's good for everyone. There's no better way for her to distance herself from Mason than that, and it helps us with the unity idea we were talking about. Agreeing fully, Godfrey fired off a quick reply to that effect. The others had heard this conversation but generally paid little attention, focusing far less on that side of things than Godfrey and Emma did 
mainly because they lacked the direct experience to know how much of a difference it could make. Timo! Alessandro Bonucci beamed, his face filling with a smile wider than any he had worn for far too long as soon as his oldest and dearest friend appeared on the screen. Addressing the station-based group in high-quality video from the other side of the gate, Timo was sitting next to Billy Kendrick. Clark's eyes were drawn to Billy, meanwhile, who, for his part, looked far more relaxed than the last time they'd seen each other. The aging archaeologist had been so shaken by his skeletal discovery in New Kerguelen's vault that he hadn't even been able to visit baby Liam before the family made it back to Earth. Neither Clark nor Tara would ever hold that against Billy, and they were instead just happy to see him looking more like himself now. This did, however, beg the question as to whether Billy yet knew about the huge spacecraft that was on its way to Earth, and even if he did, they were under little illusion that his apparent happiness would survive the additional revelation that it had destroyed the heartbeat probe and was now set to reach Earth in one week rather than six. I just spoke to the squadron, Billy said, diving right into the reason for his surprisingly upbeat expression. And I think they might be able to help us. E-79 Planetary Research Committee, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. The squadron? Emma asked, echoing Billy's word in a tone that would have been best described as flabbergasted. In truth, several of the group had instinctively repeated the two words as a question in exactly the same manner, with only Emma's volume setting her response apart from the others. Billy grinned, having expected this kind of reaction. Yep, he said. There aren't all that many of them left, but I spoke to the messengers who used to be in their old squadron cast. We were wondering about potential defensive weaponry, and one of their strategists came up with an idea. And you know the stuff you guys found out about how the architects were educated for certain roles, with the transcripts the engineers made for that purpose? None of the group interjected yet to reply to this rhetorical question, many of them still reeling in surprise at the initial point about Billy having any dialogue with the squadron in the first place. Well, that stuff's not a million miles from the way the messengers used to be streamed into casts by the architects, Billy went on using the exact same kind of transcripts, but delivering them via the elders. The squadron strategists were raised from birth to be experts in planetary defense. Okay, we know they're not the smartest in other ways, but they were literally designed for something like this. The whole multi-step chain of command from the engineers down to the messengers was in place to keep an eye on us. Remember, in case we evolved too much or too dangerously for them, so if we can ultimately use the squadron's strategic abilities against the engineers, that's just the most beautiful irony. And it gets better when we think about using their own weapon against them. So, just to be clear, you've been talking to the squadron about weapons we could possibly use against the craft that's heading for Earth? Emma probed. I know Alessandro told Leisha about the discovery, but did you not get the part about how big this thing is? Rogue says not even his mothership has anything that would be likely to make a dent in this thing, and all the tech on New Kerguelen came from the architects. Everything alien that we know about ultimately came from the engineers, so I don't know what kind of weapon you think is lying around on New Kerguelen that could help us here. Don't get me wrong, if there is one... It's worth hearing about in case it comes to that. But how can there be? Oh, it's lying on New Care Galen, all right, Billy said. And there's one lying on Earth, too. Or should I say, in the Earth. We've already seen what it can do, and the squadron think it could give these engineers a taste of their own medicine if we can find the source. Several of the group on the station looked at each other in confusion, glancing around as if wondering if they were the only one to be thinking that they had to be hearing things. The source of the pulses? Dan asked, speaking for everyone. Billy nodded. If we can figure out where the pulse energy came from, and if we can isolate that source, extract it from the vault and direct it somewhere else... I thought you actually had something, man, Clark sighed. 
Like the others, any brief hope he had felt was extinguished when Billy's idea turned out to be as hypothetical as it was far-fetched. And listen, the craft just sped up. They're going to reach Earth in a week and pass the sun in less than two days. We need to make the find public before it makes itself public, and we're hoping you can send us some footage of the vault there if you have it, or film some if you don't. We'll get some. Billy said, unperturbed by a reaction that wasn't exactly unexpected. He certainly wasn't giving up on the idea of isolating the energy source behind the pulses and only felt his determination grow with the news of the massively accelerated timescale. At Billy's side, Timo Fiori looked extremely pensive. Timo longed for the comfort of the station he had called home for several years, as well as the company of his close friends. This longing was amplified by his knowledge of what little time he had left due to his poisoning at the hands of Nick Mason, but the new knowledge of how little time Earth as a whole might have left strengthened his resolve to help in any way he could. I will go to the vault with Billy right away to get some of the footage you want, and also to see what else we might find, the billionaire announced. I'm sure Leisha will be willing to flash us there, given the urgency of this. Does he know about the change in your arrival estimate? Most of the group's members shook their heads. We just found out, Alessandro replied. Timo nodded in understanding. We'll tell him. Is the architect with you now? Billy followed up. The rogue? The group parted, revealing rogue's lower half. Alessandro then tilted his computer's camera to get the huge alien's head in shot. Billy, wrestling with an instinctive hatred for the alien's kind, given what they had done in and with the vault he discovered on the Isle of Answers, looked directly at its disturbingly crocodilian eyes. Does it know anything at all about the precise source of the pulses? he asked. Because if it ever comes to pass that you need something to defend yourselves with against these engineers, something they left on Earth might be the best bet going. Cody, an unfamiliar young boy whose story had so far passed Billy by amid all the other remarkable recent happenings and would be briefly explained a few moments later, answered on the alien's behalf. Rogue doesn't know anything about the energy source or if we could use it. But he says he'll have a look around when we're down there to wake the other architects. The others were almost as surprised by Rogue's non-dismissal of Billy's question as Billy was by Cody's presence, but no one was putting much stock in any of it. It seemed obvious to them that the energy source behind the pulses had been depleted by the final emission, just as it seemed obvious that attempting to handle anything so volatile, even if it was found, couldn't possibly be sanctioned. Most obvious of all, however, was the point that Cody and Rogue had already been in the Thurso-based vault, just as Billy and Leisha had already been in New Care Galens, and that none had detected a single transcript or any other kind of clue that even hinted at providing information about the source of all the energy, much less instructions about how to somehow redirect that energy into space without spreading outwards in every direction and destroying everything along the way. The idea of reactivating whatever technology lay behind the Pulse's destructive power was one that no one on the station was willing to entertain, least of all William Godfrey, and both his expression and his tone made that very clear when he eventually addressed Billy. Get some footage from the island and the vault as quickly as you can, and we'll be very grateful, Billy the ICA chairman stated. But mention that idea again, and it'll be the last time we speak to you. Godfrey walked away after this comment, leaving the words lingering in the air. I think we'll all just pretend you didn't suggest that, Emma said. But it really would be great if you can send some footage to Alessandro as quickly as you can. Thanks, guys. Talk soon. As the call ended, Billy looked directly at Rogue. He could have sworn he saw movement in the alien's usually unreadable eyes, and this gave him the distinct impression that whether William Godfrey wanted to hear any more about the admittedly far-fetched Pulse idea or not, a notion had now been firmly implanted in Rogue's mind. 
E-78, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland. When news came down from the station that the moon-sized craft on the way to Earth had accelerated to a speed that would bring its journey time down from six weeks to one, the trio in the cabin above the vault were lost for words. But when that news was followed up by the revelation that a plan had been hatched for Rogue to return to the vault and raise the twenty-four unbonded architects before the craft passed the sun in less than two days, the men were all but lost for breath, too. They're saying we can leave if we want to, Geo said, reading the full message. There isn't really a lot left for us to do here besides monitor the data feeds and make sure the lights stay on, but I can do that all if I need to. Guys, you don't have to be here for this if you don't want to. You can go. Davy and Stevie, the local drilling operators who had been on site at Thurso from almost the very beginning and had played a crucial role in finding the vault's entrance, understood and appreciated where this offer was coming from. That didn't mean, however, that either had even half a mind to accept it. Cheers, mate, but I'm staying, Stevie replied first. I've been here for everything else, and I saw Rogue up close just like you did. He's on our side. Aye, thanks, Gio, but I'm staying as well, Davy stated. And for sure the big fella is on our side. That doesn't mean he knows what he's doing down there, though, or that everything's gonna work out. Stevie furrowed his brow. So why are you staying, if you're thinking like that? He asked his friend. There was no anger in the words. If fear wasn't understandable now, it never would be. But there was a genuine sense of confusion. You heard the man. You can go if you want. Go where? Davy asked, getting to the crux of his point. If this goes wrong and those architects deny bond rogue, a car is hardly gonna get me far enough away to be safe, is it? As the question lingered in the air without reply, the answer was clear. E-77, White House, Washington, D.C. As a child, Anna Vasquez had dreamed of growing up to be President of the United States, her perceived distance from that dream had alternatingly grown and shrunk over the course of a long political career, and there was more than a little irony in the fact that the moment it arrived came shortly after it seemed least likely to ever come. Although being Nick Mason's pick for VP had brought her within one unforeseen incident of the top job, Vasquez hadn't considered herself any more likely to step into a void than the vast majority of those who had gone before her. Indeed, her fairly dismal showing in the primary runoffs that saw Mason emerge as the party's leading presidential candidate in the first place had given Vasquez reason to believe that her style of moderate politics was unlikely to have another day in the sun any time soon. It was, however, that moderate reputation that made her the preferred VP pick among Mason's team of strategists, countering, as it did, some of his roughest corners and most abrasive traits, particularly within a cohort of older female voters who were widely turned off by Mason's obnoxious manner, Vasquez proved an important piece of the electoral puzzle. One thing Anna Vasquez had never dreamed of as a child was obtaining the presidency by default, as she had a matter of hours earlier but as she walked towards the podium from which she would give her first presidential address, Vasquez tried to focus on the thought that her late parents, and perhaps even more so the grandfather who had sparked her early interest in politics, would be looking down upon her with pride. More pertinently, she sought to justify that pride in making the best of the bad situation Nick Mason had left behind for her party, her country, and indeed her world as a whole. Although she had already been sworn in, the upcoming speech would be the new president's first public appearance since the first news of Nick Mason's resignation broke. Media speculation had been rampant ever since surrounding why he had fled and what crimes he was so worried about coming to light, and most of the commentary regarding Vasquez centered on the uncertainty as to whether she would walk back his high-profile views on the other huge issue of the day namely the alien-related events in Scotland and the individuals most associated with them. 
although Mason's vehement opposition to William Godfrey and his ICA had reached fever pitch in recent days and weeks, they had hardly been any secret before then, and Vasquez had never gone out of her way to temper them. The shamed former president's increasingly aggressive criticism of the McCarthy family was a more recent phenomenon, however, and commentators widely suggested that Vasquez would have far less difficulty distancing herself from those comments if she wanted to. A near-silent vibration in Vasquez's pocket signaled the arrival of a message from a VIP contact just before she reached the final door that separated her from the waiting press pack, and her rapid glance at the screen revealed the sender to be exactly who she had hoped for, William Godfrey himself. Although the message was short and simple, it would have a major effect on both the tone and content of the short statement Vasquez was about to deliver. She put the phone in her pocket just before her senior advisor reached out to open the door, at which point a barrage of flashbulbs and questions rained down upon her like shrapnel. Individual words jumped above the rest in both volume and frequency, from the obvious Mason and McCarthy's to the less palatable, illegitimate, and tarnished. Shaking it all off as best she could, Vasquez approached the podium and began delivering her prepared remarks in a humble tone that came naturally, but had nevertheless been drilled into her in the preceding hours as absolutely crucial. Her senior advisor nodded along approvingly with every word. At least until Vasquez went off script. Beyond the intention I just stated to normalize our relations with the ICA, I think it's worth mentioning that I received a call from Chief Planetary Liaison Dan McCarthy this morning, the President said. We are both keen to put the past two years behind us and work together in tackling the issues that affect our whole world, particularly relating to a recent discovery his team has made. As soon as tonight, they'll be publicly discussing exactly what has been found in the alien vault beneath Scotland. The woman, who had spent all morning running through every detail of Vasquez's speech, couldn't hide her confusion at how far it had gone off track, but her initial concerns were more than a little allayed by the direction it went. There were certainly questions about why Vasquez had kept this from her, but in that moment, such considerations didn't seem all that important. What counted most was that the ability to shift attention so fully back towards the McCarthys while also thawing relations was an absolute godsend in their current situation. It didn't seem possible that Vasquez could be lying about any of this, not when she knew the McCarthys would state as much within minutes if it was the case, so it really did feel as though a great drop of fortune had fallen in their lap. The ICA is the primary forum in which global issues relating to extraterrestrial discoveries should always have been handled, Vasquez continued. But when it comes to the direct effects of such discoveries within the national borders of these United States, I want to close with a commitment that my administration will, from day one, extend an olive branch of cooperation to any and all parties who can assist in ensuring any harmful effects of such discoveries are kept to a minimum. All of Vasquez's advisors looked altogether less pleased by this unexpected diversion than the last one, but there was nothing they could do to stop the train now as it rolled down the tracks towards a destination they could only hope she had carefully thought through. In years gone by, issues relating to aliens and space as a whole have infamously been used as opportunities to score political points by the likes of John Cole and Valerie Slater. And although it pains me to say it, newly emerging evidence suggests that my predecessor has been guilty of the same thing. Under my administration, that will no longer be the case. I intend to create a bipartisan extraterrestrial engagement committee as soon as possible. But as soon as today, I will be reaching out to several opposition representatives who have previously expressed a desire to work with us on these issues. Whatever divides us on some of these issues, our oaths of service to our country quite simply demand that we stand together.
While the room had been a hubbub of commotion before Vasquez arrived, and the press pack had then fallen silent amid her fairly sedate and predictable opening remarks, the topic she was broaching now brought something halfway between the two. Feet shuffled and fingers twitched as some of the attendant reporters and journalists looked through their notes for any sign of previous comments Vasquez might have made on these issues, while others were already considering new opening lines for the reports they would have to rewrite from scratch now that Vasquez had moved so far from the lines she'd been expected to follow. We certainly don't have to look far, or indeed long into the past, for an example of successful cooperation on this front either, the president stated. Because while I count neither as a particularly close ally on any front, I was encouraged to see the unified response put forward by Chairman Godfrey and Prime Minister Logan when the scale of the threat posed by the pulses demanded it. That cooperation is what enabled the Highland evacuation to succeed like it did in keeping avoidable deaths to an absolute minimum. On this side of the Atlantic, rooms full of party officials will attest that I lobbied my predecessor to swallow his pride and cooperate with them too, just as they had swallowed their pride in cooperating with each other despite their well-known history of acrimony. While it wasn't quite true that rooms full of people could attest to it, Vasquez had encouraged Mason to consider dialing down his belligerence toward the ICA, while Earth as a whole was under a grave alien-originated threat, and her own innate feelings towards the agency were far more balanced than his. Some issues cannot be reduced to political footballs, she continued, and as Dan McCarthy has said for the better part of two decades, we would do well to remember that we all share the same sky, and all live beneath the same stars. If recent events in Scotland haven't underlined that, I don't know what will. So as I embark on my first full day in a position I have spent my life preparing for and stand ready to live always by the oaths I hold sacred, I hope others will join me in leaving the divisions of the past where they belong. The President's senior advisor closed her eyes and breathed a deep sigh of relief. Although there was much to clear up and many discussions to be had about why this surprise had been sprung, Vasquez had brought it all around from some uncertain twists and turns to finish with a very powerful line. My fellow Americans, together we are strong, Vasquez concluded, a careful smile joining the light wrinkles of experience on her face. And my number one priority is to ensure that together we stand. E-76, Departure Point, Space Station, Il Tricatore. With far more urgency than fanfare, Piper McCarthy and her parents prepared to leave the station for Earth, Birchwood, to be precise, ahead of their appearance at the drive-in later in the day. President Anna Vasquez's words had gone down well, with everyone understanding that her claim of having spoken to Dan earlier in the day was a white lie suggested by Emma and Godfrey rather than something she had plucked out of the air. The change from Mason could hardly have been starker, but the group also realized that there was no coincidence in this, with Vasquez understandably distancing herself as far as possible from a man whose crimes were in the process of being exposed and which everyone hoped would become an ever greater focus of the world's media once more pressing matters were seen to. In any event, Emma now hoped that Vasquez and a high-ranking member of the opposition party might be able to send a video for airing at the drive-in. As it went, the event there was already shaping up to be a very consequential one since the group had agreed upon the idea of having Rogue raise the 24 unbonded architects from the vault as a live finale. Via the remarkably gifted Cody, who had struck up an odd but deep bond of his own with the giant alien, Rogue confirmed his readiness to do this as well as his willingness to flash teleport the McCarthys down to Birchwood for their final preparations. The request Emma made for this brought some uncomfortable considerations to her mind as she thought about the remarkableness of the upliftability of teleportation 
which had come to be taken for granted in the days when Leisha had been able to use it on Earth whenever the group needed him to. This troubled Emma due to her new knowledge of where the architect's powers originated, or, to take it even further, the newly illuminated context of where the architects themselves came from. Rogue and his powers had been engineered by the previously distant beings who took their name from that process, and were now hurtling towards Earth at a frighteningly relentless pace. Put simply, if the engineers were willing and able to give their lapdogs a power as great as teleportation, to say nothing of the telekinetic and telepathic abilities that Piper and Cody had inherited via the additional intermediary of the messengers, Emma couldn't and didn't want to imagine what kinds of powers the engineers might have kept solely for themselves. The prospect of bringing Rogue to the drive-in for an appearance was mooted in the brief time between the decision to stage the event and the McCarthy's departure, but it was ultimately deemed both unnecessary and unwise. The size of the crowd they were expecting was likely to be a challenge for law enforcement as it was, and introducing the chance of a fear-based stampede by bringing along a mystery guest who looked straight out of a sci-fi horror movie didn't strike anyone as the wisest of moves as soon as Dan raised that possible outcome. What took slightly longer to decide was whether it made most sense for the other half of the McCarthy clan to make their return to Earth before the drive-in event, too. Clark was on the fence, while Emma thought solid ground would probably be the best place for Terra and the new baby, but Terra herself cast a deciding vote, a veto indeed, to stay where she was. There had never been any prospect of her family attending the drive-in, especially not after their frightening experience of running into a well-meaning but intimidatingly huge crowd of messengers outside of New Kerguelen's infirmary, but Terra believed that the chaos that was sure to engulf a wide area around Birchwood when news of the event broke was best avoided for Aiden as well as baby Liam. Everything will blow over soon, Terra said after stating her decision gently but decisively. Her tone was hopeful rather than confident, tinged with something more like optimism than true expectation. Until then, this is the safest place for us. No one could disagree with that since the station was insulated from all manner of problems that could conceivably kick off on Earth. Worst-case scenarios of crowd disorder or related security incidents didn't have to be discussed out loud to worm their way into everyone's heads, and Emma's own sureness that she was making the right decision in not just bringing her family back to Earth, but quite literally taking center stage alongside them, was supported primarily by something Piper had said a few days earlier. The brilliant girl's words had echoed in Emma's mind frequently since then. Planes are safest on the ground, but that's not what planes are for. They had never echoed any louder than they did when it came time for the trio to make their way to the station's departure point. Although no one else would be staying behind on the ground, their number for the trip was doubled by the need for Cody to accompany Rogue and Chip to accompany Cody. This trifecta was already a common sight on the station due to the unusual bonds that the boy had formed in each direction, due respectively to his unique ability to communicate with the giant architect and the unique comfort he felt in the company of the man who had liberated him from the confined space where he had previously been forced to lay his head. The plan is that we'll stay at home from here on out. Emma reaffirmed at the end of the station's remarkable shark-tunnel-like walkway through the stars. She was speaking mainly to Terra. One way or another, this can only last for a week, and if anything major changes, we can come back, or you can always come down to us. But the plan is for us to at least try and get some kind of grip on the situation before it goes crazy, which it would if the way people found out about the craft was by seeing it on ACN once it passes the sun. We'll probably do regular briefings. Godfrey can tell you more about what we were thinking about that. But we've just got to take this one day at a time. Of course, Tara said. Emma hugged her. I hate leaving you, and I wouldn't if Melly wasn't here with you guys. But everything is going to be fine. Melly, a close friend of both sisters and one whose happiness at meeting little Liam was still etched on her face, smiled softly at the mention of her name 
Despite not catching the full meaning of Emma's comments due to their distance from the station's vocal translator, Piper said her goodbyes to her five-year-old cousin Aiden, who looked understandably sleepy and just as understandably as though he didn't really understand much of what was going on around him. Dan and Clark were by now back to their reserved and decidedly non-physical exchanges of affection, meanwhile, with that Henry-derived habit having slipped only in the immediate aftermath of Clark's return from New Kerguelen when something much closer to the more standard hugs and tears had come out. I'll hold down this fort in Timo's absence, William Godfrey said, meaning no slight on Clark or Alessandro, or indeed anyone else. And Piper, I'm counting on you to take care of Earth in mine. Okay? The girl laughed. Maybe you should give me an ICA title like my dad's. She joked, responding in kind to Godfrey's levity-bringing jest at her parents' expense. Hmm, I'll think on it, Godfrey replied. With the air lightened, momentarily, at least, the departing members of the group stepped into the small craft from which Rogue would flash them directly to Birchwood. Days and nights were becoming difficult to track with their disrupted sleep patterns, the station's artificial lighting and live news reports from various time zones on Earth, all contributing factors, but there were now less than twelve hours remaining until the time penciled in as the best moment for Rogue to descend once more to Thurso. It would be very late in the Scottish night at that point, partly to reduce local visibility in a bid to reduce drone traffic from desperate reporters and things of that nature, but the main reason was that this would line up with prime time in Colorado, where the packed drive-in and its huge screen would be the first place on earth that anyone outside of the vault could directly see what was happening while Rogue did what had to be done. When that hour rolled around, Rogue would arrive over Scotland in his gargantuan mothership in preparation for the twenty-four newly awoken architects he hoped to bring on board without any unforeseen difficulties. This trip would involve no such craft, and began as soon as young Cody held out his right hand and counted the fingers down from five. On zero, the flash consumed them. Godspeed, McCarthy's. William Godfrey thought as his eyes adjusted to the flash, but remained focused on the now empty holding craft. And for God's sake, don't forget your bloody game faces. E-75, Ford McCarthy Residence, Birchwood, Colorado. Wow! Cody gawped as he arrived in the McCarthy's living room alongside Rogue and Chip Petrovich. He wandered over to the couch and picked up a decorative cushion, as though it was some kind of golden relic. Chip followed him over and placed a hand on the boy's shoulder. You'll live somewhere like this, kid, he promised. And everyone who had a part in putting you where I found you is going to get what's coming to them. Don't worry about that. Cody was by now used to people promising vengeance on his behalf be it Chip or Clark or even Godfrey, but while he didn't doubt their sincerity or ability to follow through, he likewise didn't pay the issue a lot of heed. With so much else going on, and so many immediate problems to deal with, the boy's mind was on other things. He was grateful that the others wanted to help him get some kind of justice for everything that had been done, but when it boiled down to it, he was just happy to be free and determined to help the group for bringing that freedom to pass. For the moment, the boy's mind appeared to be on the stylish but far from opulent decor of the room, as evidenced by his move from the cushion-covered couch to a well-scratched coffee table that none of the family could bear to part with. They never let me have any real books, he said, picking up a hardback history of TV sitcoms and flipping through the pages. I had a TV, he nodded. I mean, they weren't savages. Although Piper laughed heartily at this, the adults looked at each other less certainly. Cody was such a complex character, who often seemed so far beyond his years, but was, at the end of the day, a twelve-year-old boy who had lived a life none of them could imagine. His statements about books and TV raised more questions than answers, and when the day came, they were sure he would openly answer every question about his stolen childhood that they could think to ask. 
That day wasn't this one, however, and as long as the boy was smiling and cooperating, they were happy to keep him in that kind of headspace, rather than dredge up anything that could have done a lot more harm than good. At a time when his remarkable gifts were proving crucial in enabling communications with Rogue, and could well prove important in several other ways, this seemed like the only wise way forward. I wish I could live here, Cody said very simply. He looked directly at Emma and relieved her greatly by not directly rephrasing this as a request that even she would have had no idea how to answer tactfully. It's really nice. She gave him a genuine smile. Thanks, and Chip is right. You'll live somewhere at least as nice as this. If we survive, the boy replied in an incongruously upbeat tone. If we do, it's going to be so cool if I can have a room just for a couch. The others will be wondering where we are, Chip interjected, saving Emma and Dan, and this time Piper too, from having to think of a reply to Cody's latest unexpected remark. Tact clearly wasn't the boy's strong point, but no one could blame him for anything like that, and they all recognized that he was remarkably well-rounded for someone who had grown up, as far as they knew, with next to no socialization, and no one he could truly trust. The boy nodded and returned to Chip's side. I guess, he said. We'll see you guys later then. Bye, Piper. Bye, she said, somehow both more sure that she liked Cody and less sure of anything else about him than she had been a few minutes earlier. Rogue, who had spent those minutes standing with his head slightly crouched to avoid hitting the light shade on the high living room ceiling, looked to Cody and Chip until they came in closer for the flash. Emma blew air from her lips as soon as they were gone. That poor kid, she said. I mean... As she trailed off, neither of the others had anything coherent to add to reflect the same kind of feelings they were experiencing. There was much to be done, and little time for reflection. E-74, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland Shortly after the decision to raise 24 dormant architects from the Thurso vault in less than 12 hours had been made, ICA Chairman Godfrey personally delivered the news to Diane Logan. The British Prime Minister did little but wish him luck, knowing that certain realities, chiefly his closeness to not only the McCarthys and thus the Messengers, but now also a surprisingly cooperative architect, ensured that the decisions reached by Godfrey and his inner circle on this kind of thing were not up for any debate she could be part of. In truth, Logan had no desire to be any more deeply involved than she was, however, with her mind and spirit still positively reeling from the two-week period when increasingly vast swaths of Scotland had been reduced to rubble by the pulses which emanated from the very vault Godfrey and his ragtag cohorts sought to clear of the one potential problem that remained within it. The fact Godfrey called with this news also reduced any feelings of resentment Logan might otherwise have felt, since the ICA chairman was neither lording over her nor bypassing her altogether. Indeed, his humble request for British forces to secure the area in a way his ICA security corps couldn't hope to match further exemplified his newfound willingness to cooperate. Best of all, this new tendency towards cooperation even seemed to have rubbed off on Nick Mason's replacement in Washington. That whole business had certainly raised an overdue smile on Logan's face, even if this was nothing compared to the pleasure she expected to take when he finally faced the music for all he had done. Logan wasn't quite smiling as the sun began to set over Thurso, but the arrival of a slew of heavy-duty machinery and personnel from various branches of the British services was certainly greatly preferable to the alternative of staring at a field full of ICA-branded equipment and Godfrey's uniformed security guards. The whirring of two RAF Chinooks filled the air while several Royal Navy vessels arrived near the coastline. On the ground, Army personnel very visibly assisted the already attendant police officers in maintaining a cordon at the edge of Thurso, despite the repeated attempts of some reporters to find a weak point in the ring of steel. The public and media weren't quite sure whether this was all being done to protect the untouched sanctity of the vault until William Godfrey finally revealed what had been discovered inside it, 
or whether the conspicuous militarization of the area was intended to make sure nothing caused trouble, or worse, on its way out of the vault. Anticipation was growing by the minute as news of the ominous developments spread across Scotland and beyond, joined by a healthy dose of apprehension among a large number of observers. While many on the other side of the Atlantic were following remarkable developments on their own domestic fronts and anticipating news from the long-absent McCarthy family, few in Scotland expected to catch much sleep. Whether anyone, anywhere, would ever sleep soundly again, meanwhile, depended very much on how the upcoming Architect Awakening plan went. E-73, Ford McCarthy Residence, Birchwood, Colorado It feels like we've been gone forever, Piper mused as she crossed her living room. She slowly walked towards the kitchen and looked around at everything. It was surreal to think back to how much had happened since she last made a morning smoothie with the blender or filled the freezer's slushy maker compartment with syrup and fresh water. It really does, Dan added. All that time at the hotel in London, then all that time on the station. Everything with the pulses, everything with the gate. Emma took a seat on the couch, taking a momentary respite before stepping into her office before what she knew would be a whirlwind day of preparation for a crucial event at the drive-in. Before long, Piper came to join her while Dan set off to make a pot of his and Emma's favorite coffee for the first time in far too long. Is everything okay? Emma asked. You know, considering, with you, I mean. Piper took a few seconds to think how best to phrase the thoughts in her head. Yeah, with me she replied. But being here, something about it just doesn't feel right. No? Emma asked, surprised and more than a little upset to hear this. I'm glad to be home, the girl clarified. I just, I feel like we should be on the station, you know, helping. Emma's concerns eased a little upon hearing this. Until she did, she had been worried that Piper was picking up some kind of foreboding vibe, or that a more tangible worry was troubling her. Guilt over a selfless desire to help was a much easier thing to counter, since Emma could do so with a very simple but very true single sentence. Trust me, Piper, there's nowhere we can do more good for the world than here in Birchwood. The girl didn't argue, but didn't exactly look sold either. I can't blame you for not knowing how much this kind of thing matters, because you weren't around for all the other times, Emma said. But believe me, when your dad is talking, people listen and people calm down. Some of them even like hearing from me too, if you can believe that. Piper chuckled. But really, her mother continued, this is important. You should maybe watch some of the old announcements and rallies from the drive-in, just to see that crowd. In good times and bad, the drive-in was the only place the world wanted to look and your dad's words were the only thing anyone wanted to hear. This really is important, but believe me, darling, you're important too. Correctly sensing this was more than a general platitude and would be followed up by something a lot more specific, Piper stayed quiet and listened. Everyone knows you stopped the final pulse, Emma began to expand. So people are already going to be looking at you like the messengers look at your Aunt Tara on New Kerguelen. But if you still want to tell the world how special you really are and exactly how you stopped the pulse, they're going to look at you like, I don't know, like Cody looks at Chip. Because you saved us, darling. All of us. Don't forget that. Anyone would have done it, the girl said, no falseness in her humility. No, they wouldn't, Emma replied with a slow shake of her head. That's what you don't get, and that's what everyone else sees. But it's that combination of your goodness and your power. That's what's going to make them look at you like more than a hero. That's what makes you so special. And that's why we're here. Especially when things get bad, this world needs good people to look up to, and I can't think of anyone better. Emma then stood up to join Dan in the kitchen, leaving Piper alone with her thoughts. They were more settled than they had been before this conversation, for sure, but a new kind of pressure was building within young Piper McCarthy. 
For years, the girl had longed for opportunities to show what she was capable of, not in any boastful sense, but solely to test the limits of those capabilities and explore ways in which they could be used to help people who needed it. Recent arguments with Emma, while the world had been at the mercy of the pulses, centered specifically and explicitly on Piper's desire to find and fulfill her own potential, and there was an unspoken understanding in her mind that Emma's eventual willingness to step back and let the girl spread her wings had been just as important as Piper's direct action. Now, however, the shoe was somewhat on the other foot, with Emma being the one championing Piper's potential and Piper having slight doubts about how much help she could really be. She had heard the points about how the public would look at her, however, and understood that more now than she had earlier. Emma's words about the combination of goodness and power were similar to comments Melly had made to Piper on several occasions, and in a world where power was too often sought for its own sake, and all too typically accompanied by traits like greed and deceitfulness, it didn't take any kind of self-conceit for the girl to know what they meant. The Birchwood Drive-Ins was a stage on which Piper McCarthy had never stood, but it now seemed like as good a place as any other to make her public debut. E-72, White House, Washington, D.C. Boosted by a roundly supportive reaction to her first presidential address, Anna Vasquez was tremendously glad that William Godfrey had given her something to go on while there was still time to incorporate it into her speech. Since then, she had both reached out to thank him and extended the promised olive branch to her opponents, who were wise enough to see which way the wind was blowing. Wisely, they knew that their interests would be best served by standing alongside Vasquez on alien matters while Godfrey was taking the lead, rather than taking anti-ICA potshots from the distance, like the man they had understandably demonized for so long had made a habit of doing. By pivoting to oppose Mason's old position as completely as she had, President Vasquez really had left her foes little choice but to accept her offer of engagement. When Godfrey got back to her with advance notice that the McCarthys were going to address the world with some spoken statements and video footage at the Birchwood Drive-In at the end of the day, Vasquez enthusiastically agreed to provide a short recorded statement of her own. It would essentially be a shortened version of what she had already said, focusing specifically on her commitment to normalizing her country's relations with the ICA after years of Mason-based acrimony, but on this occasion, she would be splitting the statements with a prominent representative from the other side of the aisle. That visual would speak louder than the words they said, which Vasquez knew as well as Godfrey, but she felt sure that the fact it would be on her terms and come after her call for cross-party cooperation would prevent it from undermining her authority in any way. So far, the early stages of a mutually beneficial cooperative arrangement between Godfrey and Vasquez appeared to be working in everyone's best interests. The new president was even starting to hope that UK Prime Minister Diane Logan's continued self-imposed absence from the frontline international response to all things alien-related was leaving a void that was ready for someone else to step into. What was slipping Vasquez's mind, at least for the time being, was that Earth didn't begin and end in London and Washington. E-71. Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. Upon returning to the station from his short but eye-opening trip to Birchwood, Cody had spent a few minutes with Alessandro asking if it would be possible for him to learn to manage his powers rather than ultimately have to choose between giving them up completely or living with them as they were. The latter future felt like a difficult one to face since the boy currently had to wear a headset whenever he wanted to be sure he wouldn't accidentally move something with his powerful but unfinessed ability of telekinesis, to say nothing of the intrusive foreign thoughts that often bombarded him via his similarly unrefined power of telepathy. Continuing to wear the conspicuous headset he had been forced to wear most of the time prior to his liberation, meanwhile, would not only bring back painful memories, but also rule out ever going under the radar as a normal boy. None of these had ever been concerns until very recently, 
and one part of Cody's mind recognized this and felt glad to be having them. After all, the prospect of any kind of normal life had never felt remotely within his grasp. The conspicuousness of the headset had similarly never been a concern when the only people he met were the guards and analysts who knew all about his uniqueness, and the fact that Cody had been alone in his sparse quarters almost all of the time ensured there were rarely any thoughts to overhear or any unrooted objects to accidentally move around. Alessandro replied very honestly to Cody's questions about what might be possible with the straightforward answer that he simply didn't know. The Italian suggested that directing these questions to Piper, or perhaps Melly, might provide a better answer, but did go as far as to state that he thought a tempering of Cody's powers should prove to be an alternative option to a total block. These are probably things to start thinking more deeply about next week, my friend, Alessandro concluded. The boy nodded. I think so too. It was just seeing Piper at home. Seeing the life she's had, even with the powers? I want something like that. If I have to get rid of them to be happy, I will. But part of me thinks it would be dangerous in case there's ever another transcript we have to read or another pulse to stop, you know? Maybe they could be temporarily disabled or something? I just wish I didn't have to choose between a normal life and keeping some of the powers that are letting me help all of you. I know that if I didn't have them, I wouldn't be here. I'd just be some kid for you all to look after. Alessandro all of a sudden felt very much out of his depth and out of his element, as he tended to be when any kind of emotional discussion arose, even with another adult. When the vulnerable-sounding individual on the other end of the conversation was a child, Piper aside, something akin to another species with which Alessandro had far less experience than he did the messengers from another world, things were even more challenging. I just wish I didn't have to wear this, the boy said, removing his headset and holding it outwards. A pen shot off the surface of Alessandro's desk when Cody did this, only serving to underline his lack of fine control when it came to the miraculous telekinetic uplift power that swelled within him. I'm really sorry, he said. Sometimes it's when I move my hands like this, without even meaning, Ouch! a voice called from the doorway. Alessandro and Cody both turned to see Aiden McCarthy on the ground, rubbing his elbow in fortunately moderate pain, having been unintentionally knocked a very short distance into a wall by the force of Cody's telekinetic wave while walking by on his way to the bathroom. Are you okay? Tara asked. When she caught up with Aiden at the doorway and saw that he wasn't seriously hurt, however, her focus quickly shifted as she looked in and noticed Cody standing frozen in regret with his arm extended. Wait. The boy snapped his arm down to his side. I didn't mean to hurt him, he insisted. So it was you? Tara demanded. You knocked him down? Tara, Alessandro began in what he intended as a calming tone. He said he didn't mean it. Why aren't you wearing the headset? She continued, ignoring Alessandro and now walking towards them with a protective purpose that seemed to match her accusatory tone. I didn't mean it, Cody repeated, all but yelling the words this time. Put his headset back on him, she ordered Alessandro, speaking over Cody's head as she neared. While Alessandro hesitated, the frightened boy raised a bald fist and prepared to extend it outwards, at which point the Italian grabbed the headset from his other hand and put it in place to block the telekinetic outburst he correctly sensed was coming. Alessandro then wrapped his arms around Cody's chest, no more tightly than necessary to stop the boy from struggling free. Let me go! Cody yelled, thrashing his head towards Alessandro's chin as though he'd been held like this before and knew the best tricks for getting free. What the hell is going on in here? Chip Petrovich's concerned voice then boomed as he arrived seconds ahead of Carrick and Serena, who, like him, had made a beeline for the control deck as soon as they heard the initial commotion. Chip hurried towards Cody and took over from the highly uncomfortable Alessandro, providing arms of comfort rather than restraint. The boy acted accordingly, leaning his head gently into Chip's chest instead of thrashing it around. What's going on? Tara echoed rhetorically. With her eyes fixed on Cody, she then replied to Chip with some very terse words. 
I'm starting to see that the problem you guys brought here when we were gone isn't rogue. E-70, Zhongna Hai, Beijing, China. Ding Ziyang, the quiet but highly effective premier who had led China through the entire period of humanity's engagement with extraterrestrials, had been outlasting American presidents since before Valerie Slater even ran for the job. Almost 20 years later, the departure of Ding's least favorite yet, Nick Mason, was cause for relief rather than celebration. The early efforts of Mason's successor to walk back into the ICA were very good news for the ICA community, Ding recognized, but the level of unilateral access to Dan McCarthy she had apparently already secured was a cause for fairly significant concern. Ding and the McCarthys had navigated crises together in the past, but those days of Dordelu Tepe and everything that ran alongside that remarkable site's discovery now felt like they belonged to a history as ancient as the pillars and etchings themselves. Now, with Vasquez apparently having taken a phone call from Dan within hours of assuming her new role, and Ding's phone still silent despite global media speculation that something major about the vault could be announced at any moment, the illusion of a level playing field was fading. Diane Logan, meanwhile, was continually opting to take a lower profile than Ding could ever understand, despite the vault's presence within her national territory, offering a natural reason to keep herself in front of the cameras. Just as importantly, to his mind, it could have offered Logan an easy way to keep herself at the forefront of the public's alien-related consciousness at a time when some well-connected Western journalists believed William Godfrey might be set to vacate his chairmanship before too much longer. With routine surveillance of the Il Tricatori space station telling Ding's staff that no craft had either arrived or left all day, at least in a conventional manner, the explosion in activity on the ground in Scotland seemed more than a little ominous. The reality was that Ding Ziyang simply didn't know what he didn't know, with the presence of 24 architects in the Scottish ground as far from his current sphere of knowledge as the McCarthy family's presence back in Birchwood. But as events rolled along and certain other kinds of long, fruitless surveillance methods began to bear fruit, it wouldn't be too long until Ding's scientists spotted something very consequential before even Godfrey and the McCarthys. E-69, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. Enough! Serena Cruz boomed, quite literally interjecting herself between Tara and the unsettled-looking Cody. Can't you see he's scared? You're not helping! Tara, for her part, wore a scowl which very much fit the angry words she had thrown at Chip about Cody being a problem. You weren't here, she snapped, her anger squarely pointed at the younger but equally fiery Serena. He pushed my son into the wall with his powers, and then he was about to use them on me before Alessandro put that thing back on his head. Do you think that's okay? I have a baby here. Conspicuous by their absence were William Godfrey, and even more so Clark McCarthy, both of whom were fetching food from the canteen and thus well out of earshot. Particularly in regard to Clark, this was probably for the best. I didn't mean to hurt Aiden, Cody reiterated. But you were about to hurt me? Tara contended. Cody gulped. You were scaring me. Belatedly, and with the group's speaking volume having returned back to normal, Godfrey and Clark arrived with the food Alessandro had requested when they asked if they could get him anything to remove the need for him to take his eyes off his various telescope tracking feed for even a single second. The bizarre scene that greeted them in the control deck suggested that the Italian physicist's eyes had been away from his screen for considerably longer than that, while the look on Terra's face told Clark he wasn't walking in on anything positive. What happened? Godfrey asked. Several voices answered at once, with Terra's and Serena's proving each other's chief competition for Godfrey's focus. Having heard enough to piece together enough of a picture of the incident to know it was over, and that the problem now was the potential fallout, Godfrey asked everyone except Alessandro to be quiet. 
As if the moment hadn't already been uncomfortable enough for him, the no-win situation in which the conflict shy Italian now found himself was his idea of a nightmare. As neutrally as he could, Alessandro relayed that Cody had knocked Aiden down by accidentally engaging his powers and then tried to hold back the approaching Terra by deliberately engaging them. Hold me back? Terra challenged incredulously. He could have been going to do anything for all we know. Upon hearing this, Godfrey turned towards Cody, and more precisely to Chip, who was still comforting him. From now on, the headset stays on unless he's talking to Rogue, the ICA chairman announced. And it's a good job Rogue is busy preparing his craft's inner chambers for later. Cody, I hope you understand now that you cannot use your powers against anyone on this station, and you cannot threaten to either. This is very serious, and I'm very disappointed. Cody looked to the ground. I'm very disappointed in both of you, Godfrey went on, aiming these words at Terra. One of you should know better than to use your powers in such a way, and the other should know better than to snap at a child who's already dealing with a lot of changes. What about my child who just got thrown into a wall? She protested. It doesn't really look like he was thrown, Clark said, checking Aiden's slightly reddened elbow and seeing no sign of concern. He came to regret the comment almost immediately when Tara shot a deathly look his way, one that seemed to ask whose side he was on without any need for words, but could do nothing to take it back now. Everyone just take a breath and clear out of here for a few minutes, Godfrey diplomatically suggested. We'll come back in five minutes and feel like this didn't happen. But Cody, this cannot happen again. We're your friends and you're safe here, but there will be consequences if you ever turn your powers on one of our group again. Is that clear? The boy nodded weakly, looking very regretful. Tara was meanwhile staring a hole through Godfrey, as though challenging him to threaten her in a similar manner. And I expect more from you, he said, his tone flat. That's all. Emma certainly wouldn't behave like this. Godfrey then walked away, and if Emma had been there, she would likely have been alone in recognizing a diversion tactic that was simultaneously somewhat Machiavellian and somewhat selfless. For, as Godfrey walked away, and exactly as he intended, Tara's internal ire was suddenly directed squarely at him rather than Cody. Cody himself was next to speak, breaking a silence that followed Godfrey's surprisingly barbed comment. Aiden, I'm sorry, he choked out. The younger boy, standing by his father, didn't fully understand everything that was happening and wasn't even aware that it was an accidental burst of what he knew of as Cody's special powers that knocked him elbow first into the wall. It's okay, he said certainly more relaxed about the broader incident than his mother. Alessandro Bonucci, sensing with a great deal of relief that things were finally calming down and that his unwanted moment as a conflict resolution assistant was over, looked back at his computer and was equally relieved to see that nothing had changed in the longest period he had gone without a check within the past few hours. Tara left the room with a great deal of frustration a few moments later, still irked by Godfrey's comments and perturbed that her concerns over what had been a fairly scary moment in Cody's crosshairs had been summarily dismissed. To her surprise, the first person to follow after her was Serena Cruz. E-60 E-68, Ford McCarthy Residence, Birchwood, Colorado after a few hours in her home office, which hadn't been used for all that much in recent years, Emma McCarthy fell right back into the flow of things as if she'd never been away. Collating the most impactful images and footage at the group's disposal was an important part of her pre-event preparation. Beyond these choices of which to use, though, the work on that side of things fell upon Trey Myers. Trey was currently well on his way to Birchwood, having answered Clark's call to drive from Dallas even more quickly than he had a few weeks earlier. Back then, the purpose of his trip had been safely and discreetly bringing Serena Cruz into the fold 
following her discovery of a very different piece of footage that had already been seen around the world. But now, unlike that video of the first pulse hitting Thurso, which was captured from the unique vantage point of a passing falcon, nothing Trey was working on had yet hit any public airwaves. Trey was a passenger, rather than a driver on this occasion, with his wife agreeing to take the wheel so he could spend the journey working busily on editing and arranging everything Emma sent him. Everyone in the group trusted Trey as much as they trusted each other and as much as they trusted themselves. So flawless was his track record of protecting secrets for the public good whenever it was necessary to do so. So no one had any qualms about his access to even the most remarkable of footage several hours before anyone else would see it. Judging by the comments he had made in their occasional phone calls, Emma knew that Trey so far believed the most explosive footage to be that captured inside the Scottish Vault's so-called source room, which housed no fewer than 24 dormant architects. The order of the presentation Trey was putting together gave him a hint that this was the piece de resistance, even though they hadn't talked explicitly about everything Emma was going to announce, and Trey could easily understand why it was being saved for last. It wasn't necessarily a case of saving the best for last, he figured, since for anyone of a moderately nervous disposition, the sight of so many scary-looking aliens might be among the worst things they could imagine, but everything that came before served to gradually soften what could otherwise have been a harsh final blow. Trey was personally troubled most by the short video which unequivocally implicated Nick Mason in Timo Fiori's poisoning. One thing Emma did explain following his understandable question about what the otherwise contextless images from an ICA gala meant and why one particular delegate was so suspiciously milling around. Trey's question actually served to make Emma think it would be worth including the security recording in which Mason talked the Honduran delegate through the plan, and with that in mind, the first of the broad sections she was planning felt all but complete. For the good of his own state of mind, and consequently his productivity during this short and urgent period, Trey didn't know anything whatsoever about the rapidly approaching megaship which had spurred Emma into this preemptive attempt to calm public nerves in the first place. A live video feed to Alessandro Bonucci's main spot in the station's control deck appeared on Emma's screen several times throughout the day, but on no occasion did the Italian have anything tangible to report in regard to the incoming craft. With no servers currently tracking it, Emma was operating with a strong feeling that no news was good news on that front, at least for the moment, and Alessandro explicitly stated that very sentiment during her third check-in. By the time early evening rolled around and Trey was drawing close to Birchwood, everything was in place for the presentation. This included logistical matters relating to a screen and sound system in the old drive-in lot, as well as all of the necessary elements around public security and crowd management. A very short, text-only post in the late afternoon was the only public statement made about the event, set for 8 p.m., but it only took minutes for the word to spread far and wide and for the drive-in to be awash with visitors. Emma wisely alerted the always cooperative local police force before the public announcement, enabling them to make some of the most important preparations before the area got too busy. The drive-in was far from quiet, even before this, with several news crews already in town due to the current prominence of alien-related news and some living in hope that President Vasquez's comments about the McCarthy's intention to reveal something might have been leading to just this kind of throwback event at the drive-in. Those reporters who had taken their chance ahead of time would enjoy the best view of all, but citizens all around the world would hear and see every little thing that the family was set to reveal. The time for keeping things from the public for their own good ended when something very bad was heading their way and no meaningful plan existed to deal with it, Emma felt, and she was far from alone in holding that position. In this regard, she had always felt like there was a delicate balance to be struck between seeking public input on difficult challenges, effectively crowdsourcing creative solutions, in a sense, and, as far as possible, seeking to avoid unnecessary public alarm. There was no textbook for any of this, and with every new discovery came a judgment call about how quickly and how fully it should be most responsibly disclosed. 
The sheer imminence of the engineer's arrival had decisively tipped that balance, and Emma's promise that a non-specified discovery would be announced was met with enough fanfare to give her hope that someone out there might have a potential solution that she and the others were missing. The afternoon announcement went down as well as Emma could have hoped, and everything seemed to be going well. Just as she was reflecting upon this welcome direction of travel, however, all such thoughts were interrupted by a sudden knock on their front door. Who could that be? Piper asked from the living room. Dan leapt to his feet. I have no idea. E-67, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. Hold up, Serena Cruz called. Tara glanced back over her shoulder. For what? I'm sorry if I was sharp, the young woman replied, evidently there to de-escalate rather than coming to continue their standoff as Tara had expected. I didn't mean to be. I didn't see what happened before I arrived, you're right, but I saw Cody's face, that's all. I think some good can come of this if he hears what Godfrey told him and if Chip reinforces it, but I really don't want to start anything between us. No, Tara said with a brisk shake of her head. I mean, I'm sorry too. There's nothing between us. It was just a heat of the moment thing. Same for Cody, I guess. It's just his powers raise the stakes for things like that. Serena nodded in understanding. I think the thing we always have to remember is that he's never been socialized. He's never been loved. He's never spent a single moment with someone younger or weaker than him. The headset is a sensible precaution, but hopefully in time he won't need it. I don't have kids, but I do have a bunch of younger brothers, so I understand why you got protective and didn't see anything else back then. But for all that Cody's been through, he's doing okay, Tara. When he says he didn't mean it and Alessandro backs that up, I don't have any trouble believing it. I know. It's just that I know he meant it when he held his fist up at me, Tara replied, talking as quietly as Serena had in the collective bid to ensure Cody definitely wouldn't hear their conversation. But I hear you, and I think Chip will drill this into him, so some good might come of it, like he said. Serena smiled. Say, Carrick and I have been talking about what exactly we can do to help around here, and the list isn't exactly a long one, but I really want to find Cody's mom. I think that could be good for him, especially if it turns out she was forced to give him up or something like that. There's bound to be a trail somewhere, and we know how good Chip is at stuff like that, so we'll maybe mention it to him. He can ask Cody if he would want to know any more about where he came from, and if he does, we can help. Tara didn't say anything. With a hostile alien spacecraft the size of the moon hurtling towards them, this didn't seem like the most pressing matter. She even wondered whether Serena was perhaps latching onto it as something that could be within her control, as people often did to seek comfort when a larger and harder-to-tackle problem presented itself. I was adopted, and I never got to know, Serena said, saying a lot with just a few words. Oh, Tara replied. Serena raised her eyebrows. Yeah, this isn't about trying to play it out for myself or anything, though. I just always used to wish there had been someone who could have helped me find either of my real parents. I don't care now since I made it okay, but there was a long time when I would have given anything for someone to help me. And I get that Cody's deal is different when he kind of came from Dan, but we know he didn't grow in a test tube like those architects. So there has to be someone out there. We can definitely mention it to Chip, Tara smiled. It's nice that you want to help. I do wish there was something bigger we could do, Serena sighed. You know, in terms of this whole engineer's thing, but this could be big for Cody if he cares about it. I know it would have been huge for me. Tara nodded. Yeah, but don't be so sure there's not going to be something else you guys can help with, because if the last couple of weeks have taught us anything... It's that there's always going to be something to search for. E-66, Ford McCarthy Residence, Birchwood, Colorado. As Dan rushed to check the security camera display in the kitchen to see who was at the front door, all apprehension faded when his longtime neighbor, Mr. Bird's gentle face filled the screen. Clearly having decided to visit from just across the street, as soon as he had reason to believe the McCarthys were home, 
Mr. Bird looked happy to see them before he even did. Dan hurried to the door and welcomed the old man inside. Within a matter of seconds of the door being open, Mr. Bird's feet were inside and his arms were around Dan. Oh, is it good to see you, he stated. How is everyone doing, Tara and the baby? Dan led Mr. Bird into the living room, where Piper joined him to fill their friendly old neighbor in on the group's current status. They certainly left things out in favor of focusing on the positives, chiefly the safe arrival of little Liam and the fact that Timo was still alive on the other side of the gate, albeit still dying as the toxin did its work, and Mr. Bird was both aware and grateful of their tact. I know you wouldn't be down here, and especially that Emma wouldn't be going back to the drive-in if there wasn't something big to say, he mused, leaving it there in accordance with the tacit understanding that a temporary don't-ask-don't-tell kind of policy was appropriate for their current situation. Mr. Bird stayed for dinner, which he offered to prepare in the family's kitchen while they all got themselves ready for the evening ahead. Always enthusiastic to help, he peeled, chopped, and steamed, while listening to the TV news as talking head after talking head speculated wildly about what kind of revelation might be enough to have drawn the McCarthys back to Birchwood for a public announcement at such short notice. When dinner was ready and Piper didn't respond to Mr. Bird's call, Dan knocked on her bedroom door. He then opened it with a mild and short-lived feeling of concern when she didn't react to that sound either, but what he saw both explained her obliviousness and eased his broader concerns about how his daughter might fare in what amounted to her debut as a public-facing member of Earth's first family of extraterrestrial relations. Piper was standing in front of her full-length mirror, noise-canceling headphones on her ears while she appeared to be practicing facial expressions and gestures. Dan saw then that her computer was playing a video of one of Emma's famous speeches from the same stage they would all be standing on little more than an hour later. Still unnoticed by the highly focused Piper, Dan found his eyes flitting between her face and the one on the computer screen. The footage was from 16 years earlier, making it two years older than Piper herself, and the mother-daughter resemblance was more striking than ever. With the video of Emma's old speech playing as reference material, Dan realized that the night's particularly heightened resemblance was no accident. Piper had done her hair exactly like Emma's style from those days, and when she eventually turned round, humorlessly startled by Dan's unannounced presence at the door, he belatedly saw that the imitation extended to what she was wearing, too. Dan felt like he'd stepped into the path of a full-on nostalgia bomb when he saw the t-shirt, which sported the Now, Now, Now slogan of the Now movement Emma had made world famous, back in the halcyon days when their biggest enemy had been Richard Walker, rather than a seemingly unstoppable race of devious engineers and the gargantuan craft that was currently carrying them to Earth at a breakneck pace. What do you think? Piper asked with an uneasy expression, lifting the headphones from her ears as soon as she noticed Dan standing there. Too much? No such thing, he replied. It's perfect. Piper smiled. Responding to a loud call from Emma about dinner, which Dan had almost forgotten was the reason he'd come to get her in the first place, she then headed out towards the kitchen with him. Emma's eyes widened when she saw the hairstyle and outfit Piper had picked out. For a second it looked to Piper as though her reaction could go either way, but Dan was never in any doubt. No half measures, huh? Emma grinned. I love it. When a big part of the idea here is to give people some comfort with a sense of continuity to help them process what we have to tell them, this is perfect. It's uncanny, Mr. Bird beamed as he dished up the light dinner he had prepared. Once their plates were empty, including a rare second helping for Piper's nervously hungry stomach, there wasn't long left until 8 p.m. A countdown on the TV screen made this clear, and the live scenes from the nearby drive-in made it equally clear that the people were ready. Trey Myers was now in position in a front-row spot Emma had asked the police to reserve, as thanks for his crucial role in preparing the video elements of a presentation that was now complete and safely placed on a memory card she would link up to the lot's giant screen on arrival. 
when it finally came time to make the short trip from their residential street towards the edge of their small town, the family and their close neighbor were all stunned by the cacophonous sound that met their ears as soon as Dan opened the front door. It really was like old times, with the whirring of a news copter and the general hubbub of human excitement all making their way across the town in a manner Piper had never experienced and the others had almost forgotten. I hope it sounds as upbeat as this when you've said your piece, Mr. Bird commented. Until now, the old man had been completely content to avoid getting into that too much, happy to enjoy a calm before the storm reunion, free from concerns that were going to impose themselves before long. And, much like the group's decision to keep issues relating to Rogue and Cody from Terra and Clark immediately after their dramatic return to the station, everyone had seen the merit in this. Now, however, those concerns were suddenly imposing themselves quite firmly. This isn't going to be the easiest message to manage, Emma admitted with a tone the others couldn't help but note as being uncharacteristically hesitant. But if I know one thing, Mr. Bird, it's that there's nowhere better to try. E-65, Security Cordon, Thurso, Scotland The sudden flurry of activity on the other side of the cordon tells us that something seems to be happening in the field above the vault. An excited Scottish reporter spoke into the camera in front of him, raising his voice to a borderline shout in order to be heard over the countless others all around him. But the recent announcement from Emma McCarthy tells us that something is definitely happening in Birchwood, Colorado. Comments from William Godfrey and new U.S. President Ana Vasquez point to that being no coincidence if the timing didn't already, and it wouldn't come as a surprise to many of us here in Thurso if the McCarthys are soon revealing exactly what's been found in the ground just a few miles away from where we're standing right now. This busiest section of the cordon was in the middle of the main road into Thurso, which ultimately led to Colin Fraser's coastal farm on the edge of the town, but recent events meant that the road closures caused little disruption. There was, after all, little left to disrupt. What with the pulses having left Thurso itself looking like an out-of-place tornado had torn its way through a bomb factory. The rebuilding job would be a long and hard one, but far more possible than it would have been if one more unconstrained pulse had hit. This was because a single additional doubling of the flattened area would have hugely increased the number of people rendered homeless, due to that near-miss zone, including northern Scotland's two largest settlements by far in the shape of Inverness and Aberdeen. A signal from the cameraman then told the reporter that it was time to cut, and a sudden increase in movement among the already restless mass of other media personnel suggested that they had heard the same news. I'm being told the time is now, the reporter said. So, from one small town to another, from the current epicenter of alien activity to the original, we'll hand over now to live and uninterrupted coverage from Birchwood, Colorado, where Dan McCarthy, along with his immediate family, is set to address the world from the famous drive-in for the first time in well over a decade. We'll be back here in Thurso for reactions and further live developments as soon as things wrap up in Birchwood. But for now, here they are. Seconds later, and without any remote controls having to be touched, hundreds of millions of citizens in countless countries were looking for the first time in a long time at a makeshift stage at the Birchwood Drive-In. And one way or another, no one was in any doubt that something big was coming. Part 3. Debutante The words of truth are simple. Aeschylus. E-64. Drive-in, Birchwood, Colorado. Electricity filled the air around the Birchwood drive-in as a police cordon parted to allow the McCarthy's car to reach the edge of the lot. The noise that met the family's ears as they stepped out with their longtime friend and neighbor, Walter Bird, positively dwarfed the already uproarious sound they had heard from home. It was like being front row at a rock concert and in terms of the level of attention she was receiving, Piper McCarthy already felt like she was center stage. 
The limelight was never something the girl had craved, or even something she had felt comfortable about the prospect of one day stepping into, but recent events, and one very recent discovery, had changed everything. Despite the public having been terrified by the recent return to Earth of an architect mothership some thirteen years after what everyone had hoped would be its final visit, its quick departure, and William Godfrey's subsequent proclamation that the world was no longer at risk of any further pulses, had done much to ease citizens' concerns. A well-received call for unity from the newly inaugurated President Vasquez further calmed tensions both within her country and further afield, and as the McCarthys walked through an adoring hometown crowd towards their waiting stage, there was a warm buzz about the whole event. Emma had left Dan and Piper under no illusions in stating that their goal here was simply to limit the societal damage of the inevitable revelation that a hostile craft which made Rogue's mothership look like a child's toy was currently heading straight for Earth and would arrive in just a week's time. There was no way anyone in the crowd was going to leave the drive-in happy, she said, nipping any such hope in the bud right away. But a carefully managed announcement could at least ensure most would leave in an orderly fashion and head home rather than stampede their way to clear supermarket shelves of essential items, as had been the case too many times when panic reared its head. Emma forced a smile as she led her family towards the entrance of New Care Grillin Bar and Grill, where the stairway to a makeshift scaffold-like stage she had stood upon many times in the distant past remained in place as a tourist attraction. Trey Myers reached forward from the crowd and gladly took the memory card Emma held towards him, insisting there was no need for any thanks for his role in editing the video footage into appropriately focused clips before she arranged them within the broader slideshow. In exchange, he handed her the small remote control which would flick between slides as and when necessary, just like it had during events gone by. The nostalgia was very real as Emma climbed the stairs, flooding over her more and more with each successive step. At the top, when she caught sight of crowds stretching as far as the eye could see, and even at the crest of Hawker's Hill, it almost became too much. Game face, Piper said, nudging her mother gently in the side when she noticed what looked like an uncharacteristic bout of hesitation kicking in. Piper then unzipped her jacket to reveal the now, now, now t-shirt she had chosen for the occasion, smartly buying Emma a few seconds to compose herself and simultaneously drawing supportive hollers and applause. It only took a few seconds for the crowd members' spontaneous individual reaction to settle into a familiar but long unheard chant of Truth, Truth, Now, 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 Truth, Truth, Now, 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 Truth, Truth, Now, Now, Now. Like Piper, many in the crowd who were chanting this famous old slogan had been too young to understand anything that was happening around the time of its creation, and in many cases hadn't even been born. The fact that everyone knew the chant so well spoke volumes about the continued cultural penetration of Dan and Emma's drive-in appearances of well over a decade earlier. In turn, this reminded Emma once more of how consequential their words could be in a generally cynical world where people had come to trust them far more than almost any other public figures. Emma picked up one of the three collar-mounted microphones that had been left in place at her request and stepped forward to the edge of the stage. Truth! Truth! Now, now, now! The crowd yelled supportively. Truth! Truth! Now, now, now! Okay, Emma thought to herself. But don't say you didn't ask for it. It's good to be home, Emma began with a smile, not above going for a cheap cheer from the crowd. Right here in Birchwood, Colorado. Unsubtle or not, the words were certainly effective. The predictable support of this crowd was actually an important factor, however, and one that had very much informed Emma's decision to handle things in this very public manner, rather than from the safe distance of the Il Circatore space station. Emma had made a strategic decision not to make a live feed from either her microphone or the lot's sound system available to any media outlets, which ensured that the crowd's reactions would be heard along with the revelations that brought them about. She fully trusted the experienced Trey to have the sound mix set up appropriately for everything important to be heard, 
just as she had trusted him with much of the highly sensitive information she was about to make public for the first time. Some basic tenets of media and crowd psychology played into Emma's choice of doing things this way. In the same way that a sitcom's laugh track was designed to elicit a similar reaction in the viewer, a series of supportive and measured reactions here would increase the chances of people at home remaining as level-headed as possible about the news they were about to hear. Similarly, and in the same way receptive hometown audiences were usually chosen by comedians as the ones to perform in front of when filming their TV specials, Emma always knew the best reaction she could hope for, whether the news was good or bad, would come in Birchwood. The revelations that were coming would do so in a carefully considered order, following a logical path that Emma's well-honed instincts for message management and damage limitation saw as the optimal one for maximizing the chance of them being received without causing any avoidable harm. Avoidable was a key word, and one she had kept in mind during some of the long day's planning stages when the perfect had sometimes felt like the enemy of the good. In a situation like this, not that there had ever been one, Emma had to remind herself that perfect was an illusion that she would only drive herself crazy by pursuing. The considerations here were similar to those behind her expectations setting assertions to Dan and Piper that their goal was to break the news of the engineer's approach in the least damaging way possible, since there was no truly good way to do such a thing. In any event, the stage was set, and there was no time like the present. Without any further ado, Emma hit her remote to bring up the first slide. Pantomime-like boos filled the air as Nick Mason filled the screen. Something unsettling has emerged since Chairman Godfrey addressed the world from Thurso, Emma began. There was no accident in her decision to begin with the words, something unsettling, expectation setting at work once again, and there was likewise no accident in beginning with Mason. And if Nick Mason was still in charge, we wouldn't be standing here telling you as much as we're going to. The attentive crowd was quiet now, with no obvious reaction on their tongues to match the cheers and boos with which Emma's previous comments had been met. Unsurprised by this silence, Emma continued. Mason has done worse things than any of you know about yet, but one thing he's done for the past few years is make my daughter feel unsafe in her own skin. There are things we've always felt like we had to keep from you because of people like Nick Mason, but I'm sure you'll all come to see that the crimes we've recently found out he has committed are vindication for our vigilance. Clicking to the next slide, Emma raised a hand to call for continued silence as the crowd watched and listened in shock to first-hand evidence that Mason had ordered Timo Fiori to be poisoned. The only sounds coming from the crowd were gasps and muttered curses in Mason's direction. Timo is dying, Emma stated, sharing with the world a revelation that would ordinarily have been the biggest news in any given year, but today, tragic and heartbreaking as it was, was merely a context-setting pretext for what was still to come. His blood is going to be on Nick Mason's hands, but Mason and his associates have done things in the realm of uplift research that are so evil and so sensitive that it's really not our place to reveal them today. It's very important to stress that he was acting in a private capacity in all of this and that people like Anna Vasquez are as shocked by these revelations as we are. But the broader point I want to make is that Dan and I have been shaped by our memories of living through personal attacks from the likes of Richard Walker and John Cole. Piper didn't experience any of that, but she has spent the last few years living in fear because of Mason's penchant for demonizing everything related to the messengers and their powers. No one in the crowd had clicked on to what Emma was getting at quite yet, but they didn't have long to wait. Piper is the reason we know Mason was involved in some illegal and sickeningly immoral uplift-related research at the prison in Wyoming, where you all know the ICA launched a ground operation a few days ago. We've had to live with the harmless secret that underlies all of this for too long, all because of people like Cole and Slater and Mason. But now that he's gone and the tide is finally turning towards unified cooperation in the field where it counts most, there's something our daughter would like to say. 
Some of the crowd cheered supportively as the girls stepped forward, while those who now felt like they had a good idea of what was coming next certainly weren't confident or rude enough to yell it out before Piper had a chance. Sporting her Now 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 t-shirt and looking more like a younger version of her mother than ever before, Piper turned back to Emma and Dan one last time as though making sure she had their support before she said the words she would never be able to take back. Piper looked out at the crowd, which was a mix of media personnel and Birchwood residents. She recognized more than a few faces from local stores and some from school, but even the strangers looked friendly. How friendly they would look a few moments later was a lot less certain, but Piper called upon a recent memory of when the British Prime Minister Diane Logan had taken news of the girls' specialness as far less explosive than any of the family would have predicted. Piper hoped it would be the same case here, and she trusted Emma's judgment that Birchwood was without question the best place for her to step proudly into the next stage of a life that she alone could lead. Framing it like this was definitely better for Piper than thinking about disclosing her gifts as coming clean, which might have been how it felt without Emma's wise and supportive perspective. The word gift was one Piper mulled over too, and there was great comfort in her desiccative reflection that wherever they'd ultimately originated, the powers she inherited from Dan were a gift from the friendly messengers. Only too often throughout her fourteen years on Earth had that gift felt more like a curse, but Piper had spent much of the past week or so reflecting on the undeniable reality that Earth would have been all but destroyed if that hadn't been in place and she hadn't been able to contain the twelfth and final pulse at its origin point in Thurso. My name is Piper McCarthy, she said, standing on the verge of the rest of her life. Following her mother's advice to show before she told, the girl then pointed her index finger towards Emma and pulled the small remote control towards herself. As mouths fell open and eyes widened for as far as hers could see, Piper casually flicked to the next slide. It contained a short video of her as a baby, recorded by a camera in her bedroom as she accidentally engaged her gift for the first time by telepathically attracting a glass photo frame that Clark had to intercept before it hurt her. And as I guess you can all see by now, I was born with the uplift powers. E-63, Departure Point, Space Station, Il Cercatore. When it came to judging how well things were going at the drive-in, most of the group on the station deferred to William Godfrey's politically and media-savvy instincts. Up to and including Piper's demonstration of her telekinetic power, the ICA chairman was thoroughly pleased with how Emma's carefully arranged presentation was playing out. The two had discussed a draft version not too long before the event began, so this came as little surprise, but Godfrey had been in the game long enough to know that it was often the unexpected little things that could derail the best laid plans. As it went, the crowd had so far been as supportive and receptive to prompts as anyone could have hoped, which vindicated Emma's bold decision not to isolate her trio's microphone output and pass it directly to the attendant news crews. If things had gone wrong, that could have seen her words drowned out by booze or worse, but when it went right, it ensured no nefarious or contrarian news agencies could mischaracterize the live crowd's reaction. More importantly, that reaction was likely to be contagious for the viewing public all across the world, and that was where the real genius in Emma's bold move lay. Very little time had passed between the initial idea of making an announcement at the drive-in first and the final decision to go ahead with such a plan, purely because of the speed with which the group's urgency had soared when the approaching engineer's craft both massively accelerated its pace of travel and revealed its hostile intent within a matter of seconds. A troubling situation had, at that point, become a desperate one, and one that required thinking outside of the box. Even if the presentation itself wasn't quite as outside the box as the group's simultaneous decision to clear the gestating architects from the vault without any further delay, a lifetime in politics ensured that Godfrey was never one to assume which course of action or which roll of the dice would bring the greatest return. 
The more delicate part of the presentation would come when the focus moved to the reasons the whole thing was happening, but they were sensibly arranged to crescendo with Rogue's live descent to Thurso, which meant there was no time for the members of the group who were making that trip to watch the rest of the presentation from the control deck. Rogue, Cody, and Chip were all going to Scotland, as everyone knew. But when Chip suggested they should probably start thinking about their final departure prep, a surprise voice spoke up to voice the speaker's desire, and indeed, his authoritative decision to go with them. That voice belonged to William Godfrey. Why? Chip asked, uttering the single word everyone else was thinking. The world is watching, Godfrey said. And Chip, with the greatest of respect, you're hardly the most comforting trio. My position brings some gravitas, if nothing else, and at a time when Emma has seen the need for a large serving of that in Birchwood, I think we should be looking to bring some to Thurso, too. And you know the spirit I'm saying this in. Chip shrugged, recalling a conversation he'd had with Clark earlier when the issue of architects bonding in relation to where Rogue seemed to be falling within the group's inherent chain of authority. He then wondered if Godfrey might be considering something beyond what he was letting on. Are you thinking about the way they seem to respect hierarchies? He asked. If they bond with Rogue and he has this habit of looking to Cody for answers, then Cody looks to me. Hmm. I wasn't, Godfrey mused. He then gave a light-hearted grin. But now that you mention it, I'm definitely going. E-62, Drive-In, Birchwood, Colorado As Piper McCarthy spoke, following a well-rehearsed script that took pains to clarify that she retained only limited powers of telekinesis and not telepathy, the expressions that met her words ranged from awestruck to uneasy. Even when the individual displaying them was a McCarthy, and indeed the particular McCarthy whose risky personal action in Thurso had quite literally saved the world, a great number of people were understandably unsettled to be in the presence of such power. This hadn't always been the case, as on previous occasions when a crowd had packed the drive-in while Leisha had stood next to Clark, and when an Argentine crowd had done similar. A lot of time had passed since the messengers had been able to walk freely on Earth, however, and the interim years had been filled with enough teeth-gnashing and anti-alien propaganda to make even reasonable observers have second thoughts about how close they wanted to get to anyone who possessed any of the alien powers. When the pulses started in Scotland, I felt them, and I told everyone who could benefit from knowing, Piper said. The first pulse stopped all of the uplift patches on the space station from working, and not even the messengers can use their powers up there. Not even reading transcripts. The pulses did something to the way the powers work on this side of the gate. For almost everyone. Although Emma had initially told the group of her plans to announce absolutely everything during this event, the one exception would be certainly things relating to Cody. She figured that would be the wrong kind of distraction, almost a red herring with little immediate impact on what was coming next, and for the boy's sake as much as anything else, she and the others decided not to mention him. For that reason, this section of Piper's remarks was the only part at which she had to be careful not to say the wrong thing. As per the slogan on her chest, Piper was telling the truth, and she was telling it now. But on this one topic, she was wisely taking care not to tell certain complicating and non-beneficial parts of it. We have some footage here from the drill shaft in Thurso, where we found the door that I managed to open with the key my dad picked up from the museum in Edinburgh. It cut out at the peak of the pulse when all the lights died, too, but you can see some of what happened. Behind Piper on the giant screen, footage captured by a camera inside one of the lift shaft's many inset light fixtures was playing to the highly intrigued crowd. It showed Piper positioning herself at the doorway, glitched as a result of the electrical surge that came with the pulse, and then returned to show her unconscious while Emma tried desperately to assist her and called for help. This wasn't easy for anyone to watch, and Emma's pained screams 
certainly weren't easy for anyone to listen to. Least of all Dan, who had hoped to never hear such a sound again in his life. But the inclusion of this snippet went a long way to reducing any fear members of the crowd had been feeling. Like the rest of the presentation, this didn't happen by accident, with Emma always thinking it was better to let a negative emotion come out and then supersede it with something else. The sadness the crowd felt for what they were watching was in itself a negative emotion, of course, but it wasn't a detrimental one, and Emma considered this difference far more than semantic. I was able to put a force field around myself and the pulse, Piper explained, and fortunately, I was close enough to the source for that to work. That very moment was when I had a strange vision of a landscape that we eventually managed to narrow down as the prison in Highville, Wyoming, where it turns out illegal uplift research was being conducted on Mason's behalf. The human test subject he was exploiting is now safe on the station and cooperating with us on everything. That's the reason Mason fled. We don't just have proof of what he's done. We have the victim he did it to. Looks of disgust now crossed every face in the crowd. If those in attendance had known the victim in question was a child, who Mason's associates had furtively cloned from Dan's temporarily uplifted DNA, there was no telling what kind of furious revulsion would have been expressed. With Emma having gotten things rolling for Piper to step in with her demonstration of telekinesis and explanation of the prison raid in Highville, it was now ICA Chief Planetary Liaison Dan McCarthy's turn to address the crowd. As he got set to lead his well-primed audience through the most frightening revelations yet, Dan couldn't help but be transported back to all the bygone times when Emma had laid everything out for him in an idiot-proof manner, just like she had today. Her attention to detail and focus on the optimal order of things to elicit the desired emotional responses were always unmatched, and as the most inherently scary parts of the necessary presentation loomed ever nearer, Dan was very glad of that. Once the vault's door was open, we looked inside. Dan said. Piper handed him the remote control, enabling him to flick to the next slide, which showed the vast expanse of the vault's first chamber. But we weren't the only ones exploring a vault. When Dan tapped the remote again, Billy Kendrick and a mixed human messenger team of archaeologists filled the screen. Thanks to Billy and his team's expedition, we recently found out that almost all of New Kerguelen was destroyed by pulses thousands of years ago, Dan explained. The same kind of pulses from the same kind of vault. But when Billy went inside, he found this. Dan gulped as he hit the button one more time, bringing forth what was perhaps the most harrowing image of all, one which showed human and messenger skeletons alike, littering the ground like discarded bones at an abattoir. New Kerguelen's great shelter protected the messengers, and we know that the architects who built that shelter also built the vaults and set the pulses in motion. But what we found out deeper inside the Scottish vault is that the architects aren't what we thought. You all saw the mothership arriving over Scotland, and I'm sure you're all wondering what happened. Well, the same architect who connected with me in New York 13 years ago came back, and he came back because we called him back. Gasps came in reaction to these words, along with a few unkind words from the first hecklers of the evening. Dan shook them off, endeavoring to plow through what he always knew was going to be the toughest part of the presentation. The screen changed to show the radio-like elder the group had found further into the vault. None of you will be able to read the transcript, Dan said. But Mason's work with the uplift powers ironically meant that we were able to. It warned of an imminent final release, which we obviously worried was a warning of another pulse. The three artifacts we gathered had gotten us this far into the vault, but the only way to get any further was for an architect's hand to unlock the next door, and the only way we could get access to one of an architect was by using the radio. If we had been in contact with Billy at the time, if the gate hadn't been out of commission, I don't know what we would have done. But at this point, we didn't know the ancient architects had brought humans to New Kerguelen to test the pulses, and all we were trying to do was stop more pulses. The crowd were now on tenterhooks, wondering more than ever where this was all going to wrap up.
I've spoken about the incident in New York before, Dan continued. I've spoken about my perception that the architect I spoke to was a rogue, acting alone, and what I can tell you now, with 100% certainty, is that my perception was right. The same architect, rogue, came back and voluntarily helped us get into the final room of the vault. He didn't know what would be in there, and he hadn't been able to stop the pulses. But before I show the final images from the Scottish vault, I need to tell you what we've discovered. I need to tell you why we're standing here today. As Dan paused for a deep breath, Emma placed a supportive and unrehearsed hand on his shoulder. Dan didn't have to pretend to be troubled by what he was about to say, and it in fact took all of his resolve to get it out. We've known for a long time that the architects manipulated the messengers and programmed them from birth to fulfill specific roles. But what we learned inside the vault's final room is that the architects themselves are the genetically engineered creation of another race. And what Alessandro Bonucci just discovered via data from the heartbeat probe is that they're on their way to Earth. With his most hesitant button press yet, Dan then brought forth a still image of the craft in question. He didn't yet say it was bigger than the moon or disclose that it had destroyed the heartbeat probe since this image was captured, but the image alone was enough to strike fear in the heart of every member of the crowd and likely every TV viewer around the world. We don't know what they want, he said, but their craft materialized at the very moment Rogue helped us to repair the gate to New Kerguelen that had been broken by the final pulse. One theory is that this distant race has been compelled to interfere directly because they think we've reached a new point in our development. Perhaps we spooked them by successfully altering one of the gateways their robot-like lapdog architects created. The point is, we don't know. Another theory is that they now see Rogue as a threat since he's not doing his job of monitoring us because he lost contact with all of his kind and has slipped from his pre-programmed identity just like the vault transcript said they could. There are uncertainties, Emma interjected as rehearsed. Things were going reasonably well, and Dan had stuck to the script more closely than she had perhaps expected, but things that seemed clear and evident in her mind weren't coming across quite so neatly out loud. The biggest things had all gone right, with disclosure of Timo's poisoning and Piper's powers having their moments before quickly being superseded. The harrowing images from New Kerguelen's vault, however, were the one thing Emma was currently regretting having included. The idea had been to show that footage so that the gestating architects in Earth's vault wouldn't look so bad in comparison. But the image had been striking enough to elicit stronger visual reactions from the crowd than she had expected. Dan's attempts to position Rogue as an ally were commendable, but Emma was now worrying that it might not be enough. She recalled Clark's initial reaction to Rogue's presence on the station and reflected that unlike him, the general public didn't have direct access to Cody, who endlessly vouched for Rogue's trustworthiness, or, indeed, to the empath Melly, who likewise insisted the lonely architect had a warm aura and felt terrible for the sins of his ancestors. There are uncertainties, Dan echoed again as planned, before continuing through his own doubts. But what we now know is that the beings in this huge spaceship, who we're calling engineers, programmed the architects to do their bidding via imprinted identities suited to their specific roles. We learned that from transcripts in the vault. But the architects are grown in pods, like test tubes, and we also learned that each new batch bonds to the existing architect that lets them out. That architect is then supposed to imprint identities into each of the new batch using special transcripts, and as long as the bond is unbroken, They'll carry out their tasks unquestioningly, even when that involves genocide on a planetary scale, and all at the behest of the distant engineers whose motives we can only guess. Unfortunately, we have a clear reason to think they don't mean well. As Dan said this, he clicked to a slide which contained several images of the huge craft launching projectiles towards the heartbeat probe. A broad sense of foreboding met these images, as well as Dan's commentary, 
before he closed his eyes and clicked the button one final time. The reason I'm telling you this is that we now know the pulses were set in motion thousands of years ago to cleanse Earth in preparation for a batch of architects being released, he said. Video footage captured by Gio Nunes and his drones gave the stunned crowd a visual context of what Dan was talking about. Twenty-four huge aliens, suspended in sci-fi movie-worthy pods deep below the surface of Scotland. We think the engineers are coming to make sure Rogue doesn't raise these architects, Dan said. He has escaped his imprinted identity like someone might escape a cult, and any architects he releases will follow him instead of the demented engineers. Based on the roles the ancient architects were programmed to carry out on New Kerguelen, and even based on what Rogue told us about an early architect landing at Dortelu Tepe, we know the engineers fear the potential of human evolution. They programmed at least one batch of architects to counter the threat they think we posed, and now a new batch of architects is at the fingertips of one who resents his creators and is on our side. It's dangerous to make too many assumptions about what their perspectives might be like, but to my mind, this could explain why our cooperation with Rogue over the gate has made them appear and set their course for Earth. They don't want those architects to be here. We think that's why they're coming. For no deeper reason than Emma's hunch it would be best for the next words to come from a child, Dan turned to Piper for the punchline. The girl took a deep breath to psych herself up. And that's why Rogue is going to raise the architects from Thurso and take them far away from all of us, she said. Right now. E-61, Aerial Position, Thurso, Scotland Hovering higher than ever in the sky over Scotland, William Godfrey got his clearest view yet of the desolation caused by the pulses. Although he and the others hadn't seen anything of the inside of the giant architect mothership they were currently standing in, thanks entirely to Rogue having flashed them into a more familiar small craft that would soon emerge from the larger one to descend to the surface, Godfrey was in awe of the level of light it projected to the ground. This hadn't been evident from the ground in New York, where the glow of a thousand buildings and a million streetlights provided considerably more illumination than the handful of media spotlights and military vehicles stationed in and around Thurso, but the mothership was illuminating Thurso so totally that Godfrey imagined the lights must have been turned up higher than they ever had been before. Curious, he couldn't help but pass this question on to Rogue via Cody, when the answer came back that Rogue had indeed made it brighter in an effort to make the people on the ground less scared this time than when his arrival had cast them into shadow. Godfrey took it as yet another reminder, or indeed further confirmation, that the alien was nothing like the monsters who created him or even the ancient order followers of his kind. While the light issue hadn't been discussed, and was all of Rogue's own doing, he had been asked, and had readily agreed, to try to prevent his mothership from blocking all broadcast signals from the immediate vicinity like it had in the past, as well as allowing the group's cameras on the ground and later in the vault to send live images to the Birchwood Drive-In, this move also enabled Godfrey to keep tabs on developments at the drive-in via his phone's satellite-delivered internet service. Things were still rolling along relatively smoothly, although naturally the crowd had reacted with significant unease when the approach of the engineers and the group's apparent alliance with an architect had come up. Godfrey had seen that coming, though, just like Emma had, and what counted was ending things with the right kind of bang. Failing to raise the architects after the build-up Emma and Dan were giving the imminent attempt would be a blow for public confidence in their ability, and thus humanity's ability to tackle the issue of the engineers' seemingly relentless approach. That would be bad, Godfrey knew, but what would be far, far worse would be a success in raising the architects, but a failure in reining them in. There was no reason to expect such an outcome, given how clear the source room's transcript had supposedly been about the blank slate each architect was born with before an identity was imprinted, but being alone in a small spacecraft with only Rogue, Cody, and Chip Petrovich, it struck Godfrey that all they really had to base their understanding of that transcript on was a twelve-year-old boy's interpretation. 
Rogue had read it too, of course, but all Godfrey had to go on regarding his take also came via the intermediary of Cody. The boy was wearing his headset, as he would until they entered the vault, and as he had been since his unfortunate incident with Aiden and Tara McCarthy earlier in the day. But when he and Godfrey made some lingering eye contact, the ICA chairman got the distinct impression the boy knew, in a general and non-special sense, roughly what Godfrey was thinking about. It's all going to work out, Cody said, surprising Godfrey by reacting to his own pensive expression in this manner, rather than with an inquiring or perhaps even affronted question of his own. Trust me. Godfrey forced a grin. Time to go, rogue, he said, glancing at his phone and spotting what stage of the drive-in presentation the McCarthys had reached. We don't want to miss our cue. Like everything else, Rogue registered these words only when Cody silently sent them his way. Now, as well as far more generally, all William Godfrey and the rest of humanity could do was trust the incredible child. E-60, Drive-In, Birchwood, Colorado Rogue could have raised these architects without us as soon as he found them. Dan said, speaking off script and with a raised palm in an effort to calm some of the commotion that came when the screen behind him changed to a live feed from the ground in Thurso. Rogue's mothership was present in the sky, but had this time taken steps to ensure broadcast signals could still function beneath it. To Dan and his inner circle, this was yet another sign that the alien could and should be trusted every bit as much as the messengers, but it was clear that no such points would get through to the crowd. They needed something more. If we don't do anything, the engineer's current speed of travel would bring them here in a week, Emma solemnly announced. They're coming from the other side of the sun, and Alessandro expects them to pass it tomorrow, in a craft that's bigger than the moon. We didn't want that to happen without first letting you all know, but more importantly, we don't want that to happen at all. And if they're coming for the architects, if their issue is with them and Rogue, not us, then getting those architects far away from here is going to take us out of their crosshairs. Although she tried not to show it, Emma immediately wished she could take back that word, crosshairs, which had been such a commonly used one during the fear-driven days after the all-but-forgotten Argentine plaques had seemingly indicated Earth was a target for elimination by some distant race. Now that something like that could possibly be coming true after all, Crosshairs really was a word the public consciousness could do without. There's another possibility that I'll mention in the interest of having an adult conversation about the threat we might face, Emma continued. And that's that if these engineers were coming for us, if they've been disturbed by what they see as a developmental leap with our blocking of the final pulse and our repair of the gate, I would personally rather have Rogue on our side than not. We've seen his power firsthand, and for all we know, the engineers could be feeling like they've created a Frankenstein monster that's growing more powerful than they are. So, if that did turn out to be anywhere close to what's going on, I would personally also rather have 25 rogues on our side than just one. Wouldn't you? Although these words had most decidedly not been in the script, Dan and Piper were nodding. The more they had come to consider this point as the day wore on, after it was first raised on the station by Terra, the more they had come to think it was a very valid one. The Frankenstein's monster analogy struck them as a good one, too, and its strength appeared to have gotten through to many members of the crowd. The plan is for Rogue to awaken the architects in the vault and take them away in his mothership, Emma said. If the engineer craft doesn't stick to its course and doesn't become visible on this side of the sun tomorrow, we'll know they weren't interested in us or in Earth, just those architects who happened to be here. But if they keep coming and do pass the sun tomorrow, Rogue can bring the architects back if we want him to. Dan nodded. And there's going to be a much wider general we than there has been for the past two weeks, he said. We talked about Mason and how we had to keep things close to our chest because of his inflammatory reactions to everything Godfrey or I ever did, but we never wanted a monopoly on decision-making, because at every stage, Mason tried to shut down all ICA processes, and to be frank, we also couldn't trust his delegation with access, 
which, as you've seen with what he did to Timo, was a perfectly valid position. Although no one could disagree with this, Emma wasn't sure where Dan was taking it. But despite being very much out of practice, given the rarity with which he had addressed the ICA assembly or any other crowd in recent years, Dan was now a very comfortable speaker whose cadence and mannerisms were of a kind she would have described as natural if she hadn't been around in the early days when he used to shake with trepidation and stutter at the mere thought of having to go off script. It's hopefully going to be different now with Vasquez, he continued. And I'd like to think Ding Ziyang can be involved again, even if it's informally and not at the ICA. Whatever is going on here is a global challenge. We have friends on New Kerguelen who are always willing to help us in any way they can, and please believe me when I tell you we have a friend in Rogue. But what does it matter if we have friends from other planets if we insist on being enemies with each other? If the craft does keep coming, we stand together or we fall apart. Heads were nodding as Dan said this, his voice the most forceful anyone had heard it for many years. We stand together or we fall apart, he repeated, wisely and instinctively sensing the opportunity for a powerful and unifying soundbite. It wasn't quite as chantable or t-shirt worthy as the old truth, truth, now, 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 but it would do. And immediately, it drew applause from a previously terrified-looking crowd. I hope what Rogue is about to do gets us out of the engineer's thoughts, Dan said. But if it doesn't, and if their craft becomes visible to our telescopes tomorrow, this has to bring us together. Even if it's only for a week, there's no other way. Dad? Piper whispered, tapping his elbow. He turned to her and followed the tilt of her head towards the screen. On it, a small craft had appeared from Rogue's mothership. Here's to working together, Dan said, trying again to play the crowd. It worked again, with cheers and hollers coming from all angles, and given the level of risk inherent to what was about to happen in the vault, every last ounce of optimism was welcome. E-59, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland Under the eyes of a watchful world and the lights of the colossal mothership, three humans and a lone architect touched down in Thurso. For the first time in his various visits, William Godfrey was struck by the distant but still noticeable din of media personnel who had gathered at the nearest permissible point. This was a far cry from the oppressive silence that typically greeted him in Thurso, but he couldn't miss the irony that the local reporters near the scene were probably watching second-hand footage from the Birchwood drive-in to see what was going on. Cody pulled up his hood over his headset, at Chip's suggestion, and stuck close to his protector's side as they made the very short walk from the touchdown point at the edge of the safe zone in Colin Fraser's once ordinary field. Three other people popped out of the field's cabin to wave and offer their wishes of good luck, with the drillers Stevie and Davy looking slightly less uncomfortable than Gio Nunes. It would be Gio's task to make sure the descending quartet would be seen and heard, which involved monitoring the status of the cameras and microphones he had sent down, as well as the multitude of light-emitting drones and devices that would illuminate their path. The plan, as Gio understood it, was for Rogue to flash the group directly from the top of the drill shaft to the source room at the far end of the vault, thereby getting around the issue that the drill shaft was too small for him and saving an approximately eight-minute walk from one side of the vault to the other. Make sure you get everything, Godfrey called towards Geo. He sent an OK gesture along with the words and then turned it into a flat-handed wave to the dependable local drillers. Geo gulped. The closer the moment of truth came, the more pressure he felt to get things right. He was an archaeologist by trade and had come to master the use of his remote-controlled rover and the various kinds of drones it carried into the vault. But videography had never been something he claimed as within his competence. Over the course of the day, and in two short messages he didn't have any real chance to reply to, Geo's role had gone from keeping the lights on to keeping the lights on and making sure the cameras stayed running, all the way to making sure the cameras stayed running and that he shared the best live feed at any given time. 
The multitude of angles that would be available to him courtesy of the sheer number of camera-equipped drones that were linked up to his computer was causing a great deal of stress for Geo. Or at least it did, until Stevie caught sight of his heavy expression in the wake of Godfrey's comment and told him he was massively overthinking it. Just make sure you've got a feed from the right room and we're good to go, the Scotsman said. Too many camera changes would be worse anyway. That's how you can start missing things. Geo nodded, more in an effort to convince himself that he was overthinking it than in any agreement with Stevie's confidence it would all work out. It certainly went without saying that there were bigger potential concerns than getting whatever was going to happen in the vault on camera, chiefly what exactly was going to happen in the vault, but the fact that Godfrey and the McCarthys had decided to do it in full view of the public made Geo think there was an importance underlying that decision which he wasn't quite appreciating just yet. In an instant, and not altogether unwelcomely, Geo's stress-based concerns were ripped away by a brief but truly total burst of white light. There really was nothing like a disorienting and near-blinding alien flash to reset one's perspective, as Geo was very suddenly very aware. The emptiness of the field nevertheless implored him to hurry inside and switch the feed from a wide-angle camera mounted to the outside of the cabin itself. Geo knew only too well that no one was standing at the Birchwood Drive-In or watching the footage being beamed there to see live footage of him, so he wasted no time in dashing to his computer control console. It only took a few seconds to get there and tap the camera he needed to highlight where the intrepid would-be architect razors were now standing, which unsurprisingly, but still remarkably, was already at the entrance of the vault's source room. When Geo tapped the feed he wanted, the screen in Birchwood, plus hundreds of millions of others around the world, immediately filled with high-quality and well-lit live footage of 24 gestating architects and the one who was all set to raise them. No one knew precisely how long the vault had been in place, with 10,000 years being the round figure most commonly used as an estimate, and no one, likewise, knew how long the architects had been gestating or how long ago they might have finished growing. What everyone did know was that a major change, one way or another, was now mere minutes, or perhaps even seconds, away. As far as Gio Nunes was concerned, there was one way things could go right, and a whole lot of ways they could go wrong. But even if he had been given a million guesses, Gio would never have guessed which one of those ways it was going to be. E-58, Zhongnahai, Beijing, China Stunned by almost every word that had been spoken in Birchwood, even more so than he was by the live footage of an architect's spacecraft descending to Earth once more, Ding Ziyang sat pensively while his aides and colleagues spoke and moved with what he considered feudal urgency. They can't keep cutting us out one senior party member hissed from the seat next to Ding. At this, the long-standing premier turned away from the screen. Your ears must be failing you, he said. Dan couldn't cut me in while Mason was doing what he did. He just went out of his way to extend a hand, and you don't even see it. It's nothing but more lip service from the Americans, another man complained. Like many of a younger generation, this man was known for being increasingly frustrated at Ding's apparent willingness to cede so much ground to the Americans over anything related to extraterrestrial cooperation. By the Americans, party members who held such views tended to mean the McCarthys and their inner circle, which had always included William Godfrey and Timo Fiore. The man went on, They mock us with their announcements and you sit idly by! Ding shook his head, growing more than tired with this kind of thing. I would trust the three Americans on that stage to the ends of the earth, Zhao, he stated with more than a hint of anger in his voice. Dan McCarthy is a man of honor. I wouldn't expect you to understand. E-57, Subterranean Vault, Thurso, Scotland 
Confronted by 24 tall pods filled with 24 aliens of the kind humanity as a whole had spent the past 13 years fearing and despising, William Godfrey struggled with the notion that they had been there all along, unbeknownst to generation upon generation of unknowing humans. The alien-related struggles and cover-ups of the past seemed beyond trivial in this context, and to that end, Godfrey couldn't help but think how the McCarthys must have been feeling as they stood at the drive-in overseeing a public viewing of this remarkable happening, rather than showing scans of a translated German letter like the one that had once been the centerpiece of a similar media scrum. Everything paled in comparison to this in Godfrey's mind, to the extent that it felt less like the natural endpoint of a slow build toward greater knowledge of the universe's greatest mysteries and more like a quantum leap into the unknown. As he watched Rogue walk slowly and ruefully between the pods that lined both sides of the room, Godfrey couldn't even begin to imagine what must have been going through his mind. All the ICA chairman knew was that however much of a shock to the system the discoveries in this room had been for the humans during their first sighting, it must have been immeasurably worse for Rogue. It was no exaggeration to say that the alien's entire conception of himself had been shattered in that moment when a transcript had broken the news that all of his kind were born as blank slates and then effectively assigned an identity, a personality, as it were, deemed most useful to their distant engineers. Although it might have been unwise to read too much into the body language of a genetically engineered alien, Godfrey noted a detectable slump in Rogue's posture that for once wasn't necessary thanks to the great height of every room in the vault. Is he okay? The ICA chairman asked Cody, the alien's mental conduit to the rest of the group. The boy nodded after several seconds. He's just reading everything. There's a note on each pod stating what kind of induction transcripts they should be shown to imprint the right identity on them. Those have already been assigned. The note on each of the pods Cody referred to were evidently transcripts themselves, since Godfrey couldn't see anything and knew from a shared glance that Chip Petrovich couldn't either. What kind of things do they say? Chip asked. Are a bunch of them the same, or are they all different? Cody looked around at each of the pods without leaving his ideal vantage point in the center of the room. Some of them are the same, he replied. But there are a lot of unique ones, too. Like what? Godfrey pressed. Cody pointed to one of the pods. That one says communicator, he relayed. The program of consecutive transcripts it's supposed to be shown would make him maximally effective at interpreting all methods of communication and using them over long distance. I don't know if maybe each architect has a finite amount of mental bandwidth that means they can't just be programmed to be the best at everything, because that sounds like it might have been to the engineer's advantage if they could do it. You know, if they could show them every package of transcripts? I just feel like if I was designing a race of super aliens, I wouldn't make them all good at different things. I'd make them all good at everything. Do you think, perhaps, they weren't genetically engineered from scratch? Godfrey asked. They might have been a species native to another planet, like the messengers of New Kergolen, who have now been, for lack of a better term, domesticated by the engineers. As part of an all-important drive for full transparency, viewers around the world could hear as well as see everything that was going on inside the vault. Godfrey had this near the front of his mind as he spoke, choosing words for the clarity and contexts they could provide, and planning to use leading questions to get answers that could comfort as well as educate the watching public. One thing Godfrey wasn't sure about was how much the McCarthys would have revealed about Cody in the last few moments, but his understanding from the draft presentation Emma had shared several hours earlier was that she hadn't intended to disclose anything about him being a clone. That would have needlessly clouded matters, she suggested, and Godfrey didn't disagree. This was why he avoided making any comparisons between the way Cody had been engineered, in a sense, with the way Rogue might have been. Cody himself hadn't been asked to avoid broaching the subject, and it would be no disaster if he did at this point. 
it seemed highly likely that global attention would now be focused squarely on the two dozen aliens that looked like horror movie props and would soon be animated by the already awake member of their race who would become their unquestioned leader. At least, that was the plan. No one really knew how things would play out, and the longer Rogue stared at these pods, the less certain they became. Does he even know what he's doing? Chip Petrovich asked, drawing something of a scowl from Godfrey for asking a question that could cause a lot of unease above the surface. He's ready now, Cody stated as the alien turned to face Godfrey and Chip. He can bring them all to life at once by using the controls, and then they're supposed to stay in their drained pods until he shows them the right transcripts to imprint their preset identity. But that's not happening, so... So what? Godfrey asked after the boy trailed off. So he's going to talk to them, and if that doesn't work, if for some reason they can't understand him at first and can only read transcripts, he says he can go back to his mothership and put together some transcripts really quickly. Like writing a note for a deaf person, kind of, if you had to go somewhere to get a pen first. Godfrey nodded. Okay, I'm sure they will understand him, but it's always good to have options. And speaking of options... Could you just reiterate to Rogue that the one we're going for is the rapid moving of all 24 architects to his mothership until we see whether that affects the approach of the engineers? More than anything else he had said so far, this comment from Godfrey was a fairly obvious play for the cameras and microphones. That's the plan, Cody confirmed. Godfrey took a deep breath. Then in that case, whenever he's ready... This deep breath was accompanied by an accelerating heart rate, for Chip as well as Godfrey. However much talk there was of options and plans, and however confident they were in the accuracy of the information Cody had learned from the room's various transcripts, both men were only human, and both men felt more physically vulnerable than they had at any point in their lives. Chip in particular figured that a claustrophobic room in an underground vault wasn't many people's idea of a pleasant place to be. But a claustrophobic room filled with terrifying-looking giant aliens in an underground vault that had come within seconds of wiping out all life on Earth? Well, Chip figured that had to be a lot of people's worst nightmare, and as the moment drew ever nearer when those aliens would be roused from their slumber, he came to realize that he was one of them. A shiver ran up Chip's spine as he felt a borderline paralyzing fear like nothing he had ever known. He glanced at Godfrey and felt relief to see that he didn't seem to have felt any change in the air just yet. Fear slayed ego every single time, and in a situation like this, even a proud man like Chip Petrovich would rather feel momentarily weak for being startled for no good reason than see something that vindicated his sudden feeling of stomach-churning unease. There were twenty-four good reasons to be scared, and nowhere to look to avoid them, and with each passing second, Chip found himself wishing for Rogue to get on with it so the whole thing could be over, one way or another. Put simply, in a matter of moments the number of architects on Earth, and indeed the number of architects known to exist anywhere, was going to rise by a factor of twenty-five. The potential effects of this mass animation event could have kept anyone speculating for weeks on end, but with the engineers on the way as quickly as they were, there was no time for even a day of such inactivity. The time was now, and Rogue's movement towards the room's small control console suggested that he finally knew it, too. And... Go! Cody said, speaking exactly as Rogue pressed his hand against the console. As soon as he did, a hissing sound pierced the air, and the center of the floor lowered to create a fairly steep drainage system. The reason for this became obvious a few seconds later, as twenty-four tall cylindrical pods all drained from the bottom. Each of the humans stood tightly against one area of the wall, keen to avoid any unnecessary contact with the unknown liquid, even without any specific reason to think it would be dangerous. There's a new transcript, Cody yelled, startling everyone, including Rogue. And in that instant, everything changed. E-56, Drive-In, Birchwood, Colorado At least as much as any of the crowd who had come out to see him 
Dan McCarthy now found himself transfixed on the drive-in screen. Dan knew very well that Cody's excited announcement that he had detected a transcript in the vault could take things in all kinds of direction. But while it seemed like too much to ask for that the path forward presented by the transcript would be a clear one, Dan hoped and prayed that it would at least be passable. E-55, Subterranean Vault, Thurso, Scotland What does it say? Chip asked, staring at the area where Cody had identified a transcript but naturally unable to see it. It says this is the way to the pulse sphere, the boy said. Pulse sphere, that must be the source of all the energy, and it's deeper down, just like we would have guessed. Don't go near it, Godfrey ordered as if the boy had to be told. As it went, the next movement the boy made was backwards and towards Chip, reacting to the first sign of movement from one of the architects. That first sign was soon joined by 23 more. None of the aliens had moved their feet, but all were now clearly awake, if that was the right word to distinguish their current state from their previous one, and all were standing straighter than before. As the seconds ticked by, the beings moved their heads to look around in every direction. Like obedient sheepdogs, however, they stayed in place, at least until the shepherd called. Zink, fosh, braz, sniff, zur. Rogue shrilly boomed into the air, sounding not altogether unlike a broken 56K modem. As soon as he made the dissonant utterance, each architect stepped out of its pod. The cylinders opened effortlessly, a hinged mechanism at the front of each pod becoming visible only when the aliens walked unflinchingly towards the center of the room. They didn't walk far, seemingly wary of the drain that had emerged in the middle of the floor, but instead stopped and looked at Rogue. He stated. This time, the twenty-four huge aliens marched in lockstep towards the drain at the center of the room and looked down. What's he telling them? Godfrey asked. But in lieu of an answer, Cody stepped away from Chip and joined the architects in studying the drain. Cody, come here, Chip said, stepping forward to retrieve him. At that, however, one of the architects held out a hand and telekinetically prevented Chip from getting any further. It wasn't a painful intervention and only blocked Chip's progress rather than freeze him on the spot, but it was very troubling for what it represented. Cody, tell Rogue to tell them we're in charge and that we don't want anyone to go near whatever is down there, William Godfrey requested. It's very important you tell him that right now, okay? Cody looked at Godfrey and then across to Rogue, but nothing else happened. The architect blocking Chip's path didn't lower its force field, and Rogue didn't disperse his horde from their formation around the center of the room and its intriguing transcript about the so-called pulse sphere that lay below. Cody, Godfrey repeated through gritted teeth, his tone now very firm and impatient. Tell them I'm in charge here. With a brief second glance that looked unmistakably defiant, Cody met the ICA chairman's eyes for just long enough to give his reply. But you're not in charge, the incomparably powerful boy said, speaking so plainly that the words sent a shiver down Godfrey's spine. I am. Part 4. The Rising there is no such thing as accident. It is fate misnamed. Napoleon Bonaparte. E-54. Drive-in, Birchwood, Colorado. For the hundreds of people at the Birchwood Drive-in and hundreds of millions of viewers around the world who didn't know much about the young boy who seemed to have seized control of the situation in Thurso, the moment was as confusing as it was concerning. For the McCarthys, however, who knew the extent of Cody's powers as well as the story behind them, the sense of foreboding was even stronger. They knew how much Rogue was in awe of the boy's powers, but they also knew that for all of Cody's neurological brilliance he had been raised in a horribly unusual way that may well have warped his perception of risk and any other number of important factors. 
None of them could begin to guess what had led to his decision to effectively pull rank on William Godfrey, who had made his own trip into the vault with the explicit intent of standing at the top of the hierarchy of orders everyone had expected to develop. Dan tried not to assume anything too drastic just yet, and was still breathing deep sighs of relief that the architects hadn't simply lashed out at the three humans as soon as they were awoken. It looked very much like all 24 were following Rogue's instructions, even without the need for any transcript-based imprinting process, and Cody hadn't yet expressed anything that made him seem like a dangerous figurehead to be in turn advising Rogue. There was nevertheless a memory in Dan's mind of the day in Havana when an aggressive fleet of vessels from New Kerguelen's militaristic squadron had filled the sky before touching down and striking up a deal with the Cretanous Jack Neal. That arrival day incident, as it came to be known, occurred while Dan had been temporarily uplifted by the messengers, during which period Piper was conceived and, as had recently come to light, Dan's DNA had been unscrupulously obtained by one method or another and used to create the clone who now appeared to be in command of the most fearsome-looking group of beings the world had ever seen. Jack Neal's control over the squadron that day had ended courtesy of an unlikely intervention from former British Prime Minister John Cole, who saw enough sense to covertly work with Emma and Godfrey to stop Neil from causing more damage than any of them could imagine. But today, with a group of aliens far more powerful and potentially destructive than any from New Kerguelen, now seemingly following the lead of a child who was genetically gifted but understandably socially stunted, the stakes felt even higher and humanity felt even closer to a precipice. Everyone in the vault was out of communicational reach, meaning that neither Emma nor anyone could this time intervene to try to talk sense into the human who found himself in control of what could easily be seen as an extraterrestrial army. William Godfrey had tried and failed, as everyone saw, and no one could take too much comfort from the fact that humanity's best chance of avoiding a hugely costly architect-related disaster looked very much like it now lay in the unlikely hands of Chip Petrovich. E-53, Subterranean Vault, Thurso, Scotland What are you doing, Cody? William Godfrey asked as calmly as he could, no longer considering his words or tone for the benefit of the live cameras in the room, but now solely trying to de-escalate a situation that was getting away from him in a way no one had even considered possible. We are all on the same side here. Cody glanced back towards Godfrey. You didn't even want to listen to Billy when he said we could use the energy source to defend ourselves. You told him never to mention it again. Godfrey's eyeballs looked fit to pop out of their sockets. Billy? That's what this is about? he asked, recalling a video call between New Kerguelen and the station in which the sometimes foolhardy archaeologist had raised the very prospect Cody was now referencing. We didn't know anything about it back then, the boy replied flatly. But now I do. The transcript that appeared when the pods started draining tells us the pulse sphere is beneath this drain. If we can get it out, you could destroy the whole world is what you could do. Godfrey interrupted, although he couldn't help but react with this level of exasperated concern as soon as the words were out, he endeavored to make a conscious effort to keep calmer. The ICA chairman endeavored to be outwardly calmer, in any case, since there clearly was no prospect of any internal peace while a twelve-year-old boy and his deferent foot soldiers had their eyes set, innocently or not, on a so-called pulse sphere that was, without question, the most concentrated and dangerous energy source on the planet. This could be the only chance we have to stop the engineers from destroying the world, Cody retorted. That wasn't the plan, Godfrey said, quickly realizing that outward calmness was out of his reach too. The plan was for Rogue to take his friends far away from Earth so we could see whether the engineers change or reverse their course. Why don't we stick with that, and then bear in mind that we have this option as last resort, if it's ever needed. What do you think about that, Cody? Cody then turned his body fully towards Godfrey, at which point the architect, who was harmlessly blocking Chip's path, lowered his hand to remove the telekinetic force field that had been doing the job. 
So you will talk about this option? The boy asked. Because you told Billy you would never speak to him again if he mentioned it. Which is it? As Chip reached his hands outwards to confirm the force field in front of him had been fully removed, William Godfrey gulped and stood in deep thought. When I said that, I didn't know you would find a transcript about the source, Cody, the ICA chairman said. For the first time, he could sense that de-escalation was indeed possible now that Cody had turned around and entered a discussion about what Godfrey saw as a harebrained idea, but the boy clearly saw as one worth pursuing. Cody nodded. It says the pulse sphere is right under our feet, but I can't get down there without Rogue or one of the others, so I think we should open the hatch at the bottom of this train before they leave. Otherwise, we won't be able to. Confident he was now free to walk towards Cody as he had tried to a few moments earlier, Chip Petrovich took several steps forward until he was side by side with the boy. They stood at the point where the floor began to deeply decline towards the drain at its center, which didn't look like anything special to Chip, but clearly had more significance. You stay right there, Chip said to Godfrey, but he accompanied the fairly gruff order with a subtle wink to let him know he wasn't about to do anything foolish. Facing Cody again, Chip then crouched to his height and put a hand on his shoulder. And Cody, you did a great job spotting this transcript. It could really help us if we need it. The boy smiled. Affection and praise were as alien to him as the architect army who filled the room, but he liked how Chip's words felt. Thanks. Billy was right, just like I thought. The pulse sphere is right underneath us, and... Billy was right about the energy source still being here, Chip interrupted. But I don't know anything about it. I'll tell you, Cody replied brightly. Chip forced a smile. He was feeling the pressure of this moment, too, knowing only too well that one instruction from Cody could see the architects open the hatch beneath which an energy source capable of killing everyone on Earth would seemingly be within their reach. Even without assuming any ill intent, which Chip certainly wouldn't from Cody or, by extension, the aliens who sensed his powers and hung on his every order, there was much to fear with the pulse sphere so nearby. Chip couldn't even guess at the potential volatility of the object, if object was anything close to the right word, but he certainly had no reason to feel confident that it couldn't be engaged by accident. One false move, he considered with a racing heart rate and sweat-soaked hairline, and there would be no world left to save. E-52 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore Watching the live events in Thurso via his computer screen and through the gaps in his fingers, Alessandro Bonucci had rarely felt so on edge in his life. Chip was doing well so far, but in Alessandro's analytical mind, the developing situation left so little room for error that it hardly bore thinking about. E-51, Subterranean Vault, Thurso, Scotland Weaponry and physics may have been as far from Chip Petrovich's areas of expertise as Portuguese and crocheting, but he had seen enough movies to know that bombs could go off if they were mishandled by the good guys. Sometimes they didn't even need to cut the wrong wire, he reflected, as an accidental impact could be enough. Since the pulse sphere was clearly far more potent than any bomb or, indeed, every bomb ever conceived, and just as importantly, since the architects currently in the vault had no experience with anything like it, the chance of something going wrong if anyone got too close to the pulse sphere struck Chip as a clearer and more immediate threat than the engineers, who Cody was thinking about using it against. I'd love you to tell me all about it, Chip replied, but I bet Billy would love you to tell him all about it too. I'm not exactly the brightest on this kind of stuff. Why don't you look at the transcript again and remember as much as you can, every little thing, and then we can tell everyone else about it. They might have some ideas about how to make sure it's all safe, too. Alessandro will have some ideas, don't you think? He is really smart, Cody said in deep admiration. Piper, too. Chip nodded, 
finally feeling like he was getting somewhere. Exactly. So how about we go back to the station and let Rogue show his new friends their mothership, like we planned? We can't open the hatch without them, the boy replied. But we might not need to, Chip stated. He was doing a laudable job of talking to Cody on his level and hiding his own trepidation as he did so, but with every new statement he uttered he worried that it could undo all the work he had done in getting to that point. There was no telling what Cody might see as an attempt to deceive him, and Chip was acutely aware of the telepathic power the boy had at his disposal. This was a power Cody was known to be reluctant about using, due to an ill-defined discomfort he felt when hearing thoughts that weren't intentionally sent his way, but one which could have told him at any minute that Chip was attempting to lead the conversation in certain directions for certain fear-based reasons he didn't want to express out loud. Chip hadn't spent much time with Cody in absolute terms, what with the boy's rescue having come only a few days earlier, but since then they had spent even less time apart. In their hours together, one of the boy's personality traits that had shown through most clearly was his independent-mindedness. Chip could only imagine that it would take an army of psychologists years to unpack everything Cody had been through and how it had all affected him, but so far the boy seemed much happier when he was working things out or deciding things for himself rather than being guided. For that reason, Chip wanted Cody to arrive at the decision that it made more sense to leave the hatch intact for now than it would to open it right now. He didn't want to express his own fears because he didn't want that to cloud things. Instead, he wanted to present a reasoned position and give Cody the chance to come around to seeing its merits. Remember our plan was to get the architects out of here so we can tell if they were the reason the engineers are heading for Earth, Chip stated. So, if Rogue takes them away and the engineers stop heading right for us, we won't need to do anything else down here. But if they do keep coming? Cody pressed. Chip didn't say anything, leaving Cody to finish his own thought. The architects can come back and help us with this, the boy said, nodding along with the words. Yeah, so we can stick with the plan which is working so far, since these guys are all listening to Rogue like we hoped they would, but we've also found a fallback. I think the others are going to be really happy with us, he smiled. They sure will be, Chip smiled right back. So, do you want to tell Rogue that he can take his friends out of this old vault now? We know he can watch us from far away, so he'll know if we need more help. And Cody, I'll still be here with you. Chip threw in this last part in a bid to remove any hesitation Cody might have felt about following through with a plan to send away the individual in the group he seemed to have the deepest bond with, even if it was a scary-looking alien. They're going to leave, the boy announced, and Rogue says he will know if we need more help. He says he's only leaving because we want him to. But only to see if the architects are what the engineers want, Chip reaffirmed, looking straight at Rogue as he spoke. Make sure he knows we wouldn't be sending him away if it wasn't for them. He says he knows, the boy relayed. And thanks. If I may, William Godfrey interjected. He remained a short distance away, leaving Chip to the de-escalation task he had handled so manfully. Could you quickly ask Rogue exactly where they'll be going, for the purposes of monitoring any changes in the engineer's course, that could be very important. Cody nodded and turned to his alien friend. Only a few seconds later, he looked back at Godfrey. He's going back across a gate to the area he used to patrol with the rest of his group, before he lost them all in the time gate experiments he told Dan about. He says there's no one else there and it's nowhere near the gate the engineers must have come through. He doesn't know anything about that one? But he says the gate takes him far away, so if the engineers were only coming here for his friends, we'll never see the engineers' craft again. It won't pass the sun. Thank you, Godfrey said, pleased to have gotten far more than he bargained for in that answer. Both of you. Without making a sound, Rogue then beckoned his new charges to gather tightly around him. They're leaving, Cody said. 
His words were immediately followed by a total flash that left the room empty but for the three humans. Chip and Godfrey exchanged a glance that spoke volumes. Both could have screamed from the rooftops with relief, but both kept it in. Cody, meanwhile, stared at the drain in the middle of the floor. The others knew he was studying the transcript before leaving. Oh, uh, cabin guys, Chip said, waving his hand and looking around for any sign of a camera. They were all too small to see, but he knew they were there. Make sure you get a good shot of the transcript area over here. Cody can still read them in photos. Right, Cody? After a few final seconds of focus, the boy turned away from the transcript. I think so. I could for the other ones Alessandro showed me, but I've remembered all of this just to be safe. I'll tell Alessandro everything while it's fresh in my mind, and hopefully Billy, too. Excellent, Godfrey replied. If the ICA chairman had been perturbed at feeling like he had to kowtow to a twelve-year-old boy, unprecedentedly gifted or not, those feelings had long since been superseded by relief. Chip Petrovich, equally relieved, then held his hand towards the door that would lead them out of the enormous vault. Come on then, kid, he said. It's a pretty long walk back to the cabin. E-50, Drive-In, Birchwood, Colorado By any objective measure, the plan to wake 24 architects from their deep slumber and end their inherently unsettling presence on Earth had succeeded. The McCarthys and their inner circle had worried about several things that could have gone badly wrong, with the worst-case scenario being a hostile awakening, and none of them had come to pass. No one had envisaged Cody breaking ranks, on the other hand, albeit momentarily, and no one, with the possible exception of Billy Kendrick, had anticipated the discovery that the so-called pulse sphere responsible for the harrowing destruction around Thurso was still in the ground and apparently still able to be used. The implications of this discovery were a matter for another day, however, with the world's immediate focus falling squarely upon whether the colossal spacecraft last seen destroying Alessandro Bonucci's heartbeat probe would soon appear in Earth's sky. Best estimates suggested the moment of truth was now less than a day away, when the craft either would or wouldn't pass the sun and emerge within plain sight of humanity's numerous powerful orbital telescopes. The imminence of this moment was the context in which everything else the McCarthys had revealed to the world would now be digested, with many of their points likely to fall into obscurity while the most consequential of all dominated the minds and airwaves of the citizens and news crews and attendants. Emma McCarthy consciously realized that the fact the success of their vault-clearing plan felt like a minor one was a major sign of how warped their perspectives now were. The challenges of the past few weeks had been like none anyone could remember, not only following in quick succession, but often compounding on each other to create seemingly impossible odds. The appearance and approach of the engineers had been a perfect example of this phenomenon, coming to their attention mere hours after a room full of gestating architects. Solving the architect problem had at least since come to be seen as a possible way of solving the problem of the incoming engineers and Emma could now only hope that they had killed two birds with one stone in diverting the engineer's attention towards wherever Rogue had taken his new cohorts. Even if this best-case scenario worked out, Emma knew it would really be pushing the problem of the engineers down the road rather than solving it. To her mind, and doubtless many others, the existence within accessible distance of a race who traveled in a vessel larger than the moon and weren't opposed to using it to destroy human creations, was something that would linger in her psyche even if that craft stopped coming. Sleeping under a sky she knew to contain beings like that would not be easy. But for now, Emma knew the group, and indeed, the world as a whole, had to focus on somehow getting rid of the wolf that was circling their camp. The time for worrying about the howls in the distance would be when nothing lurked any closer, and to extend this metaphor, she dearly hoped the wolf at the door had been distracted by the architect-shaped bone humanity had effectively just thrown back into the wilderness of space. All's well that ends well, Dan blurted out, filling in the silence left by Emma's pensive reaction to the end of the immediate drama in Thurso. 
Some of that didn't go exactly as we expected, but the main thing is that we have succeeded in clearing the vault, and we now have a reasonable hope that the engineer's reason for heading to Earth has gone. The screen behind them now only showed Godfrey, Chip, and Cody making their way across the long expanse of the vault, so the shell-shocked crowd were focusing squarely on the McCarthys once more. Emma nodded along with Dan's words, but wanted to touch on one more thing before sending the crowd home for what was sure to be a sleepless night all around. The boy you saw there, she began, whose name is Cody, was the person Nick Mason and his associates have been using as a human guinea pig for uplift research. As you saw, and unlike Piper, he can communicate telepathically with the architects. Cody wants to help us in any way he can, but we don't want to talk too much about his personal circumstances at the moment. He's been through a lot, and it's going to be up to him when he wants to talk about certain things. For now, he's going to be back on the station, as you heard, but we're going to be staying in Birchwood. This was news to Dan and Piper, who hadn't really made any assumptions either way. I don't know what we'll be talking about tomorrow night, Emma went on. But we'll be here if you will. But whether we see that craft in the meantime, or whether we come to think we've succeeded in changing its course, don't let it slip by that we've succeeded in something else. We means all of us. All of us here and everyone watching around the world who have survived the pulses that were set in motion to kill us. All of us are still here and will still be here tomorrow. Dan nodded forcefully along with these words. In the crowd, positive feelings of defiance against the odds now looked to be swirling and were coming out in the form of some supportive hollers and sporadic applause. But we didn't just happen to survive everything the vault threw at us, Emma said. We found that vault before it was too late. We opened it, we mapped it, we explored it, and we just emptied it of 24 architects who could have been turned against us. So we didn't just survive the vault. No, no, no. We conquered it. This time the crowd reaction was much stronger, with loud cheers from all angles replacing the sporadic hollers and applause. So let's remember that, whichever way the news falls about the engineers, let's remember that we've handled every single thing that's been thrown at us. And let's remember something else, Piper said, preparing to repeat a strong line Dan had first spoken a short while earlier. We stand together, or we fall apart. And I don't know about any of you, but I don't feel like falling. The cheers that greeted those words were by far the loudest yet. Piper, now, 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 t-shirt and all, had stood up to an intimidating calling and reacted calmly to all the unexpected developments that night had thrown at her. The cheers and expressions of the crowd left no doubt in Emma's mind that Birchwood and the wider world had a new darling, and she couldn't have been any prouder. The last thing to say is that we're in a much better position than we were an hour ago, Dan added, raising a well-practiced hand and a slow wave to signal that this really was the end of the event. Like Emma, he deliberately and somewhat conspicuously avoided any mention of the pulse sphere and the varied questions its presence raised. That was another issue of the kind that didn't go away on its own, much like the existence of the engineers but it was another that quite simply had to be for another day. We did what we set out to do, and no more than we did when we started, he said. And that sounds like a victory in my book. The crowd applauded one last time and sustained their send-off until the McCarthys were back in their car and heading home. But any feelings of victory, however minor, would not last for long. E-49, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tercatore. Alessandro Bonucci had a mind famed for its clarity and incisiveness, but as he reflected on everything that had happened in Thurso, he found his thoughts cloudier than he could ever remember. Everyone had been shell-shocked by Cody's unexpected insistence that he was in charge, and Chip Petrovich's success in talking him down from the potentially destructive ledge that led to a phenomenally potent pulse sphere hadn't canceled out those uncomfortable feelings. For some of the group left in the station, 
The feeling was similar to how a dog's owner might have felt upon successfully reeling in their previously obedient animal when it suddenly displayed a thirst for dominance. Cody was no animal, of course, and he had responded to Chip's reasoning in a manner no truly domineering individual would, but his behavior had nevertheless changed the tone within the station's walls. Tara McCarthy, already uneasy regarding Cody after an initially accidental discharge of his telekinesis had led to a very deliberate attempt to use it against her, certainly didn't have to say anything for the others to know how she was feeling. All of this was to say nothing of what was troubling Alessandro most, the continued presence in the vault of the pulse sphere itself. He was eagerly anticipating Cody's return so they could talk about exactly what the related transcript had revealed when it became visible immediately after Rogue awakened his fellow architects, because to his mind, its discovery had been the single most consequential moment of a remarkable night. The daylight of morning would soon hit Scotland, where a familiar alien craft from the station had already been dispatched to gather Godfrey, Cody, and Chip, since the less familiar architect craft that had brought them was nowhere to be seen. No one knew the best word for Rogue's newly awakened companions. Family certainly didn't seem right, but neither did friends or colleagues. But whatever they were, they were gone. Perhaps for the human's benefit and to show them that he really had followed the agreed-upon plan, Rogue hadn't cloaked his mothership upon setting off from the skies over Scotland. Instead, he had traveled at great speed for several minutes before disappearing. The mothership had been far too far away for the visual perspective to give Alessandro any hope of pinpointing the exact location of the gate Rogue crossed, but he at least now knew which general direction should be monitored for first signs of the architect's return, or perhaps in which direction future signals should be sent if Rogue ever failed to show up on his own steam when his presence was desired. As helpful as Rogue had been, no one wanted a situation to arise in which his help would be needed again, and so, meaning nothing against the architect himself, Everyone on the station fervently hoped that they had seen the last of him. Even more so than anyone else, however, Alessandro Bonucci and his incisive mind knew that was a faint hope indeed. E-48, Planetary Research Committee, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. Am I glad they found him? Billy Kendrick mused. With Timo Fiori and Leisha at his side, he was currently on his third rewatch of the section of footage from Thurso's vault in which Cody gave him a name check while arguing in favor of exploring the Pulse Sphere's potential as a defensive weapon. Billy had failed to get through to anyone when he originally raised such a notion, drawing a particularly impatient rebuke for doing so from William Godfrey, but he had no ego in the matter and was just glad that the idea was being championed. The power of the pulses is a kind we should not touch, Leisha stated, communicating telepathically with his patch-wearing human friends. They had sat together to watch the live footage from Earth, which was sent their way by Alessandro and enabled by the incredible cross-gate communications signal technology which the best minds of both planets had united to develop. This technology was reverse-engineered from radios built into the various spacecraft the ancient messengers had been given by ancient architects, who they now knew to have been operating with imprinted identities ultimately handed down by the newly emergent engineers. Recently, it felt very much as though new contexts were emerging at a rate that made them hard to keep track of, but the notion of somehow utilizing the pulse sphere was clearly the point that was currently troubling Leisha most. It's better to have options than not, Billy contended. Leisha, the leader of the messengers and the member of their kind who spent more time with humans than any other with the possible exception of Melly, shook his head in the manner he had adopted from them. Think back, he silently communicated. Thirteen years ago, Rogue warned against any attempt to manipulate time, and he warned against any attempt to re-establish a nuclear arsenal on Earth. From wide-ranging experience, we cannot even begin to comprehend. He knew those were things we should not touch. And do not forget that it was Rogue who closed the Time Gate to Sanctuary, 
and it was Rogue who unilaterally rendered your nuclear weapons unusable. Billy looked at Leisha, waiting for the punchline. It came flatly. But Rogue has since told us that he could do nothing to stop the pulses, either here or on Earth. Billy, the destructive power of the pulse sphere you are talking about utilizing, it is not something we can even think about trying to harness. Closing our eyes doesn't make us invisible, Billy retorted, his flair for a linguistic flourish coming to the fore as it so often did. And pretending that sphere isn't there won't make it so. To my mind, the sphere is just like the architects. We're going to have to do something about it at some point. All I'm saying is that just like the time to wake the architects was when that might help by diverting the engineer's attention, the best time to start thinking about how we could redirect the pulse sphere's energy is probably when humanity is staring at an incoming enemy it has no other way of defending itself against. Call me crazy, but I just don't think it's an option we should be turning our noses up at. That's all. While Timo Fiori sat in deeply pensive thought, Leisha again shook his head. My point about closing our eyes and hoping for the best doesn't just apply on Earth either, Billy continued. Because if there's a pulse sphere in the vault on Earth, you have to know that means there's one on the Isle of Answers. While Leisha's browless face enabled less expressiveness than those of his human friends, his eyes widened in evident unease. He hadn't consciously realized it until Billy stated it outright, but the amiable archaeologist was right. It seemed unfeasible that New Kerguelen's soil didn't also still contain a pulse sphere with untold destructive potential. If there is a sphere in our vault, it has never caused a problem since the final pulse, the alien stated. And we know that was thousands of years ago, we did not even know the vault existed until you found it, Billy, let alone that there might be a pulse sphere still buried beneath it. Billy gulped. Leisha, until Timo crossed the gate, we didn't even know the engineers existed. Now the heartbeat probe is in a million pieces, and as far as we know, their moon-sized megaship is still heading for Earth. Bad things happen fast, my friend, especially when good people aren't ready. E-47, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland. As the sun rose over Thurso, the three men inside the operations cabin at the center of Colin Fraser's field wondered what else they could possibly come to learn about the vault beneath their feet. The news that the vault apparently still housed the object which emitted unprecedented waves of destruction in every direction was hardly comforting, even if, in some regards, it wasn't entirely unexpected. Until the final hours of the previous night, no one had known where the energy came from, and only upon learning of the pulse sphere did the trio come to realize that their unexplored and hopeful assumption had been that the energy was coming from some finite source that was now depleted, in the same way a gun could run out of bullets. The information young Cody gleaned and relayed from a transcript in the vault punctured that hope like a fist through a bubble, however and it now certainly seemed to be the case that the men were sitting atop something akin to a dormant volcano rather than an extinct one. A news report playing on Geo's computer was the current focus of the trio's attention, emanating from only a few miles away at the edge of the security cordon. Even through the course of this short report, the cordon grew bigger as the authorities pushed the media back in a bid to increase the buffer area around the field and the vault within it. From direct first-hand experience, Geo and his driller friends knew that this was like pouring thimbles full of water from the hull of a sinking ship, because from their small safe zone in the eye of the storm, they had seen the power of the pulses expand outwards and flatten everything across distances that made efforts to move the media back by a few hundred meters seem like the height of futility. If something's gonna go wrong, it'll go a lot wronger than that, Davy pointed out. And as much as they would have liked to, neither Geo nor Stevie could disagree. E-46, Zhongnanghai, Beijing, China Sir, an urgent voice called. Its owner burst into Ding Ziyang's private office, which startled the political titan a lot more than it irked him. 
While things had been changing in recent years and there were now elements of the party looking to life beyond their long-standing leader, and while the total deference to authority of years gone by wasn't always seen in some of the most ambitious young upstarts, the Premier's office was not a threshold that was casually breached. Furthermore, the man bursting in was one of increasingly few Ding would have trusted with his life, let alone his career, and he was one for whom respect came before all else. On any day, the sight of this man bursting in like this would have been a cause for concern as to what kind of news he was there to break. But today of all days, with so many alien-related issues swirling in an increasingly destabilizing manner, Ding's apprehension was visible. It's the Jijing probe, sir, the man panted. Our Mercury probe. Ding gulped. You mean... A hesitant nod said it all. Ding leapt to his feet. Although they weren't as light as they once were, they carried him swiftly along the corridor to the room where he could talk to senior figures at the CNSA and see whatever they had found with his own eyes. But long before he got there, Ding Ziyang knew that the news wasn't good. E-45, Ford McCarthy Residence, Birchwood, Colorado Dan McCarthy was never someone who had a great deal of trouble sleeping when he had to, even at the height of the IDA leak and, perhaps more notably, even on the last few nights before the final pulse was forecast to hit. Tonight, however, was different. At first, there had been a lot of residual adrenaline to deal with from his appearance at the drive-in, and then not a little pride in how gracefully and skillfully Piper had handled herself. It didn't take long for the grimmer realities of the situation to catch up with Dan, though, slapping him upside the head most decisively when he casually turned on the TV and saw an arbitrary seven-day countdown clock next to the headline, Countdown to Destruction? Something about how plainly it was stated got under Dan's skin, while the nonchalant question mark only underlined how little certainty there was. But to Dan, the worst thing wasn't uncertainty over whether the engineers would arrive, it was the uncertainty about when they would arrive if they did. Alessandro's seven-day projection had already come down massively from a 43-day projection within the few hours of the craft's discovery, and since then it had been untrackable due to its violent destruction of the heartbeat probe that first raised the alarm. Thinking about this for even a few minutes drove Dan to the point of having physical stress symptoms to an extent he hadn't experienced for many years, but there was little he could do to combat them. Emma, meanwhile, didn't even try to sleep, powering through the night like she'd always been able to do from time to time, though not without paying for it later, in a manner Dan had always considered close to being a superpower. When he ventured from the bedroom from time to time, Emma filled him in on the latest news from the station. The news regarding the engineer's colossal spacecraft was that there was no news, which, in the current context, Dan took as the best kind he could reasonably hope to receive. Alessandro told Emma that there had been an odd atmosphere around Cody until he went to bed for the night, with Godfrey later convening a meeting and telling the others to get a hold of themselves and remember that the boy was on their side and trying his best. The Italian believed it was the fact that Godfrey was the one to say those things that made them stick, since it was him who had been in the vault when the boy spoke out of turn, and, as some were framing it, went into business for himself until Chip stepped in to make sure no irreversible mistakes were made. Chip wisely talked Cody out of his desire to speak to Billy Kendrick that night, Alessandro said, although Alessandro did have a brief discussion with the boy and was glad to confirm that the transcript remained readable to him even in photographic format. The pertinent details of its content were that the sphere was still in the ground, was still capable of emitting incredible amounts of energy and could be either reactivated or permanently deactivated, but only by the hand of an architect. With Rogue having promised to keep an eye on Earth, and with Alessandro now having a good idea where to aim any signal-based requests if anything like that was ever needed to get his attention, it seemed very likely that the helpful architect could one day be called back to decisively remove any residual danger of a pulse-related disaster. That day would naturally lie on the other side of a more urgent problem, but with the prospect of deactivation being the one bright spark in an otherwise dreary night, 
Dan basked in that good news for as long as he could. Unfortunately, this amounted to little over an hour. The most consequential news of the night came first not to Emma, but to Dan, and that was because it came not from the station, but from China. Dan lurched for his phone as soon as the rarely heard message tone played, recognizing it as the one he had assigned to one of his deputy planetary liaisons, the long-standing and inimitable Chinese premier, Ding Ziyang. In the moment it took Dan to reach his phone and read the multi-line message, he hoped Ding was simply thanking him for the explicit supportive mention at the drive-in. That was the kind of man Ding was, which was one of the reasons Dan had always had a lot of time for him, but Dan should have known better than to think this was a moment in history when anyone had time for platitudes like that. Instead of anything so mundane, when Dan unlocked his phone, his eyes fell upon what was quite simply the worst news he could have seen. News that the engineer's craft had continued on its course and had just passed the sun. Ding explained that he knew this before Alessandro because his scientists had access to data from their pre-ICA Jijing probe, which continued to transmit from Mercury's orbit, despite being officially declared dead several years earlier. What Ding didn't have to explain was that the probe had detected the megaship's passing before Alessandro's best guess had predicted it would pass the sun. This could only mean one thing, and all that was left to calculate now was how much the gargantuan craft had sped up once more, and just how much sooner it now looked like reaching Earth than previously thought. The Chinese were sharing all that they knew, Ding promised, and every word he said was true. But the biggest problem of all, for Dan McCarthy and his world as a whole, was that the Chinese didn't know the half of it. E-44, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. At the very same moment it reached Dan McCarthy on the ground in Birchwood, Alessandro Bonucci felt his heart sink when a message notification on his computer broke the news from China. The mysterious engineers were still coming, architects or no architects, and they were coming faster than ever. Alessandro wasted no time in forwarding the news to all relevant department heads on the station, as he was sure Timo would have authorized if he was there to call the shots. With this in mind, Alessandro also made sure to pass it on to New Care Galen, since he knew there was no way for Ding to do so, even though he was sure the Chinese premier and senior ICA figure would have sought to if he could. The ICA's chairman, William Godfrey, was next to Alessandro within minutes of the call, roused from a wholehearted but ill-fated attempt to belatedly catch a few hours of much-needed sleep. How long until we have a visual? Godfrey asked. We're on it, Alessandro replied. Everyone and everything is on it. The Chinese can't see it. They've only detected a change in reflected light and the same kind of signal noise we got from Heartbeat. Their Jijing probe hasn't picked up any gravitational effects, but Heartbeat didn't either, and that was a lot closer at first than Jijing can be now. There's definitely some kind of gravitational shielding at play. Godfrey scratched his chin in thought. But how long until we can see it? We're not cooking a chicken here, Alessandro snapped in an uncharacteristically acerbic tone, lifting his hands from their incessant typing in a shrug-like expression of frustration that was similarly not like him. I can't type in a question and find out how long it's going to take. Godfrey didn't say anything else. He liked Alessandro. He had always liked Alessandro, and even if he hadn't, he didn't think he would have had any mental energy to care about being spoken to in a manner he ordinarily wouldn't tolerate. This news was a hammer blow, no two ways about it, not only revealing that the emptying of the vault hadn't been enough to dissuade the engineers from continuing their journey, but also revealing that the journey itself was going to pass even more quickly than previously expected. On that point, Godfrey was losing confidence in any kind of estimate Alessandro might be able to provide regarding a new ETA. This was no fault of the diligent and detail-oriented Italian, whose prior estimates had been based on an assumption the then-current speed of the craft would remain stable, but was rather down to the increasing obviousness that any further assumptions of that kind would be unwarranted. For all anyone knew, the engineer's craft could accelerate another five times, 
with each compounding acceleration knocking another day off the countdown to a showdown that was beginning to feel increasingly inevitable even as the form that showdown might take remained entirely unguessable. Everything is on it, Alessandro reiterated, his tone settling down without quite reaching anything explicitly apologetic. Every telescope capable of seeing the craft first is under our control, so we can at least be sure we are going to see it first. In the grand scheme of things, this hardly seemed to matter anymore, but Godfrey appreciated why Alessandro thought he might have wanted to hear it. With every successive development, however, it was starting to feel like this was one existential threat that couldn't be tackled without a terrified global population being aware of every twist and turn. On the screens in front of Alessandro, table after table was filled with data that looked as indecipherable to Godfrey as it would have if the numbers were all spelled out in Chinese. Watching the Italian navigate between tables and occasionally flicking from the remote control panel of one telescope to another, Godfrey felt like he was living life on fast forward. Alessandro's work was robotic and ultra-focused, unbroken even as Serena and Carrick arrived panting in the control deck with Clark McCarthy close behind. It was only when an incoming call from Dan McCarthy appeared on one of the screens that Alessandro momentarily looked away from his primary monitor. And even then it was only to make sure his finger tapped the green button to answer the call rather than the adjacent red one that would have rejected it. Did Ding text you too? Alessandro asked as soon as the call was live. Dan and Emma appeared on the screen, taking the others full focus while Alessandro's eyes and hands remained busy with the urgent work at hand. Godfrey was even more impressed now to see that Alessandro could maintain his hyperdrive finger speed even while talking. Yeah, Dan said. I just wanted to make sure you guys knew. Can you see it yet? He's working on it, William Godfrey cut in. But, Emma, what do you think? He's trying to stay on top of the narrative, a lost cause. It looks like it, she conceded. Right now, I just want to know what we're looking at for a new arrival estimate. That won't come until a while after we see it, Alessandro stated. His fingers paused briefly after the end of the comment, at which point he readjusted his weight in his seat and leaned in closer to the screen, to look at one particular data point which seemed to be standing out to his eyes amid the ocean of others. Everyone else stayed quiet, giving space and silence to the one man they would all have trusted for a job like this over any other. Time and again, Alessandro's keen eye had spotted something every other missed, often very consequentially, and his sudden interest in one cell of one live updating spreadsheet implied very strongly that he had just spotted something very important, I think we've got it, he said, swiping his primary data-filled screen away and replacing it with a filtered and fairly distorted-looking live image of something that still couldn't be mistaken for anything other than the sun. Alessandro then typed in a long string of numbers he had seemingly internalized from the table, a feat that impressed many of the others all on its own. At that point, the image zoomed in on one area, and revealed the presence of a small detail that had previously been indiscernible. Like a bat in the late evening sky, the silhouette of the engineer's craft was easy to miss at first, but soon enough became the only thing anyone could notice. What are you doing? William Godfrey asked as Alessandro navigated away from the image. Getting a better view now that we know where to look, the Italian replied. His habit of using we like this spoke to his lack of ego in his work as well as life, which was one strong reason why Timo had been grooming him as a potential successor to run the station since long before he had known a successor would become necessary, unfortunately soon. No one argued. These are going to be stills from our Platinum 5 telescope, he continued. The last view was from here, one of our station mounts, so this is going to be a lot clearer. The others who would have trusted more or less anything Alessandro told them about telescopes, waited with keen anticipation as Alessandro typed in a long string of data to pull the image he wanted. In a few minutes, we'll start getting much clearer stills at ten-second intervals, Alessandro said, turning away from his screen to address his words to Godfrey. I can't say for sure when we'll have a solid speed-based estimate for a new arrival time, but to be blunt, I wouldn't put much weight in one anyway. The craft could have sped up again while I've been telling you this, for all we know. 
Can you go back to the last view of it while we wait for the close-ups to start coming in? Clark asked. And is there any way you can share your main screen with us? Dan chimed in. By now, Piper was visible between her parents on their video feed from the ground. Alessandro answered both questions with a few deft keystrokes, swiftly returning the earlier image to his own screen and sharing that screen with Dan. So that's them? Piper asked. That little dot against the sun? Piper, darling, it's a big sun, Alessandro replied with a momentarily relaxed chuckle. Remember, we had a much clearer view of this thing when it came into Heartbeat's view, and we saw then that it is bigger than our moon. A thousand ill diavolos could fit inside this craft with room to spare. I am not trying to overblow the danger of what we are dealing with here, because I don't know what we are dealing with here, but that is the scale of it. In the minutes it took for Alessandro's image request for a faraway probe's primary telescope to capture the shots he wanted and send them back to the station, he fielded several questions which were worded in different ways, but all amounted to the same general query of when the craft's current speed might become apparent. Alessandro's best answer was, hopefully very soon. But shortly after his requested images began arriving, it became troublingly clear to the group that the craft's speed wasn't the only thing, or even the main thing, to worry about. Here it is, the Italian announced when his first image was in. He hovered his finger over the button to open it, and then tapped very firmly as though showing himself that he wasn't going to be scared. In truth, however, Alessandro was going to be scared. Very, very quickly, and for very, very good reason. E-43, Zhongnong Hai, Beijing, China In Ding Xiang's two decades as Chinese premier, he had seen a lot of things and overcome a lot of challenges. In the face of this one, however, the political stalwart was struggling to see a way forward. Cooperation truly was humanity's only hope, as Ding knew perfectly well and sometimes had to impress upon his younger and less internationally minded colleagues. But today, with the best minds in the world and the station all working on trying to understand and mitigate the effects of the same problem, even this deep cooperation held little hope in Ding's heart. Ding Ziyang was a man who would never give up until his dying breath, but nor would he be holding his breath for victory. E-42, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. There it is, indeed, William Godfrey sighed when the craft appeared on the screen. It was still small and lacking in detail, since this was no Hollywood movie where Alessandro could hit the enhance and bring forth a crystal-clear HD shot of the tremendously distant alien vessel. The image certainly wasn't as sharp or detailed as the pictures Alessandro got from the heartbeat, purely due to the tens of millions of miles worth of extra distance at play, but there was something psychologically different about seeing it set against the sun from Earth's perspective. More to the point, however, the fact that the craft had become visible again was a huge psychological blow in itself. Simply put, this meant that the plan to halt the engineer's approach by clearing the vault of its unborn architects had failed. What had initially felt like a long shot came to be seen as a real shot at making a difference by the group, as tended to be the case since wishful thinking often made the only available way ahead feel like a promising one. Helplessness was the word of the moment on Il Cercatore, with almost everyone focusing entirely on how fast the vessel was moving rather than what could possibly be done about it. That was going to have to change, and that would change, but the group were in for a major shock to hasten their urgency along in the worst way possible. Second image is in, Alessandro said. He navigated to it quickly and immediately moved his eyes closer to the screen. Reluctant to distort the image in any way by digitally blowing it up, he used this old-fashioned method as he flicked back and forth between the unmodified first and second images for the cleanest comparison he could get. When Alessandro leaned back to his default position, he kept flicking between the images so the others could see what had previously been obscured by his head. Whoa, it's fairly moving along, Carrick Thomas commented from the back of the watching pack. 
It looks a lot closer already. Is this enough to get an idea of the new speed yet, Alessandro? The Italian only shook his head in response, still staring at the screen as his fingers continued to click on the keyboard's right arrow key to cycle rhythmically and endlessly between the two images. Will three be enough? Carrick asked. I know it must be tougher when it's face on, but when you already know the size of this thing, isn't it possible to use the changes in its apparent size relative to the sun and factor in the observation distance to work out how far it's moved between shots? In theory, Alessandro said. Still flicking between the images, he stopped only when the third arrived. He then leaned into the screen again for a look at this latest shot and stayed there while he slowly cycled between it and the previous two. Look, he said, speaking as he finally leaned back to let the others see clearly again. Look at the edges. Is it changing course? Godfrey asked, his voice naturally rising half an octave in reaction to its first sighting of a possible source of optimism in far too long. It looks like the angle has changed. Slowly, but certainly, Alessandro shook his head. It's not changing course. The others didn't know what to make of Alessandro's demeanor, but it was starting to seem like each successive image was making him more and more certain that things were even worse than they yet realized. When a notification window popped up to announce the arrival of the fourth image, the rest of the group found themselves repositioning their heads in anticipation of another forwards lean from Alessandro. But this time, none came. Looming slightly larger in the image, the craft again looked closer, and to most of the others again looked differently shaped, which they thought had to just mean differently angled than it had in the previous shot. Wait a minute, Godfrey said first among them to catch on. Is it? It is, Alessandro interrupted. He sighed the most defeated sigh any of the others had ever heard, from him or anyone else, and took not one but two hands from the keyboard and placed them on the top of his head, in an appropriately dejected reaction. The Italian's right foot bounced on the ground in a telltale sign of stressful discomfort. It's not just getting closer, he gulped. It's getting bigger. When these impossible words punctuated the air, Godfrey put his hand on Alessandro's shoulder and leaned in like the Italian had done several times. The ICA chairman then took it upon himself to flick between the four images using the arrow key he had watched Alessandro press so many times. Now that the idea was out there, it seemed so obvious that the others couldn't believe they hadn't seen it after the second image, let alone the fourth. An etched shape at the center of the craft wasn't getting noticeably larger, indicating that the vessel wasn't getting closer at a fast enough rate to make a difference on that front, at least in these images which were being captured at such short time intervals, but the craft as a whole was undeniably increasing in size. When they knew what to look for, it looked very much as though the engineer's craft had expanded, even in the time between the first image and the second. The change between the third and fourth, however, was absolutely unmistakable. Flicking then between the fourth and the first naturally brought the biggest change of all, and it was no exaggeration to say that in under a minute the craft had at least trebled in size. Alessandro Bonucci, breathless and fidgety like no one had ever seen him, couldn't even bring himself to open the fifth image when it arrived, and instead encouraged Godfrey to click the button. When Godfrey leaned in and hit the arrow key, the craft's growth, its horribly troubling and disconcertingly consistent growth, was clearer than ever. We must have pissed these bastards off something fierce, Alessandro said, talking in a way he very rarely did. Because they're not just paying us a visit. My friends, they are blocking out our sun. Part 5. Eclipse a good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent on arriving. Lao Tzu E-41 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore We don't know this for sure, 
William Godfrey said, perhaps trying to convince himself as much as anyone else that Alessandro wasn't definitely right in his assumption that the engineer's craft was expanding in a deliberate attempt to block out the sun from Earth's perspective. The images didn't lie, however, and as a man of science, Alessandro was not in the habit of jumping to conclusions with only assumptions to take him there. When the Italian shared his unfortunately confident view of what was happening, he did so only after waiting for two additional data points to confirm what was a strong hunch after the first three images came in. By the fifth image, no one could plausibly deny that the already enormous craft was getting bigger as well as closer, and the only two pertinent questions left in Alessandro's mind were now how much life-giving solar energy the craft would block and what could possibly be done about it. A third question soon came his way from the visibly shaken Serena Cruz, who took several seconds, and indeed several attempts, to stammer out a question as to why the engineers were doing this. Alessandro could only shrug. And I guess, if they are already traveling as fast as they can, and if the rocket-like missiles we saw them use against Heartbeat can't travel this far, then this is the quickest way they can hurt us. If their craft keeps expanding, we are in serious trouble. How serious? Godfrey asked. Alessandro, what would happen in an eclipse without end? At this, Alessandro slowly blew air from his lips and shook his head. There are too many unknown variables to give any kind of meaningful answer to that question right now, Chairman Godfrey, he replied. How long will it keep expanding? Will the nature of the barrier block all direct heat from the sun as well as all direct light? We don't know. But we could quickly see huge changes to wind movements, which would only worsen temperature differentials between the poles and the equator. And that's when the real problems could begin. To be frank, though, those kinds of issues would be problems if our sun was being obscured by a stationary object. When the object in question is approaching us at the speed it is, there might not even be enough time for those kinds of effects to fully kick in. When Alessandro had been talking, two more images of the craft had come in. The fact that its continued expansion was no surprise did nothing to reduce how terrifying it was. Alessandro, Carrick said, inflecting the word into a question and adopting a tone that sounded more curious than the fear that tinged everyone else's. This in itself was curious to Alessandro, since fear seemed like the appropriate response, so he turned towards the sharp-minded Welshman with a real degree of interest. Yes? You don't think they're beginning to construct something like a Dyson sphere, do you? Alessandro looked back to the screen with a quizzical expression, as though pondering this for the first time. While he looked again at the images, including another new one as it came in and continued the pattern of rapid expansion, Carrick was explaining what he meant by Dyson Sphere to less familiarized members of the group, which was to say, all of them. No, Alessandro said, speaking with decision after enough thought and observation to be sure. A Dyson Sphere is a structure that surrounds a star to harvest its energy. We'll see for absolutely certain very soon, but I'm already sure they're not going to surround the sun. If they were, why would they have started expanding their craft while they are still moving away from the target star? They're cutting us off from the sun's energy. The final size of the block, as well as its thickness and composition, are going to determine how dangerous this is. For all we know so far, this whole thing could be a show of strength. Clark McCarthy's deep voice mused from his standing position behind Alessandro and Godfrey. If it is, it's working. But Alessandro, how much of the sun would they have to cover for people on Earth to notice without any viewing equipment? Like, if something covered half the sun, people would notice. A third, a quarter, yeah? But where's the line? That's a good question, Alessandro mused. Animals would know first. Even partial eclipses can bring major behavioral changes in some species, and totality has huge effects. I suppose plants would likely know first of all, if we're thinking in those terms, but their reactions aren't as noticeable as birds returning to their nests as soon as it hits. And I'm asking this in the roughest terms, Emma said from her office in Birchwood, prefacing her first question. Since I know you can't be precise, we must be on the seventh or eighth image by now, so hopefully there's some kind of consistent pattern emerging at the very least. Based on the expansion so far, 
If they could somehow block out the whole sun with this thing, and if that's what they're trying to do, roughly how long would it take? Alessandro glanced at the latest image. Hours, he said. The silence in the station and in Birchwood was suddenly deafening. The expansion is accelerating, Alessandro said. The block grows by a larger amount each time. If that keeps up, it's quickly exponential. Nothing would take long. But hours? Emma pushed. Another image arrived, catching Alessandro's eyes more than any of the others so far. No, forget I said that, he said. Emma breathed a sigh of relief. Good, because days would be too much to handle, so hours would... Um, Mom? Piper said, pointing to the section of their screen that displayed a mirror of Alessandro's, currently showing the latest image, rather than the video call window where Emma had been looking. I think he means we're not looking at hours because we're looking at minutes. Taking no pleasure in confirming this, Alessandro nodded several times. Just look at the last growth. It's not going to take long if it keeps increasing time by time from an already big starting point like this. But aren't we eight light minutes from the sun? Carrick asked. Alessandro gulped and nodded again. We are. So for all we know, they could already have blocked out the whole sun, and we're just waiting for the news to get here. E-40. Fishing Trawler, North Sea. Most who spent even ten minutes in the company of Callum Nash would leave the encounter sure in the knowledge they had met a man with quite a story to tell. There had been the amateur archaeologist, there had been the metal detectorist phase, and most recently there had been his little-known but crucial role in guiding Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz to the artifact that let young Piper McCarthy into the alien vault beneath their so. And amid it all, of course, there was Callum's livelihood as a trawlerman on waters where only men made of the stern stuff could get by. Callum hung on to his job despite his advancing years and relative financial comfort, always feeling the pull of the sea and the camaraderie he found upon it. The new chapter that was about to be written in Callum's story would perhaps stretch credulity in future listeners more than any other, but the men he stood alongside when it happened would always know the truth. It began with a sighting of something that never failed to warm Callum's heart, a pod of orcas. It was always a treat to see these magnificent beasts in the flesh, but today they were closer than usual when Callum spotted them and proceeded to get even closer. Nobzy! Nash yelled, calling his colleague by the same nickname he always used. Come and take a look at these! Before Callum could even finish his sentence, their boat took a colossal whack from something in the water. As Callum worked his way back to his feet, needing more than a little support as he did, he caught sight of a sperm whale breaching the water within literal spitting distance of the boat. Without doubt, it had been responsible for the thud. Nobsy arrived just in time to help the much older Callum to his feet, but at that point the younger man in turn caught sight of the pod of orcas. Unlike when Callum first saw them, though, the iconic creatures were no longer passing idly by. Now, in an inverted formation like none Nobsy had seen in his decade on the water, the orcas were very clearly preparing to charge the boat. I'm hitting the current, Nobsy yelled, leaving Callum, not seriously injured, to fend for himself out of momentary necessity. It's not going to hit us again, Callum insisted. In all of his many years on these waters, a single whale had never made contact with any of his boats more than once. But when he got to his feet and saw that Nobsy wasn't worried about the lone sperm whale, the man's decision to hit the current suddenly made a lot more sense. With a pod of powerful and intelligent orcas having set their sights on the boat for a reason Callum couldn't begin to understand, presumably the same one that had motivated the sperm whale's unusual action, a boat like this, falling firmly at the smaller end of the scale as far as trawlers went, could conceivably be in real trouble. The current, as the men called it, wasn't really a current in any technically correct sense. 
Instead, it was an underwater system that emitted waves intended to disperse cetaceans in a bid to protect them from accidental catches. The system had been installed at great expense during a brief period when it had been a legal requirement for any fishing vessel over a certain size, only for the law to be quickly repealed when the waves turned out to be not quite so harmless as first believed, and for the first time in its hitherto pointless existence, both Callum and Nobsey were glad it was there. The orcas were well on the way towards the boat when Nobsey reached the control, and in the seconds before Callum hit the button, he felt an odd sense of serenity in the face of such natural power. What Callum Nash didn't know yet was that this situation wasn't quite as natural as he thought. When the current kicked in, the orcas broke formation and scattered like city-bound pigeons fleeing the boots of an overexcited child. In all my days, Callum said, shaking his head in confusion over what could have gotten into the whales. When he turned back towards Nobsey, his entire mind turned to the question of what exactly was getting to him. For while Callum had looked up from the sea to face Nobsey, his colleague was looking at something much higher still. Holding up his left hand to shield his eyes out of habit more than necessity, Nobsey pointed towards the sun with the index finger of his right. Something's no right, he said, fighting his every instinct which told him not to look towards the ordinarily blinding light. Callum belatedly looked up too, and when he did he saw that while the edges of the sun were still bright, the bulk of it was anything but. No eclipse had been forecast, he was absolutely sure of that, but this didn't look like any eclipse he could remember anyway. As he squinted, Callum could have sworn he saw the dark shadow across the middle of the sun increase in size from the center out to leave barely a sliver of light around it. Looking away left no bright light dots in his vision, as it normally would have if he'd glanced at the sun for even a second, but what it did bring was a realization of how eerily dark it had just gotten. Whatever was going on, Callum Nash had an ironclad hunch that it was what had spooked the whales. But as the day wore on, and indeed, within as little as a few more minutes, both Callum and Nobsey would know that the bizarre events they had witnessed up close were merely a prelude of what lay ahead. Even faster moving, even more intelligent, and certainly more ruthless than the orcas who had threatened the boat, the beasts who were coming Callum Nash's way were not of a kind that could be dissuaded by anything as simple as an uncomfortable sound aimed in their direction. E-39, Ford McCarthy Residence, Birchwood, Colorado. As each successive image reached them from the station, the McCarthys felt their stomachs not even tighter. Less than ten minutes after Alessandro's prediction that minutes were indeed the appropriate unit for estimating how long it would take for the engineers' expanding craft to fully cut Earth off from the sun's life-giving energy, things had already gotten worse. With the coverage provided by the craft still increasing by larger increments each time, the blockage was by now troublingly complete to an extent that Emma imagined it would imminently begin causing chaos in countries where it was currently daytime. The direct effects of this unforeseen and unnatural eclipse could only be guessed at this stage, but Emma was struggling to think of anything that could spark fear and helplessness in humanity any more than the disappearance of the sun itself. It was such a post-apocalyptic kind of development, Emma at times felt unsure whether she might not be dreaming. What she could have done to deserve her sleep being tainted by that kind of nightmare would be a mystery in itself, she figured, with the thoughts in her head making about as much sense as the developments in her world's sky. A brief flash of her office's overhead light startled Emma, as well as Dan and Piper, but all were unspeakably relieved that the lights had merely flashed, rather than died. Everything suddenly felt very fragile, with electricity near the top of that list. Immediately after the flash, a loud alarm pierced through the air outside. Dan ran to the window, but before he got there, several more alarms had joined it. They all screamed and screeched as though competing to be heard over each other, and only a change of destination to the front door told him what was going on. 
even though it was still the middle of the night, the unnatural oppressiveness of the darkness over Birchwood was unmissable. The home security alarms had probably been triggered by the instantaneous power surge, Dan reckoned, but the wistful howls and frightened woofs of dogs in neighboring yards joined the cacophony of alarms for an altogether different reason. Rather than the presence of a power surge, the dogs were concerned by the absence of something else. Where's the damn moon? Mr. Bird called from across the street, touching on this absence with a very obvious but very good question. Dan looked up. He could see it, just, but only because he knew where to look, and likely also because it had been such a bright and almost full moon during his appearance at the drive-in at the beginning of an evening that felt like it had lasted forever. Dan invited Mr. Bird across the street with a hand gesture. They're building a barrier to block the sun, he said. There's no light to reflect. Mr. Bird's heart sank at the sound of these words, which truly hit him like a ton of bricks and sent his eyes to the ground in desolation. But Mr. Bird, Dan began. He then waited to continue only when the neighbor who'd always been there for him finally looked back up to meet his gaze. We're not giving up. E-38, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. At Alessandro's request, Chip Petrovich rushed to wake Cody from his sound sleep as soon as the reality of the group's situation, and the world's situation, began to sink in. Within minutes of a recent development that no one had seen coming and no one had the faintest idea how to deal with, Rogue had already returned to the station. His departure to the distant reaches of space through a portal-like gate uncrossed by humans hadn't changed the engineer's relentless course for Earth, and true to his word, the architect was back to keep trying to help in any way he could. Cody's ability to communicate with Rogue was seen as more crucial than ever now that humanity's situation was more fragile than ever, what with the engineer's craft now entirely blocking out the sun as it continued its approach, but the sheer urgency of the situation gave Alessandro another reason to want to talk to the boy. By the time Cody arrived in the control deck, Chip had already filled him in on what was happening. Rogue, standing once more in the station's control room, while the twenty-four other architects he had raised from the vault remained in the enormous wandering mothership they would now call home, struck a pose that somehow made him look more vulnerable than he had previously. The tall creature always had to crouch while he was on the station, which certainly hadn't been constructed with his kind in mind, but his arms now hung differently than the others were used to seeing, and even his face looked softer in a hard-to-pin-down kind of way. Via the unique bond enabled by their telepathic connection, Cody knew that Rogue was feeling deflated by the failure of his last action. He was glad to no longer be alone in the universe, so certainly didn't see that action as a waste of time, with the source of his sadness instead being sympathy for the humans he had come to consider friends. Those humans had trusted him despite the crimes of his ancestors and had led him to the twenty-four companions he was happy to have, and seeing them like this, helpless and scared, created the most intense negative emotions the architect had ever known. For several minutes, the rest of the group asked questions of Rogue via Cody, as well as directly asking some to the boy, all concerning their interpretation of the engineer's far-reaching decision to suddenly expand their craft and block out the sun. Neither had any particularly strong hunches about why this was happening, to no one's surprise but everyone's disappointment, and neither detected anything unseen by the others. One faint hope raised by Alessandro was that Cody and Rogue, the only two members of the group with any uplift abilities besides Piper's telekinesis, might have spotted a transcript on the incoming craft or the panel-like sections of the shield it had spread outwards to enable its sun-blocking attack on Earth. Attack was a word Alessandro considered perfectly appropriate, given the obvious importance of the sun's heat and light to all life on Earth, especially given that the data he was seeing on the station's instrumentation and receiving from contacts on the ground was crystal clear in confirming that the effects of this block were far more than simply visual. 
Temperatures were already dropping on Earth, albeit thankfully not yet as dramatically as might have been expected, while reports of extremely strange animal behavior were rampant on social media. Alessandro's initial reaction to the development was that the engineers had been sending a message, be it a simple show of strength or a precursor to something, and to that end, he had allowed himself to hope a transcript might have been within sight to give humanity a chance of knowing what exactly their approaching foes wanted from them. Neither Rogue nor Cody saw anything so helpful, with Melly's empathic ability to sense their feelings confirming to the others that both were as confused and troubled as everyone else. Alessandro wasn't finished with the topic of transcripts, however, and despite an element of concern as to how Chairman Godfrey might react, he quickly broached a topic that had been back at the forefront on several other minds without quite making it out into the open. With everyone gathered around his computer, Alessandro navigated away from the images and data relating to the engineer's sunshade and called up an image captured by one of Gio Nunez's drones in the vault beneath Thurso. The image came from the source room, where the architects had been found and released, and more specifically, focused on the central area of the floor where Cody had excitedly spotted a transcript about something the group could no longer avoid discussing. You can't be serious, Godfrey lamented. His words came in a deflated tone with a sigh to underline them, rather than in any kind of angry manner. Come on, Alessandro, I know that desperate times call for desperate measures, but this would be like dealing with a rat infestation by starting a fire in your living room. Even if we could somehow utilize this pulse sphere to hit these monsters, and that's the biggest if in the history of all ifs, we'd be killing ourselves in the process. Untroubled by this reaction, and indeed relatively pleased that it was far milder than it might have been, Alessandro opted not to react directly to Godfrey's words and instead looked at Cody. I need you to tell us absolutely everything the transcript in the vault says, the Italian requested. In order, with as much detail as you can give. Can you do that for us? Cody gulped, feeling more pressure than ever before under the many gazes of a group who weren't all looking at him in the unquestioningly positive way they once had. Okay, he said. While the others listened intently, and Melly paid close attention to the fluctuations of the boy's mood during each stage of his description, Alessandro scribbled fervently into a notepad. His computer was making an audio recording of Cody's description, so Alessandro's written notes were spur-of-the-moment reactions and brainstormed tangents relating to the boy's words rather than notes of those words themselves. Those who knew Alessandro well were familiar with his habit of writing with a pen and paper when he was thinking deeply. He sometimes insisted that it allowed his brain to work through things in a different way than if he was typing and he had a particularly interesting habit of doing so in Italian handwriting, even when the words he was recording or considering came in English. The physicist's rapid handwriting was so idiosyncratic and squashed together that none of the others would have been able to make heads or tails of his thoughts, even if they were in English, as it went. But they could see that his gears were turning. Cody's long look at the transcript brought a description that was entirely consistent with his live reading and the first recollection he had described to Alessandro when he got back to the station, but it was also considerably fuller and contained specific details that the Italian, as well as all of those watching and listening all around him, found very intriguing. Does Rogue see anything else this time? Alessandro asked when Cody reached the end of his thorough description. He neither looked up from his paper nor stopped writing as he asked. Cody turned to the architect and silently discussed this point. No, he eventually relayed. But he says he is willing to help with whatever we decide to do with it. No one said anything. One of the first things it says is that the pulse sphere can be permanently deactivated, Cody reiterated, repeating this early part of his insight as soon as he had finished telling the group the entirety of what he saw. Only an architect can get down to where the sphere is, and then it can either be reactivated with a new countdown, or it can be irreversibly deactivated. 
But you didn't say anything about controlling or redirecting the force of the energy release, Godfrey said. Don't get me wrong, deactivating this thing is something I'd very much like Rogue to do if he's certain he can do so safely, but I just can't see any way of using this as a last resort defense against the engineers without destroying ourselves in the process. Weren't you listening? Cody asked. It's one of the transcripts that let me really see the thing it's about, not just read it. And I can see the pulse sphere. It's silver, solid, more like a ball of steel than a ball of energy. It's floating in the middle of the chamber under the source room, but I don't know if there's a force field holding it there, or if it's maybe magnetism or something like that. I think there's going to be more instructions either written on it or right beside it. There could be a control panel on the wall, like there was to release the other architects, but one of the most important things I saw is the part about being able to reactivate it with a new countdown, not just being able to make it release the energy right away. Godfrey upturned his palms. But what use can this actually be to us? Setting a timer to go off when they arrive might get rid of them, but it would sure as hell get rid of us. And however big Rogue's craft is, there's no way we could evacuate everyone to New Kergalen. Not even close. I'm not saying we should do that, Cody said, furrowing his eyebrows at the misinterpretation. We can be more precise. Based on what evidence? Godfrey pressed. Cody, why in the world would we ever assume Rogue would be able to direct the energy from this thing, even if he can reactivate it? You said you've told us everything you saw on the transcript, and there was nothing about directing a beam of energy or anything like that. We've seen firsthand that this sphere spreads its destructive energy outwards in every direction. This thing is a grenade, not a bullet. Yeah, Cody said. Yeah, what? Godfrey asked, this time throwing his hands in the air as he lost the ability to any longer hide his frustrated confusion. It is kind of like a grenade, the boy replied. So maybe we just need Rogue to take out the pin and throw it at the bad guys before it blows. E-37, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland Gio Nunes had grown used to seeing little of the sun during his time in Scotland, and his two friends and fellow cabin dwellers were even more accustomed to dreary days. There had never before been a day like this one, though with the afternoon sun entirely obscured by something far less natural than clouds. Davy and Stevie could hardly take their eyes off the faint circle, which illuminated Thurso and the surrounding area only as much as a small candle might illuminate a cave. Their position in the field was well lit, thanks to all the equipment that had been brought in to let their earlier and all-important drilling work continue at all hours. But the men turned the lights off on several occasions, when they left the cabin in the faint hope that the shield might be lifting. It wasn't lifting, needless to say, and their communications with the station left the men with little hope that it would any time soon. Hope was in short supply across the world, too, with people in different areas of the planet waking up to the same harrowing, sunless sky with each passing hour. The trio in the cabin saw news coverage from London as well as Birchwood, and it clearly didn't take direct communication with the station for any of the networks to confidently report that the alien craft Emma and Dan had warned the world about was now here. Ground-based video captured by amateur astronomers showed an initially small object in front of the sun getting bigger very quickly, and so it was that the general public were just as aware as the looped-in trio that the engineers had blocked out the sun on purpose rather than as an incidental side effect of their approach. Like everyone else, the men felt utterly helpless. All they could do was continue their work of monitoring the vault, where very recent word from the station suggested Cody and Rogue might be coming back for a closer look, but still just a look, at the pulse sphere the boy had mentioned while they were releasing the architects from their pods in the source room. That pulse sphere was already a topic of fervent social media speculation, as Stevie noticed first, even if the mainstream media wasn't mooting its reactivation as a serious possibility in humanity's attempts to deal with and simply survive an ever-evolving threat. 
No readings had changed from inside the vault, which was at least one source of admittedly scant relief, but the surface temperature around the cabin had fallen noticeably, and various flocks of birds had been moving oddly ever since the alien shadow fell over Thurseau. Like the rest of the world, Geo, Davy, and Stevie had absolutely no idea of what was coming next. But much more specifically than anyone else, the reliable trio had no idea of just where the coming challenges might soon be taking them. E-36, Ford McCarthy Residence, Birchwood, Colorado While it was decided that Cody and Rogue would soon return to the vault, and indeed, all throughout a long morning and longer afternoon spent trying to handle all of the chaos and concerns that came with the sun being blocked, Emma McCarthy barely had time to stop for breath. There were frequent check-ins with the station, as well as personal conversations with world leaders as eminent as Anna Vasquez and Ding Ziyang, as they tried to come up with some kind of plan to deal with a rapidly deteriorating situation. Disorder was breaking out in darkened cities around the world, quite understandably, and a sense of helplessness was quickly taking hold. The audacious Pulse Sphere-related plan, championed on the station by young Cody, didn't factor into these discussions, but nothing more reasonable was rising to the fore either. With every passing hour, Emma felt like the sand of the hourglass was climbing higher around her. Time was running out, with no prospect of a solution on the horizon. Ding and Vasquez both relayed the concerns of their own government scientists, all of whom were seeing massively concerning effects of what amounted to an unexpected and unprecedentedly long-lasting total solar eclipse. To say there had never been anything like it before would have been obvious, but for scientists desperate for some kind of precedent to lean upon, the importance of this point couldn't be overstated. As the afternoon wore on in Birchwood, an idea to gather world leaders and eminent scientists for a roundtable discussion as quickly as possible gained enough traction for the event to be scheduled to occur within a matter of hours. It was perhaps unsurprising that this idea came from Alessandro Bonucci, an eminent scientist himself, as well as lifelong internationalist and cooperative voice of reason. What was more surprising was Alessandro's suggestion that the roundtable should be televised, doubling up as not only a way for leading decision-makers and scientific voices to get their heads together, but also a way to keep the world's increasingly beleaguered population informed of the situation and their leaders' tireless efforts to tackle it. This was better than leaving the kind of void the mainstream media was currently filling with doomsday predictions, Alessandro said, but he didn't need to sell Emma on the idea and she didn't need to sell anyone else. It made sense, and the stage was set. William Godfrey's firm support of the idea led to it being presented as an ICA roundtable event. The roundtable would air commercial-free on TV stations around the world and also online, hosted by Maria Janzik and featuring a small number of live panelists joined by dozens of video contributors. In the bygone days of the IDA leak, when Dan McCarthy's discoveries and persistence had all but forced governments of the world into making announcements regarding the existence of extraterrestrial life, those leaders had spoken to their respective citizenries with a common message. Today, however, no such obvious common message rose to the fore. Citizens around the world desperately wanted to know what was going on, and just as importantly, what was going to be done about it and a blacked-out sun was certainly of more immediate interest to them than relatively abstract notions of cover-ups and conspiracies had been in the past. This was a very different situation in which a consensus position had to be found rather than merely announced. National leaders jumped at the chance to participate, and when the news of the show went public, many observers noted that they were more or less going to have an all-access pass to a virtual ICA summit. ICA Chairman William Godfrey would be participating, of course, and to lend gravitas to the event, he was opting to do so from the studio in New York. The McCarthys would be joining him, along with President Vasquez and a handful of American and Canadian scientists. Ding Ziyang politely declined the offer of being transported in an alien spacecraft to enable his own in-person participation, but he would be there by video link. 
All kinds of news stories about bizarre and startling effects of the unnatural eclipse crossed Emma's eyes over the course of the day, with changes in animals' behavior being one of the most frequent kinds. In most cases, the incidents in question were simply incredible to see, such as the unprecedented gatherings of various bird species and the midday appearances of all kinds of ordinarily nocturnal creatures. Cases of aggression and other dangerous maladjustment were sadly fairly frequent in their own right, too, however, be that whales attacking boats they normally swam beside like gentle giants, or be it captive chimpanzees attempting to flee the landscaped islands where their aversion to water had until now kept them confined without bars. Almost every glance Emma took at the trending social media reactions to the eclipse and the upcoming ICA roundtable also showed her that Maria Janzik was working overtime to hype the event, quite understandably and quite rightly. The one post that caught Emma's eye in particular was Maria's call for opinions about whether the pulse sphere in the Thurso vault was something humanity should be considering utilizing if the worst came to the worst. This post had more far engagement than any of the others, which was really saying something given how many comments they all received, an opinion looked to be split right down the middle. Whether that would be the case among the world leaders who would be discussing it all in a few hours remained to be seen. In the meantime, however, Chairman Godfrey and his personally trusted inner circle took it upon themselves to gain some further context on the potential use and potential danger of that remarkable sphere. And naturally enough, there was only one place they could get it. E-35, Subterranean Vault, Thurso, Scotland in a move that was neither top secret nor deliberately publicized, William Godfrey returned to Thurso in the same company as last time, less than 24 hours after his involvement in the release of 24 dormant architects. The fact that an impossibly powerful pulse sphere was still lying dormant in that vault, rather than lying extinct, as the ICA chairman might have guessed, and certainly would have hoped, presented both a headache and a possible last resort option for humanity's increasingly forlorn hopes of surviving the approach and perhaps the eventual arrival of the incoming engineers. Prior to this trip, it was impressed upon Cody by Chip and the others that he quite simply had to follow their instructions at all times. They stressed that this was particularly crucial when it came to passing instructions on to the huge architect who considered the diminutive child as a clear intellectual superior due to his remarkable neurological gifts. Godfrey couldn't kid himself that there wasn't a risk inherent to bringing Cody and Rogue back to the source room and allowing a closer look at the hatch, which led to the sphere below, but he made an excellent point that the others missed. He wasn't letting Cody and Rogue re-enter the vault, he was simply offering to accompany them. Rogue was the one with the ability to teleport in and out of the vault, and Rogue was the one with the unique ability to access the lowest area of the vault where the sphere was believed to be positioned. Hearing it put like this didn't exactly allay any fears among the members of the group who had been concerned by Cody's earlier display of defiance, but it did remove their opposition to their return visit. Godfrey wisely suggested that it was better for their return to be accompanied, particularly by Chip, since at least that way there would be a chance of talking them out of any foolhardy or reckless actions, just as had proven the case last time. As before, Rogue flashed the group straight to the source room, with no need for the eight-minute walk from the lift shaft by the operations cabin. Geo, Davy, and Stevie waved from that cabin when Rogue's small, saucer-shaped craft touched down next to them. Hopeful the alien they had come to trust as much as they trusted the messengers wouldn't let them down. The men in the cabin were also once more able to watch proceedings unfold thanks to the countless lights and cameras Geo had put in place, and once more they were sharing the live footage with the station. The McCarthys were again watching in Birchwood too, albeit this time from home rather than in public. This second visit to the source room in quick succession wasn't being broadcast publicly at all, but it was being recorded, and would be discussed and perhaps even aired during the high-profile ICA roundtable that was set to kick off in New York in a little over two hours' time. 
Okay, William Godfrey said, breathing slowly. Cody, before we get to anything else, I would like you to ask Rogue to look absolutely everywhere in this room for any transcripts he might have missed until now, and I want you to do the same. That would help us all very much. The boy nodded in agreement with this wise request and passed it on to Rogue. They both then did as Godfrey suggested, slowly and thoroughly searching every corner of the source room. But as thorough as this search was, it rather unsurprisingly came up blank. Just the ones we've already seen, Cody said. It says to be careful because a major impact of any kind could damage the sphere and cause an energy release. It's all what I told you before, saying that Rogue can open this hatch. That's where I think more instructions and information will be. Down there. Much as he had decided to come this far because he thought it was better to be with Cody and Rogue rather than for them to later come without him, William Godfrey knew what had to be done. With the sky dark all across the world, the entire planet suddenly cast into a night without end, Godfrey knew that calls for the utilization of the pulse sphere, however foolhardy, were likely to become deafening in the coming days and even in the next few hours when he got to New York for the ICA roundtable. Gaining as much information as possible before then made all the sense in the world, as far as he was concerned, and Cody's restatement of the warning about the need for care suggested that he knew better than to do anything too reckless in any case. Can we go down? Cody asked, very plainly directing the question to Godfrey. As far as the ICA chairman was concerned, this question utterly vindicated his decision to make the trip. Cody's seeking approval now was a great sign that the boy would keep doing so whatever they might learn when they descended to the vault's lowest level. Needless to say, this was certainly preferable to the kind of guns a blazing approach he had looked set to take immediately after Rogue released the other architects from their pods and first exposed the illuminating sphere-related transcript. Carefully, Godfrey replied with a half nod. And we won't do anything silly when we get down there, will we? Definitely not, Cody promised. He then turned to Rogue and passed on Godfrey's blessing. Within a few seconds, in a manner not unlike how the touch of Piper's human hand had unlocked one of the vault's earlier doors, Rogue used the touch of his eerily long-fingered hand to unlock the hatch at the bottom of the angled floor. After waiting for further permission from the humans, who were effectively now his handlers, he then crouched his tall body in an awkward-looking manner and peered down to the deepest depths of the vault. Do we need some light? Godfrey asked. We will, Cody replied, implying that Rogue probably wouldn't. Godfrey then signaled to the cameras on the walls in a request for Gio Nunez to use his cabin-based controls to very carefully maneuver some light-emitting drones into the vault's final and previously concealed chamber. Gio got on this task right away and took almost no time to accomplish it. Godfrey, Chip, and Cody all standing with Rogue at the edge of the hatch, peered down into the newly illuminated chamber. And it was there that they saw it. The most potent, most dangerous, and most remarkable thing any of them had ever laid eyes upon. The metallic pulse sphere that had flattened half of the Scottish Highlands and come within one Piper McCarthy of ending all life on Earth. That was easy. Cody said with a delighted grin. But beside him, and very evidently, William Godfrey was far less sold. E-34, Bird Residence, Birchwood, Colorado For the first time in as long as he could remember, Walter Bird was more comfortable alone in his home than he would have been venturing outside. The darkened world was no place for anyone, and the old man, always one to make the most of the sunrise when it came, wasn't sure how he could cope if the unnatural eclipse lasted for much longer. A world without sunlight didn't bear thinking about, but the rational part of Mr. Bird's mind told him that by its very nature this was a concern that couldn't last for long. Put simply, he ruefully considered, if the sun didn't return to Earth's sky before long, 
there would very soon be no one left to miss it. E-33, Subterranean Vault, Thurso, Scotland Visible to human eyes for the first time, the incredibly powerful sphere was no larger than a car and hung in the air as though suspended by an invisible string. It took up only a small area at the center of the lower level chamber, which the dispersal of Geo's lights suggested could well have a floor space as large as the rest of the vault. This at least made it relatively straightforward and safe to get down without risking an impact of the kind the source room's transcript warned against, and Godfrey's affirmative reply to Cody's question of whether Rogue could now flash them all down there had the group standing in awe of the sphere within just a few more seconds. The object had a mysterious attraction, despite being only slightly reflective and not glistening much in the light. Godfrey knew that his feelings of awe were largely inspired by what he knew the sphere to be capable of, rather than its relatively mundane physical appearance, but the sight of it hanging in the air, like it was, did have an odd degree of beauty to it. Can you guys see anything? Chip Petrovich asked, his first words since leaving Rogue's craft several minutes earlier. He certainly couldn't, but then he knew that Cody and Rogue were alone in being able to identify the all-important transcripts that would hopefully illuminate things sooner rather than later. That looks like a control panel, William Godfrey replied, without doubt the last person Chip had expected to speak first. Oh yeah, he said. The alien workstation Godfrey was pointing to lay against the wall of the vault, directly below the control panel Rogue had used to release 24 of his fellow architects. A vast expanse lay in the other direction, all the way to the far end of the kilometer-long vault, so Godfrey and Chip both quickly assumed it was where the answers to their key questions would lie. To their surprise, however, neither Cody nor Rogue seemed to be paying any attention to it. Instead, they were looking at the ground directly beneath the sphere. Godfrey and Chip then exchanged a glance of simultaneous realization when it sank in that the two more gifted members of their party were currently digesting the transcript they had come looking for. Both men were aching to find out what the transcript revealed, but neither wanted to interrupt, so they spent the next 10 or 15 seconds trying to control their runaway heart rates and breathing patterns. Okay, Cody said. I got it all. The men exchanged one last hopeful glance before turning to the boy. Yeah? Chip asked. Anything interesting? Cody's expression, ordinarily quite animated, was very hard to read. You can tell us, Godfrey said as softly as he could. Whatever it is, Cody, you can tell us. The boy nodded. I know. I was just asking Rogue if he can sense force fields or anything above or below it. It didn't mention anything about that. All it really tells us is how Rogue can do the things we already knew he would be able to do. You know, permanently deactivate the sphere so no one could ever use it again, reactivate it and set a new countdown so he could get out of the way before it blows. It's all controllable with that console against the wall. Nothing about redirecting it or focusing the pulse as a beam? Chip asked, his disappointed tone only now betraying the fact that he'd been holding out more hope in this far-fetched scenario than he'd ever let on. Cody solemnly shook his head. That's not something we can do. We tried, Godfrey said, but in light of this I believe we have no option other than to permanently deactive- I wasn't finished, Cody interrupted trying to remember that he was at the end of the day talking to a precocious child, which wasn't easy given how intelligent and canny Cody was, Godfrey bit his tongue on the rebuke that wanted to jump out. No, he replied simply. No, remember what we talked about with it being like a grenade? Well, it warns again down here that disturbing it too much could discharge the full force of the sphere's energy. I think that's why it's all the way at the far end of the bottom layer of this impenetrable vault, but now we know how Rogue can set a countdown. He could do that and then maybe, you know, throw it at the bad guys. Or I guess we wouldn't even need the countdown since an impact would do it. Maybe, Godfrey parroted more caustically than he intended. You guess, Cody said nothing. 
Does it even say anything about the level or kind of impact it would need to set it off? Chip asked. Replying to a man he liked a lot more than the increasingly irritating Godfrey, Cody shook his head slowly. So, for all we know, it might only have to touch the ground, Chip sighed. Or who knows, even maybe a finger tap would do it. You just said you don't know if it's being held there by force fields, but I'm betting it's not floating for no reason. Something this potent is always going to be volatile. It doesn't say we can't move it, Cody said. Chip held his eyes. But it doesn't say we can. Cody's shoulders fell. Clearly, all the boy wanted to do was help the people who had helped him, to help humanity as a whole, and clearly he had become more than a little invested in this potential method of doing so. But with no clear retort at his fingertips to a very valid point, he was momentarily lost for words. We'll need to be returning soon, Godfrey said, trying as far as possible to avoid sounding confrontational. He could see Cody's intentions were good, but he could equally see that his idea had been a reckless one at best. With a slow inhalation, Cody turned to the ICA chairman. Don't ask Rogue to deactivate it yet, he pleaded. At least wait until we've talked about this with the others. In Godfrey's peripheral vision, he caught a glimpse of Chip Petrovich raising his eyebrows to encourage him to compromise on this. Both men knew that the sphere was still floating in place because Cody was allowing it to, since Rogue had by now shown himself to view the boy's word as the one to follow. For this reason, and harking back to the approach he had taken the previous night, Godfrey never wanted to make the boy feel like he was being ignored or like his ideas were being steamrollered. Rebellion that way led, the ICA chairman carefully reflected, and in this situation that could have very conceivably been a truly disastrous outcome. Dealing with Cody would have been a complicated business in regular times, but the stakes of the unique situation they found themselves in often made the balancing act feel almost impossible. Godfrey was glad to have Chip, who Cody listened to more than anyone else, and he was also glad that the boy was, for the most part, extremely reasonable and never one to flout his power or dish out threats to get his own way. Once more, a trip into the source room, and this time beyond, had brought useful distinctions without any concrete progress towards a solution to the engineer-shaped problem that was currently both heading for Earth and enveloping it in an unsustainable darkness. The pulse sphere's energy could not be focused and directed in any particular direction, they now knew, and that knowledge killed all faint hopes of somehow eliminating the hostile and all-powerful engineers before they either arrived on Earth or suffocated the planet from afar. Before long, however, these new distinctions would be tested in ways Godfrey could never have seen coming. With no reason to think the miraculous floating sphere could be safely moved, and several good ones to think it couldn't, Godfrey and Chip gathered around Rogue to be teleported back to the surface without getting anywhere near it. Cody joined them, but not before taking a long and rueful final glance at the sphere. At least, a final glance for now. E-32, Planetary Research Committee, New Birchwood, New Care Galen. Shortly before the start of the ICA Roundtable event in which Timo Fiore and Billy Kendrick were set to appear via video link from New Care Galen, the men sat with their good friend Leisha, pondering the latest data from Earth. Lamenting may have been a better word than pondering, in truth, given how grim the falling temperatures were already making life for vast swaths of the human population. The vast majority of Earth's electrical grid had thankfully not been affected by the unnatural eclipse, at least, but countries which depended heavily on solar energy for their power networks were feeling the effects more than others. As well as the recent primary data Alessandro sent their way from the station, the men had also received more footage from the Thurso vault. This time, it had come from the lowest level of all, in a previously unexplored cavern beneath the so-called Source Room. The cavernous basement itself might have been more deserving of that title, the men considered, since it had now been shown to house the remarkable sphere, which somehow contained all the source energy for the pulses, which had reduced much of the Scottish Highlands to rubble, and would have spread across the whole world, if not for Piper McCarthy's timely and selfless intervention. 
Billy was the man responsible for first seeding in Cody's mind the idea of weaponizing this sphere against its ultimate creators, and for that reason, he had watched most keenly of all as the boy analyzed the transcripts which surrounded it. To Billy's mind, some elements of what Cody learned had been rather deflating, but others had been highly promising. Certainly, learning that the sphere's energy couldn't be directed into a focused beam was bad news. The confirmation that its prodigious power could be brought forth by an impact, however, left Billy with a degree of hope. The reaction on the station, and indeed from Timo and Leisha at his side, struck Billy as overly pessimistic. In a brief discussion with the decidedly conservative William Godfrey, Billy stated that he recognized the risk posed by moving the sphere at all, given that they didn't know what level of impact might trigger an apocalyptic release of energy. The maverick archaeologist responded with an argument that worked around this concern rather than through it, stating that Rogue's 24 newly risen companions could quite conceivably use their powers of telekinesis to move the sphere without touching it, effectively suspending it in the air and giving Rogue the opportunity to flash it, and them, to his waiting mothership. From there, Billy suggested, Rogue could possibly hurl the sphere towards the craft to unleash the power of the pulse and blast the engineers to kingdom come. Clark McCarthy, one of Billy's best friends, spoke for several others and meant no offense in saying that the idea of launching the small sphere at the sun-blocking engineer's colossal craft went beyond the realms of David and Goliath and sounded more like something from a 1980s B-movie. It's not like throwing a rock at them, Billy contended. Whatever this sphere is composed of is like antimatter, and maybe even more potent. A thimble full of it would outmatch an ocean full of dynamite. For the others on the station, and in Birchwood, confirmation that the sphere's energy couldn't be focused into a beam, plus the uncertainty over whether it could be safely moved at all, had now combined to rule out its use as even a last resort to the problem they faced. But for the ever-optimistic and sometimes rash Billy Kendrick, confirmation that an impact could possibly discharge the sphere raised a long-shot hope that wouldn't be silenced as seemingly the only thing within humanity's reach that could possibly do meaningful damage to the hostile and vastly better equipped engineers, the Pulse Sphere was already the hottest topic of discussion on social media. And as the minutes ticked by until Billy Kendrick would be one of countless eminent figures to have his say before an unprecedented global audience, one way or another, something had to give. E-31, RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York. With very different feelings from those she had experienced during her visit to New York with William Godfrey a few long days earlier, as Emma McCarthy walked through the familiar corridors of the RMXT TV studio, she was this time also accompanied by Dan and Piper. Godfrey was there, of course, brought down from the station in an alien craft to participate in a televised ICA roundtable event that was the furthest thing from an entertainment production. The ICA chairman arrived in New York after a quick stopover in Birchwood to pick up three equally high-profile fellow panelists. Unlike the weekly Focus 2020 panels that usually emanated from the world-famous studio complex, there were no battle lines and no ill feeling between tonight's guests. For the first time ever, Humanity was truly united against a common enemy that had shown its power by no lesser action than blocking out the sun, and this led to a very unique vibe as Godfrey and the McCarthys took their seats in the studio before a live audience who looked more concerned than any they had ever seen. President Anna Vasquez, who Dan had met a few times at ICA events in Buenos Aires while she had served as the despicable Nick Mason's vice president, was already seated when they arrived. This alone told Emma that Vasquez really was different from Mason and really was here for the right reasons, since a more self-serving and ego-driven politician would have ensured they arrived last, like a boxer who pettily insisted on making the final ring walk. Aside from Vasquez, there were only two other panelists present in the studio. Both were space-focused scientists and neither were celebrities, which once again signaled how different this event was going to be from the showdowns the audience were used to witnessing. 
Dan, Emma, and Piper all sat before the audience and the cameras, just as they had stood before a crowd at the Birchwood Drive-In during a presentation that already felt like it had been a week ago, rather than merely the 24 most remarkable hours any of them had ever experienced. The feelings of pride and accomplishment Piper had experienced after that presentation were long gone, as were the relatively hopeful perspectives she and her parents had brought to the world about the architects in the vault possibly being what the engineers were coming for. That hope had died when the hostile aliens passed the sun and began blocking it out, and few were expecting the upcoming discussion to be a particularly uplifting one. Two huge screens were present in the studio, one at either side of the long U-shaped desk where Maria Janzik and her guests were seated. One currently contained around a hundred small squares, each of which contained an individual who would be participating remotely, while the other displayed the logo of the Inner Space Contact Agency, under whose banner this roundtable was occurring. Piper glanced at the screen and quickly saw Billy Kendrick and Diane Logan among countless other names and faces she recognized. Even Ding Ziyang was there, completing a veritable who's who of decision-makers. No one quite knew who the ultimate decision-maker would be if no consensus as to how humanity could proceed was reached. The ICA's chief planetary liaison, Dan McCarthy, and its chairman, William Godfrey, were the natural assumptions in many eyes, given their positions, and some were already wondering if tonight could be the night when it finally became clear who really had the final say. For over a decade, Dan had filled a largely ceremonial role not unlike that of the British monarch, who was technically head of state in the nation where Diane Logan and her government clearly set the laws and called the shots. If that setup was ever going to be challenged, many felt this could be the moment. But Dan and Godfrey entered the studio together for reasons much deeper than any desire to be seen as being on the same page. They entered together because they were on the same page. Both also took their seats in the slightly uncomfortable knowledge that while they might have been the individuals everyone else on the panel turned to when a decision had to be made, certain individuals might be unbound by such decisions. A recent discovery in the deepest depths of the Thurso vault were sure to be discussed, and Dan and Godfrey could only hope that its discoverers would listen to and respect the multitudinous views that were about to be aired. No star-studded episode of Focus 2020 had ever come close to matching the importance of this hastily organized roundtable, and none could match the consequences of what would be discussed. But even as the world's foremost leaders and scientific experts prepared to thrash out some kind of unified response to the unprecedented common challenge they faced, Dan and Godfrey understood that the most consequential decision of all would not be made by a human. Ultimately, however, even they would be surprised by where things went. E-30 New Care Grill and Bar and Grill, Birchwood, Colorado. It was evening in Birchwood when Walter Byrd made his way through a large crowd at the drive-in for the more sedate environs of New Care Grill and Bar and Grill. But the eerie absence of any meaningful natural light from either the sun or the moon meant that the watch on his wrist was the only way of knowing. Like many others, Mr. Byrd understandably saw the upcoming ICA roundtable as humanity's one and only chance of hatching a workable plan to deal with the approaching engineers and the eclipse they had already cast upon Earth. When they could do that from so far away, Mr. Bird considered that it hardly bore thinking about what they would be able to do when they reached Earth in a matter of days. Most troublingly of all, though, the effects of the eclipse, which were being reported in some parts of the world, had the old man worried that looking ahead to anything a few days in the future might have been baselessly optimistic. With talk of vast temperature differentials getting worse by the hour and a lack of wind creating noxious air in densely populated cities, the eclipse in its own right was a huge concern. It wasn't hard to understand why most people were paying relatively little attention to this slow suffocation when the despicable aliens who were causing it were drawing ever nearer to Earth. Nevertheless, Mr. Bird dearly hoped that world leaders would be able to focus on two things at once. As soon as the McCarthys told him they would be participating in the ICA roundtable from the RMXT studio in New York, 
Mr. Bird decided that the bar was the best place for him to watch it. It was warmer and more sedate than the drive-in itself, for sure, and exclusively reserved for regulars during times like this when massive influxes of outsiders hit Birchwood due to the magnetic pull of the drive-in whenever something alien-related was in the news. There had never been anything quite like this, of course, and Mr. Bird could assume the crowd's decision to watch the round table on a giant screen in the cold Colorado night was similarly motivated to his own decision to watch with the bar's regulars rather than at home. He knew the old phrase that misery loved company, but throughout his life, Mr. Bird had always thought an equally accurate one would have been that fear loved company. And just as children often clung to their parents when darkness fell on any typical night, people around the world were turning to each other now that a far less typical darkness had been thrust upon them. As he walked through the crowd and passed the grill's familiar security guard, a phrase Dan McCarthy had landed on the previous night echoed in Mr. Bird's mind. We stand together, or we fall apart. Now, more so than ever, these words were true. And with the world's most powerful figures now gathering to knock together some plan for a way out of the hellish situation they were all in, Mr. Bird knew full well that humanity really did face those two choices. The old man wouldn't have trusted anyone more than the McCarthys, Godfrey, and the team on the station to hatch a plan and sell it to whoever else had to give the nod, and his dearest hope as the round table got underway was that this task wouldn't prove to be beyond even them. E-29, RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York for almost an hour, hundreds of millions of Earth's citizens sat in rapt and often terrified attention as their elected leaders and brightest scientific minds discussed the bleakest of all situations in which the planet found itself. Cast into shadow by a hostile alien race, Earth felt every bit as vulnerable as it had during the countdown to the last of the pulses, which were now known to have been put in place by genetically engineered ancient architects doing the work of that very incoming race. Leading scientists from various disciplines shared their data and concerns back to back in a way that couldn't help but demoralize many viewers and indeed some of the panelists in the studio, as well as those participating via video link. One of the studio's huge screens still showed the thumbnail views of those various high-profile figures, while the other was now filled with whichever of them was speaking at the time. Piper McCarthy, yet to speak at all, found herself watching the small squares more than the focused on-person view, preferring to watch the instinctive reactions to some of the most powerful among them when certain points were made. President Anna Vasquez had chimed in to the discussion a few times, as had Emma, but only when prompted for a comment by the show's host, Maria Janzik. Understandably, Maria saw a need for some input from the box office attractions to temper the seemingly endless slew of bad news from the scientists. Vasquez put the bravest face on things that she could, echoing William Godfrey's comment that few of these scientists would have given humanity any chance of surviving the final pulse if they had known everything about it at the time. What we need is to find a plan and dive headfirst into it, the president said. No one wanted to imagine what this round table might have looked like if Nick Mason was in her place, rather than hiding somewhere on a Pacific island where his money was evidently buying a level of discretion sufficient to elude all investigations into his precise whereabouts, but Godfrey and the McCarthys were also growing increasingly glad to have Vasquez there, rather than simply relieved to not have Mason. In a manner that invited calmness, if not quite confidence among viewers, Vasquez was doing a good and responsible job of balancing out the most depressively pessimistic scientists. In accordance with a brief discussion she'd had with Emma earlier in the day, the president understood both the importance of morale and the weight her words carried. There would have been no sense in saying everything was fine, not in response to the pictures of smog-filled cities, of frozen rivers that normally flowed year-round, and of large carnivores encroaching en masse upon areas of human habitation in search of the artificial heat and light it provided. But there would, similarly, be no sense in decrying the situation as hopeless, and Vasquez was wise enough to know it. 
When the hour mark arrived, Maria Janzik stepped in to redirect the discussion away from its data-sharing phase and towards the phase Earth's beleaguered citizens had been waiting for. Everyone already knew what the problem was, even if the input from climatologists and zoologists and any number of other something-else-ologists had illuminated some ways people could protect themselves from the immediate effects of the eclipse. Viewers were glad for the change in focus because, rather than seeing the eclipse as their main problem, most people very naturally saw it as a symptom of the real problem that had to be dealt with one way or another. The Hostile Engineers We heard a lot about how the eclipse is affecting wild animals in those last few minutes, Maria said, and I'm sure we're all familiar with the fight-or-flight mechanism that lies at the heart of the way animals and humans alike tend to react to major threats. In light of that point, I'd like to hand over now to our panelists on New Care Galen, who are coming to us live via the true wonder of cross-gate communication. Billy Kendrick, Timo Fiori, thank you for joining us. For the first time all night, Billy and Timo appeared at full size on the screen to Maria's left, instead of only within a small square on the one to her right. Speaking from New Care Galen, the planet's longest-term human resident then answered a question about the plausibility of a mass evacuation in a far less upbeat manner than many had hoped. We have the space, Billy said, but that's all. Food, shelter, medical facilities. New Care Galen only has enough of these things for the human population we have. At a year's notice, we could possibly be ready for everyone, but obviously moving everyone wouldn't be plausible at a few days' notice, even if we were ready to receive you all. And I'm not in charge, but focusing any of our energy on a partial evacuation doesn't seem right. Dan said it himself, we stand together or we fall apart. In the studio, Dan made a point of nodding firmly enough to ensure the cameras couldn't miss it. It might seem like this is easy for me to say when I'm sitting here on the other side of the gate, I'll admit, Billy went on but we just can't start thinking about seeding Earth to these monsters. And it pains me to say this next part, but the idea that this side of the gate is somehow safe from the engineers is as solid as a bag of jello. All the advanced alien technology here came from the architects, including the gate, and we now know that the ancient architects were engineered and programmed to do all the dirty work on the engineers' behalf. Do you know what I mean? A gate isn't going to protect anyone from the aliens who invented the technology within it. We can't waste time thinking it will. Evacuation isn't an answer to any questions we should be asking. At Billy's side, albeit off-camera, Leisha looked very pensive and not a little concerned by his explicitly stated words about New Care Galen not being safe from the engineer's reach. There had been no notion in the mind of the messenger's leader that it would be, but the bluntness of how Billy had framed that context made it hit home harder than ever. With the greatest of respect, Billy said, we've heard a lot tonight from academic scientists who spend their lives making spreadsheets and looking for problems, and there are a lot of good people on that screen who I still want to hear more from, the likes of Ding, the like of Alessandro, and obviously my good friends in the studio, so I don't expect to have long to say my piece. Your voice is valued, Billy, Maria assured him. She was speaking very truthfully, too, as shown by the fact that Billy was voted in the top five of all panelists her viewers were most looking forward to hearing from. He smiled politely. In any case, I just want to say that while the catastrophist pencil pushers have spent their lives making spreadsheets and looking for problems, I've spent my life digging in the ground and looking for answers. The question we're eventually getting to whether it makes those people uncomfortable or not, has a single answer that's currently floating in the ground under Thurso. The discussion had been coming, and now it was here. These engineers have proven they're hostile by destroying the heartbeat probe and blocking out our sun, Billy said, looking intently into the camera on the upper bezel of his office computer. Whether we want to dance around this point or not, the cold hard fact is that if we want to survive them, we have to defeat them, and if we're going to defeat them, we have to give them a taste of their own medicine. The risks are going to be what the risks are going to be, but we have to use that sphere. E-28 
Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. Although Alessandro Bonucci had so far only been asked to speak a few times during the ICA roundtable, which was currently breaking all global viewing records, the data he had been gathering and collating on Il Tricatore had informed many of the comments and projections from the other panelists. His own views fell somewhere in the middle of the two extremes that seemed to be developing. On one side, doom-mongering academics were predicting that Earth's remaining days would be few, even if the engineers didn't get any closer, or their near-total block on solar energy didn't get any more extreme. On the other, Anna Vasquez and particularly Billy Kendrick were being far more bullshy about humanity's need and ability to do something about it. Alessandro had grave concerns about the point Billy had just raised, regarding the prospect of utilizing the pulse sphere no one fully understood, but which everyone both feared and respected as a weapon of unparalleled power. But given how central he had been to humanity's battle against that sphere when it was flattening even larger swaths of the Scottish Highlands, and given that the battle had ultimately been won by a combination of ingenuity, teamwork, and sacrifice, Alessandro was not giving up hope that a solution could be found. Just out of camera shot, Cody and Rogue watched on as Alessandro waited for his first call to comment on Billy's point about the sphere. The boy's view was clear and very much in line with Billy's, while Rogue was ready and willing to help humanity in any way they might ask him to. Clark and Tara McCarthy stood similarly out of sight, with neither having wished to participate despite the invitation being extended. The McCarthys were flanked by Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz, neither of whom had been invited, but neither of whom would have been keen to be involved either. Carrick and Serena preferred to help from the other side of the spotlight, as they had in locating the artifact which allowed Piper to open the vault in the nick of time, and as they had in identifying Sunforth Correctional Facility as the location where Cody was being held. There was, for the moment, no obvious way for the young couple to help now, which brought feelings of both frustration and helplessness. Serena's short-lived goal of helping Cody to discover something about his birth mother, if he wanted to, already felt like it belonged to the distant past. What with how wrapped up the boy now was in his idea of using the pulse sphere as a decisive defensive weapon. She was glad at least that a tiff with Tara over her reaction to Cody's accidental discharge of his telekinetic power had been equally short-lived, but that offered little solace at the moment. The group within the station were standing together rather than falling apart, but how much longer their planet could stand against the sun-blocking approach of the engineers was a question none could answer, and all were troubled by. Alessandro Bonucci, meanwhile, was so focused on the discussions centered in New York that he didn't notice an initially minor but increasingly significant change in some of the key data fields being displayed on his secondary monitor. While the number of desperately concerned citizens watching the ICA roundtable crossed into the billions, those who were instead watching the sky would very soon be noticing something else. Like the initial expansion of the engineer's craft, it would take a short while for the effects of what was happening to reach Earth. And following a depressingly similar theme, the latest change was anything but positive. E-27, RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York. Very strong words there from Billy Kendrick, Maria Janczyk said. Manfred, would you like to respond first? Manfred Pegg, an eminent climatologist and evidently one of the catastrophist pencil pushers Billy had criticized for constantly seeking the worst possible angle from which to view any situation, scratched his chin in thought. Peg was one of only two scientists in the studio, and indeed one of only two panelists at all aside from Godfrey and the McCarthys, but he had enough TV experience not to feel overawed. Some social media commenters had noted a degree of attention-loving smugness on Peg's face when so many powerful world leaders were for once forced to listen to him, with a much-shared post by one famous comedian putting it most crudely of all during Peg's statements a few minutes earlier, stating that he looked and acted like a guy who likes the smell of his own farts. I hardly even know where to start, Peg replied, 
I know the idea of using this newly discovered sphere has captured a lot of attention, but that doesn't mean it's a good one. In fact, I'd say that's happening because it's a bad one. The idea is patently ludicrous, which is why for some people it almost has that so crazy it just might be good feel to it. And don't get me wrong, solutions and suggestions are always going to be welcome, and really, not even someone like Godfrey is going to- Maria, Godfrey interrupted, looking at her even as he cut off Peg. I know Billy very well, and I think it's safe to say he would want you to address his comments to the organ grinder rather than the monkey. Manfred Pegg scowled at Godfrey, irked to have been swiftly put in his place for mentioning the ICA chairman's name in the tone he had used. Maria Janzik encouraged Godfrey to go on, and go on he did. Billy and I have discussed this privately, he said. I understand his viewpoint that we have to try everything we possibly can, and I understand the pull this sphere has in that regard, since it very clearly is the most powerful object that's ever been within our grasp. I respect Billy just as he respects me, but I can't for the life of me understand how he doesn't see that there are several key reasons his idea of using the pulse sphere in a last gasp defensive salvo against the engineers is an absolute non-starter. Some of these remote panelists on the screen here have made far-fetched proposals of their own today, for instance regarding the possibility of asking our new architect allies if they might be able to create a defensive shield of interdimensional gates around Earth before the engineers get here. To my mind, those proposals merit as much serious discussion as Billy's, which is to say, with respect, no serious discussion whatsoever. Dan? Maria asked, turning to the ICA's hitherto quiet chief planetary liaison. He gulped, feeling the weight of this moment in time even more so than the weight of the global viewership he knew would be hanging on his every word. Billy's idea is obviously better than the one about the gates, he said. Because, like Billy said about the evacuation idea, these guys are the originators of all the gate technology. Any gate Rogue and his friends could make, if they even can make one from scratch, is going to be a gate the engineers can swat aside like a human could kick aside a banana peel. And believe me, I'm not arguing for the pulse sphere idea, but we don't have any reason to think the engineers could stop its impact. After all, Rogue couldn't. The whole idea seems to be that once it's set to blow, it can't be stopped. Emma glanced between Godfrey and Dan, silently telling both of them to leave this issue rather than get pulled into an argument they didn't want to have. She knew that Dan, like her, wasn't in favor of using the pulse sphere, but she did understand why he was trying to provide some balance. The reason for that was Godfrey's unnecessarily firm dismissal of Billy's idea, which really wasn't the best way to go about addressing an idea that had gained tremendous steam among vast swaths of the public throughout the day. I think there are a number of interlinked issues here, she said, taking it upon herself to do what Godfrey should have when given the chance. The power of the sphere is unquestioned, but with that kind of power comes unprecedented danger. We know Rogue can reactivate the sphere to make a hugely powerful pulse, but we know he can't direct the pulse into a beam, Everyone knows this. We've all seen the video from the vault, and we all know Chairman Godfrey was there. I think that's worth mentioning, so that he can't be mischaracterized as closing his ears to this idea. Godfrey tilted his head slightly in acknowledgement of this. He just didn't see any reason to think it would be safe to do the only thing Rogue could possibly do, Emma went on, which is take the sphere into space and essentially firing it at them from there. We could be here all day if we get into speculation of how exactly he could ever do that, but the reality of the situation is that disturbing the sphere in any way could set it off inside the vault. Even Cody acknowledges that as a possibility, and I'm sure Billy will too. So we'd be taking a huge risk, our biggest risk ever, without even knowing that we'd achieve our goal if the risk paid off. The risk is only step one of a lot of steps that would have to go right. We'd still be counting on Rogue being able to get close enough to fire the sphere at the engineers. We'd still be counting on the impact he could create being enough to set it off. 
and we'd still be counting on them not being able to defend against it. By now, Godfrey was nodding along in agreement. Emma sighed. I wish it was more straightforward, but my view is that when the risk of an action going wrong is literally instant annihilation, you can't take that risk without knowing that the action going right would bring success. And I don't think even Billy could say that's something he knows. If I may, the other scientist in the studio chimed in. This woman, an ICA astrophysicist by the name of Bethany Hill, had so far spoken less than any of the other in-studio guests with the exemption of Piper McCarthy. Maria Janzik held out a hand for Bethany to proceed. There are a lot of things we don't know about this sphere and the pulses we saw it emit throughout those two terrible weeks, the woman said, but one thing I think I'm qualified to say is that it's going to behave very differently in the vacuum of space than it does within our atmosphere. Even if we think an impact will set it off, we need to consider what setting it off in space would look like. To my mind, this strengthens Mrs. McCarthy's position that we cannot take an extinction-level risk to enable an attempt at something that probably won't work anyway. In my professional opinion, this can't happen. Billy wasn't invited to reply to this point, nor did he rush to do so. There was certainly merit in Bethany's argument that it would be without scientific merit to assume that an impact-derived release of energy by the sphere in space would lead to the same kind of apocalyptic destruction it would on Earth. If Billy had replied, however, he would have stated his belief that a shot in the dark was better than no shot at all, and when humanity found itself in the dark like never before, any shot that could be taken struck the never-say-die archaeologist as a shot that should be taken. But let's not forget that the main point is the main point, Manfred Pegg cut in, reinserting himself into the discussion. Bethany is very correct to say we don't know if the sphere would work in space as Billy's hair-brained scheme would need it to. Frankly, I find it irresponsible to even be discussing the eventuality. We should be focused solely on the inherent and deadly risk of disturbing the sphere from its position in the vault. Billy can talk about Rogue and the other 24 architects using force fields and teleportation to avoid touching the sphere, but who says it has to be touched to go off? For all we know, there could be some kind of unseen device or force in the vault that's keeping the sphere stable. For all we know, the sphere will explode the moment it is disturbed. Granted, the transcript apparently warned that an impact would set it off, but it didn't warn that only an impact would set it off. A flamethrower can set off a fuse billy, but so can the strike of a matchstick. Even someone as obsessed with nonsensical ideas as you are must see that. You're obsessing over pitiful hypotheticals while a horde of hostile aliens is on its way to destroy us, Billy lamented, shaking his head in a manner that matched his expression and very much underlined the disdainful tone in which he delivered the words. While the world watched, Billy's head shaking became faster and more intense, all while his face reddened in something that looked like it was moving beyond frustration and well into the realms of anger. People like you, he seethed. You're the same health and safety nerds who would ban us from shaking hands in case we catch a cold, the people who would ban children from climbing trees in case they scraped a knee, and do you know what else? You're the kind of people who would have told my friend Timo here that his trip across the gate was a suicide mission, but here he is. You would have told Piper to stay out of the lift shaft and Thurso, too, because there was no guarantee that opening the vault would do any good. But she went down there because she's like me. She knows that when doing nothing means guaranteed death, you had better do whatever something is available to you. Piper gave a barely discernible nod. At Billy's side, however, Timo looked decidedly less comfortable to have been invoked in support of this argument. He didn't look annoyed, per se, but likewise didn't look like someone who would any time soon be throwing his own weight behind a plan to use the sphere as a weapon. Just as attention turned to Timo, however, it was ripped away by a gasp from Maria Janzik. As the only person in the windowless studio with a headset connecting her to the outside world, Maria was the first among them to hear what was happening in the sky. On the giant screen that showed small images of the remote panelists, however, 
something made it clear that many of them had already seen it. All of a sudden, more than half of their chairs were empty. What is it? Piper McCarthy asked Maria, the first words she had spoken during a roundtable full of arguments that had so far passed her by. In the simplest possible terms, Maria then relayed what she was being told at the very second the other giant screen cut from Timo to give a view from the studio's parking lot. Gasps came from all across the studio audience as the shocking image came into view and confirmed Maria's words were correct. The sky is turning red. E-26, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland like Stevie and Davy at his side, Gio Nunez had been too fixated with the far-reaching discussions in New York to notice the change in the sky outside the cabin he was sitting in. It was the early hours of the Scottish morning, which meant a lot less than it used to in terms of the color and brightness of the sky. Evidently, when Maria Janzik said that the sky had turned red, she was correct not only in relation to the sky in New York. In Thurso, too, despite the lateness of the hour, the redness of the hue coming from the blocked-out sun was clear and getting clearer. The trio stood at the door for a little over a minute, but even in that short time, it was as though their sky was a projected image on which someone was steadily turning up the saturation. The truth was hardly any more far-fetched as it went, with closer analysis from the Il Cercatore space station already indicating that something had changed in the light filtering the engineers were applying from their craft. There was just something about a blood-red sky that hit the men even harder than the initial eclipse had, and they were far from alone in this reaction. Darkness was natural, even if the artificial kind that had swept Earth all day and all night certainly wasn't. But in no way was there anything natural about the hue the sky had now taken. As two men who had called the Highlands home for their whole lives, Davy and Stevie were very familiar with the old weather-related axiom. Red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Red sky in morning, shepherd's warning. But as the men stood more than a little ironically in the middle of a field where a falling sheep had provided the first sign that something was stirring underfoot, they knew no one would be taking delight from this and that the power the engineers were displaying was a lot more than a warning. Whatever the hostile aliens wanted, whether it was human extinction or something more specific, they would clearly stop at nothing to get it. And like the other billion-plus roundtable viewers around the world who had been privy to a heated discussion about the pulse sphere that lay directly under their cabin, Davy, Stevie, and Geo all had the distinct feeling that what could end up mattering most was how far humanity, or perhaps someone more specific, would go to stop them. E-25, RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York As a live image of New York's evening sky turning blood red filled the giant screen in RMXT's world-famous studio, a large portion of the audience dashed outside. The expressions on their faces and urgency in their feet made it clear that these people were fleeing in fear rather than racing for a better look, and neither William Godfrey nor any of the McCarthys could blame them. For her part, Piper felt like she would have been running too if she had thought there was anywhere to go. She could only assume the people who fled were rushing home to see their families, perhaps in anticipation that the long-feared end times were well and truly here. Chaos was the only word for the situation in the studio. Maria Janzik, lacking some of the gravitas her focused 2020 predecessor, Marion de Klerk, might have used to quell the commotion, turned rather helplessly to William Godfrey. The ICA chairman rose to his feet and clapped his hands together. Enough, he called, booming out the single word firmly enough to capture everyone's attention. The people who were already on their way to the emergency exit didn't stop, but some of those who were fidgeting with the thought in mind did pause to hear what he was going to say. Maria, I want your team to clear the video feeds from anyone who isn't back in front of their camera in the next ten seconds, he requested. We don't need cowards, and we don't want them. 
The few audience members who were standing by their seats, non-committal of their next move, sat down under the weight of an intense stare Godfrey sent their way. Manfred Pegg, the climatologist who had been so vociferously arguing with Billy just minutes earlier, also sheepishly returned to his chair, having been dithering about whether to run. A fourteen-year-old child, the ICA chairman went on, gesturing to Piper with his hand as he stared at Pegg. But do you see her running away? Did you see her running away from the vault when the final pulse was coming and a vast area around it had already been evacuated? Did you see our drillers running away? Our archaeologists, hmm? Did Billy run from the vault, our new Kergelen? Did Timo run from the risk of punching a hole through a gate we barely understand? Peg gulped. Answer the damn questions, Godfrey demanded. N no the man stammered. It was uncomfortable to watch, but Emma saw the sense in what Godfrey was doing. The sky had just turned red in perhaps the most biblically terrifying moment in Earth's tumultuous history of extraterrestrial engagement, and the default reaction of many people around the world was likely to be panic. Individual panic had a way of leading to societal chaos, as that tumultuous history had shown only too often, and if making an example of one man's instinct to head for the hills was what it took to quell that instinct in others, then Emma was all for it. It wasn't as though Peg was entirely undeserving of this spotlight either, she figured, on the back of how needlessly personal he had been in his attacks on Billy, as well as Billy's admittedly flimsy plan. Godfrey took a deep breath, calming himself down not just for show, and took full command of proceedings. With his ten-second warning up, he was glad to see that all the panelists absent from their cameras had indeed been dismissed. There were now only fifteen or so remote panelists left, and they were very much the ones Godfrey had expected to see, encompassing, as they did, the likes of Ding Ziyang, Diane Logan, and Alessandro Bonucci. Alessandro, what are you seeing? the ICA chairman asked. The Italian hesitated. Well, they haven't sped up. His tone suggested there might be a sting in the tail, and Godfrey didn't have to wait long to hear it. But the filter has intensified, Alessandro went on. It seems like there is more light than before, but in fact there is less total energy reaching us, far less heat, and as we know, the falling temperatures have already begun to cause real problems in several areas. Even with what I am seeing now, assuming no further increase in the energy filter, we are in serious trouble. It didn't really come as news to anyone that Earth was in serious trouble, what with the sun having been blocked out and a hostile alien force having been on the way before that force turned the sky red. But those who knew Alessandro well knew that something in the data must have significantly changed, undoubtedly for the worse, for him to be talking like this. Before Godfrey began to reply, he saw movement in one of the small video feeds, it was the one from the office of New Kerguelen's Planetary Research Committee, where Timo Fiori and Billy Kendrick had been visible throughout the roundtable. Now, however, they had been joined by a third individual whose views William Godfrey most certainly wanted to hear. Cut to Leisha, Godfrey ordered the studio's production team. On cue, Leisha filled the other screen and the audio feed from New Kerguelen filled the studio. Ban Fu Shil Tan, the alien leader stated. Tanohas Shin Ka. Piper McCarthy sat up straight and focused solely on Leisha. Brinsek Luha, she replied in the language of the messengers, inflecting the words into a question and flat out stunning the studio audience as she did so. Nal Ko, Leisha said with his trademark slow nod. Piper covered her mouth with her hand and thought. Alessandro, she said a few moments later. Get the vocal translator and put it near your microphone. The world really needs to hear what he's saying. Part 6. Invitation Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Victor Hugo E-24 Planetary Research Committee, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. 
Speaking to a human viewership measured in the billions, but directing his words primarily to his friends on the station and in New York, Leisha wasted no time in sharing a hugely consequential decision he made as soon as Alessandro's reaction to the reddening of Earth's sky became clear. Humanity has been a great friend to my kind, the alien leader began. His words were broadcast in a gentle, computerized voice, in English, and at a very slight delay, thanks to the vocal translator on Alessandro's desk. Once again, that device was proving itself as one of the greatest projects the Italian had ever spent his time on. Melly and Piper had played a crucial role in programming the translator, and it had been Piper's idea to use it tonight. In a move reflecting some media smarts she had perhaps inherited from her mother, the girl knew it would mean a lot more if Leisha's words were relayed directly like this than if she had repeated them in English, or if Billy or Timo had done the same, having heard via their telepathy-enabling uplift patches which still functioned on New Kerguelen's side of the gate. No one was paying more attention to Leisha than ICA Chairman William Godfrey, who had no idea what his loyal ally in the quest for cooperative progress was going to say. I have listened to everything that has been said, Leisha continued, his expression even less telling than usual. And I have heard every competing voice. What I gather is that one option has been overlooked, for just like you do on Earth, we have a vault on New Kerguelen. Like Earth, New Kerguelen was rocked by pulses emanating from our vault. Our initial explorations of the vault did not find a sphere but our explorations have not yet reached its deepest chamber. In New York, Dan McCarthy's heart rate quickened, and for the first time all night it did so out of excitement rather than fear. Was Leisha really about to say what Dan hoped he was? When our sphere is sought, I am sure it will be found, Leisha went on, and today I extend an invitation for you to seek it. Dan's eyes fell closed. Leisha was really saying it. Leisha stared directly at the camera on Billy's computer and continued. We have a vault, and I am all but certain we have a sphere. I cannot state with confidence that either sphere could be used with success against the engineers who are suffocating your wonderful planet, and I cannot state with confidence that either sphere could be removed from its current position without a destructive pulse being triggered. But friends... The key difference between here and there is that we have a great shelter large enough to shield our entire population, which was designed for the explicit purpose of protecting us from the pulses. By now, Dan was not alone in catching on. Billy was right when he said that a mass evacuation from Earth to New Kerguelen would be impossible, Leisha said but a full evacuation from our home city of New Birchwood to the Great Shelter can be achieved very quickly. I have no doubt you would do the same for us if the shoe was on the other foot, and my people will never forget the risks taken by Dan, by Tara, by Billy. They will never forget the leap of destiny that human crew took to the unknown world of sanctuary, and they will never cease feeling guilty that the effects of the trip have prevented Billy from safely crossing the gate back to Earth ever since. Never worry about that. Billy cut in. He was standing behind Leisha now that the alien was center stage and placed a friendly arm on the soft tunic covering his shoulder. Leisha turned to share a friendly glance from one of his very favorite humans, then returned his focus to the camera that was sending live footage of his gentle face all the way to Earth and the station via the incredible gate in his world's sky. My offer is a simple one and comes with only a single caveat he said. Our shelter will allow the attempted removal of our sphere with no direct risk to the lives of our population, and for that reason I cannot sit idly by while Earth is threatened. I hereby invite a human team to search for the sphere within our vault, which lies almost untouched on the Isle of Answers where Billy discovered it. The related caveat is that the team will be an entirely human one, with no direct assistance on the ground or in the ground from any of my kind. As leader of New Kerguelen, I cannot allow the risk of an accidental engagement of the sphere, be that by way of an impact 
or simply by way of disturbing the sphere at all, to fall upon any messenger. That is all I must insist. When Leisha stopped talking, no one else knew where to start replying. For many years, and indeed stretching back well over a decade to before Piper was born, the McCarthys and their inner circle had known the messengers to be a friendly race, and Leisha to be a truly kind individual. This offer, however, was on a scale no one could ever have expected. Its generosity could quite simply not be overstated, with Leisha inviting his human friends to attempt to remove an immensely volatile pulse sphere from his planet's soil, well aware that their doing so could very conceivably cause a ground-flattening pulse to sweep across his home world. The first human to speak was Piper, who instinctively did so in Leisha's language after several minutes of listening to his remarkable suggestion of a new way forward. Her words were quickly relayed in English by the vocal translator on Alessandro's end, thanks to some good work from the studio's AV team. Reacting to Leisha's comment that any team who attempted to find and remove the sphere had to be an entirely human one, the girl raised a point that was already on her parents' minds, too. We could never thank you enough for this, Leisha, and I'm sure we will take the offer, but we need Rogue. Leisha's chest heaved slowly in a very human manner. He will not be well received, he replied. I understand that the sins of his ancestors are not his to bear, but Piper, my ancestors were enslaved for thousands of years, and my contemporaries do not forget easily. Persuading our population to evacuate to the shelter will be no challenge, and neither will convincing them that this operation would be a risk worth taking, since it presents a faint hope of saving your world. We will evacuate New Birchwood in case something goes wrong, but we will take that chance in the hope something will go right. But as for convincing our population that it is safe and desirable to allow even one architect to visit our world, it is not that I will not try, my friends. It is only that I fear I cannot succeed. But this doesn't work without him, Emma replied. Especially if none of you can help a human team, we need him to seize the sphere without touching it and teleport it to his craft. It's not perfect, but that's the only plan we have. Looking very troubled all of a sudden, Leisha slowly shook his head. I don't think it will be accepted. In truth, I can think of nothing that would make my people trust an architect. At that point, a new voice entered the conversation. Its owner appeared at the same time, leaning in until her face was almost pressed against Alessandro Bonucci's. What if he arrives with me? Tara McCarthy asked. Her eyes then lit up with the light of a new idea. Actually, remember when Emma let you hold Piper when she was a baby? What if Rogue arrives on New Kerguelen with me, and Clark, and Aiden? And what if we let him hold Liam? In an instant, Leisha's concerns melted away. The return of the child would go a long way, he said, as not only the first human born on New Kerguelen, but one born to no lesser luminaries in the messenger's post-contact lore than Tara and Clark McCarthy, baby Liam had been viewed and revered as a gift from above in his few days on the alien world. And as Leisha's face made clear, Truly, any friend of Liam would be taken as a friend of the messengers. That Terra suggested this betrayed not only the desperation of Earth's situation, which threatened all of her loved ones as well as billions of other innocent targets of the engineer's mysterious wrath, but also the trust that she had come to place in Rogue. The architect had so far done everything he promised, taking risks of his own and always following orders from a group of humans he seemed to feel grateful to be accepted by. Clark stood behind Tara as she made this suggestion, and although he didn't vocally share his approval, it went without saying to everyone who knew him that his lack of argument was a far more telling sign that he was okay with it. Like Tara, he recognized the risk that was currently bearing down on both of his children and knew Liam would be a lot safer in Rogue's arms on New Kerguelen than he would be in their arms on an Earth further ravaged by the engineers. 
So it's a deal? Piper asked from the studio. Tara brings Liam. We send whoever else we need. And that way Rogue can go too? Leisha nodded. Another voice then came from New Care Galen's broadcast feed, but this time it belonged to Billy Kendrick. He said just one word. Godfrey. All eyes fell upon the ICA chairman. The risk is only on the human team who go to their vault, Piper said, looking in hope across the length of the studio's desk. We still don't know if it's going to work, either getting it out of there or using it against the engineers, but your biggest argument is gone. My only argument against it is gone, Godfrey stated. If Leisha is willing to bring the risk upon his world and a human crew is willing to bring it upon themselves, I will certainly not stand in the way. To be perfectly honest, I applaud the bravery of both more than I can say. Emma and Dan expressed clear support for Godfrey's words. Even the two scientists in the studio, previously both so cautiously opposed to any plan involving the Pulse Sphere, had little tangible reason to object when the Pulse Sphere in question was the one on New Care Galen. So that's it, Piper said. Silent for a long time, her father nodded firmly. Now we just need to find the Sphere. There are a few more steps than that before success is in your reach, but it will be a good start, Leisha replied. You are welcome when you are ready, my friends, and I know time is against you. William Godfrey clapped his hands together. Okay, I will continue to pursue other courses of action, he said, aware of none in particular, but keen to leave his billion-stronger viewership that all of Earth's hopes weren't being hung on this interplanetary long shot. But we will act on this right away. Billy, you've been in that vault. Who and what do we need? Well, I don't want to call them out, Billy replied. But your team of pulse busters, pretty much. The archaeologists, maybe the drillers if we need to dig any deeper. All hands on deck. Oh, and the boy, Cody. Godfrey couldn't help but grin, imagining an even bigger smile would be spreading across the sometimes intransigent but always well-intentioned youngster's face. I'm sure you'll be seeing them very soon, he said. And Leisha, on behalf of the ICA and all of the global citizens we serve, thank you once more for this remarkable offer. I hope no occasion ever presents itself when you might need such a favor in return, but rest assured, this will not be forgotten. Yeah, seriously, Piper said, emotion croaking her voice. Thank you, Leisha. The alien smiled in a manner more human than any other ever could, with the possible exception of Melly, due purely to how much time he spent in the company of his friends from Earth. When you were a small child, I promised your parents that I would do whatever it took to keep you safe, Leisha said, setting up the simple and singular motto that truly did motivate his every action. And, Piper, a promise I make is a promise I keep. E-23, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland from an unexpected source, an unexpected opportunity had presented itself. The consideration that there was almost certainly another pulse sphere on New Care Galen wasn't one that anyone on Earth's side of the gate had given much thought when debating what could or should be done with the one in Thurso. But that had all changed now. And directly above the Thurso vault, the three men in the cabin were most shocked that they had been all but name-checked by Billy Kendrick when he was listing who he wanted on the emergency team for this urgent mission. Well, guys, Gio Nunez mused. One word, yes or no? That's three words, you nupti, Stevie replied. Davy slapped his hand to his chest and leaned back, roaring with laughter like he rarely ever had. Stevie's joke hadn't been that funny, but it came at a time when a laugh was exactly what the men needed. Gio was laughing right along with them, accustomed to his friend's ways by now. So that's an I, 
he asked, adopting their vernacular as if to prove the point. Too right it is, Chief, Stevie said. What's the weather like up there anyway? Two sons, Geo grinned. Stevie looked down at his pasty arms and faked a grimace. Geez, oh, and my skin can hardly even handle one. Davy, Geo asked, already fairly sure of the answer. A chance to help the guys find a sphere that's gonna give these scumbags a taste of their own medicine? He rhetorically mused. Geo, mate, I'm already packing my sunglasses. E-22, RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York Within minutes of Leisha's remarkable offer, William Godfrey announced the end of what had been a remarkably productive ICA roundtable. He thanked all of the panelists and made a point of inviting Chinese Premier Ding Ziyang to say a few words from his office in Beijing and new U.S. President Anna Vasquez to do the same from the studio. Neither said anything unexpected or remotely controversial, and both went out of their way to offer whatever assistance might be needed with what seemed sure to be a whirlwind trip to New Kerguelen. Godfrey did not invite the McCarthys to speak, largely because they didn't need it, but partly because they hadn't yet made their own positions regarding the trip clear, and he didn't want to put them on the spot. To his mind, there was no reason whatsoever for any of them to make the trip. We will stay in touch with all parties and keep the public looped in on what's happening, Emma said, jumping in when Godfrey left a longer-than-usual silence just as he thought she might. But I expect we'll be doing so from Earth, or at least Earth's side of the gate. The search and the dig will be a mission, not a visit, so anyone who isn't going to contribute in a tangible way really shouldn't be there. And as Chairman Godfrey said, most of us are going to keep pursuing other potential solutions to the challenge we face, while a brave few give their all on New Care Galen. To Emma's left, Piper looked more than a little disappointed by the news that Emma didn't want them to make the trip. If she was, she clearly knew better than to state it out loud on live TV, but clearly hadn't yet mastered the art of hiding it. And I don't want people to see this as an evacuation through the back door, Dan added. I know Mason isn't here anymore to say Tara is sneaking off across the gate to save herself from what could be about to happen here, but if all of us went, then some people would be saying that. But all of you at home can feel secure in the knowledge that neither myself, as Chief Planetary Liaison, Chairman Godfrey, nor either of our esteemed deputies based in Washington and London will be leaving Earth on the next flight out. We stand together, united with you, supporting those who make the trip but not taking their success for granted. That is the way forward, and forward we must go. Godfrey looked at Dan with admiring eyes, ever more impressed by how adept he was becoming in the art of the closing one-liner. A slow and deep inhalation from the round table's host, who remained glad to have been given the honor, but exhausted and mildly frustrated to have lost herself in the drama on a few occasions, then took everyone's attention as the event drew to a close. Live from New York, I've been Maria Janzik, and live on New Kerguelen, let's all hope things go to plan. E-21, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore with surface temperatures on Earth now cooling faster than ever in the shade of the engineer's relentlessly approaching craft, and with that shade now blanketing the planet in a disconcerting blood-red hue, there was little time for the team on the station to reflect on anything. There was little time to act upon Leisha's invitation for a human crew to venture to New Kerguelen, and there was certainly no time to talk about it. Plenty of talking was taking place on news stations, on social media, and on couches around the world. But on Il Cercatore, idle chat and speculation was conspicuous by its absence. And so it went that just minutes after the invitation was issued, and likewise just minutes after Billy Kendrick mentioned what kinds of things and what kinds of people he would need to have the best chance of quickly finding the pulsed sphere upon which so many hopes were now resting, work was already well underway for a quick departure. All hands were on deck and all systems were go. In the control deck, 
Alessandro Bonucci had momentarily delegated some of his exhausting data analysis work, even at a point when the data was changing more quickly than ever. Bizarre changes to the sunblock's energy filter were sending temperatures plummeting and wreaking new kinds of havoc with wind patterns, and perhaps most confusingly of all, with tidal patterns. There were certainly far more unknowns than knowns surrounding the engineers and their craft, with Alessandro still unsure what kind of gravitational shielding technology they could be using, and now wondering how their effect on the tides made sense along with everything else. These thoughts were in his head, but no longer at the forefront of his mind, because it really did now feel as though the time was right to start doing something about the steady deterioration in Earth's habitability, rather than monitoring the specific minute-by-minute -minute details. In truth, Alessandro would long have happily been focusing on doing something about the situation if it had, at any stage, looked like there was anything he could do. And to that end, Leisha's invitation came in the form of the most welcome words the Italian had heard in a very long time. Cody was particularly ecstatic with the news that an idea he had been pushing for since Billy Kendrick put it in his mind was now being put into action, caring not a jot that the pulse sphere the team were planning to utilize lay on New Kerguelen rather than Earth. The boy expressed no particular excitement about going to the alien world based on the fact that it was an alien world, but he could hardly wait to get into the vault and assist any way he could in finding a sphere that Billy's initial exploration hadn't detected. Billy hadn't known he was looking for it back then, Cody reasoned when doubts on that front entered his mind, and he had been spooked by the bones he found. This time, things would be different. This time... They had to be. E-20. Drive-in, Birchwood, Colorado. A hive of activity just hours earlier, the Birchwood Drive-in was now a red-tinged ghost town. Near the entrance of New Care Grill and Bar and Grill, a vixen and her two cubs scurried in confusion under the red sky driven by hunger to venture out despite the ominous and unnatural aura that had recently been cast upon their world. An eerie silence hung in the air, and unlike last time, there wasn't a single reporter present to film the foxes. All around the world, streets were empty. All around the world, hope was fading. E-19 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. The speed with which a departure plan was being put in place meant that no one would have to wait long, including the duo of Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz. No one had any doubts they were who Billy was referring to when he mentioned archaeologists from what he termed Godfrey's earlier team of pulse busters, and both were happy with that designation. Carrick was ecstatic, in fact, to be referenced and wanted in such a way by one of his lifelong idols, but like Serena, he was first and foremost motivated by a desire to help. Plaudits and accolades could come later and were for now the furthest thing from Carrick's mind, while Serena was delighted of the belated opportunity to do something, having been reluctantly idle more or less since her analysis had helped to locate Cody. Aside from Cody, Chip and the young couple, the only other people present on the station who would be venturing to New Kerguelen were Clark and Tara's side of the McCarthy clan. Although it didn't seem as though they would be involved in any work within or around the planet's vault, Tara and Clark, considered something close to religious figures on New Kerguelen, were to fulfill a role that no one else could. Only they could calm the messenger's nerves and soothe their hatred toward Rogue and his kind, which was a crucial prerequisite of the whole plan's success. Leisha was willing to allow access to the vault's lowest level only if New Kerguelen's population agreed to a temporary relocation to their great shelter, in case something might go wrong with the fiendishly potent pulse sphere the humans were hoping to find, and public cooperation for any plan that involved an architect would have been impossible to attain without an intervention from that public's favorite human family. Dan's side of the McCarthy clan ventured to the station to say their farewells, returning from New York with Godfrey, but not before a quick stop in Scotland to pick up Gio Nunes and his driller friends Davy and Stevie. 
The two Scotsmen may have only spent four or five hours on the station, but their wonder at every little thing was vast, least of all the fact that they could, for the first time ever, see their planet's curvature and its context among the stars. Everything would have been a lot nicer to look at if it wasn't tinged red, but the men tried not to focus on that. The entire purpose of their trip was to assist in an eventual and hopefully not too far away attack on the hostile craft that was causing it, and Davy and Stevie were both looking forward to returning to the station triumphant and ready to see the natural blues and greens of their wondrous home world. Fulfilling a request from Billy, Clark and Tara agreed to send a quick video message to New Care Galen in which they stood beside Rogue with both of their children and explained why they trusted the architect. In a powerful example of actions speaking louder than words, Tara placed her sleeping baby in Rogue's desperately careful hands. Those hands were very alien, even compared to the messengers, but they were truly safe. Nib shal poka, Melly said with a smile while Rogue held the child. Nib shal binak. In the absence of the out-of-range vocal translator, everyone turned to Piper. Rogue feels something in his chest, she relayed. Something in his soul. Given the way the architects in Thurso's vault had been gestating, it seemed likely to the group that Rogue had never been a miniature version of himself and had never seen one either. Architect children were perhaps like dog's eggs, the group figured. A contradiction in terms. Rogue had always been very gentle around Cody, which everyone had initially assumed was because he was intimidated by the boy's preternatural power, but the evident affection he was now displaying towards baby Liam was giving them second thoughts that he perhaps had more protective instincts than they had been giving him credit for. This video was sent to New Care Galen very soon after the end of the ICA roundtable, right after Piper and the others reached the station, as this enabled Leisha to begin his unenviable task of convincing his planet mates that Rogue, a member of the race they detested for all it had inflicted upon them, really could be trusted. In a conversation with Piper, Melly stated that while she could only speak for herself, she wasn't sure how Leisha planned to make a certain nuanced point to the rest of the messengers, that he believed the human's sphere-finding plan was safe enough to let them do it but that the risk was real enough to merit an evacuation to the long-abandoned Great Shelter, which the messengers despised almost as much as the ancient architects who built it. Desperation and necessity were the twin reasons, of course, but it had long been known that the messengers as a whole, and as individuals, didn't put nearly as much weight in abstract considerations or arguments as they did in gut feelings. Tara knew this very well which was why she suggested the quick and harmless stunt with Liam and Rogue. She was still willing to venture to New Kerguelen, since her presence would calm the natives far more than a video of reassurance ever could. She was willing to make the trip along with Clark and their children, meanwhile, largely because they would be joining the messengers inside the pulse-proof great shelter while the rest of the humans effectively risked their lives. An element of guilt came with this situation, naturally enough, but those who would be taking the risks told Tara that they were no greater than the risks she had taken on New Kerguelen multiple times in the past, never more so than during her leap of destiny through a dangerous time gate to the uncharted world of sanctuary. And there really was nothing she could do in the vault that any of the others couldn't, Serena assured her in a very well-intentioned manner which Tara took in the spirit intended. Everyone who was making the trip and taking the risks that went along with it was doing so voluntarily in a desperate effort to save the world they called home, William Godfrey told Tara just minutes before the group left, and they understood the risks. She heard this and took it on board. Godfrey gave no rousing speech before the group set off towards Rogue's waiting craft, which would carry them first to the holding orbit of his mothership before that huge vessel crossed the gate. It was safe for everyone, the architect insisted, and Melly used her empath abilities to, in turn, assure them that Rogue definitely wasn't guessing on this point and truly did know that the entire craft offered at least as much protection as the transition room and travel pods within different iterations of the messenger's smaller vessels. 
The most protracted goodbye prior to the craft's departure naturally occurred between Terra and Emma, but the former insisted this trip would be very different from her last, no matter what, since Rogue was along for the ride and could solve any gate-related issues that might arise. That Emma hadn't even been thinking about any danger of the gate disappearing so soon after getting Terra back when that exact disaster had occurred spoke volumes of how many competing concerns were fighting for space in her head. William Godfrey took a moment to crouch down to Cody's level and encourage the boy to stick close to Rogue at all times and make sure Billy didn't do anything too crazy. Cody laughed at this, as Godfrey intended, but he quickly returned to a serious demeanor when Godfrey asked him to run through the core elements of the plan one last time. If the group succeeded in finding New Kergalen's pulsed sphere and loading it onto Rogue's craft without killing themselves or anyone else, the plan was for Rogue to cross to Earth's side of the gate and then head out to his usual holding orbit. Under no circumstances was he to do anything else with the sphere until the group could discuss the nature and timing of their next move based upon what was going on with the engineer's craft at that point. The maximum time scale could be measured in only a matter of days, but the way things were going on Earth meant there was almost certainly a lot less than that. Godfrey and everyone else dearly hoped the mission on New Kergalen would prove straightforward at once, but he was only too aware that the really tough part might come next. When Cody was finished telepathically telling Rogue everything Godfrey had said, the tall alien surprised everyone by offering the ICA chairman a very unusual-looking handshake. Godfrey gladly obliged, so surprised that he barely even registered the sharpness and coldness of the architect's fingers. Alessandro then offered to stay in touch with the group regarding any developments on Earth even as they searched for the sphere, but Gio spoke for several of the others when he said he felt their best bet would be to have a solid and focused run at finding it without any potentially unsettling distractions. When you're already going as fast as you can, the archaeologist said, news can only slow you down. It was a good point well made, and one Alessandro took on board. He would of course remain in touch with Lisha and Timo, as and when there was anything to share, but he agreed that he wouldn't reach out to the ground team unless they wanted him to. All kinds of radios were already present on New Kergalen among the planet's human workforce, so it would be easy enough for them to get in contact with him if they wanted to. I just want to say good luck before you guys leave, Piper said just before the doors closed. As she spoke, she looked mainly between the Thurso cabin's familiar trio and her unassuming friends Carrick and Serena. If there's something to find, I know you guys will find it. There's always something to find, Serena replied with a smile and a wink. Wait, Cody? Piper called. Can you tell Rogue one more thing from me? Clark held out a hand to block the sliding door at the edge of the departure point. Sure, the boy said. What? Piper looked right into the alien's eyes. Game face. A few moments later, and right before the door slid closed, she could have sworn she saw him smile. E-18, Entrance, Great Shelter, New Kergalen. If Stevie and Davy's wonder at reaching the Il Cercatore had been a 10 out of 10, the dumbstruck awe they felt after passing through the gate to New Kergalen and catching their first glimpse of a bona fide alien world was entirely off the charts. The photos didn't do it justice, the videos didn't do it justice, and the eyewitness testimony they'd heard from colleagues in their industry who'd already been lucky enough to make the trip most certainly didn't do it justice. Stevie and Davy owed their initial involvement in Thurso to a combination of their proximity to the area and their unique willingness to work in the epicenter of a global emergency most people had tried to get as far away from as they possibly could. They had long since proven their worth to the group, however, and now owed their presence on New Kergalen to nothing so arbitrary. Rogue, who had come to the planet many thousands of years earlier to warn the islanders of an impending pulse he had lacked the knowledge and experience to stop before it was too late, made a beeline for the great shelter where he had been instructed to land. Once there, Rogue disembarked with Cody and the others 
and waited at the entrance. Leisha appeared right on cue with Billy Kendrick, bringing a cacophony of sound with him as the doors briefly opened to let them out. Billy embraced his human friends right away, apologizing once more for missing Liam's birth and taking a few moments to look closely at the sleeping child and congratulate his proud parents. Behind New Kerguelen's leader, meanwhile, hundreds of the messengers he had successfully persuaded to take shelter were now pressed against the impenetrable glass-like material. None were there to see Rogue, however, now comfortable enough with his presence following Leisha's firm insistences that the architect was trustworthy, and far more so since he showed them a video of Rogue holding Liam McCarthy. The presence of that tiny child was the reason for the entrance area being such a hive of activity, with countless messengers vying for one more in-the-flesh glance at the infant they recently, and sadly thought, had left them for good. Despite Liam being who everyone was mainly interested in, Rogue and Leisha exchanged a very human-looking handshake in full view of the messengers. Again, like the video of Rogue holding Liam, this image did far more to cement Rogue in their minds as an ally than any number of verbal insistences ever could. I will flash you all inside to a private area no one else can access, Leisha reassured the family. He knew the McCarthys were the furthest thing from divas who wanted to be isolated from the public for no good reason, but the level of mania that followed Liam around on New Kerguelen was a good reason for such a thing if Leisha had ever seen one. Tara and Clark heard via the telepathy patches they had just placed on their necks, glad as ever to be back somewhere the remarkable uplift powers still function for anyone besides the neurologically exceptional trio of Rogue, Cody, and Piper. Thanks again for all of this, Tara replied out loud. The plan to ward off the engineers with the pulse sphere is a long shot, but it's a shot we have because of you. Everyone on Earth appreciates that. Leisha nodded, then placed a hand on Billy Kendrick's back as he looked at Rogue. Your team will be in good hands. Cody grinned widely and looked at Billy. This is a really good idea, to get the sphere he said. Hope so, kid, Billy replied, ruffling the boy's hair and then little Aiden's as he walked past. But it ain't gonna find itself. E-17. Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. After the welcome news came in from New Kerguelen that the group had safely passed through the gate and arrived at the great shelter to swap four McCarthys for one Billy Kendrick, an altogether more perplexing message was making its way to Alessandro Bonucci from somewhere else. As soon as his computer registered the non-random signal coming straight from the engineer's ever-approaching sun-blocking megaship, Alessandro spread the word far and wide. Only too aware of the situation, and taking the recent shift in tone from world leaders towards cooperation as more than lip service, Alessandro sent the bizarre signal to senior astronomers in Britain, Europe, China, and the USA. He most decidedly would not have included the American astronomers in his multi-recipient message if Nick Mason had still been calling their shots, but fortunately, that was one problem no one had to worry about any longer. The incoming alien signal, however, quite possibly was something worth worrying about. But despite the potential cause for concern, Alessandro's initial reaction was one of total surprise that quickly morphed into an optimistic hope. This was due in no small part to his long-held notion, dating back to the days of the IDA leak, that no wise enemy who sought to destroy you would seek to talk to you first. All things considered, Alessandro was more optimistic in the minutes immediately after picking up the signal than he had been in the minutes immediately beforehand. Chairman Godfrey didn't share this outlook, even when Alessandro explained it, and only time would tell which of them was right. Godfrey dearly hoped to be wrong, of course, and was admittedly a little encouraged when all three of the McCarthys on the station stated their broad agreement with Alessandro's take that the news of a signal coming from the engineers was as likely to be good as it was to be bad. There was less chance of them all being wrong, Godfrey attempted to internally reason for the exclusive benefit of his own mood. 
A few minutes ago, the pulse sphere seemed like our only shot of surviving this, Piper said. And I think we all know it's a longer shot than any of us want to say out loud. This signal could be bad, sure, but it could be a request for something, or at the very least, an explanation that can give us some new idea about what to do next. But it really could be a request. They might want us to do something really simple. Like what? Dan asked, genuinely curious as to what she was thinking. Piper bit her lip slightly in thought. I don't know. Stop engaging with Rogue, maybe? Stop sending probes too far away? Stop doing any experiments relating to the gates and the dimensional stuff? As soon as these final words were out of Piper's mouth, Alessandro's gawped open. Heartbeat, he said. The timing of their appearance at the exact moment Timo punched his way through the gate was no coincidence, we know that. But maybe their appearance right next to the heartbeat probe wasn't either. The remote research I'd been doing into dimensional flux was all happening on the heartbeat probe, and that was the research that let Rogue and I figure out an approach to reinstate the gate. It can't be a coincidence. A lifetime in politics tells me it can always be a coincidence, Godfrey replied and I don't think science or aliens are all that different. Alessandro shook his head. Agree to disagree, my friend. So what do you think they'd be saying about that, Alessandro? Dan asked. Because you have stopped that research. They blew up the only place you were doing it, and their escalating actions against us don't seem like a precursor to a friendly reminder. A scratch of the chin and long, hmm, betrayed Alessandro's depth of thought until one possibility hit him. Maybe they've been broadcasting a signal for a while and they just got close enough for it to reach us. They could be waiting for a reply for all we know. And once we decode their signal, and I mean any of my team or any one of the teams I've sent it to on Earth, we can start sending our own signals back. My friends, we could end this. The McCarthys didn't look like they were getting swept up in the sudden wave of optimism quite as fully as Alessandro, so when the group dispersed to further share news of the signal for analysis in the most far-reaching ways they could think of, it was the Italian on whom Godfrey opted to focus his caution. Just be careful here, Alessandro, Godfrey said, no defeatist in the broader scheme of things, but certainly the most cautious realist of the station's remaining inner circle when it came to hypothesizing over the meaning of a signal that would surely be decoded before long. More often than not, it's the hope that kills you. E-16, Inner Basin, Isle of Answers, New Kerguelen. Not for the first time, but certainly for the most urgent, Billy Kendrick found himself standing on the Isle of Answers. He was on the ground with Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz, two sharp young things he was delighted to finally be meeting in person. Their involvement in the important searches for artifacts which first unlocked the Thurso vault and then opened a crucial door further in had been what made them ideal candidates in his mind for this search. Reaching into his pocket as he showed the young couple the entrance to New Kerguelen's broadly similar vault, Billy knew that this time they would have an advantage at their disposal that they hadn't had on those previous occasions, or indeed at any point in their lives. He handed each of them a transcript reading patch and encouraged them to place it on their neck. As soon as you see one, you'll realize why everyone has such a hard time describing it to people who never have. The aging but still excitable archaeologist predicted. Where should I be looking? Serena asked as soon as she applied the painless patch. Hmm, I don't actually think there are any out here, Billy replied. You'll see some inside, just as soon as our eyes in the sky have got what they need. All three of the ground team looked up at Rogue's colossal mothership as it hovered over the island and the volcano that utterly dominated its inner basin. They knew that Geo and the drillers, all of whom they'd met in Scotland and were glad to have here with them, were currently using state-of-the-art scanning equipment from the station to detect the full shape of the vault using comparative distinctions they had made by studying various scans of the Scottish vault they were by now so familiar with. The vault itself was impenetrable to any kind of scan, in the sense that there would never be any prospect of detecting heat signatures or any other signs to show what might be inside it, 
but very recent breakthroughs had enabled the accurate mapping of the vault's outer boundary by way of penetrating the ground with a novel kind of signal. A matter of moments after Billy spoke, his trio on the ground soared in number when the men who'd spent most of the past few weeks inside a tiny cabin joined them along with Cody, Rogue, and Chip. Twenty-four other architects remained in the air, ready to be called upon as and when they might be needed. We've got our map, Davy announced, holding a tablet-like display console in his hands. Pretty much exactly what we thought, same size and shape as Tharso, and a lower level running the full length of it. If our sphere is in there, that's where it's going to be. It's in there, Cody confidently stated with the kind of innocent confidence that only a child could muster. The hard part is going to be getting it out, remember? E-15, Zhongnonghai, Beijing, China As the blood-red sky and ever-increasing smog outside his window made Ding Ziyang increasingly concerned that this time around, humanity's days really might be numbered, a knock on his door pulled his eyes away from the troubling sight. Ding's gaze passed and couldn't help but linger on his wall-mounted TV, which was currently showing a slideshow-like presentation of some of the hostile eclipse's most striking effects. Tibet's Lake Namso, once a popular destination for alien enthusiasts and a stopover for the tour groups Billy Kendrick once famously accompanied around the world to various far-flung sites mentioned in the initial IDA leak, currently filled the screen. To Ding's visible distress, it was frozen solid. Next came an image from Bangladesh, a closely allied nation with whose leader Ding shared an excellent working relationship. The smog surrounding the capital city of Dhaka was like nothing Ding had ever seen, at least until the images cut to shots from some North American cities which were normally reliant on natural wind patterns to prevent similar buildups. From the coast of California, to the very spot in New York where the ICA roundtable had been filmed just a few hours earlier, Ding saw borderline apocalyptic scenes of streets empty, but for a few brave souls wearing high-grade breathing apparatus. The lack of wind was already responsible for a dramatic decrease in air quality which few members of the public would have expected as a consequence of the eclipse, and Ding knew from conversations with his science advisors that this situation was, unfortunately, sure to keep getting worse before it started getting better. Indeed, better felt not just a long way away, but increasingly out of reach altogether. It was almost unbelievable just how quickly things had deteriorated since the moment the world's media was already calling the reddening. The change in the color of the already dark sky had, at first, seemed to be only visually unsettling. But by now, it was clear that the reddening itself was just one symptom and far from the worst, of whatever kind of new energy filter the mysterious engineers had applied. Sir, the man at Ding's door said, forced to interrupt for a second time now that the Premier had become understandably preoccupied by the troubling scenes from around the world. At this, Ding finally met his eyes. And more than a little surprisingly, within them he found something that looked something like hope. It's the signal, sir, the man continued. The signal Alessandro shared from the engineers. Ding immediately rose to his feet. Yes, he prodded, daring to dream the news really might be good. Our scientists have decoded the message, the man replied, a smile growing on his face as these words came out. And they want you to be the first to hear it. E-14, Subterranean Vault, Isle of Answers, New Kerguelen. Loath to waste a second longer than necessary, the group, via Rogue's closest human friend Cody, asked their architect helper to flash them directly to the far end of the enormous vault. One thing that was immediately noticeable to everyone was how poorly lit the vault was compared to the Thurso equivalent, with the good job Gio Nunes had done on that front only truly being appreciated now that they had something to compare it to. Geo did have a bag full of flashbulbs and some powerful LEDs prepared for this very eventuality, and before long the room they had reached was almost fully illuminated. 
This illumination brought forth a harrowing sight that they had all been warned of, and indeed had all seen on video, but the up-close and personal sight of human and messenger bones piled in cages had an altogether stronger effect than any digital image or verbal warning ever could. Rogue could barely even look, sick with shame for what his ancestors had done. It wasn't your fault, Cody told him. It wasn't you. Blaming you for this would be like if I wasn't a human and I blamed all humans for what the bad people at the prison did to me. You're one of the good ones, and that's what counts. No one disagreed, but no one was really listening. For their part, Carrick and Serena were quickly distracted from the horrifying skeletons by their first-ever experience of glancing at a transcript and triggering its richly layered information to be directly delivered to their brains. The transcript they glanced at wasn't even of the dynamic type that really took the viewer's head for a spin, but it had been remarkable enough in its own right to render them speechless. It hadn't taught them anything new, since it was displayed on a wall-based control panel which shared much in common with the one in Thurso, which Cody and the others had seen on two occasions. This control panel essentially served as a warning and a very basic information source, instructing the reader, which it had clearly assumed, like all other transcripts, would be future architects, that the pulses would eliminate anyone unlucky enough to be around when they went off. After a few minutes of wandering around, during which time no one spoke more than a few words due to their intense focus on the matter at hand, Billy broke the silence to ask if anyone had any ideas of where they should be looking for something and what exactly they should be looking for. Safe in the knowledge that this vault once housed a pulsed sphere, and equally safe in the knowledge, thanks to Stevie and Davy, that the vault had another level further down, the group were operating on the assumption that the sphere they had come to collect would be down there. The trouble, they were now realizing with a great amount of frustration and increasing urgency-related concern, was that there appeared to be no obvious way down. Billy asked the very reasonable question of whether Rogue could simply teleport them all to the lower level, and the reply came as a qualified affirmative. He can, Cody confirmed, but he shouldn't. Rogue has never been down there, and he can't see down there either, so he doesn't know the layout. That means he could accidentally rematerialize one of us right where the sphere is, and, you know, that could be bad. Chip, standing protectively next to Cody, nodded in agreement. Worse than bad, Carrick chimed in. Exactly, Cody said. So let's just think. In Scotland, it was the control panel, when Rogue used it to release the other architects from their pods. That's what did it. Carrick looked again at that control panel, engaging its transcript once more. He would never get used to this. It doesn't say anything like that, the Welshman said. Nothing about a lower level or a hatch or a drain. Did the one in Thurso? If it didn't, it was probably a side effect of opening the pods. So maybe if Rogue pressed the option to open these cages... Cody turned to the alien who very quickly walked over to follow the boy's silent instruction and engage the control panel. Here we go. When Rogue ordered the bars to open, an unpleasant metallic creaking sound filled the room. It sounds jammed, Serena pointed out, setting off for a quick walk around the room to see if the sound was coming from any of the cages in particular rather than all of them in general. The former would be a better outcome, she figured, since fixing one stuck bar would be easier than fixing a lot of them. Before long, but with only a few cages left, Serena identified the one which seemed to be the culprit. Look, she called to the others. This one is physically jammed. The cages must only open all at once or not at all. Carrick hurried over. Was it jam? Oh cutting himself off with a realization that should have been obvious, Carrick could barely even bring himself to look. As the cage repeatedly attempted to open, its door following a curved path, it was repeatedly hitting against the same human skull and chest bone. Cody turned to Rogue and asked him to pause the cage-opening mechanism, which he duly did. Watch yourself, darling, Stevie then said announcing his presence as he squeezed past Serena and reached down to move the skull from its position. 
knowing full well it had once belonged to a human being, ancient or not, with thoughts and feelings just like his own, the Scotsman was as respectful as he could be in dislodging the skull rather than roughly kicking it aside. Within five or ten seconds, he succeeded. With the cage now looking free to open, everyone focused back on Rogue. Everyone except Davy, that was who looked at his skull-moving colleague with some odd mix of admiration and uncertainty about his ability to so casually touch the skeleton. I grew up on a farm, Stevie quietly replied with a shrug, back at Davy's side. What, a fucking murder farm? Davy whispered quietly enough for the words to evade Cody's young ears. They didn't evade Geo, though, who chuckled at the welcome moment of levity. The levity didn't last, however, only until Rogue moved to reactivate the opening mechanism and everyone held their breath in the hope it would work this time. The movement was still accompanied by a metallic screeching sound that wasn't exactly the most pleasant thing any of them had ever heard, but this time the cage doors moved steadily, if not smoothly, and eventually stood completely open. Several seconds later, and just as Billy Kendrick was set to express his disappointment, a very different kind of clicking sound filled the room. Almost immediately, a small central section of the floor parted to reveal a hatch that looked very much like the one in Thurso. With no liquid-filled pods here, there was no need for a sloping drain, naturally enough, but the hatch itself looked flat-out identical to Thurso's. For Cody, Chip, and Rogue in particular, who had not just seen video footage of that hatch, but had seen it with their own eyes, this led to an ever-growing expectation of what might be waiting for them down below. The boy walked forward first and lowered himself to the ground, not putting any weight on the grid-like hatch, but leaning close enough to see through it. Geo, can you bring over a light? The archaeologist did, walking in lockstep with his former mentor, Billy Kendrick. Along with Cody and Chip, he got ready to peer down at the vault's lowest chamber as it was illuminated for the first time. And there it was, exactly what they came for. And bingo was his name-o, Billy said, turning to the others and pumping his fist several times like a man who had just bowled a perfect game. Cody pushed himself to his feet. Is everyone ready? he asked, turning to Chip in preparation to make the request to Rogue as soon as they said yes. Chip nodded his permission. Let's do this, Billy replied. The next thing Billy knew, New Kergolen's elusive pulse sphere was right in front of him, begging to be taken, begging to be carried across the gate, and positively begging to be decisively hurled at the monsters whose orders put it there. I can nay believe we actually found it, Davy mused, gawping in awe at that floating metallic sphere. Keep a hold of yourself, mate, Stevie replied. We're no out of the woods yet. In any language or any dialect, truer words had never been spoken. E-13, Zongnanghai, Beijing, China Moving at a pace he hadn't known for years, Ding Ziyang hurried through a long corridor towards the office staffed by his lead ICA delegate, an esteemed astronomer who was in charge of mainland China's vast network of ground-based telescopes, Ordinarily, or at least officially, all discoveries of note were supposed to be shared with the ICA's Central Committee as soon as they were made. Today, however, the discovery was one the delegate wanted Ding to see first of all. More to the point, above and beyond the origin of the signal that had just been decoded, the nature of its encryption was what intrigued the man. As he very quickly and efficiently explained to Ding, the reason Alessandro Bonucci and every other astronomer in the world had so far failed to decode the message in the short time since the Italians shared it far and wide, was a simple one. The engineers had sent it using high-security Chinese encryption. Ding's expression betrayed his natural and utter confusion. Why? was all he could ask. Our working theory is that their craft picked up something from the Jijing probe in Mercury's orbit, the astronomer replied. All that probe had ever broadcast is atmospheric data, but the Jijing's communication were heavily encrypted because at the time when it was sent, pre-ICA, 
We didn't know what we might find, and we didn't want the Americans or Russians to be able to eavesdrop on our signals. Jijing's signals will have been the first thing the engineers picked up on this side of the sun, so they probably think the encrypted language we use to communicate with ourselves was the best one for them to use, too. Ding breathed slowly. It made some kind of sense, at least, but the biggest question of all remained unanswered. So, what does it say? We don't know, the man sighed, his shoulders slouching as he spoke. We decoded it, and the result is a gibberish image of mixed-up pixels. We think it might be a kind of transcript. I wanted you to see this first, before I send it to the station. Hopefully someone there can read it. Ding let out a sigh of his own as he shook his head. Everyone who could have read it is now on New Kergalen, looking for the sphere. The architect and the boy were the only two who could read transcripts on this side of the gate since the first pulse, and images of transcripts on Earth can't even be read on New Kergalen. Alessandro told us that. The man said nothing, his mental gears turning. But... Ding said, raising his eyebrows as an idea arrived. We could ask Alessandro to rebroadcast the signal through the gate. Then the messengers and humans on New Kergalen would be able to see it, because the transcript itself wouldn't be on Earth's side of the gate. Zhao, tell me I'm right. Sir, for that to work, we would have to give them the encryption key, and Jijing isn't the only thing that uses that encryption. We would be... We would be doing the only thing we can do to give the world a fighting chance of knowing what the engineers want and how we can stop them, Ding interrupted. He couldn't be angry at Zhao for raising this concern, which in ordinary times would be a very reasonable and perhaps even a patriotic one to factor in. Today, however, with untold numbers of Earth's citizens quite literally heading towards suffocation at the hands of the incoming engineers, whatever could be done quite simply had to be done. It's all on me, Ding insisted. This is my call, and if there's a price to pay down the line, then I'll be the one paying it. Zhao, as your premier, I am ordering you to send the encryption key to Alessandro Bonucci. Right now. Looking hesitant, but perhaps not entirely opposed to Ding's desires, Zhao did as he was asked. And for better or for worse, Earth's first message from the engineers was now well on the way to being fully received. E-12, Subterranean Vault, Isle of Answers, New Kergalen. So now he just takes it? Billy asked, speaking to no one in particular. That's the plan, Geo replied. But I thought Rogue was going to get the other architects down so they can all place a force field around it for extra protection. Then he was going to teleport them up to the mothership. They can take turns holding it in the air, I suppose, if maintaining a force field takes energy. It doesn't, Cody stated. He can make a platform for it to float on and then just leave it. But yeah, for getting it up there, he will bring the others down. Face to face with a sphere identical to the one that had caused such heated debate on Earth, some of the group felt far more intimidated than they had expected to. There had been feelings of relief and even premature feelings of victory at first when the object they'd been searching for was successfully discovered, but now the reality was sinking in. One false move, and they could all be dead in an instant. Can I just say something? Carrick Thomas interjected. This lower level has the same floor space as the entire upper area, with all of its rooms and chambers. Right, Davy? Stevie? The men nodded. But we really think this is all that's down here? The Welshman followed up. The first thing we found, and we think it's the last thing to be found. What else were you expecting? Billy replied. Carrick shrugged, very honestly. I'm not expecting anything, really. I just don't think we can safely assume there won't be anything. Maybe we should take a look around. We've no really a lot of time, pal, Davy said. That's a long walk. What if maybe Rogue flashes you to the other side and you can have a look there, and I'll walk that way from here and meet you in the middle? That way we'll cover the whole length of this place more quickly. Carrick turned to Rogue. And me, 
Serena requested. Cody gave the okay after getting it from Billy, at which point Rogue flashed the young couple to the far end of the vault. He returned immediately, leaving them to search for nothing in particular, and quite likely, nothing at all. In a situation as urgent and grave as the one their home planet found itself in, however, neither Carrick Thomas nor Serena Cruz had a mind to leave anything to chance, or quite likelies. And within no time at all of their eyes adjusting to the light of Rogue's return flash, the couple were more than glad of their shared instinct for thoroughness. They were also glad of their transcript-reading patches, as it went, since those were what enabled them to make sense of what they'd found. On a control panel that looked structurally identical to the one at the opposite end of the enormous vault, a very different transcript provided information about how these controls could be used and what they could and couldn't enable. Put simply, they were atmospheric controls for the entire vault. Amid descriptions and information about countless variables, a warning jumped out about the danger that exposing the pulse sphere to oxygen and gravity would cause. Quite explicitly, the transcript warned that such exposure would immediately set the sphere off. The pulse sphere was safe where it floated because it was, as predicted, encased in a protective force field which essentially enveloped it in a vacuum. This didn't have any immediate bearing on Rogue's ability to move it, since the plan already involved encasing it in a force field, and since the ones he and his fellow architects created could go around the existing one to ensure the crucial vacuum was maintained. What this did have a very telling effect on was the next and even more crucial stage of the group's plan. During the ICA roundtable, Carrick recalled one of the scientists insisting there was no guarantee that the sphere or its pulses would behave the same way in space as they did within Earth's environment. That uncertainty had just been removed, but in the wrong direction. For after reading this transcript, Carrick and Serena knew that exposure to oxygen and gravity, two things sorely lacking in space, was necessary for the sphere to be engaged. In a sickeningly disappointing moment, this killed their hopes that the sphere could be utilized against the engineer's craft by way of a physical bombardment. According to what the couple had just found out, a pulse sphere in space would effectively be little more potent than a large bowling ball. More than a little ironically, the pulse sphere had been found without too much difficulty and without any emergent reason to believe Rogue's suggested method of moving it into space would be particularly dangerous, much less impossible. The irony lay in the fact that although the group had the sphere within reach and could likely have it in space very quickly, there was nothing useful they could do with it once it was there. All of a sudden, this all-consuming quest for the pulse sphere had come to seem like a herring redder than Earth's sky. The sphere's power couldn't be redirected or focused into a beam, and it couldn't be effectively utilized in the vacuum of space. With this new knowledge in mind, Carrick and Serena trudged back towards the rest of the group to break the bad news. But any disappointment they felt here on New Care Galen, as deep as it was, positively paled in comparison to what had emerged on Earth's side of the gate only moments earlier. Because just as humanity's best hope for stopping the engineer's relentless approach towards Earth had dissipated like smoke on a cold morning, the reason for that approach had just become clear. E-11, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. Alessandro Bonucci's workstation was a veritable hive of activity from the moment the crucial message came in from Beijing. He immediately called William Godfrey and the McCarthys to his side. All of them were equally stunned by the revelation that it was protected by a Chinese encryption that had just been shared with the station at Ding Ziyang's explicit request. They think the message is some kind of transcript, and that the guys on New Kerguelen will be able to see it if we send them the signal and give them the key, Alessandro said, reading the full message from Beijing with increasing excitement. Since the first pulse we have known that a photograph of a transcript taken on this side of the gate cannot be read there, but this will be different. This time the transcript itself will be on New Kerguelen, if you follow my meaning, because that's where they'll receive and decrypt the message. I'm surprised they've shared their encryption key, Emma mused. I mean, I don't know all that much about it, but in terms of national security and strategic considerations, it was crucial. 
Godfrey replied, nevertheless impressed and pleased with Ding's swift action. Even if the message had been something clear, if we'd heard it from the Chinese, there would have been people claiming it could be some kind of trick. Less so than would have been the case if Mason was still in town, of course, but Washington and London still have their share of hawks. But since we know from direct observation that the message is coming directly from the engineers, not from the Chinese probe, and since the Chinese have given us the key to decode it, rather than giving us the final message, we know that whatever we're about to learn really is coming from the engineers. Even as Godfrey spoke, Alessandro had begun broadcasting the signal directly to the reception point in New Kerguelen's great shelter. The proximity of Il Cercatore to the gate meant there was no meaningful communications delay at all, which in turn meant that the signal would be with Lisha and Timo as soon as the instantaneous message that told them it was coming. Sure enough, within seconds, Lisha's face filled Alessandro's screen. Any news from the vault? Dan asked, interjecting quickly before they got to the business at hand. Lisha briskly shook his head. Not yet. As Alessandro explained the full situation, Timo arrived along with Clark and Tara. Neither of their children were present, both safely in the care of the human nurses who had bonded with Aiden during his previous brief stay on the alien world. Are you guys all wearing your transcript patches? Piper asked them. Sure am, her Aunt Tara smiled hopefully. Clark and Timo nodded. Okay, Godfrey encouraged them. Open it up. Alessandro provided some very straightforward instruction for how the key was to be applied, with Timo doing the typing on the other end of the line. We're in, the ailing billionaire said as the screen began to change. This must be a... Yeah. Transcript. Everyone on the station watched in rapt anticipation of the first telltale signs of what kind of message the engineers had sent. A slight crack in someone's expression would likely give it away before they were finished receiving the richly layered information, the group thought, and this turned out to be precisely the case. Leisha, by far the most experienced transcript reader among the four individuals currently analyzing the message, finished first. When he did, the desolation on his face was there for all to see. The alien's eyes fell closed and his head tipped backwards in a manner no one had ever seen from him. Timo Fiori, second to finish, then covered his face with his hands and walked away. No one on the station was yet even able to bring themselves to ask what the message was, but the clearest thing in the world was that the news was beyond bad. Tara was next to turn away, leaning her head into Clark's shoulder and beginning to sob uncontrollably. Perhaps the hardest thing for the group on the station to see was the slow tear that then trickled down Clark McCarthy's typically unbreakable face. Talk to me, man, Dan begged from the station. Clark, talk to me. His older brother closed his eyes and exhaled slowly. They've told us what they want he said, his voice weaker than anyone had ever heard. There's no negotiation, and they're not stopping or leaving until they get it. And? Emma desperately inquired. Clark's eyes remained fixed on the transcript, unable to look away in the hope that a second, third, or fourth check might somehow reveal something different. It didn't. However bad it is, we need to know. Emma continued. Clark finally managed to look at the camera. The however bad was what was getting to him, because there was no getting around the fact that this was worse than anyone could have guessed. You can tell us, Piper bravely tried to reassure him, but her interjection only made his expression even more pained. Summoning all of his internal strength, Clark then bit the inside of his cheeks and got ready to say it. It's okay, Uncle Clark, the girl said. Just tell us. Why won't they leave us alone? What do they want? Piper, darling, Clark gulped, forcing out the words before inhaling sharply to ward off a welling avalanche of emotion. They want you.
Part 7. Last Request A ship in harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. John Augustus Shedd E-10 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore The engineers want me? Piper echoed in disbelief. There was very little she wouldn't have given to read the tell-all transcript for herself, but the fact that several trusted individuals on New Kerguelen had all reached the same conclusion from their own readings left little room for hope that she would have seen anything different. You, Cody, and Rogue, Clark clarified. It's hard to explain. You know how the transcripts can be. It's not writing. It's not pictures. But this is what it's telling us. The engineers want the three of you because you shouldn't exist. You and Cody shouldn't exist at all because the uplift powers were never supposed to be hereditary for anyone, and Rogue shouldn't be swanning around without an imprinted identity to fill a specific role. I don't know what they want with you, but they want you and they say they're not going to leave until they get you. It's less of an invitation and more of a summons. They claim they don't want to get any closer to Earth than they have to for us to get the message, and the message is that they want you to go to them. Or else, basically. Clark's heart looked broken as he bravely relayed this, and no one had made the situation any worse by saying, or else what? While many things remained unclear, one thing that couldn't have been any more obvious was what would happen if Piper, Cody, and Rogue ignored this call. The status quo of the blood-red eclipse was suffocating life on Earth as it was, without even factoring in that the engineers and their sun-blocking megaship were still getting closer. By the minute, the situation on the ground was deteriorating to the extent that city dwellers in many areas were already unable to leave their homes due to atrocious buildups of air pollution caused by stagnation in the absence of wind, not to mention the continually dropping temperatures in places where humanity already lived on the edge, and the urgency of the moment quite simply could not have been any greater. On the station, no one could believe what Clark was telling them. More to the point, no one wanted to believe what they were hearing. What the engineers wanted had long been a question on everyone's mind, and now that the answer had arrived, they were wishing they had never wondered. We still have the pulse sphere idea, Dan stated, his voice weak. He looked at his daughter, who somehow seemed less troubled than either he or Emma were. This isn't over. The guys should be getting the sphere any minute now. If it's all going well down there, we still have that. The girl nodded defiantly. We do. And maybe we're in a better spot than we were a minute ago, because until now we only had that. But now, if that doesn't work... I guess at least we have this. No, we don't, Emma replied through a pained expression and trembling lips. Piper, you can't. You can't go. We don't know what they want with me, Piper said. I mean, if they wanted rid of me, would I still be here? And you know I don't want to say this, but even if we did know it was going to be a one-way trip, what's the alternative? Do nothing so everyone else dies too? Although it had already been the ultimate fear that underlined every other, hearing Piper say the word die, one that she had avoided uttering outright even during the darkest days of the Pulse countdown, took all of the air from the station and left her parents feeling like they had been kicked in the gut. If the Pulse sphere doesn't work, that's where we are, Piper concluded. I'm sorry, but it is. Emma pulled Piper in and hugged her tightly, the way the girl was taking this news said a lot about her, and the words she had just spoken truly said it all. When Piper was the one facing the prospect of laying her life on the line, for the second time in a matter of weeks, no less, Piper was the one apologizing for the situation. Knowing how hard that situation was on her parents seemed to trouble Piper more than the implications it held for her in a far more direct sense, and this was entirely in keeping with the personality of the selfless girl they were lucky enough to call their daughter. Born different, through no fault of her own, Piper had never used her neurological advantages for nefarious ends. Similar could be said of poor Cody, 
who had been brought into the world to be used by the likes of Nick Mason through no fault of his own whatsoever. For those powers to be held against them, to any reasonable person, was an affront to every imaginable concept of justice, but it was in regards to Rogue that this point was perhaps truest and most unfair of all, since his kind had been genetically programmed and manipulated by the engineers themselves. How anyone could think the trio deserved to be targeted in whatever way the engineers had in mind, no one who knew any of them could possibly understand. All three were good and decent and remarkable not because they held the varying degrees of the uplift powers, but because they remained good and decent despite them. None of the three had allowed their powers to corrupt them. This isn't over, William Godfrey said as calmly as he could. We'll hear from the vault on New Kergelen soon, Piper, and if all goes well, we'll be blowing these bastards back to the other side of the sun before the night is out. If it can be done, it will be done. I promise you that. A voice from the other end of the call to New Kergelen, belonging to Leisha, spoke next. The group on the station all got the message within a few seconds, when it was delivered via the vocal translator on Alessandro's desk, and all were desperate to hear from the vault-based explorers the alien leader was about to contact. With Earth's Plan B in the quest for survival imploring Piper to engage in a suicide mission to the craft that was causing all of the problems in the first place, every ounce of hope was on Plan A. Every ounce of hope was on the pulse sphere being usable against the incoming engineers. And a recent discovery in the vault meant that every ounce of hope was truly hanging by its final thread. E-9, Subterranean Vault, Isle of Answers, New Kergolen. As Carrick and Serena hurried back to the rest of their group from the far side of the vault, saddened by what they'd learned but keen to fill the others in as quickly as they could, a surprise flash engulfed them without warning. What the? Carrick yelled. Before he or Serena knew it, he and Serena were standing back at the Pulse Sphere with Cody, Rogue, Billy, Geo, and the Scottish Drillers. There was no hint of a smile between them, leading the young couple to assume they hadn't been alone in discovering some bad news. What happened? Serena asked, sensing from Billy's face in particular that their news had to be worse than bad. The station picked up a signal from the engineers, he relayed without a wasted word. They want Piper, Cody, and Rogue, and they're not leaving until they get them. Apparently, that's what this is all about. And no, we don't know why. Serena's heart ached when these words came her way, compounded by the knowledge that the group's only other hope was dead. She and Carrick were so far alone in knowing that the pulse sphere couldn't be activated in the vacuum of space, by an impact or any other means, since the presence of both oxygen and gravity was required for its prodigiously dense energy stores to be released, and she knew only too well how the others would feel when they found out. But we still have this, Billy Kendrick defiantly insisted, gesturing towards the sphere. Who cares why they're coming? We're blowing them away anyway. Carrick and Serena exchanged a sad glance. About that, the Welshman said. When he broke the news from the transcript at the far end of the vault, Carrick made sure to stress that while there was no longer any good reason to think moving the sphere within a force field of Rogue's creation would be unsafe, there was equally no reason to think it could be used against the engineers. Basically, Carrick sighed, without an atmosphere around it, this thing is a dead weight. Fire without oxygen, pretty much. However you want to think of it, we can't use this in space. It would make more sense to launch a conventional missile at the engineers than this. It would bounce off the outside of their craft like a bird off a window. Cody turned away from Carrick when he was finished speaking and focused intently on the sphere. So intently that the others couldn't help but notice. Chip placed a supportive and welcome hand on his shoulder. You okay, kid? Billy asked, unable to imagine how the boy must have been feeling. It was bad enough for Billy, he considered, 
without feeling the weight of being one of three individuals the engineers had demanded in exchange for otherwise leaving Earth and its population alone. The boy nodded. I want to talk to Piper and the others, he said. We need to talk. Billy couldn't disagree. We have a line to Leisha on this radio here, but if Rogue flashes us to the shelter, we can see everyone on the station too. These words were barely out of Billy's mouth by the time the whole group were out of the vault. Named, like Cody, as one of the engineer's three most wanted, Rogue clearly understood that time was of the essence like never before. Everyone trusted him implicitly by now, and some had come to be able to discern emotions from some occasional and subtle changes on his usually expressionless face. The dominant emotion of the moment, quite understandably etched across the face of an alien who had long been considered the most fearsome thing anyone had ever seen, was fear itself. E-8 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Turcatore As soon as Rogue transported the group from New Kerguelen's vault into the planet's great shelter, they began an intense and urgent video discussion with the team on the station, the urgency of the task on New Kerguelen meant that Il Tricatore's team had dwindled to five, with Alessandro Bonucci and William Godfrey flanking the McCarthys, but there was one station-based individual in question who Cody wanted to speak to. Piper, what do you think? he asked, wasting no time. Unlike him, however, she hesitated. Did you find the sphere? That's what I wanted to talk to you about, Cody said. We did? But it's kind of complicated, a mixed bag of good and bad news. It definitely seems like the sphere couldn't do its thing in the vacuum of space, because Carrick and Serena found a transcript that says it would be triggered by oxygen and gravity. Right now, it's kept in place by a force field, but Rogue could put it in one of his own and move it. The problem is the whole vacuum of space part. We could get it into space in Rogue's mothership, but we'd think it would bounce off the outside of their craft. Billy said that, and it gave me an idea. Uh, it did? Billy gulped. Cody nodded, still focusing on Piper. It gave me the idea that even if it would bounce off the outside, we could maybe still engage the sphere from the inside of their craft. A falling pin would have sounded like an elephant using a jackhammer as a pogo stick. Such was the oppressive level of silence that followed Cody's words. Every alien race we know about breathes our air, the boy continued. So, I don't know. Isn't it pretty reasonable to think these engineers will at least have some oxygen flowing around in there? There's definitely going to be gravity, so if Rogue could keep the sphere in a force field, get it inside their craft, and then remove the force field... A few minutes earlier, the notion of any members of the group entering the engineers' approaching megaship would have seemed as impossible as it was crazy. With an invitation since arriving for three of them to do just that, the impossibility was gone. For many of the rest, however, the craziness of the idea remained. How could you possibly sneak the sphere in with you? William Godfrey asked. Emma shot the ICA chairman the sternest of all looks, wordlessly asking him why in the hell he was entertaining the idea with a specific response like that when she believed the only obvious response was to dismiss it out of hand. Cody shrugged. Maybe he could cloak it, I don't know. We don't know what we're dealing with either in terms of these engineers. Maybe they're good at what they're good at, but have blind spots. We don't know. No, we don't, Emma chimed in. And we're sitting here scheming, okay, but who's to say they're not listening? Who's to say they're not always going to be that one step ahead? Piper sighed. Well, that's not something worth worrying about, she said. Sure, they know about me and Cody and Rogue, but that could be because we've done things. We've all shown our powers, and over a pretty long period, if we start thinking the engineers are literally all-knowing, we might as well just give up now. And we can't read too much into anything in either direction, but maybe they've asked for the three of us to go to them because they're worried about coming to get us. Maybe they know we have weapons of our own. Maybe a siege is their best bet, because it turns it into a range war they can't lose. Or maybe they wanted a range war they thought they couldn't lose until we got our hands on their own strongest weapon. I'm just saying, maybe. Emma scratched her forehead, briefly pressing her fingernails into the skin and her telltale sign of intense stress. 
Piper, please. I know, the girl said. I know how this must be for you, too. I know. You can't possibly say that, her mother interrupted, her tone weak and gentle. You could never know how it feels to... How it feels to wish you could save someone you love? Piper cut in, returning the favor. How it feels to have it within your power to save all the people you love, but for someone to say you can't do it? Right now, I think I have some idea. And it's not a suicide mission, Cody chimed in with a somewhat incongruously upbeat lilt to his words. Rogue could bring the sphere into their craft inside a force field and then drop it just as he flashes us back out to his mothership. Emma and Dan were both looking at the ground, desperately seeking some alternative. It's a leap of faith, Piper said. But what else do we have? Mom, Dad, these engineers aren't just going to destroy Earth if we don't do this. They're already destroying Earth, and this is the only thing we can do to stop them. It's just like the final pulse. I had to try, and we wouldn't be here if you hadn't let me. And right now, I know you would swap places with me if you could, but I would swap places with you too. I would swap places and I would let you do this. Emma gulped. It's not like that. It is, though. It's exactly like that, Piper replied. You would do anything to protect me and you always have, but I'm the one in a position to do the protecting. Cody, Rogue, and I are in that position. That's the hand we've been dealt and we can't switch. All we can do is play it to the end, because otherwise, we've already lost. But how would you get the sphere into their craft? Emma asked. The mood on both New Care Galen and the station changed completely when Emma said this, because it represented a significant change in her position. From scowling at Godfrey when he raised specific questions instead of dismissing the whole plan out of hand, Emma was now the one pushing for details. First, we need to get it from the vault, Cody replied. As quick as you can. Piper said, but carefully. Cody turned to Chip Petrovich for final approval, and in turn, Chip looked at the screen in front of him. Dan? Emma? Godfrey? Godfrey, as unsettled as everyone else, but just as out of alternative suggestions, glanced at each of Piper's parents in turn, and then looked squarely at the camera on Alessandro's computer to address Cody. Quick and careful the ICA chairman said. We'll think while you get it. Good luck. Piper felt her shoulders relax. She reached for Emma's hand and squeezed it tightly. You don't have to do this, Emma quietly insisted, for Piper's sake, trying her best not to cry. I love you, Mom, Piper said. But you know that's not true. E-7, Subterranean Vault, Isle of Answers, New Kerguelen. This time, taking with him only Cody, Chip, and Billy Kendrick, at the boys' suggestion, Rogue flashed his way into New Kerguelen's vault. The foursome arrived directly in front of the all-important Pulse Sphere, with Billy along for the ride due to his important role in first raising and consistently supporting the very idea of using this sphere as a weapon against the engineers. Surprised not to see the others at his side, Billy also couldn't help but feel flattered and glad he had made the cut. As an archaeologist by training and longtime ancient alien theorist by trade, Billy had spent a great portion of his life searching for any hints of extraterrestrial technologies. To be confronted at close range by an alien sphere of weaponized energy would once have been beyond the wildest realms of Billy's imagination, and something about the sphere got deep into his psyche even after everything he had been through with various races on various planets. There was just something about its sheer power, with the destruction he had seen firsthand in the above-ground ruins adding to the harrowing footage he'd seen from Scotland in really making it hit home just what this relatively small object was capable of. What's the exact plan here? he asked, suddenly concerned about the potential volatility of the sphere, given that the two things that would trigger its explosion— oxygen, and gravity, were very plainly abundant in the vault as a whole. Is Rogue going to surround it in another force field? A bigger one? The one that's holding it in place can't be too big, because some of the others were getting pretty close earlier. Exactly, the boy replied, 
Exactly to both parts. That's what he's going to do, and that's why we know he can do it. Then straight to the mothership? Cody nodded. Say, Billy, when we're going to the engineers, you can come if you want. It doesn't say they'll only take the three of us they asked for. It just says we have to be there. I don't know, just in case you ever wanted to see inside their craft, since we're going to be blowing it up. Now would be the time, I guess. Billy didn't know whether he was supposed to laugh, but he didn't think so. I think if you're going to do what they ask for, you should probably do exactly what they ask for and not add more people, he said. But thank you. Hmm, Cody mused. Rogue says he wants to bring the other architects, though, as a big part of the plan. Billy looked at the giant alien. He's making plans? Of course he is, the boy replied, like this was the most obvious thing in the world. And those engineers programmed him before he broke out of the imprinted identity and went rogue, so I think we should listen to what he thinks. Let's be sure we get this sphere out of here safely first, okay? Billy replied. Cody's comments were certainly thought-provoking, but a misstep here would render all other concerns utterly meaningless. As Rogue held out his hands towards the incredibly potent pulse sphere in preparation to surround it in a telekinetic force field he could safely maneuver and teleport to his waiting mothership, Billy briefly wondered whether he might have drawn the short straw in being chosen to accompany the core trio of Cody, Chip, and Rogue for this moment. Everyone else was safely out of the sphere's range, either on Earth's side of the gate or in New Kerguelen's pulse-proof great shelter, but all Billy Kendrick could do as Rogue stared intently at the sphere was cross his fingers and hope for the best. The helpful architect outstretched his right arm and opened the palm before pulling it slowly towards him. As he did so, the sphere followed the movement. Billy looked around, fairly confident he was still alive and not dead in a forever dream, then focused again on Rogue. When the sphere was well clear of its previous floating point, albeit still suspended, Cody gave the alien a thumbs up. At that point, Billy's vision was overtaken by a white flash, and the next thing he saw was the inside of Rogue's mothership. Cody and Chip were there too, but more pertinently, so was the sphere. Intact, and seemingly stable as it floated in this new room full of oxygen and gravity. So the force fields, Billy said. Clearly he can keep something in a vacuum surrounded by an atmosphere, but he can keep something in an atmosphere surrounded by a vacuum? Not for long, Cody replied. Why? Billy upturned his lip and shook his head. I was just curious. This is incredible to see if exposure to oxygen and gravity really would set it off. I didn't know the force fields were as strong as this. I suppose I always thought they were more porous. The boy nodded. You really shouldn't underestimate him. I won't, Billy said, looking again at the alien and hoping the boy's faith in his abilities was well placed. From what Billy had seen so far, there was little reason to think it wasn't, but he was under no illusions whatsoever that the upcoming challenge wouldn't be the biggest rogue ever faced. And more than anything else, Billy Kendrick just hoped it wouldn't be the last. E-6, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore Even in the minutes it took Rogue to return Billy back to the surface of New Kerguelen and gather the others who wanted to return to Earth's side of the gate, the situation on Earth got even worse. Alessandro's data suggested that global cooling was not just continuing but accelerating, and articles and videos that popped up on his secondary monitor showed the kinds of effects this was already having. If the group hadn't known already, it now really was abundantly clear that to ignore the engineer's summons would be to sign the death warrant of every soul on Earth. Even this stark reality, and the guilt that came with even a slight level of hesitation, didn't make it easy for Emma or Dan to accept Piper's decision to accept the invitation, however, and their grief and concern were so great that very little room was left for the pride they should have been feeling above all else for the selflessness of the daughter they had raised together. Given the massive danger currently looming down on Earth, 
and indeed the space station that orbited the planet at a distance far too small to offer any protection against a sizable incoming threat, the group currently stationed on Il Cercatore were surprised to see just how many people had come to join them. Everyone who made the outbound trip was back, from Carrick and Serena to Davy and Stevie, Clark and Terra's family, and of course Cody and Rogue along with Geo and Chip. Billy couldn't make the trip due to his well-understood heart condition that ruled out cross-gate travel, but one other individual who stepped forward from the returning pack brought overdue smiles all round and brought Alessandro Bonucci from his desk to the edge of the control room as soon as he saw him. Timo, the physicist called. Oh, my friend, my friend, how we worried. It's good to see you. Timo smiled, patting his longtime right-hand man on the back several times as they embraced. While they caught up for a few moments, far less time than they would have taken in more normal times, Cody and Rogue made a beeline for the McCarthys. Hey, Piper said, is the sphere stable inside Rogue's craft? Cody nodded. It's going to be totally stable until he disengages the force field. It's not like when the messengers make a force field and have to hold in place— or like when we do it, I guess. It's going to stay until he gets rid of it. I need to know what his plan is, Cody, Emma cut in. A desperately concerned mother first, second, and third, Emma was also acutely aware that a botched attempt to eliminate the engineers would likely bring a wrath down on Earth that would exceed the hellish conditions that were being imposed already. It has to be good. Does he know anything about the engineers at all that we could use? No to that, but he does have a plan, Cody said. He's going to bring all of the architects and use them to shield the sphere. It depends on what happens when we arrive, but one idea he has is that the others could teleport it into the engineer's craft at the last minute, and he can sneak us away with a flash right before one of the others disengages the force field. It really depends on the layout, how many of them there are, what they seem like in terms of power and telepathy, and all those other things we won't know until we get there. But he's ready. He's bringing the others? Emma asked. He thinks that'll be allowed. Cody glanced at Rogue, then back to Emma. He needs at least one, to make sure we get away safely before one of them gets the sphere in there and disengages the force field. Otherwise, it could be too tight if he has to disengage it and flash us away right after he does it. We don't know if the sphere will engage literally instantly when it's exposed to the atmosphere in their craft, but for safety, we have to assume it will. And we can't set a countdown timer or anything like that, like we hoped at first. That was only for doing it inside the vault, because that's where the control panel was, and there was definitely no way we could have been sure that a countdown we set back there would work on this side of the gate. No way. Emma didn't, and couldn't, disagree with any of that but the initial point about bringing the other architects raised something in her mind. She looked at Dan, using the experience of their many happy years together, to silently check if he was thinking the same thing. He was, so she said it as plainly as she could. If Rogue is bringing along the other architects who weren't invited, we're coming too. They're either going to be angered by uninvited guests showing up or they're not, so it shouldn't make a lot of difference. Okay, Cody replied without missing a beat. He's okay with that, and I am too. Piper, are you? She shook her head. Definitely not. And Mom, before you say I'm being a hypocrite, you guys don't have to take this risk. I do. What if the plan of going there works at saving the world, but they don't let us go or we can't get the sphere inside their craft to destroy it? Would you really want Aunt Tara and Aiden and Liam to be without all of us when you coming along doesn't even help? When it's just a risk? Tara was standing close enough to hear all of this, but she couldn't bring herself to vocally come down on either side. If I may, William Godfrey interjected with a cough to clear his throat. This is an unprecedented moment when we face a threat from beings we know almost nothing about. I wish I could step in for Piper or for Cody, but Emma, I can no more do that than you can. My view is that Rogue has a plan to utilize the sphere, and anything that adds an unnecessary potential point of failure should be avoided. Riling our enemies by having Piper arrive with an entourage rather than alone 
could very conceivably be one such potential point of failure. If we believe in the plan, your presence could bring more danger to Piper than your absence, and for no tangible benefit. Emma had no reply, and could reluctantly see only sense in Godfrey's point. What finally got through to her was the explicit statement that by going along she could be putting Piper in more danger than she was already in, by way of irking or even just surprising the engineers. When Emma came to consider that her desire to be at Piper's side when she walked into such an awful situation meant more to her than it did to her selfless and intensely independent daughter, she realized it might even have been selfish as well as foolish to insist on joining her. Okay, Emma said, sighing deeply after a single word of tremendous consequence. Piper immediately hugged her, tighter than ever. Thank you. I want you to be safe, just like you want me to be safe, and this is our best chance of being safe together again. For an emotional few minutes, everyone in the control deck gave Piper and Cody their best send-offs. For Piper's sake in particular, they tried to stay relatively upbeat, but this was much easier said than done. Chip Petrovich gave Cody a pep talk about how much adversity he had already overcome, and the boy took every word on board before hugging the man he had always seen as a protector by virtue of how they met, and who he now saw as a real friend. Rogue watched on throughout all of this, moved by the depth of feelings his human friends clearly had for each other. He felt enough of a connection with them, and especially Cody, to take a risk like this for their sake. There was a second motivation to his plan, however, and that was payback against the engineers who had not only subjected Earth to a previously unimaginable period of sunless hell, but who were also ultimately responsible for his own deep confusion over his own identity as something akin to a genetically engineered worker drone who had accidentally slipped from their sphere of pre-programmed control. The alien's confidence in his own plan, coupled with the neurologically gifted Cody's total agreement with that confidence, wasn't quite contagious, but it definitely served to temper the runaway fears in the minds of some members of the group. Piper encouraged the others to remember their emotional farewells to Timo when there had been so much uncertainty about whether his attempt to force the gate to New Kergolen back open would succeed. The fact he was now standing on the station, with Terra's family for company, after his successful mission to enable their return, said everything that had to be said, Piper insisted. If we start fearing the worst, they've already won, she said. Serena. I remember when you said sometimes things just work out, and they do. But always, we have to try. Serena nodded supportively. I'll see you soon, she said. And the sky won't be red. Piper smiled for the first time in a while, glad of the momentary levity, however brief. She then hugged Dan and Emma one more time and made a promise to little Aiden, less successfully distracted by his headphones and game than usual, given how easily he could sense the grown-ups were extra worried about something today, that she would be back as soon as she possibly could. There came a point when she had to leave, and when further words only made it harder, so she gave one final wave to everyone and stepped forward with Rogue and Cody towards the station's departure point and the waiting mothership. I think the engineers are scared of us, Cody said as soon as he was sure the others couldn't hear. We weren't supposed to exist. They have power, and they had plans, but we slipped through the cracks. All we know about them is that they crave order. They imprinted identities on the architects so they would carry out specific jobs. Then those imprinted architects put the messengers into casts. You know more about them than I do, but it's all about structure, confined development, no room for personality or divergence. And I know way too much about all that. If these robot-style engineers are scared of us and think we could be dangerous, Piper said with a slight grin, I guess we don't want to let them down. Yeah, it's only fair that we prove them right, Rogue responded in the same spirit. Whether the youngsters were attempting to psych themselves up or truly felt confident, the giant alien who strode alongside them did so with a determined purpose, and as uniquely gifted as Cody and Piper were, Rogue was a different beast. The architect's power was utterly without question. 
but in the face of a threat like no other and a journey into the unknown, what was going to be challenged most of all was his decision-making and powers of judgment. Whether Earth as a whole was saved by the trio's sacrifice in making the trip in the first place, their own safety was in the hands of an alien who had no idea where he was taking them or who he was taking them to. There was by now no doubt in any human's mind that Rogue would always do his best to help in any way he could. When it counted most, however, it remained to be seen whether his untested best would be enough. Part 8 Endgame Count no man happy until the end is known. Salon E-5 Central Chamber Architect Mothership As Piper McCarthy sat in the central chamber of an architect mothership, which looked as though it might have had a thousand wondrous mysteries lurking behind every door, the mystery that filled her mind was anything but wonderful. When she looked through one of the central chamber's viewing areas, she saw the reddened and dying homeworld that she and Cody were in the process of laying their exceptional young lives on the line to save. When she looked through the other, she saw their destination, the colossal craft manned by hostile forces that had both cast Earth into its hellish situation and beckoned the young duo forth. What lay ahead was entirely unknown. Who lay ahead was entirely unknown. What they wanted and whether they could possibly be defeated, most crucially of all, remained similarly unknown. Piper couldn't help but compare her present situation in the mothership to the situation Chip Petrovich had faced when he ventured to the prison, where a mysteriously powerful individual had been detected. Chip bravely burst into the room with no idea of what he was going to find, knowing only that the uplifted being inside had been strong enough to defensively eliminate several of Chip's fellow foot soldiers. That uplifted individual being had been Cody, but the similarities ended there between the mission to recover him from Nick Mason's shady forces and the mission Cody himself was now involved in to tackle forces unknown. After all, on that occasion, the clarity of Piper's visions had meant Chip knew precisely which door to burst through. The man-made nature of the fortress in which the child was held also enabled a hole to be blown in the fence from above, whereas in this instance the trio en route to answer the engineer's call had no idea of the internal layout of the craft they would seemingly be invited to enter, or any way of damaging from the outside. All hope of damaging it from the inside depended on a bold plan to use against the engineers a remarkably powerful pulse sphere of their own ultimate creation. The presence of Rogue at their side was one advantage Piper and Cody had that Chip most certainly hadn't, and amid endless uncertainties about what lay ahead, the one thing they knew was that everything rested on the architect's ability to manipulate the atmosphere around the volatile sphere, his ability to ensure its prodigious power was unleashed at the perfect moment and not a second too soon. The twenty-four architects Rogue had recently raised from their slumber in Thurso were all stationed near the mothership's outer edge, watchfully guarding the sphere and ready to teleport it into the craft when Rogue gave the order from within. This was the basis of what would have to be an adaptable plan, and as it stood the moment of truth would involve one architect placing an additional force field around the sphere and then for another architect to flash itself and its sphere-shielding colleague into the craft. It was Rogue who saw an additional force field as a worthwhile endeavor, since teleporting between his craft and the engineers could involve a brief passage across a vacuum of space, depending on whether he was invited to dock within the destination craft or simply to park in its vicinity. Rogue had insisted there was nothing to worry about in terms of the strength of his force fields, but when counting on the less experienced architects from the vault, he saw sense in providing a level of redundancy. If the sphere was lost in space due to a teleporting architect's inability to focus on two things at once, all hopes of defeating the engineers would be gone. But if, on the other hand, the sphere was exposed to oxygen and gravity too soon, perhaps by a teleporting architect releasing the wrong force field at the wrong time, victory might still be achieved, but the trio of Cody, Rogue, and Piper 
would most certainly not be around to see it. Even the few elements of the plan that felt sturdiest were not without uncertainty, especially around whether the engineers might well sense the presence of the additional architects and of the sphere they were shielding. Trying to guess what the engineers might know and what might irk them was a fool's errand of little consequence, but Piper figured that the difference between bringing her parents or anyone else into the craft quite conceivably could have gone differently, and worse, than the other architects being stationed within their own mothership while Rogue answered his call. Despite her best efforts, Piper couldn't fully shift these concerns since the element of surprise was just about the only tactic the group had at their disposal. To that end, intermittent bouts of pessimism in that regard were as stubborn as they were natural. Piper nevertheless thought back to other challenges she had overcome when disaster looked inevitable and her efforts to prevent it, like the desperate thrashings of a fish on a rod. The final pulse in Thurso was the ultimate example, and it lived large in her mind. Engaging a truly final pulse within the engineer's craft was now her only hope of saving the world from the death by a thousand cuts at their hands, and any shot was better than none. The journey to meet the engineers was short, but not instant, minutes rather than seconds, with Rogue teleporting his mothership in fits and bursts rather than one singular move. Clearly the distance was a factor, with limitations and caveats at play around all of the uplift's powers in a manner the humans didn't understand and likely never would. For her part, Piper lived in hope the engineers might be similarly bound by unexpected limitations, in her desperate search for hope to hang on to, she particularly pondered the potential significance of the fact that each time she got closer to the engineer's craft, and each time more detail came into view, it became clearer and clearer that the panel-like shades which had been extended to block out the sun were receding inwards as they became unnecessary. Like a mere fingertip held close to an eye would block out the sun from that eye's perspective, the engineer's increasing proximity to Earth meant that they needed a less massive object to continue blocking the planet's natural sunlight. It was a jump, for sure, but Piper pondered that the energy filtering process and the propulsion of a craft with such a colossal surface area must have been hugely resource-intensive in one way or another. Considering that the engineers, too, must at some level be bound by the laws of physics, even if, with the benefit of some loopholes and workarounds humanity hadn't yet gotten to grips with, Piper told herself that they weren't infallible. The core of their craft was still larger than the moon, and at its largest, the panel-like extended block had been closer in size to the sun itself, but by now it had receded quite considerably. An incredibly powerful foe was more defeatable than an all-powerful, she considered, and in the midst of this darkest night of the soul, she grabbed onto this hope and held it close. They want us to go in, Cody said. Are you ready? Piper took the deepest breath of her life and gave an affirmative nod. Ready as she'd ever be would have been closer to the truth than ready, since there was no way of truly being ready for this, but Piper put on the bravest and boldest face she could for her own sake, as well as for Cody's. Rogue then walked between the two young humans, and without further ado, flashed them and himself to meet whatever monster was waiting to be met. When they materialized in a white room that stretched as far as their eyes could see, Rogue's spine stiffened. There were so many of them. Legion was the only appropriate word. But above and beyond the number, Rogue was stunned by the nature of the beings before him. This was one surprise no one had seen coming, least of all Rogue. Because every single one of the supposed engineers looked exactly like him. E-4 Entrance, Engineer Mothership Standing face to face with at least 100 architects and possibly far more, neither Piper nor Cody could believe what they were seeing. After the initial shock, Piper felt a sudden pang of relief that this was nowhere near as bad as what they could have been confronted by on arrival. 
Within a few seconds of this pang kicking in, however, it was quickly kicked aside as the architect legion parted at its center to clear a path for someone else. Or perhaps something else would have been a better term, the girl's mind pondered as a truly remarkable being, very unlike the others, made its way forward to the trio. Although it had the face of an architect, the being's torso and limbs were entirely metallic and its skull was even longer and more bulbous than Rogue's. This being was clearly in charge, and clearly of a kind, all of its own. Some bizarre and incredible fusion of biology and technology. The way the others acted around this most remarkable cyborg-style architect left Piper in no doubt. He was the engineer. Uplifted in a far deeper sense than anyone else, and quite possibly having been around for an unfathomable length of time, given that he appeared to have conquered his own dependence on a biological body, the engineer was a force to be reckoned with that made Piper's earlier relief at seeing only architects seem like her most misplaced optimistic thought ever. The engineer walked directly to Rogue and stopped in front of him. Instinctively, Cody and Piper took several steps back. Rage swirled within Piper McCarthy as she gazed upon the despicable engineer whose hostile approach had inflicted untold misery on Earth. The reasons for her feelings of rage ran deeper than that, however, with his clear mastery over so many obedient architects and his command of the largest vessel ever seen, leaving little doubt that he also bore ultimate responsibility for the recent pulses on Earth and the horrors his legions of automaton-like architects had inflicted upon New Kerguelen's messengers for thousands of years. Little doubt became no doubt when Cody turned to Piper and whispered, It was him. He engineered Rogue, and he wants to re-imprint him. He says we've corrupted him. Are they talking now? The girl asked. For now, at least, she and Cody didn't seem to be in the engineer's focus at all. He's trying to talk Rogue around, Cody whispered. He didn't know why he was whispering since that seemed unlikely to make any difference to anything, but the instinct was a strong one. He's flat out telling Rogue that he wants to determine whether we've corrupted him completely or if he's still receptive to reason, which is kind of good if it means we get information out of it. As he trailed off, Cody focused ever more closely on Rogue, utilizing their telepathic connection to hear all of the thoughts the friendly architect was consciously sending his way. The boy gulped. What? Piper asked. Belatedly, Cody turned to her. He called Rogue here to re-imprint him, but he brought us here to study us, to study why Rogue listens to us, to see if there's anything he can take from our brains to improve himself, and to see if we can give him the key he's been looking for to start engineering humans like he figured out how to control the other architects. We are the link between races, the missing pieces that shouldn't exist, with power we should never have inherited. As her planet had darkened and reddened under the despicable engineer's influence, Piper McCarthy's face whitened in reaction to these explosive insights about his motivation. Fear of death was one thing, but the fear of being used as a study tool in this monstrous alien machine hybrid's plot to subjugate humanity was too much for Piper to bear. Part of her wanted to scream for Rogue to have his charges in the mothership bring the sphere in now and get the whole thing over with while the engineer was busy spewing his lies. The rage and determination within her was strong enough to supersede any focus on her own plight, with her obvious desire to walk on Earth again playing second fiddle to her drive to ensure the evil engineer never would. The craft's huge entrance room, if that was the best term for it, was clearly teeming with oxygen and subject to a roughly Earth-like level of gravity, which meant that the sphere could absolutely be engaged at any moment. All it would take was the signal from Rogue and the architects who looked to him for orders, like the others in this huge craft looked to the engineer, would be on hand with the sphere. There was an associated plan to ensure the trio could escape alive, of course, but Piper really was focused on the main issue of unleashing the sphere's energy to destroy the engineer before he could subjugate and enslave anyone else. 
The architects around him weren't necessarily guilty of much given their deliberately engineered lack of free will, and Piper would take no joy from the collateral damage coming their way. On balance, though, the girl eased her mind with the realization they would have crushed her in an instant if the engineer gave the order, and as such, any action that harmed them would be one of true self-defense. Even more importantly, it would be an action that defended and protected billions of people who were entirely innocent, and the vast majority of whom used their free will to do good rather than seek dominion over others. But as Rogue in turn remained focused on the engineer before him, a technologically advanced hybrid it was difficult not to see as superior to the race he had somehow and at some point ascended beyond, a new concern entered Piper's mind. Everything about the plan, and any level of success it could attain, was dependent on Rogue giving the order. With Rogue still engaged in a seemingly one-way conversation with the engineer telling him it was the humans who had corrupted him, and as he stood surrounded by a legion of potential companions after so many thousands of years spent wandering the galaxy alone, Piper McCarthy began to wonder whether that order would ever be forthcoming. E-3 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore Several successive and compounding accelerations had brought a hostile force perilously close to Earth in recent days, but in truth, the peril had also been felt from afar. And even though the craft that continued to block Earth's natural sunlight was now considerably closer to Earth than it was to the sun, the distance still left a communication lag of several minutes, no communication as such was possible, in any case, due to a lack of compatibility between the radio-like devices and Rogue's craft and any at the humans' disposal. But the sights those humans would have to wait a few minutes to see would be a much more impactful sign than any signal could ever be. For the sake of Earth, they hoped and prayed to soon be witnessing the total destruction of the colossal craft and the return of sunlight, and all the life-giving goodness that came with it. But what the humans on the station desperately hoped just as hard, and none more so than Dan and Emma McCarthy, was that the brave trio who had ventured forth to plant the seed of destruction would escape before its effects were felt. There had been no time and no perceived benefit of telling the world at large about the desperate mission that was now underway. And on the Il Tricatore space station, the few people who knew what was afoot could do nothing more than wait and hope it went well. Millions of miles away, however, a lone engineer who amounted to the most powerful being in the known universe was all set to make sure it didn't. E-2 Entrance, Engineer Mothership Don't be scared, Cody whispered. The hairs on Piper's neck stood up as soon as he said it, because the words accompanied the movement of an alien-machine hybrid to the space right in front of her. A well-known description of Rogue was that he looked like something from a sci-fi horror movie, and Piper had always been able to see why, even after she came to know and trust him. This devious and dastardly engineer, however, truly looked like a nightmare come to life. His metallic body added greatly to the intimidation factor, with his hands somehow being the worst part of all. They were much smaller than rogues, clearly designed for dexterity, and the eight fingers which exuded from a palm that looked three sizes too small for them couldn't fail but evoke the image of an octopus. Like everything else on the monstrous being other than its head, these tentacle-like appendages were made of a steel-colored metal of some kind. One of the engineer's earlier comments to Rogue, which Piper heard third-hand via Cody, suggested that it was interested in studying their minds for clues as to how they had managed to make a follower out of the previously lonesome architect. Given this point, and the odd collection of metal body parts the engineer sported, it seemed very much to Piper as though he was on a mission to make himself as powerfully optimized as possible. There would have been no problem with this if he was good, the girl considered, 
In the same way, a human who fairly sought power or wealth for benevolent or at least morally neutral purposes was of no harm to anyone. But this engineer was very clearly the opposite of good. He was obsessed with power for its own sake and would stop at nothing to bring himself just a little more. Filling in the blanks led Piper to conclude he had almost certainly begun as an architect, a race which must have been a naturally occurring one, like humans or the messengers. From there, he seemed to have established himself over time as the supreme overlord of that race, ascending above the rest of his kind with technological enhancements, and at some point securing his position by stunting theirs via genetic interventions that made them more pliable to his will. Pretty much. Cody whispered in reply to these thoughts. He was using his unique connection to Rogue to effectively act as a conduit between him and Piper, in a sense rebroadcasting her words as thoughts the architect could understand. The engineer was an architect, and he is seeking an ultimate final form. He wants Rogue to be with him, and he wants to use whatever he can get from our minds to keep humanity down with limiting interventions like he's used on his own kind and the messengers. He wants Rogue to help. He sees something in Rogue. He says Rogue can be like him. He can ascend, too. Piper stared into the monster's eyes. They looked more like Rogue's than any others she had ever seen, but there was an unfamiliar darkness within them. The girl knew, without doubt, that she was staring into an evil soul possessed by an evil urge for dominion. To her horror, in her peripheral vision, she then saw Rogue step away from his position and join the ranks of the Engineer's Legion. Don't be scared, Cody whispered once more. How in the hell Piper was supposed to not be scared, she had no idea. But a glance at Cody brought a sign of hope in the form of an unmissable wink. The engineer turned to see Rogue and slowly raised one of his hands in what seemed to be a sign of approval or celebration. There was no handshake, nod, or applause here, all of which had only come to be demonstrated by friendlier aliens who had spent time in human company. Rogue copied the raised hand gesture, making Piper wonder what Cody had seemed so relaxed about. As clear as day, and perhaps unsurprisingly given the promises and lies the engineer had thrown at him, Rogue had turned. The engineer then faced Piper once more. He lifted his tentacled hand and placed it on her trembling head, bringing a shiver throughout her entire body like nothing she had ever known. Cody, bravely but pointlessly, lurched towards Piper and tried to free her from the alien's grasp. The engineer's other hand swatted him away like a fly, causing a painful fall. As the boy got to his feet, he stared at Rogue, at the alien he had bonded with so closely, and who had so far followed every request he had ever made. What Piper didn't know was that Rogue had moved to stand beside his fellow architects in a bid to lull the engineer into a false sense of security, but what Cody didn't know either was why Rogue wasn't acting now. Do it, he pleaded, so caught up in the moment he yelled the order aloud despite that being wholly unnecessary. If this wasn't the time, with Piper rooted to the spot under the engineer's horrific metal hand, he didn't know when possibly would be. Rogue, call them! Do it! As soon as the order was given, Rogue stepped forward and revealed to Piper that he hadn't turned at all. He did so by issuing the long-awaited signal to the architects in his mothership, and two of them responded by fearlessly teleporting into the engineer's craft. Pulse, sphere, and all. The engineer barked in fury. He released his grip on Piper, sending her to the floor. Cody, still smarting from his own fall, rushed to help her up. Their attention was split between the friendly architects as they guarded the sphere and the demonic engineer as he paced towards Rogue, clearly furious at deceit. Tell him to keep going with the plan, Piper urged Cody. Come on, tell him to get those two ready to unleash the sphere and get us all out of here. Even as the engineer approached him, 
Rogue was repeatedly outstretching the finger-like divisions of his hands and even placing them against his head. What's he doing? Piper bemoaned. Cody, we need to leave and they need to release the sphere from its force field. Right now! He can't, Cody relayed, speaking in the most deflated tone Piper had ever heard. The boy literally then slumped back to the ground. Rogue is trying, but he can't teleport out of here. The engineer has sealed us in. Piper stared at Rogue, who was looking right back at her with an apologetically defeated expression. He continued moving his hands into various positions, which she now saw as an effort to engage his teleportation ability in any way he could think of. But all of it was to no avail. None of the other architects were moving, seemingly all so deferent to the engineer's total authority that they couldn't act without a specific order and didn't seek to protect the sphere or round in on the outsiders who had infiltrated their domain like ants on a termite. But none of that mattered. All that mattered, as Piper knew only too well, was that Rogue and his allies were outmatched even more than they were outnumbered. He says we can unleash the sphere and stop all of this right now, the boy panted, almost hyperventilating amid the tension and magnitude of their situation. We can save Earth and we can kill this monster before he hurts anyone else. But Piper, there's no way we can get out before it blows. Piper closed her eyes and wished she was anywhere else. She wished hardest of all that she was back in London, looking out at the skyline with her parents as she had been in the blissful moment before the first pulse stung her neck and set this whole sorry mess in motion. That was the life she wanted, those closest to normal birthday week moments she could remember. But there was no sense in wishing, and when Piper opened her eyes, she saw Cody staring right at her. Say yes, and they'll do it. Piper McCarthy made the biggest gulp and inhaled the deepest breath of her life. With Earth on the line, there was only one answer she could give, and it sure as hell wasn't no. E-1, Outer Chamber, Architect Mothership Try as they might, none of the 22 architects remaining inside Rogue's Mothership were able to answer the distressed telepathic calls of the two who had carried the pulse sphere into the belly of the beast. In both directions, the engineer truly had enacted a block against teleportation. Rudderless without their leader rogue, and lost with no way of following their singular instinct to help the others from their group, the architects in this craft felt as helpless as the humans in the other. E-0. Entrance. Engineer Mothership. You can talk to them too, can't you? Piper whispered to Cody, gesturing with the tip of her head towards the sphere-guarding architects who were awaiting a decisive instruction. Yeah, Cody said. A terrified gasp then escaped his mouth as he watched the engineer reach Rogue and place his tentacled hand under the friendly architect's chin. Stay with me, Piper pleaded with the boy, pulling his arm to recapture his attention. We have to do this, but I have one new idea. Cody was all ears. The architect's force fields can keep an atmosphere in or out of the area they surround, right? She began. Just like it can keep a vacuum in or out? And you said the engineer sealed us in here, not that he blocked Rogue's teleportation power, just that he sealed us in here? One of few people alive who could keep up with Piper's mind, purely by virtue of the fact that their brains both developed around the neurological uplift powers, Cody sat up straight as he started to see what she was getting at. You mean... Piper nodded. The scene occurring with Rogue and the engineer was harrowing, but it wasn't having an immediate impact on their safety, and she knew it was important to be explicitly on the same page with Cody regarding a last-ditch plan that was far too audacious to allow any room for error. If they lift the force field around the sphere, it'll blow as soon as it feels the oxygen and gravity, she said. 
because all of a sudden it's surrounded by an atmosphere instead of a vacuum. So maybe if we're in a force field before the pulse rips the craft apart, Rogue would be able to teleport us back to the mothership at the very instant the craft does rip apart. Because we know Rogue can teleport through space. And if you're right that the engineer put up some kind of seal in this craft that blocks teleportation, and that he didn't do something to take that actual teleportation power away from Rogue, blowing a hole in the craft is going to blow a hole in the seal. Right? Cody looked more focused than Piper had ever seen him. And you think if we're close enough to the source of the pulse when it hits, a force field will shield us from it? Like your mom in Thurso? He asked. When you made the force field? Exactly, Piper said. Neither of us can make a force field that keeps an atmosphere in or out, though, so we'd obviously die instantly if we blow this craft open without one of the architect's force fields protecting us. We're counting on the sphere puncturing the craft's shell, and we're counting on Rogue being able to teleport. The fact that the sphere hasn't blown yet is proof that we can trust their atmospheric force fields, so I'm not worried about that. If their force field can survive the pulse for a second, which even mine did at Thurso, that's all we need for Rogue to flash us out of here before the pulse really picks up steam and blows this thing to hell. Ah, uh, Cody uttered, pulling Piper's arm to divert her attention like she had done in reverse a moment earlier. She followed the boy's gaze to Rogue, who was now very concerningly elevated in the air while the engineer held out an open fist as though he was about to do something very final. It went without saying that Piper didn't want to see Rogue get hurt, but in that moment her primary thought was that he was absolutely necessary for her plan. Tell one of those architects to surround us in an impenetrable force field and tell the other one to be ready to release the sphere, she urgently whispered to Cody. As Cody did as she suggested, trusting her judgment and willing to try anything at this point, Piper removed one of her shoes and telekinetically directed it, hard, towards the back of the engineer's head. There was no real physical damage, of course, but the monster turned around immediately with menace in his eyes. Rogue hit the ground with a thud and took the opportunity provided by Piper's distraction to scamper over towards the sphere-guarding architects. Having heard Piper's plan, he was ready to give it a shot. Rogue shepherded the two architects and Cody towards the extreme edge of the large white room preparing to try to teleport them away as soon as the sphere blew a hole in the craft. The engineer was far too distracted by Piper to notice, but this preoccupation presented a problem in itself. Because while Rogue and the others were ready to go, Piper was far too far from them and far too close to the engineer for any protective force field to enclose all of them within an atmosphere without also protecting the engineer. Throw it! Cody said to the architect at his side as the engineer bore down on Piper. Like it often did, the heat of the moment had the boy talking out loud when he intellectually understood that the thoughts were all he needed. Throw the sphere at him like we were going to fire it at the craft, then drop the force field. It'll distract him and Piper can run. Rogue, be ready. Piper heard this perfectly well and wasn't sure whether the engineer was too angry at her to hear anything or if Cody's words somehow didn't register. Rogue's gonna do it, Cody commented aloud for Piper's benefit. He's taking control of the sphere. The girl recoiled at the proximity of the engineer as he leaned in towards her face, but that didn't make her flinch half as much as the sudden arrival of a sphere she knew was capable of destroying entire worlds. To see the sphere hurtling through the air in a moving force field under Rogue's telekinetic control, particularly after so much care had been taken to make sure it avoided any possible accidental detonation, brought all new levels of mortal fear. The large sphere stopped just short of the engineer, close enough to distract him. No impact was possible yet, since the force field it was inside contained an atmospheric vacuum but the distraction was enough to let Piper scamper some of the way towards the group. One of you guys get all of us inside a force field, she yelled, and Rogue, be ready to release the sphere, then flash us away. The room hadn't seemed loud by any means, but the sudden presence of absolute silence told Piper that an impenetrable force field had been engaged, and that for the first time in her life, she was standing inside one. As his hand 
and indeed his entire being strained under the unprecedented challenge of maintaining one atmospheric force field while himself being contained within another, Rogue turned to Piper. He didn't have any eyebrows, but the widening of his eyes mimicked a raise. Yes, she implored him. Now! Needing no more encouragement, Rogue then released the pulse sphere his friends had found on New Kergolen from the atmospheric vacuum that had kept it stable for thousands of years. And so it went that with Piper McCarthy and her brave band of voyagers still inside it, the engineer's craft was instantly ripped apart by the power of the pulse. Endgame Unknown Time Unknown location. At the very moment when the oxygen and artificial gravity within the engineer's sun-blocking craft triggered the pulse sphere's phenomenally destructive power, that oxygen and gravity rapidly began disappearing into the void of space. Piper McCarthy heard nothing even as the pulse's explosive effects cascaded through the army of automaton-like architect minions and even as the craft's outer shell first buckled and then surrendered in the wake of a force like no other. Although it all happened within a split second, the moment very much felt like it passed in slow motion. Piper gasped in fear and awe when the stars first came into view. She had crossed the station's shark tunnel-like walkway through the stars on countless occasions, but on every one she had felt the reinforced glass underfoot and understood the workings of the man-made structure that kept her alive. Today, however, the stars were clearer and met the girl's eyes with not even a glass barrier. It humbled Piper totally and utterly to consider that all that was keeping her alive was the power and grace of the friendly extraterrestrial whose body was beginning to visibly strain under the weight of the effort. She didn't have to ask Rogue to teleport the group back to the mothership, which they could only hope was still intact, because he was already doing it. The flash came with no countdown or warning, instantly taking Piper and Cody away from the stars, when the light dissipated and Piper's vision returned, she and Cody were huddled together in apprehensive anticipation. Did we do it? The boy asked, seemingly too scared to open his eyes. <laughs> Rogue said. Never before had the dissonant words of an architect sounded so sweet. E plus one. Outer Chamber, Architect Mothership Relief did not even begin to cover it. The feelings sweeping through Piper McCarthy as she looked out of Rogue's mothership and saw nothing between Earth and the sun's life-giving light could never be described in mere words. The only person who could relate to the overwhelming emotions was the one standing by her side and smiling just as wide. How long until they see the engineer's craft in pieces? Cody asked, directing it to both Piper and Rogue. How long until the unfiltered light starts reaching them? I think Alessandro said the craft was about two light minutes away. Piper smiled. The thought of everyone else feeling this kind of relief, from her parents on the station to Mr. Bird in Birchwood, was almost as wonderful as the relief itself. E plus two. Arrival point, space station Il Cercatore. In the few extra minutes it took Rogue to make his way back to the station, everyone there rushed to the arrival point to greet the returning heroes. Piper and Cody emerged alone at first, quickly swamped by a congratulatory and thankful crowd. Emma and Dan were at the very front to see Piper, while Chip Petrovich was right there beside them to welcome Cody back with a high five. So, what happened? William Godfrey asked, as delighted as anyone that it had happened, but more cognizant of the fact that the whole world would be asking that very question, and he would be expected to answer it. And do we know if there are more of them? 
Emma sent Godfrey a brief scowl for bringing a question like that latter one up at a moment like this, but she likewise knew it would have to be addressed before long. Rogue knows more than we do, Cody said, but there was only one engineer and there aren't any more. He was like a super evolved architect. He wanted to study our brains to see how come we were able to give Rogue orders. Everyone turned to Piper looking for her to bring some more context to the boy's excitable retelling. I don't know a lot more than that, she shrugged. What happened was that we used the sphere and Rogue teleported us away just in time. There was more to it than that, but that's the headline. No, that's the headline, her proud father stated. Dan was pointing down to Earth from the walkway next to the station's arrival point, bathed in life-giving sunlight. The planet looked just as it should. It would take a while for the damage of the past few days to be undone, particularly when it came to city-based air pollution that had ramped up due to the sudden absence of circulatory winds, but things were going to get better, and perhaps even more importantly, they weren't going to keep getting worse. Morale on the ground had taken so many hits since the engineer's craft was first detected, from the initial eclipse that darkened the sky to the hellish reddening that followed, and salvation truly had come when untold millions of people were within a hair's breadth of reaching their breaking point. When Godfrey inquired about Rogue, Cody said that he and his 24-strong backup crew were all in their mothership, and that he wanted to give the humans some time together before coming to say his own farewell. Tell him not to be so crazy, Timo said. Rogue is as welcome here as anyone else. The architect appeared within seconds, not obviously shaken by everything that had happened, but definitely emitting vibes of physical and emotional exhaustion that Melly's empath abilities enabled her to pick up on. Melly placed a gentle hand on Rogue's wrist, sending him kindness and thanks that had a visible effect in straightening his lower back and reducing the tension in his soul. No one was scared of Rogue anymore, not even little Aiden, and he received almost as many thank yous and words of praise as had his two young human crewmates. As the group made their way back to the control deck in the main area of the station, an important question came from one of the Scottish drillers. So, what's happening with the sphere in Thurso? Davy asked, straight to the point. Hmm, Godfrey mused. The obvious answer is permanent deactivation, which we know to be possible, but I suppose you're thinking that could be an irreversible action we might one day regret? Davy shrugged. Aye, it could be pretty handy if we get another unwelcome visitor. I mean, if we had nae had that sphere on hand, we'd be dead. I'm inclined to agree, Timo Fiori chimed in. Chairman Godfrey. Perhaps an orbital location would be more suitable than one within Earth's atmosphere. Not here, of course. A purpose-built facility, as far away as we deem necessary. Because I feel that our Scottish friend is correct in what he says, and while my personal opposition to weapons of mass destruction has always been known, there does come a balance of responsibility. We'll talk about it, Godfrey replied. The quick glance he exchanged with Emma was enough to tell him that she agreed on both fronts, that Davy's point was a good one, and that the time to talk about it was later. When the group reached the control deck, the first order of business was a call to New Care Galen. Billy Kendrick and Leisha leapt to their feed in a heartwarming display of joy when the news reached them, and Leisha switched camera feed to let everyone on the station see the equally ecstatic reaction of New Care Galen's native population when he began airing the incoming video from the station on the giant screen in Central Plaza. Terra and Clark stepped in front of Alessandro's computer to address the messengers directly, thanking them in particular for their unquestioning willingness to upend their lives and evacuate to the great shelter at such short notice as they had. Without Leisha's offer to let a human crew remove the planet's volatile pulse sphere, and without his population's agreement to take shelter in accordance with his precondition that no messengers would be put in danger by the inherently risky sphere removal process, the plan Piper and Cody had carried out, quite simply, would not have been possible. 
like never before, the true value of interspecies cooperation had been proven and underlined. Meanwhile, as Alessandro sat at his workstation and pulled up various news stations from Earth to see just how quickly the desolation had lifted, the group belatedly came upon a different and very notable news story from five hours ago. It had understandably passed them by until now and was just as understandably playing second fiddle to the fact that the world itself had been saved, but there was no denying it was a major development. The headlines said it all. Mason Manhunt Ends, Ex-President Handed to Authorities in Guam Alessandro rapidly pulled up a few articles to get the gist of the story. It turned out that when the world learned that Mason had been tied up in the illegal detention of an innocent child, even the underworld figures and cash-hungry national leader who had previously been willing to shelter him on a small Pacific island for the right price couldn't turn a blind eye. Mason was currently being held in a U.S. facility on Guam, having been transported there when Eclipse-related visibility issues had rendered a flight to the mainland out of the question. Everyone on the station was pleased to hear he would face justice, and no one more so than young Cody. News footage from the Birchwood drive-in was perhaps the most uplifting of all for the group on the station, showing a jubilant crowd promptly gathering in what had become a dead zone during the darkest moments of the past few days. You should be there, my friends, Timo Fiori insisted, placing a hand on Dan's shoulder. I am home, and you should be too. Definitely, Tara chimed in. Aiden needs it, and Liam has been a dream, but he does too. I need it, Clark chuckled. No offense, obviously. Timo, everyone, you're all great and this place is great, but yeah, I do kind of want to remember what it feels like to sit at home and just... be. With a week old baby, Stevie cracked. Good luck, mate. Everyone laughed. If yous are going down, we will too, though, the Scotsman continued. Right, Davy. Before long, most of the group were ready to leave, Carrick and Serena were the main exceptions, jumping at the chance to stay and talk to Timo about the potential of any permanent positions on the station's varied research teams being available. The only others staying behind were Chip Petrovich and Cody, who at this stage didn't really have anywhere else to go. Chip promised to stay with him for as long as he wanted or needed, while Serena finally shared with the boy her willingness to help him look for his birth mother if that was ever something he wanted to do. It was, Cody said with interest rather than enthusiasm, but there were two other things he wanted to do before thinking much about that. The second was to have his uplifted powers neurologically disabled, which he knew Melly was able to help him with, to give him the best possible chance of the normal life he craved more than anything else in the world. The first thing Cody wanted to do, however, more than anything else, and crucially, before his powers were removed, was to meet Nick Mason in the flesh. There would be more than a little irony in that meeting occurring in a prison now that Mason was the one being held, albeit very justifiably, and Chip didn't wait for permission from anyone else to promise Cody the meeting would happen. Rogue was on board too, and after all Cody had been through at the disgraced president's hand, no one voiced any opposition or broached the potentially uncomfortable question of why exactly Cody so insistently wanted the meeting to occur while he still retained his remarkable powers. And so it went that shortly after the bulk of the group made their way to their Earth-based destinations in a docked alien craft that originated on New Kerguelen, Rogue, Cody, and Chip entered another small craft nested inside the architect's mothership for a previously unexpected visit to Guam. Nick Mason had run like a coward, but the old axiom was about to be proven truer than ever. Whoever he was, and wherever he hid, he could not outrun the sky. E plus three, drive-in, Birchwood, Colorado. Once the Scottish drillers had been dropped off at their so, the whole McCarthy clan landed in Birchwood for a quick stop at the drive-in. 
Tara and Clark opted to stay in the craft with their children, reluctant to subject baby Liam to the kind of racket that lay outside, however supportive the cheers and shouts were. Emma had no such concerns and indeed saw the moment as a great opportunity to send a powerful message of hope to a world that needed it. She knew that people in some regions had been hit far harder than those in Colorado, including residents of some of America's most densely populated cities, but this was as good a place as any to address them from. Hearing from the horse's mouth that the danger really was over was exactly what people needed, and it filled Emma only with pride to consider that the horse's mouth in question was no longer her own. She nudged Piper forward, trusted the girl's growing knack for public speaking. We stood together, Piper said. She then pointed to the sky. And our problem fell apart. Louder cheers greeted these words, a play on Dan's from their recent presentation. After everything Piper had disclosed to the crowd those few days earlier, many of the people in attendance looked at her differently than they had before. Their feelings were still positive, and in many cases more so, but when the time came for the world to hear the story of how the engineer was defeated, Piper would come to be idolized by the people of Birchwood and beyond in a way that exceeded even the height of her father's popularity. She continued with some reassurances that everything was going to return to normal very quickly, that the sphere, which currently remained under the ground in Thurso, posed no threat, and that the full story of how exactly Earth's problem had fallen apart would soon be told. It would be more accurate to say the problem had been torn asunder, of course, and the world would know the whole story soon enough. For now, the crowd cheered every word the girl did say. And while Piper McCarthy had long ago given up any hope of living anything close to a normal life, as long as it was filled with love like this coming her way under a warm yellow sun, she would never take a moment of it for granted again. E plus four, Santa Maria Prison, Guam. At Cody's request, Chip Petrovich stayed inside Rogue's craft while the endlessly helpful alien flashed the boy into Nick Mason's holding cell. Chip spent his few minutes alone wondering what might be happening behind those bars, but at no point was he concerned for Cody's safety, and at no point did he feel like it was his place to prod for details that weren't voluntarily forthcoming. It was impossible to quantify the pain Mason had caused Cody, and for Chip, the most incredible thing was that the boy had somehow emerged from his lifelong detention as a generally thoughtful and kind child. This raised some interesting questions for Chip about nature versus nurture, since all of the McCarthys were among the best people he'd ever known, and since Cody was, at the end of the day, a genetically identical carbon copy of Dan. If there was something that Cody had to get out of his system before he chose to have his powers disabled in his quest for something approaching a normal life, Chip could understand why it would involve the man responsible for the total lack of normality he had known so far. Unless Cody told him what happened, he would never ask. But when a sudden flash brought the boy back into the craft with Rogue at his side, the motivation for his visit became crystal clear. I didn't hurt him, Cody said, perhaps mistakenly thinking Chip would have minded if he had. No? Chip asked. Cody shook his head and handed his friend a folded piece of paper. Without any dramatic hesitation, Chip unfolded it and read the words. Virafax, 20 milliliters. Neuroflam, 12 milliliters. CPFR9 activator, 6 milliliters. CPFR9 location, 263 Calle del Sol, Tegucigalpa. When Chip looked back up, Cody was smiling. Timo's antidote, the boy said. He's going to be okay. One year later. E plus five. Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland. On the grand public opening of the Thurso Vault Visitor Center, 
The enormous crowd and the media hordes were spoiled for choice as to where to direct their attention. The luminaries in attendance included the likes of U.S. President Anna Vasquez and British Prime Minister Diane Logan, who jointly took this positive media opportunity to officially announce a new cooperation pact. This pact legally eliminated all remaining vestiges of the tit-for-tat travel ban and trade restrictions that had come into force during Nick Mason's tumultuous days in the White House. That Mason was now behind bars, just like Logan's predecessor, John Cole, said a lot about how low politics had sunk for a period, but the year since the Great Eclipse truly had been one that would come to be seen as a positive turning point for humanity. International cooperation was back in vogue, with the experience of the Eclipse having highlighted, like only a common threat could, that humanity really was in it together. The real focus of the day, however, was interspecies cooperation. Although the vault's public opening came almost as soon as the attraction was ready, it had been delayed by a few days to coincide with a very rare visit to Earth Leisha was already making for another purpose. During his stopover in Thurso, the leader of New Kerguelen stood alongside ICA Chairman William Godfrey to cut the ceremonial ribbon above the lift shaft, which would lead visitors from around the world into the remarkable alien structure below. The men who dug that shaft were also there for the big day, with Stevie and Davy now comfortably wealthy men, thanks to the variety of easy money sponsorship and advertising opportunities that came their way. The two remained close friends and were delighted to be joined for the event by Gio Nunes, who had sat at their side during many of the highest highs and lowest lows that had come their way in the cabin they'd called home for the strangest few weeks of their lives. Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz were also present and enjoyed catching up with the drillers. Like Geo, they now called the station home. Carrick worked alongside him in the archaeology division, which primarily saw him analyzing potential sites from above and liaising with Billy Kendrick on the latest finds on New Kerguelen, where the seemingly ageless old stalwart continued to unearth archaeological gems and answer questions about the planet's ancient messengers and islanders alike. Serena, for her part, was delighted to have been able to establish a brand new position of wildlife executive. Her work, from a bird's-eye view in low Earth orbit, included tracking migratory patterns and assisting with clampdowns on poaching and illegal hunting. Like Carrick, however, she also got to work with counterparts on New Kerguelen. Continued exploration of the planet's islands and oceans threw up new species on an almost daily basis even now, with many more than previously thought having found ways to survive the pulses that had flattened so much of New Kerguelen many thousands of years earlier. For the first time since the evening of the first pulse, Colin Fraser himself was in attendance at the farm he had tended for many happy years. His loyal dog Finn was there too taking delight in the familiar smells around some parts of his old home, but being considerably less enamored with the new structure that had replaced Colin's old house. That house had been flattened by the pulse, rather than knocked down to accommodate anything new, and the patch of land it occupied was now a multi-story education and multimedia center, especially focused on the needs of school groups and families. All kinds of memories and emotions hit Colin as he wandered around the field, which had been kept as a field largely because the authenticity and thus marketability of the site was improved by keeping things as they were. With the vault directly underfoot, there were also understandable concerns that too much building work could damage its structure. The pulse sphere had been removed prior to any building at all, of course, and was now safely stored, or at least as safely as could be, in a distant and heavily fortified vault all of its own, high in orbit where scientific experts insisted that even an accidental detonation would do no damage. On the ground, meanwhile, a small flock of sheep remained in one corner of the field. Like the field itself, they were in place primarily to satisfy the tourists' appetites for all the little details they remembered from the days when the field had been the focus of the world's attention as pulse after pulse emanated from its soil and flattened ever larger areas of the highlands. The local recovery had been tough, understandably, 
with hundreds of thousands of displaced citizens and tens of thousands of flattened homes taking considerable resources to accommodate and rebuild. A year on, while things were certainly a long way from how they used to be, many locals had moved back to their original plots and rebuilt their lives with assistance from the Global Pulse Recovery Fund. The public opening of the vault was seen as a watershed moment, with huge numbers of tourists now set to bring custom and currency that would aid in the rejuvenation of Thurso and the surrounding area. The sun shone over Scotland, yellow and true, while a brisk coastal breeze reminded the various international media personnel that they were, after all, standing near the northernmost point of Britain, on the edge of a romantic wilderness that had been attracting visitors since long before it became an alien hotspot. Life in Thurso and the Highlands as a whole would never be quite the same as it had been before the Pulse, but as a majestic falcon passed overhead to the delight of the onlookers who recognized the ironic significance of its timely appearance, the future was bright. E plus six, McCarthy Ranch, East View, Colorado. On the day of Liam McCarthy's first birthday, the boy's closest family and their closest friends gathered for a celebration that doubled as a moment of reflection of everything that had happened around the time of his birth. Looking back, it seemed hard to believe that it had all occurred within such a compressed time period, from the warning jolt that hurt Piper's neck atop the London Eye, all the way to the colossal pulse she instigated millions of miles from Earth when the planet was in the midst of the lamentable Great Eclipse. The public opening of the Thurso Vault made it an even more natural day for these reflections, and the McCarthys watched that event with great interest and warm thoughts. They watched it on a huge projector screen Clark had installed for the day with some help from his buddy Trey Myers, who had once again driven all the way from Texas, like he had when Clark needed help twice during those crazy weeks of the previous year. None of the others, including Tara, really understood why Clark and Trey had gone to so much trouble just for a viewing of the scenes from the vault, pleasant though they were. But Clark and Trey hadn't acted with only that footage in mind. As the day wore on and Liam's visitors arrived, the festivities expanded outwards from Clark's porch and onto the grassy area at the edge of the famous cornfield where so many consequential events had taken place. Clark could never look out at the cornfield for long without thinking back to the day he and Emma had found Dan sitting in a crop circle, entranced as he drew the map that led them to Lolo National Forest and their first meeting with Leisha. He could never forget the night when Dan had reluctantly revealed his temporary uplift powers to the world's media in self-defense right at the edge of the field, or indeed when Dan had proposed to Emma in the very same spot while the family had gathered to watch Il Diavolo's moment of perigree when the god-forsaken comet stopped getting closer to Earth and started getting further away. Nothing would ever erase the decidedly less happy memory of finding Phil Norris's slain corpse in the same field, but on balance, there had certainly been more good than bad. Sitting under a gazebo to keep herself and baby Liam out of the sun, which was still yellow rather than red, in a welcome change from fifty-one weeks earlier, Tara too was gazing out to the field with a thousand thoughts and memories in her head. Birthdays were always days she spent looking back and looking forward, but on this one she found that those thoughts were deeper and wider than ever. It was all positive, particularly when she remembered how desperate her situation had been on the day of Liam's birth, when her family was stranded on New Kerguelen with no good reason to think that anyone on Earth's side of the gate was still alive. A day like this, surrounded by the people she cared about most, really was what it was all about for Tara McCarthy. Dan, Emma, and Piper were naturally in the first group of party guests to arrive, coming along with Chip Petrovich and his newly adopted son, Cody. At no point in Chip's life had he ever expected or desired to care for a child, but the bond he struck up with Cody, and particularly the strength of the boy's desire to stay with him, changed all that. A succession of dead ends in the search for Cody's birth mother sped things along, 
with the boy ultimately realizing he was happy with the love and support he had in his life thanks to Chip and the McCarthys. Recognizing that what the child needed more than anything was stability, Chip agreed to give it a shot. There were challenges in the adjustment period for both of them, but with each passing day, they grew more and more glad they had endeavored to give tried. With the boy's uplift powers a thing of the past, thanks to a painless and reversible procedure conducted by Melly on the station, he and Chip had moved into the famous McCarthy residence where Dan and Clark had grown up, right next door to the property Emma had bought from old Mrs. Naylor back in the days of the IDA leak and where Dan had moved in with her just a short while later. Cody was in heaven in his dream house with a bedroom all of his own and even a small yard to walk around in. People knew who and what Cody was, which made his life fairly complicated at times, but he had the most supportive environment he could ask for. In the year since the remarkable truth of his genetic identity had become known, everyone had more or less settled into thinking of Piper, Aiden, and Liam as his cousins. Tara had certainly warmed to Cody and felt a lot more comfortable in his presence now that his powers were a thing of the past. While Aiden loved playing with him, and Piper loved the healthy competition his brilliant mind offered in all of the games they liked to play. The guests of honor for the birthday party were none other than Leisha and Timo Fiori, both of whom arrived after a long afternoon in Scotland, where they had shaken more hands and posed for more photographs than they cared to count. Despite great effort being thrown at the issue, there had still been no success in restoring the general function of the uplift powers on Earth's side of the gate, to New Kerguelen. This meant that all of Leisha's communications today occurred via Piper, who could innately both understand and speak the language of the messengers. Cody had been studying their language for a while, and was growing fluent too, but he was a ways away from catching up with Piper. Leisha and Timo's arrival, slightly belated through no fault of their own, was Clark's cue to fire up the big screen once more and hit play on a video that both of the recent arrivals had played key roles in creating. The video featured birthday wishes from various individuals on New Kerguelen and the station, from Billy Kendrick and Dr. Cardulo to Alessandro and Melly. Tara's favorite part, and Aiden's too, came when a group of messenger children performed their traditional birthday song and dance. Given that Liam's birth on New Kerguelen had combined with the identity of his parents to create something close to a messianic personality cult, albeit without any of the negative aspects, the production values and splendor of the young messenger's performance were significantly higher than would have been the case for an average birthday. When can we go back? Aiden asked, gently tugging on Clark's arm as he asked. One day, Clark said. The video ended with a surprise appearance from Rogue, the friendly architect who had once again taken to wandering the galaxy, but this time had 24 other members of his kind for company. None were imprinted with predetermined identities, and all enjoyed the same free will as Rogue. Rogue still ventured to the station on a regular basis, usually around once per month, where he willingly engaged in whatever harmless tests and experiments the endlessly curious Alessandro Bonucci had dreamed up since last time. At Timo's suggestion, Rogue had been filmed during his most recent visit. Alessandro had been overseeing a study in alien linguistics at the time, which was what gave Timo the idea. Was there anything you wanted to say to Liam? Timo asked from behind the camera. Rogue gave a slow and deliberate nod, something else he had picked up from the humans. With great effort, he then did his best to form his lips and tongue into the necessary shapes to mimic Timo's suggestion of the message for the day. Happy birthday, Liam. It looked very much like Rogue was smiling when Timo and Alessandro cheered and applauded his breakthrough effort to wish Liam a happy birthday. In Colorado, everyone was smiling as they watched. As night fell and the visitors returned home, with particularly warm farewells given to Leisha and the thankfully cured Timo Fiori, 
before their much longer journeys. Tara found herself back outside with Liam while Clark and Aiden got ready for bedtime. The stars were out, endlessly glistening and occasionally dancing, and Tara couldn't help but think where her youngest son's life would take him. Already an idol on one alien world, and a child whose birthday was a news story on Earth purely by virtue of his last name, a normal life did not lie ahead for little Liam. But if the endlessly bright and loving Piper was anything to go by, Tara had a feeling normal was overrated. With first birthday wishes having come in from friends in the highest of places, quite literally, Liam would certainly not be short of opportunities. The stars are yours if you want them, Tara whispered to her son as he slept soundly in her arms. And wherever a doubtlessly extraordinary life might take him, Tara knew there was one thing Liam McCarthy would never be. Alone. Thank you for listening to Not Alone, Endgame. Written by Craig A. Falconer. Narrated by James Patrick Cronin, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Produced by Blue Nose Audio. Production coordination by Candace Lawrence. Post-production by Michael Straza. Production copyright 2021 by Craig A. Falconer. All rights reserved.